Renewal by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The terms renew and renewing occur in the English New Testament only in the epistles, Paul and Hebrews, where they give expression to a wide conception which embraces the entire subjective side of salvation. This they represent as a work of God issuing in a wholly new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Galatians 6.15, Ephesians 2.10. The absence of these terms from the Gospels does not argue the absence of the thing expressed by them. In point of fact, it is taught throughout Scripture that man has, by his sin, not merely incurred the divine condemnation, but also corrupted his own heart, and needs, therefore, for his recovery, not merely objectively pardon, but subjectively purification, neither of which can he have except by a work of God. In the Old Testament, the sin of our first parents is represented as no more inculpating than corrupting, and all that are born of woman are declared to be corrupt from the womb. Job 15, verses 14 to 16, Psalm 51, verse 5. It is God alone who can turn a man a new heart. 1 Samuel 10, 9, Psalm 51, 10. And the saints rest on the divine promise that he will do so. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, Jeremiah 31, 33, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Jesus began his ministry as the dispenser of the Spirit, and his distinction lay precisely in the fact that his baptism with the Spirit works the inner purification which the baptism of John only symbolized. Accordingly, he teaches expressly that the kingdom of God is not for the children of the flesh, but the children of the Spirit, John 3 verse 3. And everywhere he presupposes that the corrupt tree of human nature must be first cleansed before good fruit can be expected of it. Matthew 7, verse 17. The broad treatment of such a theme, characteristic of the Gospels, gives way measurably in the epistles, where discrimination of aspects and stages begin to show themselves. The stress continues to be laid, however, on the main points that man is dead in sin and is vitalized to righteousness only by a creative work of the Holy Spirit in his heart. The Church has retained on the whole, with considerable constancy, the essential elements of this biblical teaching. In all types of historical Christianity, the teaching is persistent that salvation consists in its substance of a radical, subjective change wrought by the Holy Spirit. By virtue of this change, the tendencies to evil, native to man, as fallen, are progressively eradicated, and holy dispositions are implanted, nourished, and perfected. The most direct contradiction which this teaching has received in the history of Christian thought was that given by Pelagius at the opening of the 5th century. Asserting the inalienable ability of the will to do all righteousness, Pelagius necessarily denied that man had been subjectively injured by sin or needed subjective divine operations for his perfecting. The vigorous reassertion by Augustine of the necessity of subjective grace for the doing of good put pure Pelagianism once for all outside the pale of recognized Christian teaching. In more or less modified forms, however, it has persisted as a widespread tendency, conditioning the purity of the supernaturalism of salvation which is confessed. The strong emphasis laid by the Reformers on the fundamental doctrine of justification threw the objective side of salvation into such prominence that its subjective side, which was not in dispute between them and their most immediate opponents, seemed to pass temporarily out of sight. Occasion was taken, if not given, to represent it as neglected, if not denied. In the first generation of the Reformation movement, men of mystical tendency, like Osiander, reproached the Protestant teaching as if it recognized only an external salvation. The reproach was eminently unjust. With all the emphasis which Protestant theology lays on justification by faith as the central fact of salvation, it has never failed to lay equal stress on regeneration as its root and sanctification as its crown. Least of all, can the reform theology, with its insistence upon total depravity and irresistible grace, be justly accused of failure to give its rights to the great fact of supernatural renewal? In its view, justifying faith is itself the gift of God, operating subjectively upon the soul, and as justification thus issues out of a subjective effect wrought in the soul by God, so it issues into a subjective effect, the sanctification of the soul through the indwelling spirit. 
The debate at this point of the Protestant system with that of Rome does not concern the necessity or the reality of the cleansing of the soul from sinful tendencies and dispositions, but the relation of this cleansing operation to the reception of the sinner into the divine favor. Protestant theology insists that God does not wait until we deserve his favor before he is gracious to us. It feels that if that were so, our doom were sealed. In its view, God first receives us into his favor and then makes us worthy of it. This is commonly given expression in the formula that justification underlies sanctification and sanctification is a consequence of a precedent justification. But Protestant theology has never imagined that the sinner could get along with justification alone. It has rejoiced in the provision of the gospel for relieving the soul of its intolerable weight of guilt and condemnation but it has rejoiced equally in the provision made for relieving the soul of its intolerable burden of corruption and pollution. If it has refused to think of salvation as grounded in our holiness, it has equally refused to think of it as issuing in anything else but holiness. However far off the perfecting of this holiness may seem to be removed, it has never been willing to discover the substance of salvation in anything other than a perfected holiness. End of Renewal by B. B. Warfield. The Bible's Summum Bonum by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bible is a perfectly plain and a perfectly practical book. The purpose of its giving to the world was not at all that scholars might have a field in which they might try the depth of their insight and expend their best efforts in seeking and securing truth. It was given to plain and practical men as a prescription to cure them of the disease of sin, to busy and careless men as a trumpet call which they could not choose but hear. Its prime purpose was not to teach either a philosophy or a science or an art, not at all to systematize knowledge in any sphere of learning. Its prime purpose was simply to tell sinful men what a God they had and what they practically needed to do in order to serve that God and save their souls. It is easy to jump to the conclusion from this fact that the Bible does not teach any system, whether of theology or ethics. A moment's thought will guard us, however, against so false a step. Practical maxims, earnest, simple commands necessarily imply a system of both theology and ethics. To venture upon the simple statement, be sure you are right and then go ahead, is to commit oneself to a whole theory of the universe. It is to imply that there is such a thing as right and such a thing as wrong, that it lies in man's power to distinguish between them, yea, even to choose between them, that it will go well or ill with him according to this choice, that therefore there is such a thing as good and ill desert and as reward and punishment attached to them, involving in higher reach of logic the responsibility of the human soul, and higher still, the existence of a wise, holy, just, personal God to whom our duty is owed, and who, according to our desert, will reward or punish us. Just so that other maxim, while we live, let us live, how many of us practically live by it, involves likewise a whole theory of the universe, but diverse from the other. It implies that whatever we profess, we really do not believe in a God or a soul or a life after death. It implies that being brutish in character, we are willing to be brutes in life. It is thus impossible to give maxims to guide the life without implying in them a system of truth on which the practical teaching is based. According to the system of faith that lies in the depths of our hearts will be, therefore, the maxims by which we practically live, and out of the maxims of any man we can readily extract his faith. It is, therefore, inevitable that the Bible, being consistent in its commands, should imply a consistent system of ethics, and it is of much importance to us to know what that system is. It does not state it, indeed, as the philosophers would state it, but it no less clearly states it than they state their own systems, and we can easily compare it with theirs. Nor let anyone imagine that because the Bible does not scientifically state its system, it has simply adopted some one of, or a hodgepodge of, the systems which are prevalent among men. Its system differs from all men-born ones, 
just in the degrees that the pure teaching of God might be expected to differ from the residuum of that teaching left after straining through the very open sieve of a narrow and sinful human heart. We may compare it in whatever element we will, and on every comparison we shall find biblical ethics immeasurably superior to that of the schools. We shall find that, though the Bible does not present an unhuman, it does present an unmistakably superhuman system. It will be sufficient for us to institute this comparison in only one point, but it will serve good ends to choose for the point the key point of the systems, the question of the summum bonum. I call this the key point because, of course, when it is settled, everything is settled. The question, what is the highest good which man can strive after? Of course, on that depends everything. This is simply to say that the ideal a man has will determine the whole life of man. Of course, it must determine his notion of virtue, of duty, of motive. It determines also his whole character, motives, modes of life. The man, for instance, who practically considers wealth the highest good in human attainment will necessarily think it virtuous to turn the world over in the effort to get money, and it may soon not matter much to him how he gets it, so only he gets it. He will hold it his duty to acquire and save it even unto cheatery and miserliness. He will act on money-making motives. He will sink finally into a mere minting machine. According to our ideal, thus, our idea of what is the highest good, so is everything. Our characters, our lives, and their issues. If it be low, so will our life be low, and our death if it be high, so will our life be high, and that which comes after death. Now, how does biblical ethics compare with other systems in its teaching of what is the highest good? However they may differ in other particulars, all human systems of ethics are at one in this, they all find the highest good in something human. They differ vastly as to what human thing it shall be, whether the pleasure of the individual or of the race, his or its conformity to nature, or even his or its virtue. And as they differ in their idea of the thing, what constitutes it, so too in what is fitted to gain it, even when they call it by the same name. But they agree in this, they rise no higher than man, than some human quality or possession, in the assignment of their chief good. Thus by them, one and all, the attention is centred on what is human, Man is bidden look no higher than himself for his ideal, and the race is elevated just as much as the boy was able to lift himself by his trousers straps. Nay, further, man's attention being concentrated on man, he soon finds himself the type of man, and the inevitable and constant result has been that the ideal is, in the last analysis, practically found in the individual's happiness or development. Practically, the Epicurean sinks into a sot, the Stoic schools himself into cruel indifference to the fate of those about him. The altruist cannot think the mass of mankind happy so long as so substantial a part of it as himself is unhappy and thus learns to seek their happiness through his indulgence rather than his happiness through theirs. And thus everything ends in self-worship or self-indulgence, high or low. The world has never been able to invent anything better than this. See, then, the immense superiority of biblical ethics. It takes man out of himself and bids him seek the highest good in the glory not of his pitiful self, but of his all-glorious God. In no self-gratification, in no self-glorification, can he reach the height of his ideal. He is forced to look out of himself. He is necessarily lifted above himself. He is given at last a ladder to climb whose top rests securely against something other than and higher than his own head. With his eye set on glorifying his saviour and maker, his idea of virtue is transfigured and purified from earthly dross. His notions of duty are ennobled. His motives become holy and his whole life divine. In this one point we can see the transforming greatness of Christian ethics. This, I say, is the biblical idea of the summum bonum. But, of course, the Bible does not say, in technical words, the summum bonum is the glory of God. That is the way a scientific moralist, 
had he not been struck dumb at the grandeur of the thought, would have put it. But the Bible was not concerned about scientific morality. It was concerned about practical morality. It was not addressed to scientific moralists. It was addressed to simple men and women. And the way it puts it, you may read it in many places, and nowhere more plainly than in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, is, Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. How does this differ from that? Much every way, most notably of all, in this. The Bible gives no statement. It gives a command. It teaches, as they say of Jesus, with authority. It comes not coldly saying, this is the best thing on the whole to do, but calmly declaring, this is a thing which you shall do on penalties. And it is well to note this sharply. There are no ifs and ands about it. It simply says, do it. The question for us is, are we doing it? Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. There is a sense in that, that we may not all be gathering. Why, for instance, are you going to your business house tomorrow morning? To make money? Good. For what? Consciously, in order to glorify God in the wise, true, noble use of it. No? Well, then are you a Christian? My dear lady friend, to serve what purpose are you planning to give that entertainment tomorrow? Is it in order to glorify God through it? Perhaps you never thought of that. Well, are you a Christian? What God commands is, let us face it unflinchingly, that we shall do nothing without taking absolute care to see that we are trying to glorify God in the doing of it. Now, do not say, as some of you may be just ready to say, that this was never meant to apply to such everyday things as these. Paul was of a different opinion. He says it applies to the very choice of the food we eat and drink we drink. In fact, to everything. Let us not emasculate that word that we do. And do not say, as more of you are perhaps ready to say, that it is impossible to keep the command. What does that mean except that it is impossible to do this, and at the same time live a godless or inconsistent life? It is true indeed that we cannot do this and at the same time be votaries of pleasure, that we cannot do this and at the same time be worshippers of wealth, that we cannot do this and at the same time be eaten up with selfishness, this is all true enough, but it is no discovery of ours. Christ himself declared that we could not serve God or mammon. He himself asserted that we must desert the world to become his disciples. If we feel that we cannot observe this command, therefore, and leave one atom of our old self in us, remain anything like what we are. Why, we are just proving that Paul was only repeating the doctrine of his master, for that is just what Christ told his disciples too and the beloved disciple repeats it after his own fashion also, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for nothing that is in the world is of the Father. How can we then hope to make a compromise between them? Nor does the command stop here. The inspired writers go on to tell us what we must do, much in detail, yes, even this spirit in which we must do it. Thus, in Philippians, Paul, after repeating this same command in essence, continues by commanding that we should moreover do all these things without murmurings and disputings, or as we might more clearly render the words, without grumblings or questionings, without grumbling at the difficulty or hardness, shall we even say harshness, of the task, or stopping to consider narrowly and question as to just how far obedience is necessary. This is nothing more than to say that God not only wishes his command outwardly obeyed, but also inwardly. It is not obeying it. We are not glorifying God, either when we are showing that we, his servants, find him a hard master, or when our effort is not to yield him unquestioning service, running even beyond the command in eager love, but to be careful to do no more for him than we must. Would you think your own children were living only to your honor if they yielded you only such obedience? Although the Bible does not stiffly say, therefore, the summum bonum is the glory of God, it does much better. It says practically, and to every man, in words that every man can understand, do everything you do, consciously, in order to glorify God in the doing of it, and to do it all freely and gladly, with no grumbling at having to do it, and with no desire to confine the doing of it, to the narrowest possible limits. 
thus, though the Bible does not discourse learnedly as to the summum bonum, or the nature of virtue, or duty, or motives, it does manage to place very sharply before the mind, and sink very deeply into the heart of the really earnest reader, very clear notions of what is the highest good, what is virtuous, what duties are required, and what motives are high and to be followed. It lacks all technical terms. The Christian man may not know one scientific phrase, but if he has hearkened to the teaching of the book, he will know how to govern his life and to be good. He will know ethics practically, if not scientifically. Is not this the object of all ethics? Does not herein lie the supreme claim of Christian ethics to be the one true and adequate system? End of The Bible's Summum Bonum by B.B. Warfield John Calvin, The Man and His Work by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John Calvin was born on the 10th of July, 1509, at Noyon in Picardy. His boyhood was spent under the shadow of the long, straight-backed cathedral which dominates his native town. His mother, a woman of notable devoutness, omitted no effort to imbue her son with her own spirit. His father, a successful advocate and shrewd man of affairs, holding both ecclesiastical and civil offices, stood in close relations with the cathedral chapter and seems to have been impressed with the advantages of a clerical life. At all events, he early devoted his promising son to it. According to the bad custom of the times, a benefice in the cathedral was assigned to the young Calvin at an early age, and to it was afterwards added a neighbouring curacy. Thus funds were provided for his support. His education was conducted in companionship with the youthful scions of the local noble house of Montmont, and began therefore with the training proper to a gentleman. As changing circumstances dictated changes of plan, he was educated first as a churchman, then as a lawyer, and through all, and most abundantly of all, as a man of letters. He was an eager student, rapidly and solidly mastering the subjects to which he turned his attention, and earning such admiration from his companions as to be esteemed by them rather a teacher than a fellow pupil. His youth was as blameless as it was strenuous. It is doubtless legendary that the censoriousness of his bearing earned for him from his associates the nickname of the accusative case, but serious-minded he undoubtedly was, dominated by a scrupulous piety and schooled in a strict morality which brooked with difficult immorality in his associates, an open-minded, affectionate young man of irreproachable life and frank manners, somewhat sensitive, perhaps, but easy to be entreated, and attracting not merely the confidence but the lasting affection of all with whom he came into contact. At the age of twenty-two, this high-minded young man is found established at Paris as a humanist scholar, with his ambition set upon literary fame. His debut was made by the publication of an excellent commentary on Seneca's treatise On Clemency, April 1532, in which a remarkable command of the whole mass of classical literature, a fine intelligence, and a serious interest in the higher moralities are conspicuous. A great career as a humanist seemed opening before him when suddenly he was converted and his whole life revolutionized. He had always been not only of an elevated ethical temper, but of a deeply religious spirit. But now the religious motive took complete possession of him and directed all his activities. Renouncing all other studies, says Beza, he devoted himself to God. He did not indeed cease to be a man of letters any more than he ceased to be a man, but all his talents and acquisitions were henceforth dedicated purely to the service of God and his gospel. Instead of annotating classical texts, we find him now writing a Protestant manifesto for the use of his friend Nicholas Kopp, November 1st, 1533 a detailed study of the state of the soul after death, 1534, and in his enforced retirement at Agulem, 1534, making a beginning at least with a primary treatise on Christian doctrine designed for the instruction of the people as they came out into the light of the gospel, 
which, however, when driven from France, he was destined to publish from his asylum at Basel, spring of 1536. In circumstances which transformed it into, at once an apology, a manifesto, and a confession of faith, it is interesting to observe the change which in the meantime had come over his attitude towards his writings. When he sent forth his commentary on Seneca's treatise, his first and last humanistic work, he was quivering with anxiety for the success of his book. He wanted to know how it was selling, whether it was being talked about, what people thought of it. He was proud of his performance, he was zealous to reap the fruits of his labour, he was eager for his legitimate reward. Only four years have passed, and he issues his first Protestant publication. It is the immortal Institutes of the Christian Religion in its first state, free from all such tremors. He is living at Basel under an assumed name, and is fully content that no one of his acquaintance shall know him for the author of the book which was creating such a stir in the world. He hears the acclamations with which it was greeted, with a certain personal detachment. He has sent it forth not for his own glory, but for the glory of God. He is not seeking his own advantage or renown by it, but the strengthening and the succoring of the saints. His sole joy is that it is doing its work. He has not ceased to be a man of letters, we repeat, but he has consecrated all his gifts and powers as a man of letters without reserve to the service of God and his gospel. What we see in Calvin, thus fundamentally, is the man of letters as saint, He never contemplated for himself, he never desired in all his life, he never fully acquiesced in any other vocation. He was by nature, by gifts, by training, by inborn predilection and by acquired capacities alike, a man of letters, and he earnestly, perhaps we may even say passionately, wished to dedicate himself as such to God. This was the life which he marked out for himself, from which he was diverted only under compulsion, and which he never in principle abandoned. It was only by the dreadful imprecation of Pharrell that he was constrained to lay aside his cherished plans and enter upon the direct work of the Reformation of Geneva, autumn of 1536. And when, after two years of strenuous labour at this uncongenial employment, he was driven from that turbulent city, it came to him only as a release. Once more he settled down at Basel and applied himself to his beloved studies. It required all of Busser's strategy as well as entreaties to entice him away from his books to an active ministry at Strasbourg. And he yielded at last only when it was made clear to him that there would be leisure there for literary labours. That leisure he certainly not so much found as made for himself. His little conventicle of French refugees quickly became under his hand a model church. His lectures at the school attracted ever wider and wider attention. As time passed, he was called much away to conferences and colloquies, where, as the theologian, as Melanchthon admiringly called him, he did important service. But it was at Strasbourg that his literary activity as a Protestant man of letters really began. There he transformed his little book of religion, the Institutes of 1536, which was not much more than an extended catechetical manual, into an ample treatise on theology, August 1539. There, too, he inaugurated the series of his epoch-making expositions of scripture with his noble commentary on Romans, March 1540. Thence, too, he sent out his beautiful letter to Sadaletto, the most winningly written of all his controversial treatises, September 1539. There, too, was written that exquisite little popular tract on the Lord's Supper, which was the instruction and consolation of so many hundreds of his perplexed fellow countrymen, published in 1541. It caused Calvin great perturbation when these fruitful labours were broken in upon by a renewed call to Geneva. It was with the profoundest reluctance that he listened to this call, and he obeyed it only under the stress of the sternest sense of duty. Returning to Geneva was to him going straight to the cross. He went, as he said, as a sacrifice slain unto God, bound and fettered to obedience to God. He was not the man to take up a cross and not bear it and this cross too he bore faithfully to the end. But neither was he the man to forget the labour of love to which he had given his heart. Hence the unremitting toil of his pen with which he wore out the days and nights at Geneva. Hence the immensity of his literary output, produced in circumstances as unfavourable as any in which a rich literary output was ever produced. Even on this rack, 
Calvin remained fundamentally the man of letters. It requires 59 quarto volumes to contain the works of John Calvin, as collected in the great critical edition of Baum, Kunitz and Reuss. Astonishing for their mere mass, these works are still more astonishing for their quality. They are written in the best Latin of their day, elevated, crisp, energetic, eloquent, with the eloquence of an earnest and sober spirit, almost too good Latin, as Joseph Scaliger said, for a theologian, or in a French which was a factor of importance in the creation of a worthy French prose for the discussion of serious themes. The variety of their literary form runs through the whole gamut of earnest discourse, from lofty discussion and pithy comment laden with meaning, to burning exhortation, vehement invective and biting satire. The whole range of subjects proper to a teacher of fundamental truth, who was also both a churchman and a statesman, a minute observer of the life of the people, and a student of the forces by which peoples are moved, is treated, and never without that touch of illumination which we call genius. At the head of the list of his writings stands, of course, his great dogmatic treatise, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. In a very literal sense, his book may indeed be called his life work. It was the first book he published after he had devoted himself to God, and thus introduces the series of his works consecrated to the propagation of religion. But from its first appearance in the spring of 1536 to the issue of its definitive edition in 1559, Throughout nearly a quarter of a century, Calvin was continually busy with it, revising, expanding, readjusting it, until, from a simple little handbook innocent of constructive principle, it had grown into a bulky but compact and thoroughly organized textbook in theology. The importance to the Protestant cause of the publication of this book can hardly be overstated. It is inadequate praise to describe it, as the Roman Catholic historian Kamp Schulter describes it, as, quote, without doubt, the most outstanding and most influential production in the sphere of dogmatics which the Reformation literature of the 16th century presents, end quote. This goes without saying. What demands recognition is that the publication of the Institutes was not merely a literary incident, but an historical event, big with issues, which have not lost their importance to the present day. By it was given to perplexed, hard-bestead Protestantism an adequate, positive program for its reformation. As even a not very friendly critic is compelled to bear witness, in this book Calvin at last raised banner against banner, and sounded out a ringing sursum corda, which was heard and responded to wherever men were seeking the new way. Quote, the immense service which the institutes rendered to the evangelicals, expounds this critic. It is M. Busson in his biography of Sebastian Castellian, and he is thinking particularly of the evangelicals of France, though mutatis mundandis, what he says, has its application elsewhere too, was to give a body to their ideas an expression to their faith, end quote. Protesting against superstitious and materialistic interpretations of doctrine and worship, quote, their vague aspirations would undoubtedly have issued in nothing in the church or out of it, end quote. What they needed and what the institutes did for them was the disengagement of a principle from this vortex of ideas and the development of its consequences. Such a book, continues M. Busson, quote, is equally removed from a pamphlet of Ulrich von Hutten, from the satire of Erasmus, from the popular preaching, mystical and violent, of Luther. It is a work of a theologian in the most learned sense of the term, a religious work, undoubtedly, penetrated with an ethical inspiration, but before all a work of organization and concentration, a code of doctrine for the minister, an arsenal of arguments for simple believers. It is the summa of reformed Christianity. The author's concernment is far more to bring out the logical force and the moral power of his own doctrine than to descant on the weak points of the opposing doctrine. What holds his attention is not the past but the future. It is the reconstruction of the church. End quote. What wonder, then, that it has retained its influence through all succeeding time. As the first adequate statement of the positive program of the Reformation movement, the Institutes lies at the foundation of the whole development of Protestant theology and has left an impress on evangelical thought which is ineffaceable. After three centuries and a half, it retains its unquestioned preeminence as the greatest and most influential of all dogmatic treatises. There, says Albrecht Ritschl, 
pointing to it, there is the masterpiece of Protestant theology. Second only to the service he rendered by his institutes was the service Calvin rendered by his expositions of scripture. These fill more than thirty volumes of his collected works, thus constituting the larger part of his total literary product. They cover the whole of the New Testament except 2 and 3 John and the Apocalypse, and the whole of the Old Testament except the Solomonic and some of the historical books. It was doubtless in part to his humanistic training that he owed the acute philological sense and the unerring feeling for language which characterize all his expositions. A recent writer, who has made a special study of Calvin's humanism, at least, writes, quote, In his sober grammatico-historical method, in the stress he laid on the natural sense of the text, by the side of his deep religious understanding of it, in his renunciation of the current allegorizing, in his felicitous, skillful dealing with difficult passages, the humanistically trained master is manifest, pouring the new wine into new bottles. End quote. Calvin was, however, a born exegete and adds to his technical equipment of philological knowledge and trained skill in the interpretation of texts a clear and penetrating intelligence, remarkable intellectual sympathy, incorruptible honesty, unusual historical perception, and an incomparable insight into the progress of thought, while the whole is illuminated by his profound religious comprehension. His expositions of scripture were accordingly a wholly new phenomenon and introduced a new exegesis, the modern exegesis. He stands out in the history of biblical study as what Distel, for example, proclaims him, quote, the creator of genuine exegesis, end quote. The authority which his comments immediately acquired was immense. They opened the scriptures as the scriptures never had been before. Richard Hooker, the judicious Hooker, remarks that in the controversies of his own time, the sense of scripture which Calvin alloweth was of more weight than if 10,000 Augustans, Jeromes, Chrysostoms, Cyprians were brought forward nor have they lost their value even today. Alone of the commentaries of their age, the most scientific of modern expositors still find their profit in consulting them. As Professor A. J. Baumgartner, who has set himself to investigate the quality of Calvin's Hebrew learning, which he finds quite adequate, puts it after remarking on Calvin's, quote, astounding, multiplied, almost superhuman activity, end quote, in his work of biblical interpretation, quote, and, a most remarkable thing, this work has never grown old. These commentaries, whose durable merit and high value men of the most diverse tendencies have signalized, these commentaries remain to us even today, an astonishingly rich, almost inexhaustible mine of profound thoughts, of solid and often ingenious interpretation, of wholesome exposition, and at the same time of profound erudition. The Reformation was the greatest revolution of thought which the human spirit has wrought since the introduction of Christianity, and controversy is the very essence of revolutions. Of course, Calvin's whole life, which was passed in the thick of things, was a continuous controversy, and directly controversial treatises necessarily form a considerable part of his literary output. We have already been taught, indeed, that his fundamental aim was constructive, not destructive, he wished to rebuild the church on its true foundations, not to destroy its edifice. But like certain earlier rebuilders of the holy city, he needed to work with the trowel in one hand and the sword in the other. Probably no more effective controversialist ever wrote. Quote, the number of Calvin's polemical treatises, remarks an unfriendly critic, is large and they are all masterpieces of their kind, end quote. At the head of them, in time as well as in attractiveness, stands his famous letter to Cardinal Sadoletto, written in his exile at Strasbourg, for the protection from an insidious foe of the church which had cast him out. Courteous, even gentle and deferential in tone, and yet cogent, conclusive, in effect it perfectly exemplifies the precept of suavitor in modo, fortite in re. Others are no doubt set in a different key. The critic we have just quoted, E. F. Bela, tells of the one he thinks, quote, the harshest and bitterest of all, end quote, the defense against the calumnies of Peter Caroli. Quote, the letter to Sadoletto, he remarks, was certainly written in a good hour. The contrary must be said of the present book. From the point of view of literary history, the defense, no doubt, merits unrestricted praise. 
the elegant, crisp style, the skill with which the author not only casts a moral shadow upon his opponent, but brands him as an unsavoury person not to be taken seriously, while over all is poured the most sovereign disdain, brings to the reader of this book, now almost four hundred years old, such aesthetic pleasure that it is only with difficulty that he recalls himself to righteous indignation over the gross unfairness and open untruthfulness which the author permits himself against Caroli. End quote. No doubt, Calvin often spoke in harsh terms of his opponents. They were harsh things they were seeking for him, and the contest in which he was engaged was not a sparring match for the amusement of the onlookers. Nor need it be asserted that he was infallible, though, quote, even his enemies will admit, as even Mark Patterson allows, that he knows not how to decorate or disguise a fact, end quote. Between the suavity of the letter to Sadaletto and the furiousness of the defense against Caroli, a long list of controversial writings of very varying manners range themselves. A frankness of speech characterizes them, which never balks at calling a spade a spade. We meet in them with deprecatory, even defamatory epithets, which jar sadly on our modern sensibilities. These are faults not of the man, but of the times. As we are reminded by M. Lenient, the historian of French satire, of all figures of rhetoric, euphemism was the least in use in the 16th century. But none of Calvin's controversial tracts fails to be informed from beginning to end with a loftiness of purpose, to be conducted with a seriousness and directness of argument, and to be filled with a solid instruction, such as raise them far above the plane of mere partisan wrangle, and give them a place among the permanent possessions of the church. Fault was found with him in his own day, as, for example, by Castellion, for permitting himself the use of satire in religious debate. This was not merely a result of native temperament with him, but a matter of deliberate and reasoned choice. Of course, he had nothing in common with the mere mockers of the time, the Perrier, Marot, Rabelais, whose levity was almost as abominable to him as their coarseness. Satire to him was a weapon, not an amusement. The proper way to deal with folly, he thought, was to laugh at it. The superstitions in which the world had been so long entangled were foolish as truly as wicked. And how could it be, he demanded, that in speaking of things so ridiculous, so intrinsically funny, we should not laugh at them with wide open mouth? Of course, this laugh was not the laugh of pure amusement, and as it gained in earnestness, it naturally lost in lightness of touch. It was a rapier in Calvin's hands, and its use was to pierce and cut. And how well he uses it. The Sorbonne for example, issued a series of articles declaring the orthodox doctrine on the points disputed by the Protestants. Calvin republishes these articles and subjoins to each of them a quite innocent-looking proof, conceived perfectly in the Sorbonic manner, but issuing in each case in a hopeless reductio ad absurdum. Thus, quote, it is proved, moreover, that vows are obligatory from their being dispensed and loosed. The Pope could not dispense vows were it not for the power of the keys, and hence it follows that they bind the conscience. End quote. Truly as fine a specimen of lucus a non lucendo as one will find in a day's search. It is only rarely that the mask is dropped for a moment and a glimpse given of the mocking eyes behind it, as thus, quote, but that our masters, when congregated in one body, are the church, is proved from this that they are very like the Ark of Noah, since they form a herd of all sorts of beasts. Quote. The matter is indeed in general so subtly managed that perhaps the antidote, which in each instance follows on the proof, was not altogether unnecessary. There is no such subtlety in what is perhaps the best known of Calvin's satirical pieces, his admonition showing the advantage which Christendom might derive from an inventory of relics, here we have a simple, straightforward enumeration of the relics exposed in various churches for the veneration of the people. The effect is produced by the incongruity, which grows more and more monstrous, of the reduplication of these relics. Quote, Everybody knows that the inhabitants of Toulouse think that they have got six of the bodies of the apostles. Now let us attend to those who have had two or three bodies, for Andrew has another body at Malfi, Philip and James the Less, 
have each another body at the church of the holy apostles, and Simeon and Jude in like manner at the church of St. Peter. Bartholomew has also another in the church dedicated to him at Rome. So here are six who each have two bodies, and also by way of a supernumerary, Bartholomew's skin is shown at Pisa. Matthias, however, surpasses all the rest, for he has a second body at Rome, in the church of the elder Mary, and a third one at Treves. Besides, he has another head and another arm existing separately by themselves. There are also fragments of Andrew existing at different places and quite sufficient to make up half a body, end quote. And so on, endlessly and, of course, monotonously, which, however, is part of the calculated effect. As M. Lunion remarks, quote, his pitiless calculations give to a mathematical operation all the piquancy of a bon mot and the irony of numbers destroys the credit of the most respected pilgrimages, end quote. It is, however, in such a tract as the excuse of the Nicodemites that Calvin's satire is found at its best, as he rails at those weak Protestants who were too timid to declare themselves. Quote, his pen, says M. Lunion, was never more light or incisive, moralist and painter after the fashion of La Bruyère, he amuses himself sketching all these profiles of effeminate Christians with their slackness, their compromises of conscience, their calculations of selfishness and indifferent lukewarmness. End quote. Literature, this all is doubtless and good literature, and by virtue of it, Calvinistic satire, Calvin, Biza and Viret were its first masters, has a recognized place in the history of French satire. But it is not primarily or chiefly literature, and it had its part to play among the moral and religious forces which Calvin liberated for the accomplishment of his reforming work. Perhaps enough has been said to suggest how Calvin fulfilled his function as reformer by his literary labours. There were, of course, other forms of his literary product which have not been mentioned, creeds and catechisms, church ordinances and forms of worship, popular tracts and academic concilia. We need not stop to speak of them particularly. Of one other product of his literary activity, however, a special word seems demanded. Calvin was the great letter-writer of the Reformation age. About 4,000 of his letters have come down to us, some of them almost of the dimensions of treatises, many of them practically theological tractates, but many of them also of the most intimate character in which he pours out his heart. In these letters we see the real Calvin, a man of profound religious convictions and rich religious life, of high purpose and noble strenuousness, of full and freely flowing human affections and sympathies. In them he rebukes rulers and instructs statesmen and strengthens and comforts saints. Never a perplexed pastor but has from him a word of encouragement and counsel. Never a martyr but has from him a word of heartening and consolation. Perhaps no friend ever more affectionately leaned on his friends, Certainly no friend ever gave himself more ungrudgingly to his friends. Had he written these letters alone, Calvin would take his place among the great Christians and the great Christian leaders of the world. It is time, however, that we reminded ourselves that Calvin's work as a reformer is not summed up in his literary activities. A man of letters he was fundamentally, and a man of letters he remained in principle all his life, but he was something more than a man of letters. This was his chosen sphere of service, and he counted it a cross to be compelled to expend his energies through other channels. But this cross was laid upon him, and he took it up and bore it. And the work which he did under the cross was such that had we no single word from his pen, he would still hold his rank among the greatest of the reformers. We call him the reformer of Geneva. But in reforming Geneva, he set forces at work which have been worldwide in their operation and are active still today. Were we to attempt to characterize, in a phrase, the peculiarity of his work as a reformer, perhaps we could not do better than to say it was the work of an idealist become a practical man of affairs. He did not lack the power to wait, to make adjustments, to advance by slow and tentative steps. He showed himself able to work with any material, to make the best of compromises, to abide patiently the coming of fitting opportunities. The ends which he set before himself as reformer he attained only in the last years of his strenuous life, but he was incapable of abandoning his ideals, of acquiescing in half measures, of drifting with the tide. Therefore, his whole life in Geneva was a conflict, 
but in the end he made Geneva the wonder of the world, and infused into the reformed churches a spirit which made them not only invincible in the face of their foes, but in active ferment that has changed the face of the world. Thus this man of letters, entering into life with his ideals, was the means to adopt the words of a critic, whose sympathy with those ideals leaves much to be desired, of concentrating in the narrower corner of the world a moral force which saved the Reformation, or rather, to put it at its full effect, which saved Europe. Quote, it may be doubted, as the same critic, Mark Patterson, exclaims in extorted admiration, if all history can furnish another instance of such a victory of moral force. End quote. When Calvin came to Geneva, he tells us himself, he found the gospel there, but no church established. When I first came to this church, he says, there was as good as nothing here. Il n'est avoir quasi comme rien. There was preaching, and that was all. He would have found much the same state of things everywhere else in the Protestant world. The church, in the early Protestant conception, was constituted by the preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments, the correction of the morals of the community was the concern not of the church, but of the civil power. As a recent historian, Professor Karl Rieke, rather flippantly expresses it, quote, Luther, when he had preached and sowed the seed of the word, left to the Holy Spirit the care of producing the fruit, while with his friend Philip he peacefully drank his glass of Wittenberg beer, end quote. Calvin could not take this view of the matter. Whatever others may hold, he observed, we cannot think so narrowly of our office that when preaching is done, our task is fulfilled, and we may take our rest. In this view, the mark of a true church is not merely that the gospel is preached in it, but that it is followed. For him, the church is the communion of saints, and it is incumbent upon it to see to it that it is what it professes to be. From the first he therefore set himself strenuously to attain this end, and the instrument which he sought to employ to attain it was, briefly, church discipline. It comes to us with a surprise, which is almost a shock, to learn that we owe to Calvin all that is involved for the purity and welfare of the church in the exercise of church discipline. But that is the simple truth, and so sharp was the conflict by which the innovation won a place for itself, and so important did the principles seem, that it became the mark of the reformed churches that they made discipline one of the fundamental criteria of the true church. Moreover, the application of this principle carried Calvin very far, and indeed in its outworking gave the world through him the principle of a free church in a free state. It is ultimately to him, therefore, that the church owes its emancipation from the state, and to him goes back that great battle cry which has since fired the hearts of many saints in many crises in many lands, the crown rights of King Jesus in his church. Censorship of manners and morals was not introduced by Calvin into Geneva. Such a censorship, often of the most petty and galling kind, was the immemorial practice not only of Geneva but of all other similarly constituted towns. It was part of the recognized police regulations of the times. Calvin's sole relation to this censorship was through his influence, he never bore civil office or exercised civil authority in Geneva, and indeed acquired the rights of citizenship there only late in life, gradually to bring some order and rationality into its exercise. What Calvin introduced, and it was so revolutionary with respect both to the state and to the church, that it required eighteen years of bitter struggle before it was established, was distinctively church discipline. The principles on which he proceeded were already laid down in the first edition of his Institutes, spring of 1536, and when he came to Geneva in the autumn of 1536, he lost no time in seeking to put them into practice. Already at the opening of 1537, we find a document drawn up by him in the name of the ministers of Geneva before the council, in which the whole new conception is briefly outlined. This great charter of the church's liberties, for it is truly such as the Magna Carta is the charter of British rights, opens with these simple and direct words, quote, it is certain that a church cannot be said to be well-ordered and governed unless the Holy Supper of our Lord is frequently celebrated and attended in it, and that with such good regulation that no one would dare to present himself at it except with piety and deep reverence. And it is therefore necessary for the church to maintain in its integrity the discipline of excommunication, 
by which those should be corrected who are unwilling to yield themselves amiably and in all obedience to the holy word of God. End quote. In the body of the document the matter is argued, and three things are proposed. First, that it be ascertained at the outset who of the inhabitants of the town wished to avow themselves of the Church of Jesus Christ. For this it is suggested that a brief and comprehensive confession of faith be prepared, and all the inhabitants of your town be required to make confession and render reason of their faith, that it may be ascertained which accord with the gospel, and which prefer to be of the kingdom of the Pope, rather than of Jesus Christ. Secondly, that a catechism be prepared, and the children be diligently instructed in the elements of the faith. And thirdly, that provision be made by the appointment of certain persons of good life and good repute among all the faithful, and likewise of constancy of spirit and not open to corruption, who should keep watch over the conduct of the church members, advise with them, admonish them, and in obstinate cases bring them to the attention of the ministers, when, if they still prove unamenable, they are to be held as rejected from the company of Christians, and as a sign of this rejected from the communion of the Lord's Supper, and denounced to the rest of the faithful as not to be accompanied with familiarly. By this program Calvin became nothing less than the creator of the Protestant Church. The particular points to be emphasized in it are two. It is purely church discipline which is contemplated, with none other but spiritual penalties. And the church is for this purpose especially discriminated from the body of the people, the state. And a wedge is thus driven in between church and state, which was bound to separate the one from the other. In claiming for the church this discipline, Calvin naturally had no wish in any way to infringe upon the police regulations of the civil authorities. They continued in their own sphere to command his approval and cooperation. He has the clearest conception of the limits within which the discipline of the church must keep itself, and expressly declares that it is confined absolutely to the spiritual penalty of excommunication. But he just as expressly states that the state, on its own part, might well take cognizance of spiritual offences, and even invokes the aid of the civil magistrate in support of the authority of the church. This, he says to the council, after outlining his scheme for the appointment of lay helpers, in effect elders, in the exercise of discipline, this seems to us a good way to introduce excommunication into our church, and to maintain it in its entirety. And beyond this correction the church cannot proceed. But if there are any so insolent and abandoned to all perversity that they only laugh at being excommunicated, and do not mind living and dying in such a condition of rejection, it will be for you to consider how long you will endure and leave unpunished such contempt and such mockery of God and his gospel. This is not requiring the state to execute the church's decrees. The church executes her own decrees, and its extremist penalty is excommunication. It is only recognizing that the state as well as the church may take account of spiritual offenses. And particularly it is declaring that while the church by her own sanctions protects her own altars, it is the part of the state by its own sanctions to sustain the church in protecting its altars. Calvin has not risen to the conception of the complete mutual independence of church and state. His view still includes the conception of an established church. But the established church which he pleads for is a church absolutely autonomous in its own spiritual sphere. In asking this, he was asking for something new in the Protestant world, and something in which lay the promise and potency of all the freedom which has come to the Reformed churches since. Of course, Calvin did not get what he asked for in 1537, nor did he get it when he returned from his banishment in 1541, but he never lost sight from it, he never ceased to contend for it, he was always ready to suffer for its assertion and defense, and at last he won it. The spiritual liberties which he demanded for the church in 1536 for the assertion of which he was banished in 1538, for the establishment of which he ceaselessly struggled from 1541, he measurably attained at length in 1555. In the fruits of that great victory we have all had our part, and every church in Protestant Christendom which enjoys today any liberty whatever in performing its functions as a church of Jesus Christ owes it all to John Calvin. It was he who first asserted this liberty in his early manhood, he was only twenty-seven years of age when he presented his program to the council. It was he who first gained it in a lifelong struggle against a determined opposition. It was he who taught his followers to value it above life itself and to secure it to their successors with the outpouring of their blood. 
and thus Calvin's great figure rises before us as not only in a true sense the creator of the Protestant Church, but the author of all the freedom it exercises in its spiritual sphere. It is impossible to linger here on the relations of this great exploit of Calvin's, even to point out its rooting in his fundamental religious conceptions, or its issue in the creation of a spirit in his followers, to the efflorescence of which this modern world of ours owes its free institutions. We cannot even stop to indicate other important claims he has upon our reverence. We say nothing here, for example, of Calvin the preacher, the man of the word, as Du Merg calls him, pronouncing him as such greater than he was as man of action or man of thought, as both of which he was very great, who for twenty-five years stood in the pulpit of Geneva, preaching sometimes daily, sometimes twice a day, a word the echoes of which were heard to the confines of Europe. We say nothing again of his reorganization of the worship of the Reformed churches, and particularly of his gift to them of the service of song for the Reformed churches did not sing until Calvin taught them to do it. There are many who think that he did few things greater or more far-reaching in their influence than the making of the Psalter. That Psalter, of which twenty-five editions were published in the first year of its existence, and sixty-two more in the next four years, which was translated or transfused into nearly every language of Europe, and which wrought itself into the very flesh and bone of the struggling saints throughout all the killing times of Protestant history. The activities of Calvin were too varied and multiplex, his influence in numerous directions too enormous, to lend themselves to rapid enumeration. We can pause further only to say a necessary word of that system of divine truth, which by his winning restatement and powerful advocacy of it, he has stamped with his name, and with his eye upon which a Roman Catholic writer of our day, Canon William Barry, pronounces Calvin, quote, "...undoubtedly the greatest of Protestant divines." and perhaps after St. Augustine, the most persistently followed by his disciples of any Western writer on theology. End quote. It has become very much the custom of modern historians to insist that Calvin's was not an original, but only a systematizing genius. Thus, for example, Reinhold Seeberg remarks, quote, His was an acute and delicate, but not a creative mind. As a dogmatician, he furnished no new ideas, but with the most delicate sense of perception, he arranged the dogmatic ideas at hand, in accordance with their essential character and their historical development. He possessed the wonderful talent of comprehending any given body of religious ideas in its most delicate refinements, and giving appropriate expression to the results of his investigations. End quote. Accordingly, he did not leave behind him, quote, uncoined gold, like Luther, or questionable coinage like Melanchthon, end quote, but good gold well minted, and in this lies the explanation of the greatness of his influence as a theologian. The contention may very easily be overpressed, but at its basis there lies the perception of a very important fact, perhaps we may say the most important fact in the premises. Calvin was a thoroughly independent student of scripture and brought forth from that treasure house things not only old but new and if it was not given to him to recover for the world so revolutionizing a doctrine as that of justification by faith alone, the contributions of his fertile thought to doctrinal advance were neither few nor unimportant. He made an epoch in the history of the doctrine of the Trinity by his insistence on self-existence as the proper attribute of Son and Spirit as well as of the Father. He drove out the lingering elements of subordinationism and secured to the church a deepened consciousness of the co-equality of the divine persons. He introduced the presentation of the work of Christ under the rubrics of the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. He created the whole discipline of Christian ethics. But above all, he gave to the church the entire doctrine of the work of the Holy Spirit, profoundly conceived and wrought out in its details, with its fruitful distinctions of common and efficacious grace, of noetic, aesthetic, and thelematic effects, a gift we venture to think so great, so pregnant with benefit to the Church, as fairly to give him a place by the side of Augustine and Anselm and Luther, as the theologian of the Holy Spirit, as they were respectively the theologian of grace, of the atonement, and of justification. Nevertheless, despite such contributions, contributions of the first order to theological advance, it is quite true, and it is a truth deserving the strongest emphasis, that the system of doctrine which Calvin taught, and by his powerful commendation of which his greatest work for the world was wrought, was not peculiar to himself, 
was in no sense new, was, in point of fact, just the gospel common to him and all the reformers, on the ground of which they spoke of themselves as evangelicals, and by the recovery of which was wrought out the revolution which we call the Reformation. Calvin did not originate this system of truth. As a man of the second generation, he inherited it, and his greatest significance as a religious teacher is that by his exact and delicate sense of doctrinal values and relations, and his genius for systematic construction, he was able, as none other was, to cast this common doctrinal treatise of the Reformation into a well-compacted, logically unassailable, and religiously inspiring whole. In this sense, it is as systematizer that he makes his greatest demand on our admiration and gratitude. It was he who gave the evangelical movement a theology. The system of doctrine taught by Calvin is just the Augustinianism common to the whole body of the Reformers, for the Reformation was, as from the spiritual point of view a great revival of religion, so from the theological point of view a great revival of Augustinianism. And this Augustinianism is taught by him not as independent discovery of his own, but fundamentally as he learnt it from Luther, whose fertile conceptions he completely assimilated, and most directly and in much detail from Martin Busser, into whose practical, ethical point of view he perfectly entered, many of the very forms of statement most characteristic of Calvin, on such topics as predestination, faith, the stages of salvation, the church, the sacraments, only reproduce, though of course with that clearness and religious depth peculiar to Calvin, the precise teachings of Busser, who was, above all others, accordingly Calvin's master in theology. Of course, he does not take these ideas over from Busser and repeat them by rote, they have become his own and issue afresh from him with a new exactness and delicacy of appreciation in themselves and in their relations with a new development of implications and especially with a new richness of religious content. For the prime characteristic of Calvin as a theologian is precisely the practical interest which governs his entire thought and the religious profundity which suffuses it all. It was not the head but the heart which made him a theologian and it is not the head but the heart which he primarily addresses in his theology. He takes his start, of course, from God, knowledge of whom and obedience to whom he declares the sum of human wisdom. But this God he conceives as righteous love, Lord as well as Father, of course, but Father as well as Lord, whose will is, of course, the prima causa rerum, for is he not God? but whose will also it will be our joy as well as our wisdom to embrace, for is he not our Father? It was that we might know ourselves to be holy in the hands of this God of perfect righteousness and goodness, not in those of men, whether ourselves or some other men, that he was so earnest for the doctrine of predestination, which is nothing more than the declaration of the supreme dominion of God. It was that our eternal felicity might hang wholly on God's mighty love and not on our sinful weakness that he was so zealous for the doctrine of election, which is nothing more than the ascription of our entire salvation to God. As he contemplated the majesty of this sovereign father of men, his whole being bowed in reverence before him and his whole heart burned with zeal for his glory. As he remembered that this great God has become in his own son the redeemer of sinners, he passionately gave himself to the proclamation of the glory of his grace. Into his hands he committed himself without reserve, his whole spirit panted to be in all its movement subjected to his government, or, to be more specific, to the leading of his spirit. All that was good in him, all the good he hoped might be formed in him, he ascribed to the almighty working of this divine spirit. The glory of God alone the leading of the spirit, or as a bright young French student of his thought has lately expressed it, la maîtrise, the mastery, the control of the spirit, became thus the twin principles of his whole thought and life, or rather the double expression of the one principle, for since all that God does, he does by his spirit, the two are at bottom one. Here we have the secret of Calvin's greatness and the source of his strength unveiled to us, no man ever had a profounder sense of God than he. No man ever more unreservedly surrendered himself to the divine direction. Quote, we cannot better characterize the fundamental disposition of Calvin the man and the reformer, writes a recent German student of his life, Bernhard Bess, than in the words of the psalm, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? 
After that virtuoso in religion of ancient Israel, no one has spoken of the majesty of God and the insignificance of man with such feeling and truth as Calvin. The appearance which Luther's expressions often give, as if God exists merely for man's sake, never is given by Calvin. God is for him the almighty will which lies behind all that comes to pass. What comes to pass in the world serves, no doubt, man, the church, and salvation, but this is not its ultimate end, but the revelation of the glory and the honor of God. End quote. If there is anything that will make a man great, surely it is placing himself unreservedly at the disposal of God, and seeking not only to do nothing but God's will, but to do all God's will. This is what Calvin did, and it is because he did this that he was so great. He was, of course, not without his weaknesses. He had no doubt a high temper, though, to do him justice, we must take the term in all its senses. He did not, in all things, rise superior to the best opinion of his age. We have seen, for example, that he was in full accord with his time in its extension of the cognizance of the civil courts to spiritual offences, and it was by the consent of his mind to this universal conviction of the day that he was implicated in that unhappy occurrence, the execution of Servetus. But to do him justice here, we must learn to speak both of his connection with that occurrence and of Servetus himself in quite other terms than the reckless language with which a modern writer of repute speaks when he calls Calvin, quote, the author of the great crime of the age, the murder of the heroic Servetus, end quote. Servetus, that, quote, fool of genius, end quote, as a recent writer not without insight characterizes him, was anything but an heroic figure. The crime of his murder, unfortunately, had scores of fellows in that age, in which life was lightly valued, and it was agreed on all hands that grave heresy and gross blasphemy were capital offences in well-organized states. And Servetus was condemned and executed by a tribunal of which Calvin was not a member, with which he possessed little influence, and which rejected his petition against the unnecessary cruelty of the penalty inflicted. Quote, there are people, remarks Paul Wernle, who is certainly under the influence of no glamour for Calvin or Calvinism, there are people who have been told at school that Servetus was burned through Calvin's fault and are therefore done with this man. They ought to remember that had they lived at the same time, they would in all probability have joined in burning him. It is not so easy to be done with the man, who was the most luminous and penetrating theologian of his time, and the source from which flowed that power which Protestantism showed in Scotland, France, England, Holland. We are all glad, no doubt, that we did not live under his rod, but who knows what we would all be, had not this divine ardor possessed him. Concentrated, well-directed enthusiasm, that is his essence. It was himself, first of all, whom he consumed in his zeal, his rule at Geneva was no more rigorous than the heroism was glorious with which he compacted half the Protestantism of Europe into a power which nothing could break. Calvin was, in very truth, the soul of the battling and conquering reformed world. It was he who fought on the battlefields of the Huguenots and the Dutch, and in the hosts of the Puritans. In scarcely another of the reformers is there to be seen such thoroughness, absoluteness. And yet what moderation, what real dread of every kind of excess... With what deference and tact did he know how to speak to the great? If you would know the man, how he lived with and for God and the world, read first of all in the Institutes the section on the life of the Christian man. It is the portrait of himself. And then, for his religious individuality, add the sections on justification and on predestination, where will be found what is most profound, most moving in his life of faith. End quote. Such a man was John Calvin, and such was the work he did for God and his kingdom on earth. Adolf Harnack has said that between Paul the Apostle and Luther the Reformer, Augustine was the greatest man God gave his church. We may surely add that from Luther the Reformer to our day, God has given his church no greater man than John Calvin. End of John Calvin, The Man and His Work by B.B. Warfield Review of Jean Gauvin by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean 
Calvin. Les hommes et les chances de son temps. Par et de Merck, professeur à la faculté de théologie de Montauban. Tome premier. La jeunesse de Calvin. Ouvrage orné de la reproduction de 157 estampes anciennes, autographes, etc., et de 113 dessins originaux par H. Armand de Lille, Lausanne, Georges Bridel, S.I., éditeur, 1899, quarto, Pages 9 to 634. Calvin has had to wait long for an adequate biography, but this first volume of the work projected by Monsieur Emile de Merge of Montauban gives us hope that he will have it ere the fourth century since his birth runs wholly out. We are not forgetful or unappreciative of those who have already labored in this field. How many they are, any good bibliography will exhibit. Say, for example, the select list given by Dr. Schaff at the head of his treatment of the Reformation in French Switzerland in the seventh volume of his History of the Christian Church. How good they are, everyone who has sought to know this greatest man, nay, as Renan was compelled to recognize this greatest Christian God has given the modern church, has had ample opportunity to appreciate. There has been left us little excuse for not knowing John Calvin. The description of the wealth of our means of information, with which M. and J. Baumgartner opens his admirable lectures on Gavon, Ébrisson et Interprète de l'Ancien Testament, is no more than just. A considerable number of really good biographies of Calvin already exist, biographies which seem to leave almost nothing to be desired. Henry's, 1835-44, Bungener's, 1862, E. Stehlen's, 1836, Kamschulters, 1869 to 99, Le France, 1888. These have been supplemented by the publication of his correspondence by Jules Bonnet, 1854, Herr Minajad, and the Strasbourg editors, by the great Strasbourg edition of his works with its illuminating prefaces, and by an incredible number of special essays and articles. Quote, Thanks to his biographies, remarks Monsieur Baumgartner, we have seen cleared up many an obscure point, many a detail of his life as youth, student, mature man. Thanks to his commentaries, we are better prepared than ever to appreciate the astonishing, multifarious, almost superhuman activity of this supernaturally courageous man, this vere theologus, this incomparable theologian, as Melanchthon fitly called him. His latest biographies enable us to penetrate deeply into his inner life and make it possible for us to witness his early studies, to see in action the factors which produced his first works, and the unrolling of the diverse phases through which his spiritual or intellectual development passed. End quote. He concludes, quote, We should not be wrong, therefore, to be satisfied with what we know. End quote. Yet he at once adds a nevertheless, and we must echo this nevertheless. It is possible to be sure to exaggerate this nevertheless. Dr. A. Pearson certainly exaggerates it when, in his preface to the first part of his Studien over Johannes Galvin, he represents mere studies about him, and not a complete biography of him as alone possible as yet, and speaks of the present duty of the historian as the renunciation of the legends set forth by Henry, Mère de Bigné, Stehlen, and not wholly eliminated from even the, in many ways, admirable work of Kampfschröter, and the careful and patient deduction of the truth from the authentic records, or at least the demonstration that the riddles of this life are incapable of resolution. As if no one had trodden this hard pathway of detailed investigation before himself, and as if such painstaking investigation could result only in revolutionary conceptions of the course of this life. Before Pearson and after Pearson, such studies have been vigorously prosecuted, and our knowledge of Calvin's life has been correspondingly enriched. The older biographies had already made use of the results of many of them. Much has, however, been acquired since, 
and thus an adequate biography has remained a desideratum up to this day and grown daily ever more a desideratum. It is one of the reasons we have for hoping that Monsieur du Mergue is about to give us this adequate biography, that he has neglected none of the studies over John Calvin that have hitherto been made. Everything seems to be in his control, and controlling all that has been hitherto brought to light, he has added investigations of his own, and better than that, he has brought to his task a clear intelligence and a trained literary habit, a detailed knowledge not only of the whole compass of the literature concerning Calvin, earlier and later, but of the times in which he lived, and the currents of thought in which he was formed, and amidst which he labored, and as well an accurate, as well as a calm faculty of judgment. Above all, he has brought apparently a keen and instinctive sympathy with the personality he is depicting. We do not know how fully this sympathy extends to the doctrinal and ethical teachings of Calvin. Subsequent volumes of the work will determine this but this first volume enables us to say that if Monsieur de Mergue is able to write a sympathetic an account of Calvin's labors in Geneva and of his theological teaching, as he has written of his youthful development and his preparation for his work, he will give us at length an adequate biography of Calvin. There will no doubt remain details which will require further investigation. There will no doubt be expressed historical judgments which will need correcting the really definitive treatise on no subject will ever be written. But if the promise of this first volume is fulfilled in the remaining four, we shall have a portrait of the greatest of the reformers which will adequately present his grand figure before the eyes of every sympathetic reader. It will doubtless have been already noted that the book has been planned on a scale which, so far as bulk is concerned, ought to be adequate. Here are nearly 650 quarto pages devoted to the youth of Calvin. For the depicting of his entire life, five such great volumes are to be subsidized. It is a veritable monument which Monsieur Dumerc is raising to the memory of the greatest of theologians, and everything has been done to make this monument, even in its externalities, worthy of the memory it is to enshrine. The publishers have spared no expense and no pains to turn out a perfect piece of work, the best of press work vie here with the best of editing to produce a volume that it is a pleasure to the eye to look upon and to the hand to handle. Archaeological knowledge and artistic skill have combined to illustrate it richly and illuminatingly. The illustrations alone almost suffice to carry us back into the 16th century and to place us among the scenes, in the midst of the companions, in the presence of the literary products, in contact with which Calvin's youth was passed. Already in this we see revealed one side of Monsieur du Merck's furnishing for the task he has undertaken. Monsieur du Merck is evidently an enthusiastic archaeologist. No archaeological detail escapes his keen sight or fails to set him throbbing with enthusiasm. Perhaps his antiquarian zeal is even a little excessive. Perhaps when he reaches, for example, his chapter on Protestant Paris in the 16th century, his ardour runs a little away with him, and he almost forgets his Calvin for a season in his engrossment with the old streets and old houses and their multifarious associations. All this, to be sure, is in accordance with his theory of how a biography should be written. He would fain present to us not a dead abstraction called Calvin, but a concrete living man in the midst of the rich life in which he was immersed. And certainly his archaeological enthusiasm has borne good fruit in adorning the volume and throwing a local atmosphere around the portrait that is painted. The life of the 16th century stares us in the face here on every page, and even he who runs cannot fail to read it off from the beautiful cuts that are lavished everywhere. And let no one imagine that because Monsieur du Merc is an archaeologist he is therefore dull, he appears incapable of writing a tiresome line, whatever may be his subject. Indeed, if the book errs in the matter of its style, it errs in precisely the opposite direction. It is the temperament of the dramatist, of the orator, of the journalist, rather than that of the antiquary, which is revealed to us in these sparkling, lively, ever-moving pages, full of literary art and Gallic vivacity. The touch is light with French gaiety, the disposition of the material lucid with French clarity, the story is told with the verve and liveliness of which only a French pen is capable. There is not a dull line from the beginning of the volume to the end of it, 
and he is a poor reader who, having begun it, will not be content to stay until he reads through to the last page. This volume treats, as we have said, of the youth of John Calvin, and it treats of it in the full light of all that has been brought to knowledge upon this obscurest period of his life. Of course, the investigations of Le Franc and the studies of Le Coultre and of Heminijad are largely used, but the whole mass of recent discussion also has been thoroughly winnowed, and a keen intelligence is brought to bear upon its criticism and utilization. The period covered by the volume extends from the birth of the Reformer in 1509 to the publication of the first edition of the Institutes in 1536. Along with his personal development, of which we get a picture even more vivid and even more winning than that offered by Le Franc himself, we have all the currents of thought of his time and all the influences that played upon him, humanism, Faber, Stapolensis, and the religious movement of which his teaching was the source, and all the reformatory impulses that were aroused in the France of the day, fully depicted for us. We are shown the noyon of his boyhood, the Paris of his youth, the Orleans and Bourges of his opening manhood, the France of his years of persecution, the Bay of his refuge, and all the streams of intellectual and religious life that were flowing through them. And then we are shown the young Calvin moving through them all, and thrown out into relief against them all, until we almost feel as if we had lived his life with him, and might well claim him as our boyhood's friend. And let us note the phrase which we have thus unpremeditatedly used to describe the impression, the picture of the youthful Calvin, as limned by Monsieur Dumerg makes on us. We feel, as we read this flowing but precise narrative which so vividly brings his figure before us, we say, as if we might well claim him as our own boyhood's friend. For it is distinctly a friendly, attractive, lovable youth who is here presented to us, one whom we look upon distinctly as a friend, whom to look upon is to love. We have been taught to think of another kind of Calvin, even in his youth, somber, sour, forbidding, inaccessible, almost a hater of the human race, as other Christians before him have been slanderously designated. We have been told that the iteration and severity of the denunciation he visited upon his young companions earned him everywhere their disgust, and won for him at their hands the unenviable nickname of the accusative case. It is only a part of the Romish legend, fully exploded by Le Franc, and now again by Dumergue. A serious-minded youth he was, of course, and one filled with a gracious piety, and schooled in a strict morality. He was certainly no Rabelais, rioting among his companions, but, as certainly, he was neither an anchorite nor an accuser of his associates. Born to a competency, reared in the company of the greatest and the cultured, living on terms of frank and free intercourse with the choicest spirits of his time, the young Calvin reveals himself to us as an open-minded, affectionate young man of irreproachable morals, decent habits and frank manners, somewhat sensitive perhaps, but easy to be entreated, and attracting not merely the admiration but also the lasting affection of all into contact with whom he came. He finds his biblical prototype not in Elijah or in John the Baptist, but distinctly in that other John who was at once a son of thunder and the apostle of love. This is how Monsieur de Merck sums up the chief results attained by his minute study of Calvin's life among his fellows during these years of preparation. Quote, Thus he journeys from place to place, from north to south, and from south to north, through France and through the churches, seeing, hearing, observing, noting, enriching his heart and his conscience not less than his understanding, with all that he encounters among men as well as in libraries. A prodigy of work, of rigorous self-denial, ascetism, and yet full of youthfulness, highly esteemed, always welcomed. All circles dispute for him, and on all he exercises that mysterious influence, that irresistible power of seduction and attraction, which is one of the most characteristic signs of the sovereignty of genius. All who know him love him, and those who love him cannot resist the wish, or let us say the necessity of seeing him again. They leave one after another. Noyon, his brother, his sister, his successor in the chaplaincy of the Gessin, his successor in the curacy of Pont-l'Evêque, and the king's lieutenant, Laurent of Normandy. 
Paris, his master, Maturin Cordier, his fellow pupils of the House of Montmont, his friends, the Copts, his friends, the Boudets, Orleans, the sons of his friend Daniel, Bourg, the Colladons, Angoulême, his host himself who cannot be separated from him, Portiers, Varon, the procureur, Babinon, the lecturer in the institute, Son Vertumion, a strange enough procession, but one which attests the fascination exercised upon hearts by one whom men have dared to reproach with not being able to feel or inspire affection. End quote, page 515. In a word, the legend of Calvin's hard and unlovable disposition on any real acquaintance with his life goes up in the same smoke with those other legends, the product with it of the malignant imagination of hate, which have pictured him as of low extraction and of criminal habits, branded for nameless vices at Noyon, convicted of theft at Orleans, and a victim of all sorts of evil passions. One of the chief preoccupations of Monsieur de Merck in studying the early years of Calvin is naturally the preparation it formed for his subsequent labours. The hand of providence is indeed so clearly revealed in the training of the future reformer that it has ever been the subject of admiring remark. Dr. McCree, for example, has written a very striking page or two on it in his posthumous work on The Early Years of John Calvin, pages 2, 22, 57, 72. The more careful study of his early years only increases the impression of the singular preparation which they formed for his subsequent career, and Monsieur de Merck does not permit this side of his task to escape him. The words we have just quoted from him, indeed, are a portion of an eloquent passage in which he sums up the elements of this preparation. It was certainly long, he remarks, but assuredly also most marvellous. Quote, Driven from Noyon by the plague, while still little more than a child, he falls in with the best teacher of Latin of the age, Maturin Cordier, who waits before leaving Paris to teach him. Then at Orleans he falls in with the best master of Greek of the age, Melchior Voima, who seems to have come from Germany, whither he is about to return, in order to inculcate his method upon him. Two incomparable masters who prove incomparable instructors. Not content with teaching him the languages, they speak to him also of the gospel of Christ. It was for him, it seems, that the Middle Ages had preserved its somber college of Montagu, so that before it disappeared it might initiate him into all the secrets of an irresistible dialectic, for him, too, it was that modern times had hastened to establish the College of France that he might attend its first lectures and later rank among the masters of humanism. And on the benches of these schools, while his cousin, Robert Olivetan, is pressing him to read the Bible, he almost had opportunity to elbow Loyola, who pronounced the vow of Montemart, and Rabelais, who wrote Gargantua, the Jesuitical spirit and the Gallic spirit, the two inspirations of the anti-Calvinistic opposition. And even this is not enough. Here is our young man encountering the most illustrious professors of law, Lestoy, who is still at Orleans, and Alquiat, who is just arriving at Bourges. They mould his mind to that kind of precise, exact, realistic thinking which permits him to be not merely the theologian but the legislator of the Reformation. Nevertheless, providence had not yet accomplished more than half its task. What is intellect without life? And these wonderful years of study are at the same time wonderful years of experience. The church takes care to reveal to him all its failings, all its most secret vices. It gives him personal experience of its weaknesses and its hardnesses. It endows him abusively with its benefices. It casts him unjustly into prison. It obliges him to rescue the dead body of his father from its anathemas. While yet a babe, he commences to visit the bizarre relics of Uscam. Later, he looks upon the episcopal disorders at Angoulême. He listens to the legends of Poitier. And just as he is leaving France, the Franciscans are still playing before his eyes the farce of Orleans, that he may sound the lowest depths of a superstition which ends in vulgar trickery. But by the side of the shadow destined to repel him shines the light destined to attract him. If Calvin was the pupil of Beda, chief of the Sorbonic band, he is also the protégé of the friends of Lefebvre des Tables, the Copts and the Boudes, 
and he passes through all the stages of the Fabrician movement. He allies himself intimately with Gerard Rousset, and the venerable Lefebvre prolongs his life to more than a century that he may be able to give him his blessings at Narac. Similarly, before enduring his martyrdom, Estienne de la Forge receives him into his house and permits him to learn the piety and heroism of the nascent church, while Quintin, chief of the Libertines and Servetus, chief of anti-Trinitarians, present themselves in Paris to horrify the young doctor with their dangerous heresies. End quote. Then follows the description of the enchanting personality which the young man bore through all these experiences, which we have already quoted. This was the youthful David, intellectually and morally fair of eyes and goodly to look upon, whom God had chosen to overthrow those new Goliaths, the king, the pope, the emperor, and to conduct Protestant Christianity to its destined victory. And this was the way God chose to prepare him for this great work. We have quoted Monsieur de Merck as saying that the young Calvin, quote, passed through all the phases of the Fabrician movement, end quote, and the remark bids us pause to call brief attention to the most interesting controverted question which is treated in the whole volume. This concerns, of course, the conversion of Calvin. It has become customary to date the conversion of Calvin in 1532 or later. Monsieur de Merg enters the lists with great spirit for an earlier date and would carry it back, say, to 1528. We cannot go here into the reasons pro and con. It may well be that too much stress is laid by Monsieur de Merg on the necessity of a development of Calvin's religious life through stages, if not slow, at least not unprepared. Calvin himself speaks of his conversion as sudden. It may well be that a little of that Gallic spirit, which is such an ornament to Frenchmen, attaches itself to his argumentation, and that he is a shade overzealous for the purely French origination of French Protestantism. But certainly he marshals the facts and inferences with amazing skill, and the result of his construction is to leave an impression on the mind of the reader, which is very strong that Calvin was no stranger to the new doctrines through his years of study at Orleans and Bourges, and that, if we are still to speak of a conversion as late as 1532, it must be in the purely spiritual sense. Long before this he assuredly had known and yielded intellectual assent to the central elements of the new teaching. We know it is a very inadequate introduction to our readers that we are giving Monsieur de Merck's notable book. Our consolation is that we shall have subsequent occasion on the appearance of the remaining volumes to call attention to it anew. The first volume exhibits it as a piece of solid historical work, fortified by ample citations of the sources and presented in a charmingly direct and readable narrative style. No one can pretend hereafter to know John Calvin, who does not take account of Monsieur de Merck's full, rich and thoughtful study of his life and work. We look forward with the greatest eagerness to the appearance of the subsequent volumes, and we can wish nothing better for them than that they may prove as thorough and illuminating for their own periods as this first one is for the years of Calvin's youth. End of review of Jean Calvin by B.B. Warfield Calvinism by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Meaning and use of the term. Calvinism is an ambiguous term in so far as it is currently employed in two or three senses, closely related indeed and passing insensibly into one another, but of varying latitudes of connotation. Sometimes it designates merely the individual teaching of John Calvin. Sometimes it designates more broadly the doctrinal system confessed by that body of Protestant churches known historically, in distinction from the Lutheran churches, as the Reformed churches but also quite commonly called the Calvinistic churches because the greatest scientific exposition of their faith in the Reformation age, and perhaps the most influential of any age, was given by John Calvin. Sometimes it designates more broadly still the entire body of conceptions, theological, ethical, philosophical, social, political, 
which, under the influence of the mastermind of John Calvin, raised itself to dominance in the Protestant lands of the post-Reformation age and has left a permanent mark not only upon the thought of mankind but upon the life history of men, the social order of civilized peoples, and even the political organization of states. In the present article, the term will be taken, for obvious reasons, in the second of these senses. Fortunately, this is also its central sense, and there is little danger that its other connotations will fall out of the mind while attention is concentrated upon this. On the one hand, John Calvin, though always looked upon by the Reformed churches as an exponent rather than as the creator of their doctrinal system, has nevertheless been both reverenced as one of their founders and deferred to as that particular one of their founders to whose formative hand and systematizing talent their doctrinal system has perhaps owed most. In any exposition of the Reformed theology, therefore, the teaching of John Calvin must always take a higher and indeed determinative place. On the other hand, although Calvinism has dug a channel through which not merely flows a stream of theological thought, but also surges a great wave of human life, filling the heart with fresh ideals and conceptions which have revolutionized the conditions of existence. Yet its fountainhead lies in its theological system, or rather, to be perfectly exact, one step behind even that in its religious consciousness. For the roots of Calvinism are planted in a specific religious attitude, out of which is unfolded first a particular theology, from which springs, on the one hand, a special church organization, and, on the other, a social order involving a given political arrangement. The whole outworking of Calvinism in life is thus but the efflorescence of its fundamental religious consciousness, which finds its scientific statement in the theological system. Fundamental Principle The exact formulation of the fundamental principle of Calvinism has indeed taxed the acumen of a long series of thinkers for the last hundred years, for example, Ullmann, Semisch, Hagenbach, Ebrard, Herzog, Schweitzer, Bauer, Schneckenburger, Guder, Schenke, Schöberlein, Stahl, Hundeshagen. For a discussion of the several views, compare H. Feucht, Fundamentaldogmatik, Guter, 1874, pages 397 to 480, W. Hasty, The Theology of the Reformed Church in its Fundamental Principles, Edinburgh, 1904, pages 129 to 177. Perhaps the simplest statement of it is the best, that it lies in a profound apprehension of God in His Majesty, with the inevitably accompanying poignant realization of the exact nature of the relation sustained to Him by the creature as such, and particularly by the sinful creature. He who believes in God without reserve, and is determined that God shall be God to him in all his thinking, feeling, willing, in the entire compass of his life activities, intellectual, moral, spiritual, throughout all his individual, social, religious relations, is, by the force of that strictest of all logic which presides over the outworking of principles into thought and life, by the very necessity of the case, a Calvinist. In Calvinism, then, objectively speaking, theism comes to its rights. Subjectively speaking, the religious relation attains its purity. Soteriologically speaking, evangelical religion finds at length its full expression and its secure stability. Theism comes to its rights only in a teleological conception of the universe, which perceives in the entire course of events the orderly outworking of the plan of God, who is the author, preserver, and governor of all things whose will is consequently the ultimate cause of all. The religious relation attains its purity only when an attitude of absolute dependence on God is not merely temporarily assumed in the act, say, of prayer, but is sustained through all the activities of life, intellectual, emotional, executive. And evangelical religion reaches stability only when the sinful soul rests in humble, self-emptying trust purely on the God of grace as the immediate and sole source of all the efficiency which enters into its salvation. And these are the formative principles of Calvinism. Relation to Other Systems The difference between Calvinism and other forms of theistic thought, religious experience, evangelical theology, is a difference not of kind but of degree. Calvinism is not a specific variety of theism, 
religion, evangelicalism, set over against other specific varieties, which along with it constitute these several genres, and which possess equal rights of existence with it and make similar claims to perfection, each after its own kind. It differs from them not as one species differs from other species, but as a perfectly developed representative differs from an imperfectly developed representative of the same species. There are not many kinds of theism, religion, evangelicalism, among which men are at liberty to choose to suit at will their individual taste or to meet their special need, all of which may be presumed to serve each its own specific uses equally worthily. There is but one kind of theism, religion, evangelicalism, and the same constructions laying claim to these names differ from each other, not as correlative species of a broader class, but as more or less perfect or more or less defective exemplifications of a single species. Calvinism conceives of itself as simply the more pure theism, religion, evangelicalism, superseding as such the less pure. It has no difficulty, therefore, in recognizing the theistic character of all truly theistic thought, the religious note in all actual religious activity, the evangelical quality of all really evangelical faith. It refuses to be set antagonistically over against any of these things, wherever or in whatever degree of imperfection they may be manifested. It claims them in every instance of their emergence as its own, and essays only to point out the way in which they may be given their just place in thought and life. Whoever believes in God, whoever recognizes in the recesses of his soul his utter dependence on God, whoever in all his thought of salvation hears in his heart of hearts the echo of the soli deo gloria of the evangelical profession, by whatever name he may call himself, or by whatever intellectual puzzles his logical understanding may be confused, Calvinism recognizes as implicitly a Calvinist, and as only requiring to permit these fundamental principles which underlie and give its body to all true religion, to work themselves freely and fully out in thought and feeling and action, to become explicitly a Calvinist. Calvinism and Lutheranism It is unfortunate that a great body of the scientific discussion which, since Max Goebel, die religiöse Eigentümlichkeit der lutherischen und reformierten Kirchen, Bonn, 1837, first clearly posited the problem, has been carried on somewhat vigorously with a view to determining the fundamental principle of Calvinism, has sought particularly to bring out its contrast with some other theological tendency, commonly with the sister Protestant tendency of Lutheranism. Undoubtedly, somewhat different spirits inform Calvinism and Lutheranism, and undoubtedly the distinguishing spirit of Calvinism is rooted not in some extraneous circumstance of its antecedents or origin, as, for example, Zwingli's tendency to intellectualism, or the superior humanistic culture and predilections of Zwingli and Calvin, or the democratic instincts of the Swiss, or the radical rationalism of the reformed leaders as distinguished from the merely modified traditionalism of the Lutherans, but in its formative principle. But it is misleading to find the formative principle of either type of Protestantism in its difference from the other, they have infinitely more in common than in distinction, and certainly nothing could be more misleading than to represent them, as is often done, as owing their differences to their more pure embodiment respectively of the principle of predestination and that of justification by faith. The doctrine of predestination is not the formative principle of Calvinism, the root from which it springs, it is one of its logical consequences, one of the branches which it has inevitably thrown out. It has been firmly embraced and consistently proclaimed by Calvinists because it is an implicate of theism, is directly given in the religious consciousness, and is an absolutely essential element of evangelical religion, without which its central truth of complete dependence upon the free mercy of a saving God cannot be maintained. And so little is it a peculiarity of the Reformed theology that it underlay and gave its form and power to the whole Reformation movement, which was as from the spiritual point of view a great revival of religion, so from the doctrinal point of view a great revival of Augustinianism. There was accordingly no difference among the reformers on this point. 
Luther and Melanchthon and the compromising Bucer were no less jealous for absolute predestination than Zwingli and Calvin. Even Zwingli could not surpass Luther in sharp and unqualified assertion of it, and it was not Calvin but Melanchthon who gave it a formal place in his primary scientific statements of the elements of the Protestant faith. Just as little can the doctrine of justification by faith be represented as specifically Lutheran. Not merely has it from the beginning been a substantial element in the Reformed faith, but it is only among the Reformed that it has retained or can retain its purity, free from the tendency to become a doctrine of justification on account of faith. Compare E. Böll von der Rechtfertigung durch den Glauben, Amsterdam, 1890. Here, too, the difference between the two types of Protestantism is one of degree, not of kind. Compare C.P. Krauth, The Conservative Reformation, Philadelphia, 1872. Lutheranism, the product of a poignant sense of sin born from the throes of a guilt-burdened soul, which cannot be stilled until it finds peace in God's decree of justification, is apt to rest in this peace, while Calvinism, the product of an overwhelming vision of God, born from the reflection in the heart of man, of the majesty of a God who will not give his glory to another, cannot pause until it places the scheme of salvation itself in relation to a complete worldview, in which it becomes subsidiary to the glory of the Lord God Almighty. Calvinism asks with Lutheranism, indeed, that most poignant of all questions, what shall I do to be saved, and answers it as Lutheranism answers it. But the great question which presses upon it is, how shall God be glorified? It is the contemplation of God and zeal for his honor, which in it draws out the emotions and absorbs endeavor, and the end of humans, as of all other existence, of salvation, as of all other attainments, is to it the glory of the Lord of all. Full justice is done in it to the scheme of redemption and the experience of salvation because full justice is done in it to religion itself, which underlies these elements of it. It begins, it centers, it ends with the vision of God in his glory, and it sets itself before all things to render to God his rights in every sphere of life activity. Soteriology of Calvinism one of the consequences flowing from this fundamental attitude of Calvinistic feeling and thought is the high supernaturalism which informs alike its religious consciousness and its doctrinal construction. Calvinism would not be badly defined indeed as the tendency which is determined to do justice to the immediately supernatural, as in the first, so also in the second creation. The strength and purity of its belief in the supernatural fact, which is God, saves it from all embarrassment in the face of the supernatural act, which is miracle. In everything which enters into the process of redemption, it is impelled by the force of its first principle to place the initiative in God. A supernatural revelation in which God makes known to man his will and purposes of grace, a supernatural record of this revelation in a supernaturally given book, in which God gives his revelation permanency and extension, such things are to the Calvinist almost matters of course. And, above all, he can but insist with the utmost strenuousness on the immediate supernaturalness of the actual work of redemption itself, and that no less in its application than in its impetration. Thus it comes about that the doctrine of monogistic regeneration, or, as it was phrased by the older theologians of irresistible grace or effectual calling, is the hinge of the Calvinistic soteriology, and lies much more deeply embedded in the system than the doctrine of predestination itself, which is popularly looked upon as its hallmark. Indeed, the soteriological significance of predestination to the Calvinist consists in the safeguard it affords to monogistic regeneration, to purely supernatural salvation. What lies at the heart of his soteriology is the absolute exclusion of the creaturely element in the initiation of the saving process, that so the pure grace of God may be magnified. Only so could he express his sense of men's complete dependence as sinners on the free mercy of a saving God, or extrude the evil leaven of synergism, by which, as he clearly sees God is robbed of his glory, and man is encouraged to think that he owes to some power, some act of choice, some initiative of his own, his participation in that salvation which is in reality all of grace. 
There is accordingly nothing against which Calvinism sets its face with more firmness than every form and degree of autosoterism. Above everything else, it is determined that God, in his Son Jesus Christ, acting through the Holy Spirit whom he has sent, shall be recognized as our veritable Savior. To it, sinful man stands in need not of inducements or assistance to save himself, but of actual saving, and Jesus Christ has come not to advise or urge or induce or aid him to save himself, but to save him. This is the root of Calvinistic soteriology, and it is because this deep sense of human helplessness and this profound consciousness of indebtedness for all that enters into salvation to the free grace of God is the root of its soteriology that, to it, the doctrine of election becomes the cor cordis of the gospel. He who knows that it is God who has chosen him and not he who has chosen God, and that he owes his entire salvation in all its processes and in every one of its stages to this choice of God, would be an ingrate indeed if he gave not the glory of his salvation solely to the inexplicable elective love of God. Consistent Development of Calvinism Historically, the Reformed theology finds its origin in the reforming movement begun in Switzerland under the leadership of Zwingli, 1516. Its fundamental principles are already present in Zwingli's teaching, though it was not until Calvin's profound and penetrating genius was called to their exposition that they took their ultimate form or received systematic development. From Switzerland, Calvinism spread outward to France and along the Rhine through Germany to Holland, eastward to Bohemia and Hungary and westward across the Channel to Great Britain. In this broad expansion through so many lands, its voice was raised in a multitude of confessions, and in the course of the 400 years which have elapsed since its first formulation, it has been expounded in a vast body of dogmatic treatises. Its development has naturally been much richer and far more many-sided than that of the sister system of Lutheranism in its more confined and homogeneous environment, and yet it has retained its distinctive character and preserved its fundamental features with marvellous consistency throughout its entire history. It may be possible to distinguish among the Reformed confessions between those which bear more and those which bear less strongly the stamp of Calvin's personal influence and they part into two broad classes according as they were composed before or after the Arminian defection. Circa 1618 demanded sharper definitions on the points of controversy raised by that movement. A few of them written on German soil also bear traces of the influence of Lutheran conceptions. And of course no more among the Reformed than elsewhere have all the professed expounders of the system of doctrine been true to the faith they professed to expound. Nevertheless, it is precisely the same system of truth which is embodied in all the great historic Reformed confessions. It matters not whether the document emanates from Zurich or Bern or Basel or Geneva, whether it sums up the Swiss development as in the Second Helvetic Confession or publishes the faith of the National Reformed Churches of France or Scotland or Holland or the Palatinate or Hungary, Poland, Bohemia or England or republishes the established Reformed doctrine in opposition to new contradictions as in the Canons of Dort in which the entire Reformed world concurred or the Westminster Confession to which the whole of Puritan Britain gave its assent or the Swiss form of consent which represents the mature judgment of Switzerland upon the recently proposed novelties of doctrine. And despite the inevitable variety of individual points of view, as well as the unavoidable differences in ability, learning, grasp in the multitude of writers who have sought to expound the Reformed faith through these four centuries, and the grave departures from the faith made here and there among them, the great streams of Reformed dogmatics has flowed essentially unsullied, straight from its origin in Zwingli and Calvin, to its debauchure, say, in Chalmers and Cunningham and Crawford, in Hodge and Thornwell and Shedd. Varieties of Calvinism It is true an attempt has been made to distinguish two types of Reformed teaching from the beginning, a more radical type developed under the influence of the peculiar teachings of Calvin, and a so-called more moderate type, chiefly propagating itself in Germany, which exhibits rather the influence, as was at first said, Hofstede de Grüt, Ebrard Hepper of Melanchthon, or in its more recent statement, Gussen of Bullinger. In all that concerns the essence of Calvinism, however, there was no difference between Bullinger and Calvin, German and Swiss. The Heidelberg Catechism is no doubt a catechism and not a confession, 
but in its presuppositions and inculcations it is as purely Calvinistic as the Genevan Catechism or the Catechisms of the Westminster Assembly. Nor was the substance of doctrine touched by the peculiarities of method which marked such schools as the so-called scholastics, showing themselves already in Zanchius, died 1590, and culminating in theologians like Alsted, died 1638, and Voetius, died 1676, or by the special modes of statement which were developed by such schools as the so-called Federalists. For example, Cocius, died 1669, Bormann, died 1679, Witsius, died 1708. The first serious defection from the fundamental conceptions of the Reformed system came with the rise of Arminianism in the early years of the 17th century. Arminius, Udenborgard, Episcopius, Limbor, Corsaleus, and the Arminian party was quickly sloughed off under the condemnation of the whole Reformed world. The five points of its remonstrance against the Calvinistic system were met by the reassertion of the fundamental doctrines of absolute predestination, particular redemption, total depravity, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints, canons of the Synod of Dort. The first important modification of the Calvinistic system, which has retained a position within its limits, was made in the middle of the 17th century by the professors of the French school at Saumur, and is hence called Salmorianism, otherwise Amaraldism, or hypothetical universalism. Cameron died 1625, Amaraut died 1664, Placaeus died 1655, Testardus died circa 1650. This modification also received the condemnation of the contemporary Reformed world, which reasserted, with emphasis, the importance of the doctrine that Christ actually saves by his Spirit, all for whom he offers the sacrifice of his blood. For example, Westminster Confession, Swiss form of consent. Supralapsarianism and Infralapsarianism If varieties of Calvinism are to be spoken of, with reference to anything more than details, of importance in themselves no doubt, but of little significance for the systematic development of the type of doctrine, there seem not more than three which require mention, supralapsarianism, infralapsarianism, and what may perhaps be called in this reference post-redemptionism, all of which, as indeed their very names import, take their start from a fundamental agreement in the principles which govern the system. The difference between these various tendencies of thought within the limits of the system turns on the place given by each to the decree of election in the logical ordering of the decrees of God. The supralapsarians suppose that election underlies the decree of the fall itself and conceive the decree of the fall as a means for carrying out the decree of election. The infralapsarians, on the other hand, consider that election presupposes the decree of the fall and hold, therefore, that in electing some to life, God has mankind as a massa perditionis in mind. The extent of the difference between these parties is often, indeed, usually grossly exaggerated, and even historians of repute are found representing infralapsarianism as involving, or at least permitting, denial that the fall has a place in the decree of God at all, as if election could be post-posited in the ordo decretorum to the decree of the fall, while it was doubted whether there were any decree of the fall, or as if indeed God could be held to conceive men in his electing decree as fallen, without by that very act fixing the presupposed fall in his eternal decree. In point of fact, there is and can be no difference among Calvinists as to the inclusion of the fall in the decree of God. To doubt this inclusion is to place oneself at once at variance with the fundamental Calvinistic principle, which conceives all that comes to pass teleologically and ascribes everything that actually occurs ultimately to the will of God. Post-Redemptionism Accordingly, even the post-Redemptionists, that is to say the Salmurians or Amaraldians, find no difficulty at this point. Their peculiarity consists in insisting that election succeeds in the order of thought, not merely the decree of the fall, but that of redemption as well, taking the term redemption here in the narrower sense of the impetration of redemption by Christ. They thus suppose that in his electing decree God conceived man not merely as fallen, but as already redeemed. 
This involves a modified doctrine of the atonement from which the party has received the name of hypothetical universalism, holding, as it does, that Christ died to make satisfaction for the sins of all men without exception, if, if that is, they believe. But that foreseeing that none would believe, God elected some to be granted faith through the effectual operation of the Holy Spirit. The indifferent standing of the post-redemptionists in historical Calvinism is indicated by the treatment accorded it in the historical confessions. It alone of the varieties of Calvinism here mentioned has been made the object of formal confessional condemnation, and it received condemnation in every important reformed confession written after its development. There are, it is true, no supralapsarian confessions. Many, however, leave the questions which divide supralapsarian and infralapsarian wholly to one side and thus avoid pronouncing for either and none is polemically directed against supralapsarianism. On the other hand, not only does no confession close the door to infralapsarianism, but a considerable number explicitly teach infralapsarianism, which thus emerges as the typical form of Calvinism. That, despite its confessional condemnation, post-redemptionism has remained a recognized form of Calvinism and has worked out a history for itself in the Calvinistic churches, especially in America, may be taken as evidence that its advocates, while departing in some important particulars from typical Calvinism, have nevertheless remained, in the main, true to the fundamental postulates of the system. There is another variety of post-redemptionism, however, of which this can scarcely be said. This variety, which became dominant among the New England Congregationalist churches about the second third of the 19th century, for example N. W. Taylor, died 1858, C. G. Finney, died 1875, E. A. Park, died 1900, attempted, much after the manner of the Congruists of the Church of Rome, to unite a Pelagian doctrine of the will with the Calvinistic doctrine of absolute predestination. The result was, of course, to destroy the Calvinistic doctrine of irresistible grace, and as the Calvinistic doctrine of the satisfaction of Christ was also set aside in favor of the Grotian, or governmental theory of the atonement, Little was left of Calvinism except the bare doctrine of predestination. Perhaps it is not strange, therefore, that this improved Calvinism has crumbled away and given place to newer and explicitly anti-Calvinistic constructions of doctrine. Present fortunes of Calvinism It must be confessed that the fortunes of Calvinism in general are not at present at their flood. In America, to be sure, the controversies of the earlier half of the 19th century compacted a body of Calvinistic thought which gives way but slowly, and the influence of the great theologians who adorned the churches during that period is still felt, especially Charles Hodge, 1797-1878, to Robert J. Breckenridge, 1800-1871, to James H. Thornwell, 1812-1862, to Henry B. Smith, 1815 to 1877, W. G. T. Shedd, 1820 to 1894, Robert L. Dabney, 1820 to 1898, Archibald Alexander Hodge, 1823 to 1886. And in Holland, recent years have seen a notable revival of the Reformed consciousness, especially among the adherents of the Free Churches, which has been felt as widely as Dutch influence extends, and which is at present represented in Abraham Kuyper and Hermann Bavink, by a theologian of genius and a theologian of erudition worthy of the best reformed traditions. But it is probable that few Calvinists without reserve exist at the moment in French-speaking lands, and those who exist in lands of German speech and Eastern Europe appear to owe their inspiration directly to the teaching of Kohlbrugger. Even in Scotland there has been a remarkable decline in strictness of construction ever since the days of William Cunningham and Thomas J. Crawford. Nevertheless, it may be contended that the future, as the past, of Christianity itself is bound up with the fortunes of Calvinism. The system of doctrine founded on the idea of God, which has been explicated by Calvinism, strikingly remarks W. Hasty, Quote, is the only system in which the whole order of the world is brought into a rational unity with the doctrine of grace. It is only with such a universal conception of God, established in a living way, that we can face, with hope of complete conquest, all the spiritual dangers and terrors of our time. But it is deep enough, and large enough, and divine enough, 
rightly understood, to confront them and do battle with them all in vindication of the Creator, Preserver and Governor of the world, and of the justice and love of the Divine Personality. End of Calvinism by B. B. Warfield The Theology of the Reformation by B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Charles Beard begins his Hibbert lectures on the Reformation with these words. To look upon the Reformation of the 16th century as only the substitution of one set of theological doctrines for another, or the cleansing of the Church from notorious abuses and corruptions, or even a return of Christianity to something like primitive purity and simplicity, is to take an inadequate view of its nature and importance. He wishes us to make note of the far-reaching changes in human life which have been wrought by what we call the Reformation, to observe the numerous departments of activity which have been at least affected by it, and then to seek its cause in something as wide in its extension as its effects. He himself discovers this cause in the general awakening of the human intellect, which had begun in the 14th century and was being urged on with accelerating rapidity in the 15th. In his view, the Reformation was merely the religious side of what we speak of as the Renaissance. Quote, it was the life of the Renaissance, he affirms, infused into religion under the influence of the grave and earnest Teutonic race. End quote. He even feels justified in saying that, in the view he takes of it, the Reformation quote, was not primarily a theological, a religious, an ecclesiastical movement at all. End quote. That there is some exaggeration in this representation is obvious. That this exaggeration is due to defective analysis is as clear, and the suspicion lies very near that the defect in analysis has its root in an imperfect sense of values. To point us to the general awakening of the human intellect, which was in progress in the 15th century, is not to uncover a cause, it is only to describe a condition. To remind us that, as a result of this awakening of the human intellect, a lively sense had long existed of the need of a reformation, and repeated attempts had been vainly made to effect it, that men everywhere were fully alive to the corruption of manners and morals in which the world was groveling, and were equally helpless to correct it, is not to encourage us to find the cause of the reformation in a general situation out of which no reformation had through all these years come. The question which presses is... Whence came the power which achieved the effect, an effect apparently far beyond the power of the forces working on the surface of things to achieve? There is no use in seeking to cover up the facts under depreciatory forms of statement. It is easy to talk contemptuously of the, quote, substitution of one set of theological doctrines for another, end quote, as it would be easy to talk contemptuously of the substitution of one set of political or of sanitary doctrines for another. The force of the perverse suggestion lies in keeping the matter in the abstract. The proof of the pudding in such things lies in the eating. No doubt it is possible to talk indifferently of merely working the permutations of a dial lock, regardless of the not unimportant circumstance that one of these permutations differs from the rest in this, that it shoots the bolts. The substitution of one set of theological doctrines for another, which took place at the Reformation, was the substitution of a set of doctrines which had the promise and potency of life in them for a set of doctrines, the issue of which had been death. What happened at the Reformation, by means of which the forces of life were set at work through the seething, struggling mass, was the revival of vital Christianity, and this is the vera causa of all that has come out of that great revolution in all departments of life. Men, no doubt, had been longing and seeking after, quote, a return of Christianity to something like primitive purity and simplicity, end quote. This was the way that an Erasmus, for example, pictured to himself the needs of his time. The difficulty was that, rather repelled by the Christianity they knew than attracted by Christianity in its primitive purity, of the true nature of which they really had no idea, they were simply feeling out in the dark. What Luther did was rediscover vital Christianity and to give it afresh to the world. 
To do this was to put the spark to the train. We are feeling the explosion yet. The Reformation was then, we insist upon it, precisely the substitution of one set of theological doctrines for another. That is what it was to Luther, and that is what, through Luther, it has been to the Christian world. Exactly what Luther did was for himself, for the quieting of his aroused conscience and the healing of his deepened sense of sin, to rediscover the great fact, the greatest of all the great facts of which sinful men can ever become aware, that salvation is by the pure grace of God alone. Oh, but, you will say, that resulted from Luther's religious experience. No, we answer, it was primarily a doctrinal discovery of Luther's, the discovery of a doctrine apart from which and prior to the discovery of which Luther did not have and could never have had his religious experience. He had been taught another doctrine, a doctrine which had been embodied in a popular maxim current in his day, do the best you can and God will see you through. He had tried to live that doctrine and could not do it. He could not believe it. He has told us of his despair. He has told us how this despair grew deeper and deeper until he was raised out of it precisely by his discovery of his new doctrine, that it is God and God alone who, in his infinite grace, saves us, that he does it all, and that we supply nothing but the sinners to be saved and the subsequent praises which our grateful hearts lift to him, our sole and only saviour. This is a radically different doctrine from that, and it produced radically different effects on Luther. Luther the monk and Luther the reformer are two different men, and it has produced radically different effects in the world. The medieval world and the modern world are two different worlds. The thing that divides them is the new doctrine that Luther found in the monastery at Wittenberg, or was it already at Erfurt, poring over the great declaration in the first chapter of the epistle to the Romans, the righteous shall live by faith. Emile de Merck puts the whole story into a sentence, quote, two radically different religions give birth to two radically different civilizations, end quote. Luther himself knew perfectly well that what he had done for himself and what he would fain do for the world was just to substitute a new doctrine for that old one in which neither he nor the world could find life. So he came forward as a teacher, as a dogmatic teacher, as a dogmatic teacher who gloried in his dogmatism. He was not merely seeking for truth, he had the truth. He did not make tentative suggestions to the world for its consideration. What he dealt in was, so he liked to call them, assertions. This was naturally a mode of procedure very offensive to a man of polite letters like Erasmus, say, who knew of nothing that men of culture could not sit around a well-furnished table and discuss together pleasurably with open minds. Quote, I have so little stomach for assertions, he says, striking directly at Luther, that I could easily go over to the opinion of the sceptics, whenever, he smugly adds, it were allowed me by the inviolable authority of the sacred scriptures and the decrees of the church, to which I everywhere submit, whether I follow what is presented or not. End quote. For this, his Oliver, he certainly got more than a Roland from Luther. For Luther takes occasion from this remark to read Erasmus a much needed lecture on the place of dogma in Christianity. To say you have no pleasure in assertions, he says, is all one with saying you are not a Christian. Take away assertions and you take away Christianity. No Christian could endure to have assertions despised, since that would be nothing else than to deny at once all religion and piety, or to declare that religion and piety and every dogma are nothing. Christian doctrines are not to be put on a level with human opinions. They are divinely given to us in Holy Scripture to form the moulds in which Christian lives are to run. We are in the presence here of what is known as the formal principle of the Reformation. The fundamental meaning of it is that the Reformation was primarily, like all great revolutions, a revolution in the realm of ideas. Was it not a wise man who urged us long ago to give a special diligence to keeping our hearts, the heart is the cognitive faculty in Scripture, on the express ground that out of them are the issues of life? The battle of the Reformation was fought out under a banner on which the sole authority of Scripture was inscribed. But the principle of the sole authority of Scripture was not to the Reformation an abstract principle. 
What it was interested in was what is taught in Scripture, and the sole authority of Scripture meant to it the sole authority of what is taught in Scripture. This, of course, is dogma, and the dogma which the men of the Reformation found taught in Scripture above every other dogma, so much above every other dogma that in it is summed up all the teaching of Scripture, is the sole efficiency of God in salvation. This is what we call the material principle of the Reformation. It was not at first known by the name of justification by faith alone, but it was from the first passionately embraced as renunciation of all human works and dependence on the grace of God alone for salvation. In it, the Reformation lived and moved and had its being. In a high sense of the words, it is the Reformation. The conclusion would be ludicrous, if it were not rather pathetic, by which the correction of abuses in the life, whether of the church or of society at large, is confounded with the Reformation. Luther knew perfectly well from the beginning where the centre of his Reformation lay, and did not for a moment confound its peripheral effects with it. Here, indeed, lay the precise difference between him and the other reformers of the time, those other reformers who could not reform. Erasmus, for example, was as clear of eye as Luther, to see, and as outspoken as Luther, to condemn the crying abuses of the day. But he conceived the task of reform as a purely negative one. The note of his reform was simplicity. He wished to return to the, quote, simplicity of the Christian life, end quote, and, as a means to that, to the, quote, simplicity of doctrine, end quote. He was content with a process of stripping off, and he expected to reach the kernel of true Christianity merely by thoroughly removing the husk which at the moment covered and concealed it, the assumption being that true Christianity lay behind and beneath the corruptions of the day. No restoration was needed, only uncovering. When he came to do the stripping, it is true, Erasmus found no stopping place. He stripped not only to the bone, but through the bone, and nothing was left in his hand but a philosophy of Christ, which was a mere moralism. Peter Canisius, looking at it formally, calls it not inaptly, quote, the theology of Pyrrhus. Luther, judging it from the material standpoint, says Erasmus has made a, quote, gospel of Pelagius, end quote. Thus, at all events, Erasmus at once demonstrated that beneath the immense fabric of medieval Christianity there lay, as its sustaining core, nothing but a bald moralism, and by dragging this moralism out and labelling it simple Christianity, has made himself the father of that great multitude in our day who, crying back to Christ, have reduced Christianity to the simple precept, Be good, and it will be well with you. In sharp contrast with these negative reformers, Luther came forward with a positive gospel in his hands, a new religion his adversaries called it then, as their descendants call it now, and they call it so truly. He was not particularly interested in the correction of abuses, though he hewed at them manfully when they stood in his way. To speak the whole truth, this necessary work bored him a little. He saw no pure gospel beneath them which their removal would uncover and release. He knew that his new gospel, once launched, had power of itself to abolish them. What his heart was aflame with was the desire to launch this new gospel, to substitute it, the gospel of grace, for the gospel of works, on which alone men were being fed. In that substitution consisted his whole reformation. In his detailed answer to the Bull of Excommunication published against him in 1520, in which 41 propositions from his writings were condemned, Luther shows plainly enough where the centre of controversy lay for him. It was in the article in which he asserts the sole efficiency of grace in salvation. He makes his real appeal to scripture, of course, but he does not neglect to point out also that he has Augustine with him, and also experience. He scoffs at his opponent's pretensions to separate themselves from the Pelagians by wire-drawn distinctions between works of congruity and works of condignity. If we may secure grace by works, he says, it means nothing that we carefully name these works works of congruity and refrain from calling them works of condignity. Quote, For what is the difference, he cries, if you deny that grace is from our works and yet teach that it is through our works? The impious sense remains that grace is held to be given not gratis but on account of our works. For the Pelagians did not teach and do any other works on account of which they expected grace to be given than you teach and do. They are 
the works of the same free will and the same members, although you and they give them different names. They are the same fasting and prayers and almsgiving, but you call them works congruous to grace, they works condign to grace. The same Pelagians remain victors in both cases. End quote. What Luther is zealous for, it will be seen, is the absolute exclusion of works from salvation and the casting of the soul wholly upon the grace of God. He rises to full eloquence as he approaches the end of his argument, pushing his adversaries fairly to the ropes. Quote, For when they could not deny that we must be saved by the grace of God, he exclaims, and could not elude this truth, then impiety sought out another way of escape, pretending that, although we cannot save ourselves, we can nevertheless prepare for being saved by God's grace. What glory remains to God, I ask, if we are able to procure that we may be saved by his grace? Does this seem a small ability, that he who has no grace shall nevertheless have power enough to obtain grace when he wishes? What is the difference between that and saying with the Pelagians that we are saved without grace, since you place the grace of God within the power of man's will? You seem to me to be worse than Pelagius, since you put in the power of man the necessary grace of God, the necessity of which he simply denied. I say it seems less impious wholly to deny grace than to represent it as secured by our zeal and effort, and to put it thus in our power. End quote. This tremendous onslaught prepares the way for a notable declaration in which Luther makes perfectly clear how he thought of his work as a reformer and the relative importance which he attached to the several matters in controversy. Rome taught, with whatever finessing, salvation by works. He knew and would know nothing but salvation by grace, or, as he phrases it here, nothing but Christ and him crucified. It was the cross that Rome condemned in him, for it was the cross and it alone in which he put his trust. In all the other articles, he says, that is to say, all the others of the forty-one propositions which had been condemned in the bull, quote, those concerning the papacy, councils, indulgences, and other non-necessary trifles, nor gay, this is the way in which he enumerates them, the levity and folly of the Pope and his followers may be endured. But in this article, that is the one on free will and grace, which is the best of all and the sum of our matter, we must grieve and weep over the insanity of these miserable men. End quote. It is on this article, then, that for him the whole conflict turns as on its hinge. He wishes he could write more largely upon it. For more than three hundred years, none, or next to none, have written in favour of grace, and there is no subject which is in so great need of treatment as this. And I have often wished, he adds, quote, passing by these frivolous papist trifles and brawls, nugis et negotis, which have nothing to do with the church but to destroy it, to deal with this, end quote. His opportunity to do so came when four years afterward, 1524, Erasmus, egged on by his patrons and friends, and taking his start from this very discussion, published his charmingly written book On Free Will, it is the great humanist's greatest book, elegant in style, suave in tone, delicate in suggestion, winning in its appeal, and it presents with consummate skill the case for the Romish teaching against which Luther had thrown himself. Separating himself as decisively, if not as fundamentally, on the one side from Pelagius and Scotus, in another place he speaks with distaste of, quote, Scotus, his bristling and prickly soul, end quote, as on the other from the reformers, he has Karlstadt and Luther especially in mind. Erasmus attaches himself to what he calls, in accordance with the point of view of his time, the Augustinian doctrine, that is to say, to the synergism of the scholastics, perhaps most nearly in the form in which it had been taught by Alexander of Hales, and at all events practically as it was soon to be authoritatively defined as the doctrine of the Church by the Council of Trent. To this subtle doctrine he gives its most attractive statement and weaves around it the charm of his literary grace. Luther was not insensible to the beauty of the book. He says the voice of Erasmus in it sounded to him like the song of a nightingale. But he was in search of substance, not form, 
and he felt bound to confess that his experience in reading the book was much that of the wolf in the fable, who, ravished by the song of a nightingale, could not rest till he had caught and greedily devoured it, only to remark disgustedly afterward, Vox et praetera nil. The refinements of Erasmus's statements were lost on Luther. What he wished, and nothing else would content him, was a clear and definite acknowledgement that the work of salvation is of the grace of God alone, and man contributes nothing whatever to it. This acknowledgement Erasmus could not make. The very purpose for which he was writing was to vindicate for man a part, and that the decisive part, in his own salvation. He might magnify the grace of God in the highest terms. He might protest that he too held that without the grace of God no good thing could be done by man, so that grace is the beginning and the middle and the end of salvation. But when pressed to the wall, he was forced to allow that, somewhere in the middle, an action of the man came in, and that this action of the man was the decisive thing that determined his salvation. He might minimize this action of the man to the utmost. He might point out that it was a very, very little thing which he retained to human powers. Only, as one might say, that man must push the button and grace had to do the rest. This did not satisfy Luther. Nothing would satisfy him but that all of salvation, every bit of it, should be attributed to the grace of God alone. Luther even made Erasmus's efforts to reduce man's part in salvation to as little as possible, while yet retaining it, at the decisive point, the occasion of scoffing. Instead of escaping Pelagianism by such expedients, he says Erasmus and his fellow sophists cast themselves more deeply into the vat and come out double-dyed Pelagians. The Pelagians are at least honest with themselves and us. They do not palter, in a double sense, with empty distinctions between works of condignity and works of congruity. They call a spade a spade, and say candidly that merit is merit. And they do not belittle our salvation by belittling the works by which we merit it. We do not hear from them that we merit saving grace by something, quote, very little, almost nothing, end quote. They hold salvation precious and warn us that if we are to gain it, it can be at the cost only of great effort. Dota plena perfecta, magna et multa studia et opera. If we will fall into error in such a matter, says Luther, at least let us not cheapen the grace of God and treat it as something vile and contemptible. What he means is that the attempted compromise, while remaining Pelagian in principle, yet loses the high ethical position of Pelagianism. Seeking some middle place between grace and works, and fondly congratulating itself that it retains both, it merely falls between the stools and retains neither. It depends as truly as Pelagianism on works, but reduces these works, on which it nevertheless depends, to a vanishing point. In thus suspending salvation on, quote, some little thing, almost nothing, end quote, says Luther, it, quote, denies the Lord Christ who has bought us more than the Pelagians ever denied him or any heretics, end quote. To the book in which Luther replied to Erasmus's On Free Will, Matching Erasmus's title, he gives the name of On the Enslaved Will. Naturally, the flowing purity of the great humanist's latinity and the flexible grace of his style are not to be found here. But the book is written in sufficiently good Latin, plain and strong and straightforward. Luther evidently took unusual pains with it, and it more than makes up for any lack of literary charm it may show by the fertility of its thought and the amazing vigor of its language. A. Freitag, its latest editor, characterizes it briefly in one great word as an exploit, Großtat, and Sorder does not scruple to describe it roundly as, quote, a dialectic and polemic masterpiece, end quote. Its words have hands and feet. Its real distinction, however, is to be sought in a higher region than these things. It is the embodiment of Luther's Reformation conceptions, the nearest to a systematic statement of them he ever made. It is the first exposition of the fundamental ideas of the Reformation in comprehensive presentation, and it is therefore, in a true sense, the manifesto of the Reformation. It was so that Luther himself looked upon it. It was not because he admired it as a piece of mere literature that he always thought of it as an achievement. It was because it contained the Doctrine Evangelicae Caput, the very head and principle of the evangelical teaching. 
he could well spare all that he had ever written, he wrote to Capito in 1537, let them all go, except the on the enslaved will and the catechism. They only are right, just them. He is reported in the table talk, Lauterbach, Auri Faber, to have referred once to Erasmus's rejoinder to the book. He did not admit that Erasmus had confuted it. He did not admit that Erasmus ever could confute it. No, not to all eternity. Quote, that I know full well, he said, and I defy the devil and all his wiles to confute it, for I am certain that it is the unchangeable truth of God. End quote. He who touches this doctrine, he says again, touches the apple of his eye. We may be sure that Luther wrote this book, Con Amore. It was not easy for him to write it when he wrote it. That was the year, 1525, of the Peasants' Revolt, and what that was, in the way of distraction and care, anguish of mind and soul, all know. It was also the year of his marriage, and has he not told us with his engaging frankness that during the first year of his married life, Katie always sat by him as he worked, trying to think up questions to ask him? But what he was writing down in this book, he was not thinking out as he wrote. He was pouring out upon the page the heart of the heart of his gospel, and he was doing it in the exulting confidence that it was not his gospel merely, but the gospel of God. He thanks Erasmus for giving him, by selecting this theme to attack him upon, a respite from the wearying, petty strifes that were being thrust continually upon him, and thus enabling him to speak for once directly to the point. Quote, I exceedingly praise and laud this in you, he writes at the end of his book, that you alone, in contrast with all others, have attacked the thing itself, that is, the top of the question, summum cause, and have not fatigued me with those irrelevant questions about the papacy, purgatory, indulgences, and such like trumperies, nuge, rather than questions in which hitherto all have vainly sought to pursue me. You and you alone have seen the hinge of things and have aimed at the throat, and for this I thank you heartily. End quote. It was no light, however buoyant spirit, however, that Luther entered upon the discussion. In a very moving context, he writes, quote, I tell you and I beg you to let it sink into the depths of your mind. I am seeking in this matter something that is solemn and necessary and eternal to me of such sort, and so great, that it must be asserted and defended at the cost of death itself. Yea, if the whole world should not only be cast into strife and tumult, but even should be reduced to chaos and dissolved into nothingness. For by God's grace I am not so foolish and mad that I could be willing, for the sake of money, which I neither have nor wish, or of glory, a thing I could not obtain if I wished it, in a world so incensed against me or of a life of the body, of which I cannot be sure for a moment, to carry on and sustain this matter so long, with so much fortitude and so much constancy, you call it obstinacy, through so many perils to my life, through so much hatred, through so many snares, in short, through the fury of men and devils. Do you think that you alone have a heart disturbed by these tumults? I am not made of stone either, nor was I either born of the Marpesian rocks." But since it cannot be done otherwise, I prefer to be battered in this tumult, joyful in the grace of God, for the sake of the word of God, which must be asserted with invincible and incorruptible courage, rather than in eternal tumult, to be ground to powder in intolerable torment under the wrath of God. End quote. This was the spirit in which Luther sustained his thesis of the enslaved will. It is the spirit of, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. It is the gospel which he has in his hands, the gospel for the world's salvation, and necessity is laid upon him to preach it. The gospel which Luther had it thus in his heart to preach was, to put it shortly, the gospel of salvation through the grace of God alone. There are two foci around which this gospel revolves, the absolute helplessness of man in his sin, the sole efficiency of grace in salvation. These complementary propositions are given expression theologically in the doctrines of the inability of sinful man to good and of the creative operation of saving grace. It is the inability of sinful man to good that Luther means by his phrase, the enslaved will. Neither he nor Erasmus was particularly interested in the psychology of the will. We may learn incidentally that he held to the view which has come to be called philosophical determinism or moral necessity. 
but we learn that only incidentally. Neither he nor Erasmus was concerned with the mechanism of the will's activity, if we may be allowed this mode of speech. They were absorbed in the great problem of the power of sinful man to good. Erasmus had it in mind to show that sinful man has the power to do good things, things so good that they have merit in the sight of God, and that man's salvation depends on his doing them. Luther had it in his heart to show that sinful man, just because he is sinful and sin is no light evil but destroys all goodness, has no power to do anything that is good in God's sight, and therefore is dependent utterly on God's grace alone for salvation. This is to say, Luther was determined to deal seriously with sin, with original sin, with the fall, with the deep corruption of heart which comes from the fall, with the inability to good which is the result of this corruption of heart. He branded the teaching that man can save himself or do anything looking to his own salvation as a hideous lie, and, quote, he launched point-blank his dart at the head of this lie, taught original sin, the corruption of man's heart, end quote. Erasmus, of course, does not fail to put his finger on the precise point of Luther's contention. He complains of the new teachers that they, quote, immensely exaggerate original sin, representing even the noblest powers of human nature as so corrupt that of itself it can do nothing but ignore and hate God, and not even one who has been justified by the grace of faith can affect any work which is not sin. They make that tendency to sin in us, which has been transmitted to us from our first parents, to be sin itself, and that so invincibly sin that there is no commandment of God, which even a man who has been justified by faith can keep, but all the commandments of God serve no other end than to enhance the grace of God, which bestows salvation without regard to merits, end quote. It outraged him, as it has outraged all who feel with him up to today, as, for example, Hartmann Grisa, that Luther so grossly overdraws the evil of concupiscence, and thus does despite to the human nature which God created in his image. Luther was compelled to point out over and over again that he was not talking about human nature and its powers, but about sin and grace. We have not had to wait for Erasmus to tell us, he says, quote, that a man has eyes and nose and ears and bones and hands, and a mind and a will and a reason, end quote, and that it is because he has these things that he is a man. He would not be a man without them. We could not talk of sin with reference to him, had he not these things, nor of grace either. For does not even the proverb say, God did not make heaven for geese? Let us leave human nature and its powers to one side then. They are all presupposed. The point of importance is that man is now a sinner, and the point in dispute is whether sinful man can be, at will, not sinful, whether he can do by nature what it requires grace to do. Luther does not depreciate human nature. His opponents depreciate the baleful power of sin, the necessity for a creative operation of grace, and because they depreciate both sin and grace, they expect man in his own powers to do what God alone, the almighty worker, can do. He draws out his doctrine here in a long parallel. Quote, As a man, before he is created, to be a man does nothing and makes no effort to be a creature and then after he has been made and created, does nothing and makes no effort to continue a creature. But both these things alike are done solely by the will of the omnipotent power and goodness of God, who without our aid creates and preserves us. But he does not operate in us without our cooperation, seeing that he created and preserved us for this very purpose, that he might operate in us and we cooperate with him. Whether this is done outside his kingdom by general omnipotence or within his kingdom by the singular power of his spirit. So then, we say that a man, before he is renovated into a new creature of the kingdom of the spirit, does nothing and makes no effort to prepare himself for that renovation and kingdom. And then, after he has been renovated, does nothing, makes no effort to continue in that kingdom, but the spirit alone does both alike in us, recreating without our aid and preserving us when recreated. As also James says, of his own will he begat us by the word of his power that we should be the beginning of his creation. He is speaking of the renewed creature. But he does not operate apart from us, seeing that he has recreated and preserved us for this very purpose, that he might operate in us and we cooperate with him. 
Thus, through us, he preaches, has pity on the poor, consoles the afflicted. But what, then, is attributed to free will? Or rather, what is left to it except nothing? Assuredly, just nothing. End quote. What this parallel teaches is that the whole saving work is from God, in the beginning and middle and end. It is a supernatural work throughout. But we are saved that we may live in God and in the powers of our new life, do his will in the world. It is the Pauline, not out of works, but unto good works, which God has afore prepared that we should live in them. It is obvious that the whole substance of Luther's fundamental theology was summed up in the antithesis of sin and grace, sin conceived as absolutely disabling to good, grace as absolutely recreative in effect. Of course, he taught also all that is necessarily bound up in one bundle of thought with this great doctrine of sin and grace. He taught, for instance, as a matter of course, the doctrine of irresistible grace, and also, with great purity and decision, the doctrine of predestination, for how can salvation be of pure grace alone, apart from all merit, save by the sovereign and effective gift of God? A great part of the enslaved will is given to insistence upon and elucidation of this doctrine of absolute predestination, and Luther did not shrink from raising it into the cosmical region, or from elaborating it in its every detail. What it is important for us at the moment to insist upon, however, is that what we have said of Luther, we might just as well, mutatis mundandis, have said of every other of the great reformers. Luther's doctrine of sin and grace was not peculiar to him. It was the common property of the whole body of the reformers. It was taught with equal clarity and force by Zwingli as by Luther and by Martin Busser and by John Calvin. It was taught even in his earlier and happier period by that Protestant Erasmus, the weak and unreliable Melanchthon, who was saved from betraying the whole Protestant cause at Augsburg by no staunchness in himself, but only by the fatuity of the Catholics, and who later did betray it in its heart of hearts by going over to that very synergism which Luther declared to be the very marrow of the Pope's teaching. In one word, this doctrine was Protestantism itself. All else that Protestantism stood for in comparison with this must be relegated to the second rank. There are some interesting paragraphs in the earlier pages of Alexander Schweitzer's Central Doctrines of Protestantism, in which he speaks of the watchwords of Protestantism and points out the distinction between them and the so-called formal and material principles of Protestantism, which are, in point of fact, their more considered elaboration Every reformatory movement in history, he says, has its watchwords, which serve as the symbol by which its adherents encourage one another, and as the banner about which they gather. They penetrate to the very essence of the matter, and give, if popular, yet compressed and vivid, expression to the precise pivot on which the movement turns. In the case of the Protestant Revolution, the antithesis, not tradition but scripture, emerged as one of these watchwords, but not as the ultimate one, but only as subordinate to another in which was expressed the contrast between the parties at strife with respect to the chief matter, how shall sinful man be saved? This ultimate watchword, says Schweitzer, ran somewhat like this, not works but faith, not our merit but God's grace in Christ, not our own penances and satisfactions but the merit of Christ only. When we hear these cries, we are hearing the very pulse beats of the Reformation as a force among men. In their presence, we are in the presence of the Reformation in its purity. It scarcely requires explicit mention that what we are then face to face with in the Reformation is simply a revival of Augustinianism. The fundamental Augustinian antithesis of sin and grace is the soul of the whole Reformation movement. If we wish to characterize the movement on its theological side in one word, therefore, it is adequately done by declaring it a great revival of Augustinianism. Of course, if we study exactness of statement, there are qualifications to be made, but these qualifications serve not to modify the characterization, but only to bring it to its utmost precision. We are bidden to remember that the Reformation was not the only movement back towards Augustinianism of the later Middle Ages or of its own day. The times were marked by a deep dissatisfaction with current modes of treating and speaking of divine things, and a movement away from the dominant nominalism, so far back towards Augustinianism as at least to Thomism, 
was widespread and powerful. And we are bidden to remember that Augustinianism is too broad a term to apply undefined to the doctrinal basis of the Reformation. In its complete connotation, it includes not only tendencies, but elements of explicit teaching, which were abhorrent to the Reformers, and by virtue of which the Romanists have an equal right with the Protestants to be called the true children of Augustine. It is suggested, therefore, that all that can properly be said is that the Reformation, conceived as a movement of its time, represented that part of the general revulsion from the corruptions of the day, the whole of which looked back towards Augustine for guidance and strength, which, because it was distinctively religious in its motives and aspirations, laid hold purely of the Augustinian doctrines of sin and grace, and built exclusively on them in its readjustments to life. We may content ourselves with such a statement. It is quite true that the Reformation, when looked at purely in itself, presents itself to our view as, in the words of Father Luf's, quote, the rediscovery of Christianity as religion, end quote. And it is quite true that purely Augustinian, as the Reformation is in its conception of religion, it is not the whole of Augustine that it takes over, but only, quote, the Augustine of sin and grace, end quote, so that when we speak of it as a revival of Augustinianism, we must have in mind only the Augustinianism of grace. But the Augustinianism of grace, in the truest sense, represents the real Augustine. No injustice is done to historical verity in the essence of the matter when we speak of him as a post-Pauline Paul and a pre-Lutheran Luther. We have only in such a phrase uncovered the true succession. Paul, Augustine, Luther. For substance of doctrine, these three are one, and the Reformation is perceived to be, on its doctrinal side, mere Paulinism, given back to the world. To realize how completely this is true, we have only to look into the pages of those lecture notes on Romans, which Luther wrote down in 1515 to 1516, and the manuscript of which was still lying in 1908, unregarded in a showcase of the Berlin Library. Luther himself, of course, fully understood it all. He is reported to have said in his table talk in 1538, Lauterbach, quote, There was a certain cardinal in the beginning of the gospel plotting many things against me in Rome. A court fool looking on is said to have remarked, My lord, take my advice and first depose Paul from the company of the apostles. It is he who is giving us all this trouble. It was Paul whom Luther was consciously resurrecting. Paul, with the constant cry on his lips, so Luther puts it, of grace, 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 end quote. Luther characteristically adds, quote, in spite of the devil, grace in spite of the devil, end quote, and perhaps it will not be without its value for us to observe that Luther did his whole work of re-establishing the doctrine of salvation by pure grace in the world, in the clear conviction that he was doing it in the teeth of the devil. It was against principalities and powers, and spiritual wickednesses in high places, that he felt himself to be fighting, and he depended for victory on no human arm. Has he not expressed it all in his great hymn, the Reformation hymn, by way of eminence, A trusty stronghold is our God, yea, were the world with devils filled. End of The Theology of the Reformation by B. B. Warfield The Literary History of Calvin's Institutes, Part 1, by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin might well claim attention merely on the score of its position in the history of Christian thinking on the themes of the Gospel, even though it were as dull and as alien from our own modes of thought as the Zen Avesta. It is, on the contrary, however, the fundamental treatise in the development of that evangelical theology to which the Reformed churches are committed, and it is to it that they must look back as the first serious attempt to cast into a system the body of truth to which they adhere as taught in the Holy Scriptures. And from the point of view of mere literary standing, the Institutes of John Calvin holds a position so supreme in its class that everyone who would profess to know the world's best literature must perforce make himself acquainted with it. 
It is saying too little to say that, in reading this work, we are brought into contact with a great book. Would we justly express its eminence, we must say that it is one of the world's greatest books, absolutely the greatest book of its class. What Thucydides is among Greek, or Gibbon among 18th century English historians, what Shakespeare is among dramatists, or the Iliad among epics, that Calvin's Institutes is among dogmatic treatises. Quote, the Institutio of Calvin, says Dr. William Cunningham, to whom will be conceded a right to an opinion in such a matter, is the most important work in the history of theological science, that which is more than any other creditable to its author, and has exerted directly or indirectly the greatest and most beneficial influence upon the opinions of intelligent men on theological subjects. It may be said to occupy in the science of theology the place which it requires both the Novum Organum of Bacon and the Principia of Newton to fill up in physical science, at once conveying, though not in formal didactic precepts and rules, the finest idea of the way and manner in which the truths of God's word ought to be classified and systematized, and at the same time actually classifying and systematizing them, in a way that has not yet received any very material or essential improvement. End quote. It is only a kind of perverse moderation, therefore, born of his fundamental lack of sympathy with Calvin, which leads Dr. Schaff to praise it in such measured terms as even these may, in the circumstances, be accounted. Quote, it threw into the shade the earlier Protestant theologies, as Melanchthon's Loki and Zwingli's commentary on the true and false religion, and it has hardly been surpassed since. As a classical production of theological genius, it stands on a level with Origen's De Principis, Augustine's De Civitate Dei, Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, and Schleiermacher's De Christliche Glaube. End quote. These are all great works that he names, though the greatest of them, Augustine's The City of God, is not properly a dogmatic treatise, but an apology for the Christian religion, and therefore comes into comparison with Calvin's Institutes only so far as the latter may be looked upon in that apologetic aspect which was given it by the circumstances of its first publication. But Calvin's Institutes attained something even above their level, and there is no danger of speaking unguardedly if we give enthusiasm itself the reins and adopt as a sober critical judgment the glowing praise of the famous distich of the Hungarian reformer and poet Paulus Turius, which, so the editors of the Strasbourg edition tell us, many of the old owners and readers of the institutes have written lovingly on its front. Preter apostolicas post Christi tempora cartas Huic peperere libro secula nulla parem. This is indeed no more than what the greatest scholar of Calvin's own age did, that Joseph Scaliger, 1540 to 1609, whose caustic criticisms have made so many scholars writhe. Quote, oh, that a good book is the Institutes, he exclaims. Calvin stands alone among theologians. Solus inter theologos Calvinus. End quote. And this is no other than what the Strasbourg editors, Baum, Kunitz, and Reuss, certainly among the most learned and least extravagant critics of our own day, have done. For they did not scruple to adopt Turius's expression into the well-weighed Latin of their critical prolegomena, and to give it as their deliberate judgment upon the merits of the book. Among the other reasons which have led them to devote their time and labor to an edition of Calvin's works, they tell us is the unique preeminence and high authority enjoyed by this Lycurgus of the Reformed Churches. For, they continue, quote, Though Luther was supremely great as a man, and Zwingli was second to none as a Christian citizen, and Melanchthon well deserves the appellation of the most learned of teachers, Calvin may justly be called the prince and standard-bearer of theologians, Theologorum Principem et Aute Signarum. For who will not marvel at his command of language and letters, at his control of the entire sphere of learning? The copiousness of his erudition, the admirable disposition of his material, the force and validity of his reasoning in dogmatics, the acuteness and subtlety of his mind, and the alternating gay and biting saltness of his polemics, the felicitous perspicuity, sobriety and sagacity of his exegetics, the nervous eloquence and freedom of his paranetics, his incomparable legislative prudence and wisdom in the constitution, ordering and governing of the churches. All this is fully recognized among men of learning and candor. 
Even among Romish controversialists themselves, there is none today possessed of even a moderate knowledge of these matters or endowed with the least fairness in judgment who does not wonder at the richness of his reasoning and ideas, the precision of his language, the weight and clearness of his diction, whether in Latin or French. All these qualities are, of course, present in his other writings, but they are especially resplendent in that immortal Institutes of the Christian Religion, which, beyond all controversy, far excels all expositions of the kind that have been written from the days of the Apostles down, including, of course, Melanchthon's Loki Theologici, and which captivates even today the learned and candid reader, even though he may be committed to different opinions and wrests from him an unwilling admiration, end quote. So, estimating the institutes, it is no wonder that these learned editors wished to begin their corpus with this work. This is how they explain their procedure. Quote, In undertaking a new collection of the works of John Calvin, of immortal memory, a body of writings worthy of his great name, we have determined to begin with the institutes of the Christian religion. That work does not, to be sure, hold the first place among his writings in the order of composition, though very few of them preceded it but none of them is superior to it in the fame it enjoys. It has often happened that a book set apart by the great applause of men has afterwards fallen into neglect through the harsher judgment or the careless indifference of a later time. Often, too, that one which reached few minds at first and almost escaped notice has, as time proceeded, emerged from obscurity and is daily celebrated with increasing praise. But with regard to this book, seized upon from its very cradle with great and widespread avidity, and scrutinized by its very adversaries with a zeal born of envy. Its glory has abided the same, intact now through three centuries, without the least diminution or fading, despite the frequent changes which successive schools of theology have introduced into the treatment of Christian doctrine. If it were the custom of our time, as it was formerly to collect at the beginning of volumes eulogies pronounced on their writers by various authors, we could gather here a great harvest of laudations, and time and paper would fail us before the material at our disposal would be exhausted. End quote. He who would see this omission of the Strasbourg editors supplied may consult the copious collection of opinions and testimonies concerning the writings of Calvin, given in the last volume of the translation of his works, published by the Calvin Translation Society, Edinburgh, 1854, pages 376 to 464, or the shorter collection given by Dr. Scharf in the seventh volume of his History of the Christian Church, pages 272 to 295. We may for the present rest content with the testimony to the quality of the book offered by its immediate and continued extreme popularity. Quote, Although innumerable, says one of Calvin's best biographers, E. Stehlen, is the circle of readers which have successively gathered out of all conditions and nations about Calvin's book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, altogether immeasurable the influence which it has exerted in the course of the centuries. The number of its editions, and they still continue to be issued, exceeds the limits of reckoning, It may be asserted without fear of exaggeration that no other book of similar scientific form and extent has ever reached a like circulation. One of the marvels connected with this remarkable book is the youth of its author when it was written. We do not indeed know with exactitude precisely when it was written, but, as the colophon of the first edition tells us, it was published at Basel in March 1536, and the prefatory address to the King of France, which was written, as we know, sometime after the book itself, is dated the 23rd of August, and that this means August 1535. Royce, among others, has fully shown. In the opening words of this preface, Calvin explicitly declares that when the work was written, he had no thought of presenting it to Francis. Quote, When I first put hand to this work, he says, nothing was less in my thoughts, most illustrious king, than to write a book which should be presented to your majesty. My intention was only to inculcate some elementary truths by which those interested in religion might be trained to true piety, and at this task I toiled chiefly for our French, multitudes of whom I saw to be hungering and thirsting after Christ, but very few to be possessed of even a slight knowledge of him. That this was my purpose, the book itself shows by its simple and elementary manner of teaching. 
It would seem natural to suppose, therefore, that the book was composed some weeks, or possibly even months, before the middle of 1535, perhaps even in 1534. There are not lacking some further considerations which support this supposition. A direct statement to this effect is made, indeed, by an almost contemporary author, Florimond de Raymond, 1540-1602, councillor of the Parliament of Bordeaux, who wrote from the Romish point of view a Historie de la naissance, progrès et décadence de la récit de ces siècles. Paris, 1605 and again 1623. His statements are, to be sure, scarcely worthy of credence when unsupported, but when, as in the present case, they are corroborative of what is otherwise probable, they may be worth our attention. He represents Calvin as, on leaving Paris, sojourning three years at Angoulême, a manifest error, and continues as follows, quote, Angoulême was the forge where this new Vulcan beat out these strange opinions which he afterwards published, for it was there that he wove to the astonishment of Christendom the fabric of his institutes, which may be called the Koran, or rather the Talmud of heresy, being, as it is, a mass of all the errors that have ever existed in the past, or ever will exist. I verily believe in the future. He was commonly called the Greek of Clay, from the name of his patron, the Curé of Clay, because he made a constant parade of his Greek, without, to be sure, knowing very much of it. This Greek of Clay, then held in high esteem and reputation and loved by all who loved letters, would weave into his speech remarks about religion and continually drop piquant words against the authority and traditions of the Church. He enjoyed the favor of many persons of authority, especially Anthony Calu, prior of Bouteville, who has since been called the Pope of the Lutherans, and of the Abbé de Passac, two men of letters eager to gather together all the good books they could meet with, and of the Sierre de Torsac, brother of President Laplace, who afterwards became the historian of Calvinism. Calvin was often with these two in the company of du Tillet also. Their rendezvous was in a house outside the town of Angoulême, named Girac, where the prior of Bouteville ordinarily made his dwelling. There he entertained them with the sketches for his institutes, laying open to them all the secrets of his theology, and read to them the chapters of his book as he composed them, laboring so assiduously on it that he often passed entire nights without sleeping and whole days without eating. It is a pleasure to me to follow step by step the course of this man fatal to our France, and to touch upon all the details of his training, because no one has written it down. And as I have taken the trouble to inform myself of the truth, I make no complaint of the trouble of writing it. End quote. There is some vraisemblance in this rather overdrawn picture of Calvin working out his treatise in his retirement at Angoulême, though it is quite clear not only that the author has wrongly given to Angoulême the whole three years that extended between Calvin's flight from Paris late in 1533 and his arrival in Geneva late in July 1536, but also, as Reuss points out, that he has in mind the Institutes not as first published in the spring of 1536, but in the elaborated form which it took only later, that the book may have been written in Angoulême, where Calvin seems to have spent the greater part of the year from the autumn of 1533 to the autumn of 1534 in the house of his wealthy friend, Louis de Tillet, is in itself, however, certainly possible, and such a supposition may account for Beza's placing it in the chronological list of Calvin's works, which he published immediately after his master's death, directly after his first publication, the commentary on Seneca's De Clementia, which appeared in April 1532, and before his next published book, the Psychopanachia, which was issued in 1534. It may indeed be said that Beza was demonstrably labouring under a misapprehension as to the date of the publication of the Institutes, and that it is due to this error that he so places it in his catalogue, and not the influence of knowledge on his part that the book was written earlier than the date of its publication. He certainly says in the first edition of his Life of Calvin that Calvin, quote, left France in 1534 and had his first Institutes printed that same year at Basel, as an apology addressed to King Francis, first of the name, in behalf of the poor persecuted believers upon whom the name of Anabaptists was imposed in order to excuse the persecution of the gospel in the eyes of the Protestant princes. End quote. 
and he was certainly wrong in so saying, as is evident, were there nothing else to show it, from the fact that the persecutions in question did not begin until early in 1535. Nevertheless, it is not clear that knowledge on Beza's part that the Institutes was written in 1534 may not be rather the cause of his error here as to the date of its publication, an error of which he seems subsequently to have become aware as he suppressed the whole passage in the second edition of his book. Whatever support may come from these doubtful passages, however the main ground supposing that the Institutes was composed at some point earlier than the middle of 1535, when the Epistola non copatoria was written, must be drawn from the pointed discrimination that is made by both Calvin and Beza between the writing and the publishing of the book, as determined by wholly different motives arising out of changing circumstances and therefore arguing different times. As we have seen, this is plainly asserted in the opening words of the epistle itself, where his motives in writing his institutes are declared by Calvin himself. This account is supplemented by the full account of his motives in publishing the book, given in that precious autobiographical fragment which is included in the preface to his commentary on the Psalms. It will be wise to have this pretty fully before us, as it will be of use in the discussion of more than one point in the history of the Institutes. Quote, Leaving my native country France, says Calvin, I, in fact, retired into Germany expressly for the purpose of being able there to enjoy in some obscure corner the repose which I had always desired and which had been so long denied me. But, lo, whilst I lay hidden at Basel and known only to a few people, many faithful and holy men were burnt alive in France, and the report of these burnings having reached foreign nations, they excited the strongest disapprobation among the great part of the Germans, whose indignation was kindled against the authors of such tyranny." In order to allay this indignation, certain wicked and lying pamphlets were circulated, stating that none were treated with such cruelty but Anabaptists and seditious persons, who by their perverse railings and false opinions were overthrowing not only religion but also all civil order. Observing that the object which these instruments of the court aimed at by their disguises was not only that the disgrace of shedding so much innocent blood might remain buried under the false charges and calumnies which they brought against the holy martyrs after their death, but also that afterwards they might be able to proceed to the utmost extremity in murdering the poor saints without exciting compassion towards them in the breasts of any. It appeared to me that unless I opposed them by the uttermost of my ability, my silence could not be vindicated from the charge of cowardice or treachery. This was the consideration which induced me to publish my Institutes of the Christian Religion. My objects were, first, to prove that these reports were false and calumnious, and thus to vindicate my brethren whose death was precious in the sight of the Lord, and next, that as the same cruelties might very soon after be exercised against many unhappy individuals, foreign nations might be touched with at least some compassion towards them and solicitude about them. When it was then published, it was not that copious and laboured work which it now is, but only a small treatise containing a summary of the principal truths of the Christian religion, and it was published with no other design but that men might know what was the faith held by those whom I saw basely and wickedly defamed by those flagitious and perfidious flatterers that my object was not to acquire fame, appeared from this, that immediately afterwards I left Basel, and particularly from the fact that nobody there knew that I was the author. Wherever else I have gone, I have taken care to conceal that I was the author of that performance, and I had resolved to continue in the same privacy and obscurity, until, at length, William Farrell detained me at Geneva, not so much by counsel and exhortation as by a dreadful imprecation which I felt to be as if God had from heaven laid his mighty hand upon me to arrest me. End quote. The plain implication of this passage is that Calvin had the manuscript of his institutes by him and was led to publish it as an apologetical document by the malignant aspersions on the character of the saints slain in France as if they were a body of mere fanatics. By reading it, the world would know the sort of doctrine held by the French martyrs. How long he had had it by him, we have no means of certainly divining, but the persecutions in France had begun early in 1535, and it does not seem as if the book could have been so spoken of if it had been written subsequently to this. Whether, however, it was written in Angoulême in 1534 or in Basel in 1535 makes little difference. Calvin was born July 10th, 1509. 
His dedicatory letter to Francis I is dated August 23rd, 1535, 26 years afterwards. The Institutes was beyond question written then, before he had completed his 26th year, and possibly before he had completed his 25th year. It was in the hands of the public before he had completed his 27th year. In estimating the nature of this performance, there are two other facts which we should take into consideration, one of an enhancing, the other of a moderating character. We must bear in mind, on the one hand, that the young Calvin's book had practically no predecessors but broke out a new path for itself, but also, the other hand, that when it was first given to the public, it was on far from being the complete treatise in dogmatic theology which we know, but was, as he himself describes it in the extract already quoted from the preface to his commentary on the Psalms, doubtless with some exaggeration of its unimportance, not densum hoc et laboriosum opus, quale nunc extat sed breve dunt extat en caridion, seulement un petit livret contenant summairement les principales matières. A brief handbook, a little booklet. From that small beginning it grew under his hand from edition to edition and was transformed from a short handbook on religion for the people into a scientific treatise in dogmatic theology for students of theology. When we say it had practically no predecessors, we do not mean to obscure the fact that, before it, attempts had been made to set forth the fundamental articles of the Christian faith as the Protestants conceived them. As a matter of fact, Calvin's Institutes was preceded by three earlier such attempts, two of which, at least, were of considerable importance. The very nature of the Reformed movement imposed on the Protestant party the necessity of giving a scientific account of itself. As Reuss admirably puts it, such a declaration of principles was necessary in the face of adversaries armed with an authority consecrated by ten centuries and charging the new movement with blasphemy, with the destruction of all order, human and divine, with the overthrow of the whole social fabric. It was necessary in the face of troubled friends who gave the reform their sympathy but were frightened at the uproar it caused and the very efforts which were required to sustain it. It was necessary above all in the face of the radical party which always accompanies the advance of the great movements which agitate humanity and is always ready to compromise the good cause and to alienate those who judge things according to their first results. It was inevitable, therefore, that even the very first steps of the Reformation should produce attempts to state in some systematic way the recovered truths of the gospel, and the first Protestant dogmatics accordingly saw the light scarcely four years after Luther nailed up his theses on indulgences, 1521. It did not indeed come from the hand of Luther himself, but it came from the hand of his chief helper in the gospel, the saintly and learned Melanchthon. Thus, as Reuss says, quote, the first attempt to formulate the evangelical doctrine according to the methods of the schools was the work of a young professor of the humanities scarcely 23 years old, who by this publication laid the foundations of Lutheran dogmatics and impressed on them the direction which they did not cease to follow for a whole century. End quote. The Loki Theologici of Melanchthon in its first form scarcely exceeded in size one of our catechisms, and, owing its composition to a course of lectures on the epistle to the Romans given to a private class, followed in its order the emergence of the topics in that epistle, and thus lacked all systematic arrangement. But it was written in a classic style of great simplicity which deserved its great popularity, and was gradually wrought by its author into an ever-improving systematic order. Four years after the publication of Melanchthon's Loki Theologici, the far better arranged and more penetrating work of Zwingli appeared, 1525, entitled Commentarius de Vera et Faisa Religione, written at the solicitation of the Italian and French refugees, and like Calvin's Institutes, introduced with a noble dedicatory letter to Francis I. Of much less importance than either of these is the manual of William Farrell, the first theological treatise written in the French language, entitled Sa mère brief déclaration de quel effort nécessaire à un chasquant chrétien pour mettre sa confiance en Dieu et discerne son portion, etc. A treatise distinguished by simplicity of language, a truly biblical popularity and persuasive application to the Christian life. 
Whether Calvin was acquainted with these works or not, we have no direct evidence to show. It may be assumed, but in any event, he wrote with independence and with an unexpected command of this special field, which showed itself ever greater with each new addition. Were indeed the comparison with his predecessors made only with the first edition of Calvin's Institutes, his superiority, though marked, would be less extreme. But the first edition of the Institutes was, as we have said, only the first stage in a development, and was a less satisfactory stage to its author than to any of his readers. He himself speaks almost with contempt of his own production. In the preface to the second edition, which was published in 1539, he says, quote, in the first edition of this work of ours, because I had not the least expectation of that success which God in his goodness has given it, I had, for the greater part, performed my office perfunctorily, as is customary in trivial undertakings, in minutis operibus, end quote. Accordingly, the title of this second edition, on which he had bestowed much labor, and for the late appearance of which he apologizes, is made to run Institutio Christiane Religionis Nunc Vere Demum Suo Titulo Respondens. In it, the text is swelled to something more than double its original bulk, and its character is so changed that the reworked volume is put forth as a totally new book, with a different purpose from that had in view when it was first composed. The book was written, as we are told, in the dedicatory letter to Francis I., solely to supply rudimentary instruction in religion to the neglected multitudes, and was, therefore, quote, composed in a simple and elementary form, suitable for instruction, end quote. It was published, as we are told in the preface to the Psalms, to exhibit to the world what the French Protestants really believed, and to render incredible the calumnies by which their judicial murder was excused. It was now revised, or rather elaborated, in order to fit it to be a textbook in theology. Quote, I may add, continues Calvin in his preface, that my object in this labor, of reworking the institutes, was this, so to prepare and train candidates in sound theology for the reading of the divine word, that they might both have an easy introduction to it, and proceed in it with unfaltering step, seeing I have endeavored to give such a summary of religion in all its parts, and have digested it into such an order as to make it not difficult for anyone who is rightly acquainted with it to ascertain what he ought properly to look for in Scripture, and also to what head he ought to refer whatever is contained in it. End quote. In other words, Calvin now designed his institutes to be a doctrinal introduction to the study of the scriptures, and he goes on to explain that the fact that this book was accessible would enable him, when writing his commentaries, to pass over doctrinal points without long discussion. To this conception he kept throughout the labor of subsequent revision. For not even the enlarged institutes of 1539 satisfied him. Six additional revisions were made by him before what we may call the definitive edition of 1559 was reached, in which the institutes appear not only once more doubled in length, now about five times the size of the booklet of 1536, but entirely altered in arrangement and presenting at last that almost perfect disposition of its material in which it has come down to us, and by which it has won the unalloyed admiration of subsequent ages. In the preface to this edition, Calvin, speaking of the labor he had expended in bringing the book as first published to a worthier form, says, quote, This I attempted not only in the second edition, but in every subsequent one the work has received some improvement. But, though I do not regret the labor previously expended, I never felt satisfied until the work was arranged in the order in which it now appears. End quote. On the title page, accordingly, we read, Institutio Christiane Religionis in Libros Quatoro Nunc Primum Digesta Certisque Distincta Capitibus Ad Aptissimam Methodum Aucta Etiam Tam Magna Accessione Ut Propemodum Opus Novum Haberi Possit. The first edition was divided into six chapters on the law, faith, prayer, the sacraments, spurious sacraments, and Christian liberty. 
the first three chapters being essentially expositions of the Decalogue, the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer, while the concluding three treated the matters chiefly in dispute at the time. As the material grew, these six chapters were increased partly by division, partly by insertion of additional topics, to 17 in the second edition and 21 in subsequent ones, but remained in a somewhat artificial arrangement. With the edition of 1559, however, a totally new arrangement was introduced, which reduced the whole to a simple and beautiful order, redacted into four books, each with its own chapter divisions, from 17 to 25, subdivided into sections. These four books treat in turn of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and the Holy Catholic Church, of the knowledge of God the Creator, of the knowledge of God the Redeemer, of the mode of receiving the grace of Christ, and of the external means of salvation. The order was suggested by the connection of topics in the Apostles' Creed and follows what is called the Trinitarian method of arrangement, or the order of God's revelation as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The discovery of this simple principle of arrangement gave the final touch to the Institutes as a work of art and permitted it to make its due impression upon the mind of the reader. What kind of impression it makes on a spirit sensitive to form and artistic effect, Mr. Peter Bain may teach us. Quote, the Institutes, he says, are in all, save material form, a great religious poem, as imaginative in general scheme and as sustained in emotional heat as Paradise Lost, though, of course, not to be compared for beauty of language or picturesqueness of detail with Milton's poem. Calvin treats in four successive books of Christ the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, Christ the Inspirer, and Christ the King. If he had written in verse, avoided argumentative discussion, and called his work the Christiad, it would have been the most symmetrical epic in existence. End quote. It was only then, in 1559, that the Institutes as we know the book was finished. Throughout the whole quarter of a century, from the stay in Angoulême, in 1534, to the appearance of this, its eighth edition. It was, in a true sense, in the making, and not until its appearance in this form was it completed. The changes it had undergone since its composition were immense, quintupling its size, revolutionizing its arrangement, changing its very purpose and proposed audience. And yet, through all these changes, it remained, in some true sense, the same book, and bore in its bosom precisely the same message. In the case of others of the great writers of the Reformation period, Royce strikingly remarks, their several publications may mark the stations of their gradual growth in knowledge or conviction. In Calvin's case, the successive editions mark only stages in the perfection of his exposition of principles already firmly grasped and clearly stated. Quote, the masterpiece of Calvin offers in this respect an interest altogether peculiar. We have seen how often it was reworked, how in each rewriting it was enriched and transformed, how from the little sketch it had been at first it ended by becoming a thick volume, how the simple popular outline was changed into a learned system, and nevertheless, through all these metamorphoses, which left no single page unaffected, the ideas, the theological conception, remained the same, the principles never varied. Its adversaries, in whose eyes change was in itself the worst of errors, vainly strove to discover variations in the doctrine taught in this book. Calvin added, developed, defined. He did not retrench nor retract anything. And it was before he had finished his twenty-sixth year that he found himself in full possession of all the productive truths of his theology, and never afterwards, during a life of thought and of incessant mental labor, did he find in his work either principles to abjure or elements fundamentally to alter. End quote. Another of the notable facts about the Institutes is that it was published by its author in two languages, Latin and French. The honour of priority has been a perennial matter of dispute between the two. The earliest French edition, copies of which have as yet come to light, however, is that of 1541, and it not only bears on the title page the declaration that it was Quote, composed in Latin by John Calvin and translated into French by the same, end quote, but contains in the preface the following explicit statement. Quote, Seeing then how necessary it was in this matter to aid those who desire to be instructed in the doctrine of salvation, 
I have endeavoured, according to the ability which God has given me, to employ myself in so doing, and with this view have composed the present book. And first I wrote it in Latin, et primièrement l'imir latin, that it might be serviceable to all studious persons, of what nation soever they might be, and afterwards, puis après, desiring to communicate any fruit that might be in it to my French countrymen, I translated it into our own tongue. Le aussi translate un nostre lor. End quote. It is of course true that the mere fact that no copy of an earlier French edition has as yet turned up does not in itself exclude the possibility that such an one may be some day chanced upon, and it may even be allowed that the language just quoted may possibly be pressed to refer to the Latin edition of 1539 alone, which Calvin considered the first edition worthy of the name, and of which the French is certainly a translation. But in the absence of any trace of an earlier French edition, we submit the natural implication of the words is that the Latin institutes is the fundamental, and the French the derived institutes. We are pointed indeed to certain facts which are said to imply an earlier French edition, but these seem capable of plausible explanation without this assumption. The most important of them consist of passages from Calvin's own writings, notably the autobiographical passage in the preface to his commentary on the Psalms, where he says that when he published his Institutes, nobody at Basel knew that he was the author of the book, and a sentence in a letter to Francis Daniel, written on the 13th of October, 1536, in which he speaks of contemplating, quote, a French edition of our little book, end quote. It is argued with respect to the former passage that it must mean that the first edition of the Institutes was published anonymously, and that this cannot be said of the Latin edition of 1536, since it bore Calvin's name conspicuously on its front. Therefore the reference must be to a previous French issue, published without the name of its author appearing. Any careful reading of the passage, however, will convince us that this explanation cannot stand. The ignorance ascribed to the people of Baza as to Calvin's authorship of the book is evidently represented as continuing until Calvin had left that city, and as shared by others outside the city at a later date. In any event, therefore, the Latin edition, published before he left Baza, comes into account, and it is plain that it is not anonymous publication that he is speaking of, but cautious conduct on the part of the author, perhaps with a reference to the further fact that he lived in Basel under an assumed name. The statement in the letter to Daniel, on the other hand, does seem to show that already in the autumn of 1536 Calvin was contemplating a French version of his little book, but whether he means by this the Institutes or his Psychopanachia, a second edition of which was published at Basel this same year, or whether the project was abandoned and only fulfilled in the edition of 1541, does not appear. In any event, it cannot point to an original edition of the Institutes in French, as it distinctly speaks of the project as of a French edition of an already existent libellus. It would seem, then, pretty certain that the French editions of the Institutes begin with that of 1541, which is a close rendering of the Latin of 1539. End of The Literary History of Calvin's Institutes, Part 1, by B.B. B. Warfield. The Literary History of Calvin's Institutes, Part 2, by B.B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The first French edition of the Institutes then, that of 1541, is a careful translation by Calvin himself, as the title, page, and preface alike inform us, of the second Latin edition of 1539. The subsequent revisions of the Latin text repeat themselves in editions of the French, the Latin of 1543, repeated in 1545, in the French of 1545 the Latin of 1550, repeated in 1553 and 1554, in the French of 1551, repeated in 1553 and 1554, and finally the definitive Latin of 1559, repeated twice in 1561, in the French of 1560, repeated twice in 1561, three times in 1562, and again in 1563 and 1564. 
There is a remarkable fact about the final French edition, however, which requires notice. The former editions had repeated, with only the necessary revisions, the original translation of 1541. But the definitive edition of the Latin of 1559 evidently seemed to Calvin a new beginning, Increased as it was to nearly twice the bulk of its immediate predecessor, it announces itself indeed on its title page as, quote, augmented by such additions that it could almost be considered a new work, end quote. So looking upon it, Calvin began an entirely new translation of it, a translation corresponding to nothing in the previous editions, even in the parts and phrases where the Latin had not been changed. This new translation was continued, however, only to the seventh chapter of the first book. The rest of the volume, except those portions of it merely taken over from the earlier editions, about half of the whole, is by another hand than Calvin's, as its frequent inexactitudes and even occasional misapprehensions of the Latin text show. It would seem that Calvin did not even oversee the proofs of this portion, nearly the whole, of the volume. The French translation of the completed institutes cannot therefore be treated, as it often is treated, as a second original, but in large part must take its secondary rank as a mere translation of the institutes, of value only, like other versions, in giving the great book which it represents a wider circulation and a greater influence than it could have had in its Latin form alone. This important task of diffusing the knowledge of the institutes was not left, however, to the French version alone. The book was fortunate in securing translation almost at once into most of the languages of Europe, and it was fortunate in the translators it secured. The Italian version, indeed, did not wait for the publication of the definitive Latin version, but, depending mainly on the French, appeared as early as 1557 from the pen of Guilio Cesare Pascali, an excellent poet who subsequently published a metrical Italian version of the Psalms, 1592, and was introduced by a dedicatory letter addressed to Galeazzo Carasioli, Marquis of Vico, one of the band of nobles who formed the nucleus of the first Protestant church at Naples. The English translation came next, 1561, and five times repeated before 1600, from the pen of a much more notable man, Thomas Norton, 1532 to 1584, a ripe scholar, able jurist, wise statesman, ardent reformer, and no mean poet, who has left an enviable record of work in all these departments of mental effort, but who is most generally known, doubtless, as co-author with his friend, Thomas Sackville, of the Tragedy of Gorboduc a piece that plays a part in the history of the English drama. The theologians of Heidelberg issued a German translation at that place in 1572, and a Dutch translation appeared at Dort in 1578. In 1597, a Spanish version appeared from the pen of Cipriano de Valera, one of the most notable of the Spanish literary reformers, and also an anonymous German translation printed at Hanau. Early in the next century, a new Dutch version by Charles Agricola, 1614, and a Hungarian one, 1624, were added. It is not necessary to trace the repetitions of these translations in later editions. As time went on, more modern versions were needed. A modernized French version was begun by Charles Icard, pastor of the French church at Bremen, as early as 1696 and finished in 1713 a modern German version by F. A. Krummacher of Elberfeld, was begun in 1823 and finished in 1834. Two new English versions have been published in this century, those of John Allen, 1813, second edition, 1839, and often since, and of Henry Beveridge, 1845 and 1863. We naturally feel a special interest in the English translations, as already stated, the Institutes has been thrice translated into English by Thomas Norton, 1561 and often afterwards, by John Allen, 1813 and often afterwards, and by Henry Beveridge, 1845 and at least once subsequently. Besides these translations of the whole work, three abridgments of it seem to have been early in circulation in English. Knowledge of one of them seems to have been preserved only by Monsell, 
It is given as Edmund Bunny, his Abridgment of Calvin's Institutes, translated by Edward May, London, for William Norton, 1580. The Abridgment of William Lorne, translated by C. Featherstone, appeared in Edinburgh in 1585 and again in 1587. Finally, the Aphorisms of Christian Religion, or a very compendious abridgment of M. I. Calvin's Institutions, set forth in short sentences methodically by M. I. Piscator, and now Englished according to the author's third and last edition by H. Holland, appeared at London in 1596 and was reprinted as late as 1844. Norton's translation of the whole work, early as it was, was yet almost preceded by a yet earlier one. A note from The Printers to the Readers, printed on the reverse of the title page of the edition of 1561, which is identified as Norton's only by the initials T.N., with which the last page of the book is signed, tells us of a previous translation which had been begun but was not published. Here the note in full. Quote, Whereas some men have thought and reported it to be very great negligence in us, for that we have so long kept back from you, this being so profitable a work for you, namely since Master John Dawes had translated it and delivered it into our hands more than a twelve-month past, you shall understand for our excuse in that behalf that we could not well imprint it sooner. For we have been by diverse necessary causes constrained with our earnest entreatance to procure another friend of ours to translate it whole again. This translation, we trust, you shall well allow, for it hath not only been faithfully done by the translator himself, but also hath been wholly perused by such men whose judgment and credit all the godly learned in England will know and esteem. But since it is now come forth, we pray you accept it and use it. If any faults have passed us by oversight, we beseech you, let us have your patience, as you have had our diligence. End quote. The bare allusion we are given to it rouses our curiosity why Master Dawes's translation was set aside. Certainly the preface is a model document. It seems to take the reader into full confidence, and yet says nothing derogatory to anyone. No one better fitted for the task of retranslating the book could easily have been found, at any rate, than Thomas Norton. His name appears for the first time on the title page of the third edition, while to the fourth he prefixes a nobly written preface. Quote, Thomas Norton, the translator to the reader, end quote, in which is included an account of how he was led to translate the book, of the care he took to secure a proper piece of work in the translating, and of the subsequent means adopted to perfect the printed text. After a brief account of Calvin and his purpose in the Institutes, the preface continues, quote, So great a jewel was meet to be made most beneficial, that is to say, applied to most common use. Therefore, in the very beginning of the Queen's Majesty's most blessed reign, I translated it out of Latin into English for the commodity of the Church of Christ, at the special request of my dear friends of worthy memory, Reginald Wolfe and Edward Whitchurch, the one Her Majesty's printer for the Hebrew, Greek, and Latin tongues, the other Her Highness's printer of the Books of Common Prayer. I performed my work in the house of my said friend, Edward Whitchurch, a man well known of upright heart and dealing, an ancient zealous gospeler, as plain and true a friend as ever I knew living, and as desirous to do anything to common good, especially by the advancement of true religion, end quote. He then explains why he chose the method of literal rather than of paraphrastic translation and continues, quote, in the doing hereof, I did not only trust mine own wit or ability, but examined my whole doing from sentence to sentence throughout the whole book, with conference and overlooking of such learned men as my translation being allowed by their judgment, I did both satisfy mine own conscience that I had done truly, and their approving of it might be a good warrant to the reader that nothing should herein be delivered him but sound, unmingled, and uncorrupted doctrine, even in such sort as the author himself had first framed it. All that I wrote, the grave, learned, and virtuous man, M. David Whitehead, whom I name with honourable remembrance, did, among others, compare with the Latin, examining every sentence throughout the whole book. End quote. The care taken to bring the text of the book in its new editions to greater correctness in the printing being next noted, the preface concludes thus, 
quote, thus on the printer's behalf and mine, your ease and commodity, good readers, is provided for. Now resteth your own diligence for your own profit in studying it. To spend many words in commending the work itself were needless, yet thus much, I think, I may both not untruly and not vainly say, that though many great learned men have written books of commonplaces of our religion, as Melanchthon, Sarcarius, and other, whose works are very good and profitable to the Church of God. Yet, by the consenting judgment of those that understand the same, there is none to be compared to this work of Calvin, both for his substantial sufficiency of doctrine, the sound declaration of truth in articles of our religion, the large and learned confirmation of the same, and the most deep and strong confutation of all old and new heresies, so that the Holy Scriptures accepted. This is one of the most profitable books for all students of Christian divinity. Wherein, good readers, as I am glad for the glory of God, and for your benefit, that you have this profit of my travail, so I beseech you, let me have this use of your gentleness, that my doings may be construed to such good end as I have meant them, and that if anything mislike you by reason of hardness, or any other cause that may seem to be my default, you will not forthwith condemn the work, but read it often, in which doing you will find, as many have confessed to me, that they have found by experience, that those things which at the first reading shall displease you for hardness, shall be found so easy as so hard matter would suffer, and, for the most part, more easy than some other phrase, which should, with greater looseness and smoother sliding away, deceive your understanding. I confess, indeed, it is not finely and pleasantly written, nor carrieth with it such delightful grace of speech as some great wise men have bestowed upon some foolisher things. Yet it containeth sound truth, set forth with faithful plainness, without wrong done to the author's meaning, and so, if you accept and use it, you shall not fail to have great profit thereby, and I shall think my labour very well employed." End quote. We have quoted so largely from this preface because it appears to us an admirable document, altogether worthy of its place in the forefront of the Institutes and of the hand of its author, one of the most notable figures in the literary world of his day. Born in 1532, bred to the law in which profession he gained high distinction, Thomas Norton lived on terms of intimacy with the leaders of the religious reformation in England, and did his part to further it by voice and pen. A ripe scholar, he prepared translations for some of the best books in circulation, expository of Christian truth, and sent forth a number of writings of his own. A, quote, wise, bold, and eloquent, end quote, member of Parliament, he championed there the movements that tended to the religious settlement of the land on the lines of a complete reformation. Possessed of a poetic gift, he contributed some 28 translations of psalms to Sternhold and Hopkins's collection, as well as wrought for the advancement of more secular spheres of English poetry. In every way, he seemed glad to use his high powers freely in the cause of religion. Assuredly, we will say, Calvin's Institutes was introduced by fit hands to its English public, and the excellence of the performance seems to be attested by the rapidly repeated issue of editions of the translation during the latter years of the 16th century and its long-continued hold on the religious public. It was not until the early years of the present century that Norton's was superseded by a modernized translation, that of John Allen, which appeared first in 1813. John Allen was a layman like Thomas Norton, a nonconformist schoolteacher born at Truro in Cornwall in 1771, and for thirty years master of a private school at Hackney near London where he died in 1839. His principal work was a treatise on modern Judaism, 1816, though he published also a memoir of Major General Byrne, 1815, and a translation of some sermons of D. de Saperville, 1816, and William Durham's Two Dissertations on Sacrifice, 1817. He tells us in the preface to his translation of the Institutes that one of the circumstances that led him to publish it was, quote, the recent controversy respecting Calvinism, commenced by Dr. Tomlin, the present Bishop of Lincoln, end quote. His interest in that controversy had already been shown by the anonymous publication in 1812 of a reply to Tomlin's Refutation of the Charge of Calvinism Against the Church of England, which appeared in 1811. 
Allen's book bore the title The Fathers, the Reformers and the Public Formularies of England in Harmony with Calvin and Against the Bishop of Lincoln. It does not conduce to predisposing the reader favorably to Allen's work that he speaks with scant appreciation of Norton's translation, though that perhaps was not unnatural in the preface of a work designed to supersede it. This preface is plainly written and gives an appreciative account of the book being rendered, and a statement of the translator's method of translating, which declining both, quote, a servile adherence to the letter, end quote, and, quote, a mere attention to the ideas and sentiments, aimed at a medium between civility and looseness, and endeavour to follow the style of the original as far as the respective idioms of the Latin and English would admit, end quote. If Allen is chargeable with underestimating the merits of his predecessor's work, he certainly was called on to repay his fault a hundredfold by the treatment he received at the hands of his successor, Henry Beveridge, who simply passes by Allen's translation without any mention at all. Allen's judgment on Norton's translation, however, Beveridge repeats with interest, the gravamen of his charge turning on its excessive literalness. Quote, Instead of the pure English of the period which he wrote, he remarks, the utmost he could give was English words in a Latin idiom. In this way, the translation, which must often have seemed rugged and harsh to his contemporaries, has become in great measure unfit for modern use. End quote. Beveridge, for his part, avoiding, quote, overstraining after such scrupulosity as Norton aimed at, end quote, hopes that, in his own translation, quote, the true meaning of the author has been given in plain English and so made accessible to every class of readers, End quote. Beveridge's translation was issued by the Calvin Translation Society in 1845 and has probably superseded in Britain the earlier work of Allen. Meanwhile, however, in 1841 and 1842, the Presbyterian Board of Publication at Philadelphia has stereotyped a somewhat revised edition of Allen's translation, issuing it in the Sixth American Edition, and this has accordingly become the one most accessible in America. It was brought out at the expense of the First and Second Presbyterian Churches of Baltimore, of which the Reverends John C. Bacchus and Robert J. Breckenridge were then pastors, and was introduced by a not very attractive preface written by Dr. William M. Engels, then editor of the board. How far the revision of the text extended we do not know. Dr. Engels says, quote, under the direction of the executive committee of the board, the translation has been diligently compared throughout with the original Latin and French, and various corrections have been made to convey the meaning of the author more distinctly and accurately. This laborious duty has been performed by a member of the publishing committee. End quote. This quote, member of the publishing committee end quote, was Mr. Joseph Patterson Engels. 1793 to 1861, a man of varied and high culture, master of the Classical Institute at Philadelphia from 1817 to 1845, and from 1845 to his death, publishing agent of the board. He was perhaps most widely known as the editor of an American reprint with many corrections of the so-called Polymicreon Greek New Testament, 1838 and often afterwards, and was a man who, by habits of exact accuracy and by thorough classical scholarship, was eminently fitted to correct a translation from the Latin. It is observable that all three of the later rehandlings of the English institutes plume themselves considerably on their use of the French text, treating it as a second original of equal or almost equal authority as a witness to Calvin's meaning with the Latin. Allen says, quote, after the greater part of the work had been translated, he, the translator, had the happiness to meet with an edition in French, of which he has availed himself in translating the remainder, and in the revision of what he had translated before. Every person who understands any two languages will be aware that the ambiguity of one will sometimes be explained by the precision of another, and notwithstanding the acknowledged superiority of the Latin to the French in most of the qualities which constitute the excellence of a language, the case of the article is not the only one in which Calvin's French elucidates his Latin. End quote. Beveridge says, quote, Constant use has also been made of the last French translation, revised by Calvin himself, and printed at Geneva in 1562. The Latin text is in general perfectly clear, 
and where there is a competent knowledge of the language, there is also little danger of mistaking the meaning. Ambiguities, however, do occur, and it was considered that there could not be a more legitimate and effectual mode of explaining them than to make the author his own expositor and hold the meaning to be what he himself has made in his vernacular tongue. It has already been observed that Calvin, in his translation, occasionally avails himself of his privilege as an author. Due attention has been paid to the changes thus made on the original, any difference of meaning or of expression which seemed deserving of notice being given in footnotes. In this respect, it is hoped that the present translation possesses a very decided advantage. End quote. Dr. Engels says, quote, The translation has been diligently compared throughout with the original Latin and French, End quote, etc. This use of the French, except in the earlier portion of the first book to the seventh chapter, as already pointed out, is liable to some danger when carried through uncritically. For the rest of the book, that alone is Calvin's, which has been preserved from the translation of the earlier editions. The text is composed, as Reuss puts it, quote, of fragments of the old translation, where the Latin text remains the same, although there too the changes are somewhat frequent, and a new translation of the complementary editions, which form nearly half the text. Here, he adds, we meet with not only a great number of inexactitudes, omissions, meaningless and embarrassing additions, but even passages where it is evident that the translator did not even understand the Latin text. End quote. Striking examples of this are given by Royce. It is obvious that an uncritical use of this French translation, as in all its parts of equal authority for Calvin's meaning with the Latin original, is scarcely a commendation of a translation, and we need no further evidence that, so far it was used at all, it must have been uncritically used by our English translations, than the fact that, though each of them compared the French diligently with the Latin, no one of them discovered those glaring faults in the French which render it impossible to attribute it to Calvin's own hand. It would be interesting to compare the texts of the several English translations with a view to discovering how far the later translations are really independent of the earlier and which represent the original most faithfully, clearly, and happily. We cannot undertake that task now, but we can at least give a specimen of their rendering of a typical passage from which we may perhaps catch something of the flavour of each. Here is the opening section of the treatise in its three English forms, Book 1, Chapter 1, Section 1. Norton, 1599 The whole sum in a manner, of all our wisdom, which only ought to be accounted true and perfect wisdom, consisteth in two parts, that is to say, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But whereas these two knowledges be with many bonds linked together, yet whether goeth before or engendereth the other, it is hard to discern. For, first, no man can look upon himself, but he must needs, by and by, turn all his senses to the beholding of God, in whom he liveth and is moved, because it is plain that those gifts wherewith we be endued are not of ourselves, yea, even that we have being is nothing else but an essence in that one God. Finally, by these good things that are, as by drop meal, powdered into us from heaven, we are led, as it were, by certain streams to the springhead, and so by our own neediness better appeareth that infinite plenty of good things that abideth in God, specially that miserable ruin wherein to the fall of the first man hath thrown us, compelleth us to lift up our eyes, not only being foodless and hungry, to crave from thence that which we lack, but also being awakened with fear to learn humility. For as there is found in man a certain world of all miseries, and since we have been spoiled of the divine apparel, our shameful nakedness discloseth an infinite heap of filthy disgracements. It must needs be that every man be pricked with knowledge in conscience of his own unhappiness to make him come at the least unto some knowledge of God. So, by the understanding of our ignorance, vanity, beggary, weakness, perverseness, and corruption, we learn to renowledge that nowhere else but in the Lord abideth the true light of wisdom, sound virtue, perfect abundance of all good things, and purity of righteousness. And so, by our own evils, we are stirred to consider the good things of God, and we cannot earnestly aspire toward him, until we begin to mislike ourselves. For of all men, 
what one is there that would not willingly rest in himself? Yea, who doth not rest so long as he knoweth not himself, that is to say, so long as he is contented with his own gifts, and ignorant or unmindful of his own misery. Therefore every man is by the knowledge of himself not only pricked forward to seek God, but also led, as it were, by the hand to find him. Allen, 1813 True and substantial wisdom principally consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. But while these two branches of knowledge are so intimately connected, which of them precedes and produces the other, it is not easy to discover. For in the first place, no man can take a survey of himself, but he must immediately turn to the contemplation of God, in whom he lives and moves. Since it is evident that the talents which we possess are not from ourselves, and that our very existence is nothing but a subsistence in God alone. These bounties, distilling to us by drops from heaven, form, as it were, so many streams conducting us to the fountainhead. Our poverty conduces to a clearer display of the infinite fullness of God, especially the miserable ruin into which we have been plunged by the defection of the first man, compels us to raise our eyes towards heaven, not only as hungry and famished, to seek thence a supply for our wants, but aroused with fear to learn humility. For since man is subject to a world of miseries, and has been spoiled of his divine array, this melancholy exposure discovers an immense mass of deformity. Every one, therefore, must be so impressed with a consciousness of his own infelicity as to arrive at some knowledge of God. Thus a sense of our ignorance, vanity, poverty, infirmity, depravity, and corruption leads us to perceive and acknowledge that in the Lord alone are to be found true wisdom, solid strength, perfect goodness, and unspotted righteousness. And so, by our imperfections, we are excited to a consideration of the perfections of God. Nor can we really aspire towards Him till we have begun to be displeased with ourselves, for who would not gladly rest satisfied with Himself? Whereas the man not actually absorbed in self-complacency while he remains unacquainted with his true situation, or content with his own endowments and ignorant or forgetful of his own misery. The knowledge of ourselves, therefore, is not only an incitement to seek after God, but likewise a considerable assistance towards finding him. Beveridge, 1845 Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God, and of ourselves. But, as these are connected together by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the two proceeds and gives birth to the other. For in the first place no man can survey himself without forthwith turning his thoughts towards the God in whom he lives and moves, because it is perfectly obvious that the endowments which we possess cannot possibly be from ourselves. Nay, that our very being is nothing else than subsistence in God alone, in the second place, those blessings which unceasingly distill to us from heaven are like streams conducting us to the fountain. Here, again, the infinitude of good which resides in God becomes more apparent from our poverty. In particular, the miserable ruin into which the revolt of the first man hath plunged us compels us to turn our eyes upwards, not only that while hungry and famishing we may thence ask what we want, but, being aroused by fear, we may learn humility. For, as there exists in man something like a world of misery, and ever since we were stripped of the divine attire, our naked shame discloses an immense series of disgraceful properties, every man being stung by the consciousness of his own unhappiness, in this way necessarily obtains at least some knowledge of God. Thus our feeling of ignorance, vanity, want, weakness, in short, depravity and corruption, reminds us that in the Lord, and none but he, dwell the true light of wisdom, solid virtue, exuberant goodness. We are accordingly urged by our own evil things to consider the good things of God, and indeed we cannot aspire to him in earnest until we have begun to be displeased with ourselves, for what man is not disposed to rest in himself? who, in fact, does not thus rest so long as he is unknown to himself, that is, so long as he is contented with his own endowments and unconscious or unmindful of his misery. Every person, therefore, on coming to the knowledge of himself, is not only urged to seek God, but is also led as by the hand to find him. 
So far as one may judge from so brief an extract, it would seem that Allen's version is entirely independent of Norton's, and that Beveridge worked with his predecessor's versions before him, indeed, but with a conscious effort to give a fresh rendering of the original. Any one of the three would appear to provide a plain and sufficiently clear and faithful rendering of the original, while the perfect version, or the version which in any degree conveys the sense of delight and satisfaction with which Calvin's Latin affects the reader, is yet to seek. Meanwhile, the original itself is doubtless to be technically described as out of print. Copies of the numerous early editions are still to be had in the second-hand shops, among which the beautiful Elsevier edition of 1654 is especially sought after. And the admirable edition of Baum, Kunitz and Reuss, forming the 29th and 30th volumes of the Corpus Reformatorum, published at Brunswick by Schwetzke and Son, 1863-1864, may still be purchased separately and supplies to the scholar all that he can ask laying before him, as it does separately, the texts of the first edition, of the middle editions, and of the final edition, cared for by Calvin, provided with every means possible to conceive of, to render their comparison easy and profitable. But the excellent edition of Tollock, Berlin, Wilhelm Thoma, 1834, second edition, 1846, remains the latest hand edition which has left the press. End of The Literary History of Calvin's Institutes Part 2 by B.B. Warfield God Our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the opening sentence of the very first of Paul's letters which have come down to us, and that is as much as to say, in the very first sentence which, as far as we know, he ever wrote, he makes use of a phrase in speaking of the Christian's God, which at once attracts our interested attention. According to the generous way he had of thinking and speaking of his readers at the height of their professions, he describes the church at Thessalonica as living and moving and having its being in God. But, as it was a Christian church which he was addressing, He does not content himself in this description with the simple term God. He uses the compound phrase God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Thessalonians, he says, because they were Christians, lived and moved and had their being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is quite clear that this compound phrase was not new on Paul's lips, coined for this occasion. It bears on its face the evidence of a long and familiar use by which it had been worn down to its bare bones. All the articles have been rubbed off, and with them all other accessories, and it stands out in its boldest elements as just God Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Plainly, we have here a mode of speaking of the Christian's God which was customary with Paul. We are not surprised, therefore, to find this phrase repeated in precisely the same connection in the opening verses of the next letter which Paul wrote, to Thessalonians, with only the slight variation that an hour is inserted with God the Father, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The significance of this variation is probably that, although it is a customary formula which is being repeated, it has not hardened into a mechanically repeated series of mere words, It is used with such lively consciousness of its full meaning and with such slight variations of wording from time to time as the circumstances of each case or perhaps the mere emotional movement of the moment suggested. This free handling of what is, nevertheless, clearly in essence a fixed formula is sharply illustrated by a third instance of its occurrence. Paul uses it again in the opening sentence of the third letter which he wrote, that to the Galatians. Here it is turned, however, end to end, while yet preserving all its essential elements, and is set in such a context as to throw its fundamental meaning into very strong emphasis. Paul was called upon to defend to the Galatians the validity of his apostleship, and he characteristically takes occasion to assert, in the very first words which he wrote to them, that he received it from no human source, no, nor even through any human intermediation, but directly from God. The way he does this is to announce himself as an apostle, not from men, neither through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who, he adds, raised him from the dead. 
The effect of the addition of these last words is to throw the whole emphasis of the clause on Jesus Christ. Even God the Father is defined in relation to him. Yet the whole purpose of the sentence is to assert the divine origin of Paul's apostleship in strong contrast with any possible human derivation of it. Clearly, the phrase Jesus Christ and God the Father denotes something purely divine. It is, in effect, a Christian periphrasis for God. And in this Christian periphrasis for God, the name of Jesus Christ takes no subordinate place. It will conduce to our better apprehension of the nature and implications of this Christian periphrasis for God, which Paul employs in the opening words of each of the first three of his epistles, if we set side by side the actual words in which it is placed in these three instances. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, En theopatri ke curio Iesu Christo 2 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, En theopatri emon ke curio Iesu Christo Galatians 1.1 1, 1, Thea Iesu Christo ke theopatros to egirantos afton ek necron it is not, however, merely or chiefly in these three instances that Paul uses this Christian periphrasis for God. It is the Apostle's custom to bring the address which he prefixes to each of his letters to a close in a formal prayer that the fundamental Christian blessings of grace and peace, or in the letters to Timothy, grace, mercy and peace, may be granted to his readers. In this prayer, he regularly employs this periphrasis to designate the divine being to whom the prayer is offered. It fails to appear in this opening prayer in two only of his thirteen letters, and its failure to appear in these two is useful in fixing its meaning in the other eleven. It is quite clear that Paul intends to say the same thing in all thirteen instances. They differ only in the fullness with which he expresses his identical meaning. When he says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, only grace to you and peace, he is not expressing a mere wish. He is invoking the divine being in prayer, and his mind is as fully on him as if he had formally named him. And when he names this divine being, whom he is invoking in this prayer, in Colossians 1-2, God our Father, grace to you and peace from God our Father, his meaning is precisely the same as when he names him in the companion letter, Ephesians 1-2, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ or a similar prayer at the end of the same letter, Ephesians 6.23, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace to the brethren and love, along with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In every instance, Paul is invoking the divine being and only the divine being. Once he leaves that to be understood from the nature of the case. Once he names this being simply God the Father. In the other eleven instances, he gives him the conjunct name, which ordinarily takes the form of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously employing a formula which had become habitual with him in such formal prayers. That we may see at a glance how clear it is that Paul is here making use of a fixed formula in his designation of the Christian's God, and may observe at the same time the amount of freedom which he allows himself in repeating it in these very formal prayers, we bring together the series of these opening prayers in the chronological order of the epistles in which they occur. 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, Charis umon ke irene. 2 Thessalonians 1.2, Charis umon ke irene apotheu patros ke curio Iesu Christo. Galatians 1.3, Charis umin ke irene apotheu patros emon ke curio Iesu Christo. 1 Corinthians 1.3, Charis umin ke irene apotheu patros emon Ke curio Iesu Christo. 2 Corinthians 1 2. Charis umin ke irene apotheu patrosemon ke curio Iesu Christo. Romans 1 7. Charis umin ke irene apotheu patrosemon ke curio Iesu Christo. Ephesians 1 2. Charis umin ke irene apotheu patrosemon ke curio Iesu Christo. Ephesians 6.23, Irene tus adephus ke agape meta pisteos apo theo patros ke curio Iesu Christo. Colossians 1.2, Charis umin ke Irene apo theo patros emon. Philemon 3, Charis umin 
ke Irene apothe upatrosemon ke kuriu Jesu Christu. Philippians 1, 2 Charisu min ke Irene apothe upatrosemon ke Christu Jesu tu kuriu emon. Titus 1, 4 Charis ke Irene apothe upatros ke Christu Jesu tu soteros emon. 2 Timothy 1, 2 Charis Elios Irene apotheu patros ke Christu Iesu tu curiu emon. Alfred Zeeberg, seeking evidence of the survival of old Christian formulas in the literature of the New Testament, very naturally fixes on these passages and argues that we have here a combination of the names of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, which Paul found already in use in the Christian community when he attached himself to it, and which he took over from it. It is a hard saying when Ernst von Dobschütz professes himself ready to concede that Paul received this combination of names from his predecessors, but sharply denies that he received it as a fixed formula. One would have supposed it to lie on the face of Paul's use of it that he was repeating a formula. While it might be disputed whether it was a formula of his own making or he had adopted it from others, it goes to show that it was not invented by Paul, that it is found not only in other connections in Paul's writings, as we have seen, but also in other New Testament books besides his. James 1.1 1, 1, Theu ke curio Iesu Christu lulos. 2 Peter 1.2 En epignosi to Theu ke Iesu tu curio emon. 2 John 3 Este methemon charis elios irene para theo patros ke para Iesu Christu tu uiu tu patros. In the presence of these passages, it is difficult to deny that we have, in the closely knit conjunction of these two divine names, part of the established phraseology of primitive Christian religious speech. It would not be easy to exaggerate the closeness with which the two names are knit together in this formula. The two persons brought together are not, to be sure, absolutely identified. They remain two persons, to each of whom severally they may be ascribed to activities in which the other does not share. In Galatians 1.1 1, 1, we read of Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. In Galatians 1.3 we read of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. The epithets by which they are described, moreover, are distinctive. The Father, our Father, the Lord, our Lord, our Saviour. There is no obscuration, then, of the peculiarities of the personalities brought together, but their equalization is absolute, and short of thoroughgoing identification of persons, the unity expressed by their conjunction seems to be complete. How complete this unity is may be illustrated by another series of passages. J.B. Lightfoot has called attention to the symmetrical structure of the two epistles to the Thessalonians. Each is divided into two parts— Quote, the first part being chiefly narrative and explanatory, and the second hortatory, end quote, and each of these parts closes with a prayer introduced by Aftosthe, followed by the divine name, a construction not found elsewhere in these epistles. Clearly there is a formal art at work here, and it will repay us to bring together the opening words of the four prayers, including the designations by which God is invoked in each. 1 Thessalonians 3.11 Aftos de o theos ke patere mon ke o curios mon Iesus. 2 Thessalonians 5.23 Aftos de o theos des Irenes. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 Aftos de o curios mon Iesus Christos ke o theos o patere mon o agapesas emas ke dus paraklesin eonian ke elpida agathen en chariti. 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Aftos de o curios des irenes. It is remarkable how illuminating the mere conjunction of these passages is. Taking 1 Thessalonians 3.11 in isolation, we might wonder whether we ought to read it, God himself, even our Father and our Lord Jesus, or our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus, or our God and Father and our Lord Jesus himself. So taking it in isolation, we might hesitate whether we should construe 2 Thessalonians 2.16, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, or our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father himself. 
The commentators accordingly divide themselves among these views, each urging reasons which scarcely seem convincing for his choice. But so soon as we bring the passages together, it becomes clear that the aftos is to be construed with the whole subject following it in every case, and thus a solid foundation is put beneath the opinion arrived at on other grounds by Martin de Belius, Ernst von Dobschütz, and J. A. Frame that in 1 Thessalonians 3.11 and 2 Thessalonians 2.16 the aftos binds together the two subjects, God and the Lord, as the conjunct object of Paul's prayer. The four prayers are in every sense of the word parallel. The petition is substantially the same in all. It cannot be imagined that the being to whom the several prayers are addressed was consciously envisaged as different. Paul is, in every case, simply bringing his heart's desire for his converts before his God. Yet in describing the God before whom he lays his petition, he fairly exhausts the possibilities of variety of designation which the case affords. As a result, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ could not be more indissolubly knit together as essentially one. Both are mentioned in two of the addresses, but the order in which they are mentioned is reversed from one to the other, and all the predicates in both instances are cast in the single number. In the other two addresses, only one is named, but it is a different one in each case, although an identical epithet is attributed to them both. We learn thus not only that Paul prays indifferently to God and to the Lord in precisely the same way, for precisely the same things and with precisely the same attitude of mind and heart expressed in identical epithets, but also that he prays thus indifferently to God or the Lord separately and to God and the Lord together. And when he prays to the two together, he does all that it is humanly possible to do to make it clear that he is thinking of them not as two but as one interchanging the names so that they stand indifferently in the order God and the Lord or the Lord and God. He binds them together in a single self, and then, proceeding with his prayer, he construes this double subject, thus bound together in a single self, in both cases alike with a singular verb. Now our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, who loved us, himself, he prays, may he comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Now our God and Father, and Lord Jesus himself, he prays again, may he direct our way unto you. And then he proceeds immediately, continuing the prayer, but now with only one name, though obviously with no change in the being addressed. And may the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and towards all men. If it was with any difference of consciousness that Paul addressed God or the Lord, or God and the Lord together in his prayers, He certainly has taken great pains to obscure that fact. If he had intended to show plainly that to him God and the Lord were so one that God and the Lord conjoined were still one to his consciousness, he could scarcely have found more effective means of doing so. There is probably no instance in all Paul's epistles where God and the Lord are mentioned together that they are construed with a plural adjective or verb. We should not pass without notice that it is in the passages from 2 Thessalonians that Okurios is given relative prominence. In the two passages from 1 Thessalonians, Otheos comes forward, while in those from 2 Thessalonians it is Okurios. That is, in accordance with the general character of 2 Thessalonians, which is distinctively a Kurios epistle. Proportionately to the lengths of the two epistles, while Theos occurs about equally often in each, Kurios occurs about twice as often in the second as in the first. We do not pause to inquire into the causes of this superior prominence of Kurios in two Thessalonians, although it may be worth remarking in passing that in both epistles it is relatively prominent in the hortatory portions. Whatever, however, may have been the particular causes which brought about the result in this case, the result is in itself one which could not have been brought about if Theos and Curios had not stood in the consciousness of Paul in virtual equality as designations of deity. For the phenomenon amounts at its apex, as we see in the four passages more particularly before us, to the simple replacement of Theos by Curios as the designation of deity. And that means at bottom that Paul knows no difference between Theos and Kurios in point of rank. They are both to him designations of deity, 
and the discrimination by which the one is applied to the Father and the other to Christ is, so far, merely a convention by which two that are God are supplied with differentiating appellations by means of which they may be intelligibly spoken of severally. With respect to the substance of the matter, there seems no reason why the Father might not just as well be called Kyrios and Christ Theos. Whether the convention by which the two appellations are assigned respectively to the Father as Theos and to Christ as Kyrios is ever broken by Paul is a question of little intrinsic importance, but nevertheless of some natural interest. It is probable that Paul never, not only in these epistles to the Thessalonians, but throughout his epistles, employs Kyrios of the Father. The term seems to appear uniformly in his writings, except in a few, not all, quotations from the Old Testament as a designation of Christ. Thus, the Old Testament divine name Kyrios, Jehovah, is appropriated exclusively to Christ, and that in repeated instances, even when the language of the Old Testament is adduced, which Paul carries over to and applies to Christ as the Lord there spoken of. The question whether Paul ever applies the term Theos to Christ is brought sharply before us by the form in which the formula, the use of which we are particularly investigating, occurs in 2 Thessalonians 1.12. There we read of Paul's constant prayer that our God should count his readers worthy of their calling and fulfill with reference to them every good pleasure of goodness and work of faith with power, to the end that the name of our Lord Jesus might be glorified in them, and they in him, kata ten charin to theo emon ke curio iesu Christo. It will probably be allowed that, in strictness of grammatical rule rigidly applied, this should mean, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, or, if we choose so to phrase it, according to the grace of our God, even the Lord Jesus Christ. All sorts of reasons are advanced, however, why the strict grammatical rule should not be rigidly applied here. Most of them are ineffective enough and testify only to the reluctance of expositors to acknowledge that Paul can speak of Christ as God. This reluctance is ordinarily given expression either in the simple empirical remark that it is not in accordance with the usage of Paul to call Christ God, or in the more far-reaching assertion that it is contrary to Paul's doctrinal system to represent Christ as God. Thus, for example, W. Bornemann comments briefly, quote, in themselves, these words might be so taken as to call Jesus here both God and Lord. That is, however, improbable according to the Pauline usage elsewhere. End quote. This mild statement is particularly interesting as a recession from the strong ground taken by G. Lunemann, whose commentary on the Thessalonian epistles in the Maya series, Bonemann's superseded. Lunemann argues the question at some length, and one might almost say with some heat. Quote, According to Hofmann and Regenbach, he writes, Christ is here named both our God and our Lord, an interpretation which, indeed, grammatically is no less allowable than the interpretation of the doxology, Romans 9, 5, as an apposition to Christos, but is equally inadmissible as it would contain an un-Pauline thought, on account of which also Hegenfeld, Zeitschrift für die wissenschaftliche Theologie, Halle, 1862, page 264, in the interest of the supposed spuriousness of the epistle, has forthwith appropriated to himself this discovery of Hofmann. End quote. Ernst von Dobschütz, who has superseded Bornemann as Bornemann superseded Lunemann, is as sure as Lunemann that it is unpauline to call Christ God, but as he is equally sure that this passage does call Christ God, he has no alternative but to deny the passage to Paul, though he prefers to deny to him only this passage and not, like Hilgenfeld, the whole epistle. Quote, but an entirely unpauline trait meets us here, he writes, that to Dotheuemon there is added Ke curio iasu Christo, not that the combination God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is not original Pauline, see on 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, but that what stands here must be translated of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, as Hofmann and Wollenberg rightly maintain. This, however, is in very fact in the highest degree un-Pauline, Lunemann, 
in spite of Romans 9.5 and has its parallel only in Titus 2.13 of our great God and Saviour Christ Jesus or in 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 11 of our God, Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. End quote. H. J. Holtzmann, as is his wont, sums up the whole contention crisply. Quote, in the entire compass of the Pauline literature, only 2 Thessalonians 1.12 and Titus 2.13 supply two equally exegetically uncertain parallels, end quote, to Romans 9.5, while in Ephesians 4.6, God the Father is o epipanton, end quote. It is manifest that reasoning of this sort runs great risk of merely begging the question. The precise point under discussion is whether Paul does ever or could ever speak of Christ as God. This passage is offered in evidence that he both can and does. It is admitted that there are other passages which may be adduced in the same sense. There is Romans 9.5, which everyone allows to be Paul's own. There is Titus 2.13, which occurs in confessedly, distinctively Pauline literature. There is Acts 20.28, credibly attributed to Paul by one of his pupils. There is 2 Peter 1.1, to show that the usage was not unknown to other of the New Testament letter writers. It is scarcely satisfactory to say that all these passages are as exegetically uncertain as 2 Thessalonians 1.12 itself. This exegetical uncertainty is in each case imposed upon the passage by reluctance to take it in the sense which it most naturally bears, and which is exegetically immediately given. It is as exegetically certain, for example, as anything can be purely exegetically certain, that in Romans 9.5 Paul calls Christ roundly God over all. It is scarcely to be doubted that this would be universally recognized if Romans could with any plausibility be denied to Paul, or even could be assigned to a date subsequent to that of, say, Colossians. The equivalent may be said of each of the other passages, mutatis mutandis. The reasoning is distinctly circular, which denies to each of these passages in turn its natural meaning on the ground of lack of supporting usage, when this lack of supporting usage is created by a similar denial on the same ground of its natural meaning to each of the other passages. The ground of the denial in each case is merely the denial in the other cases. Meanwhile, the usage is there and is not thus to be denied away. If it may be, any usage whatever may be destroyed in the same manner. In these circumstances, there seems no reason why the ordinary laws of grammar should not determine our understanding of 2 Thessalonians 1.12. We may set it down here, therefore, with its parallels in Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1, in which the same general phrasing even more clearly carries this sense. 2 Thessalonians 1.12 Den charin to theuemon ke curio esu Christu. Titus 2.13 Ke epiphanian des doxes to mechalo theu ke sotera semon Christu esu. 2 Peter 1.1 Pistin en digiosune to theuemon in these passages, the conjunction in which God and Christ are brought together in the general formula which we are investigating reaches its culmination in an express identification of them. We have seen that the two are not only united in this formula on terms of complete equality, but are treated as in some sense one. Grammatically, at least, they constitute one self, aftos, and they are presented in nearly every phraseology possible as the common source of Christian blessing and the unitary object of Christian prayer. Their formal identification would seem after this to be a matter of course, and we may be a little surprised that the recognition of it should be so strenuously resisted. The explanation is no doubt to be sought in the consideration that so long as this formal identification is not acknowledged to be expressly made, those who find difficulty in believing that Christ is included by Paul in the actual Godhead may feel the way more or less open to explain away, by one expedient or another, the identity of the two, manifoldly implied in the general representation indeed, but not formally announced. Expositor after expositor, at any rate, may be observed introducing into his reproduction of Paul's simple equalization, or rather unification of God and the Lord, 
qualifying phrases of his own which tend to adjust them to his personal way of thinking of the relations subsisting between the two. C. J. Ellicott already found occasion to rebuke this practice in G. Lunemann and A. Koch. The former explains that Paul conjoins Christ with God in his prayers because, according to Paul's conception, quote, see Usteri, Lehrbuch, 2, 2.4, page 315, end quote, Christ, as sitting at the right hand of God, has a part in the government of the world. The latter, going further, asserts that Paul brings the two together only because he regards Christ, quote, as the wisdom and power of God, end quote. Few expositors entirely escape the temptation to go thus beyond what is written. It is most common, perhaps, to follow the path in which Lunemann walks, and to declare that Paul unites the two persons because Christ, by his exaltation, has been made for the time co-regnant with God over the universe, or perhaps only over the church. Quite frequently, however, it is asserted, more like Koch, that the unity instituted between them amounts merely to a unity of will, or even only to a harmony of operation. At the best, it is explained that our Lord is placed by the side of God only because it is through him as intermediary that the blessings which have their source in God are received or are to be sought. An especially flagrant example of the substitution of quite alien phraseology for Paul's, in a professed restatement of his conception, is afforded by David Somerville in his Cunningham Lectures on St. Paul's Conception of Christ. He tells us that Paul's, quote, conjunction of God and Christ in his stated greetings to the churches indicated his belief that a co-partnership of divine power and honor was included in the exaltation of Christ to be Lord, end quote. It obviously smacks, however, much less of Paul than of Sosinus to speak of the relation of Christ to God as a, quote, co-partnership of divine power and honor, end quote, and of this co-partnership of divine power and honor between them as resulting from Christ becoming Lord by his exaltation. Benjamin Jowett, with that fine condescension frequently exhibited by the, quote, emancipated, end quote, remarks on Chrysostom's comment on Galatians 1.3, quote, this is the mind not of the apostolic but of the Nicene age, end quote. He does not stay to consider that the mind of his own age and coterie may in such a matter be as much further removed than that of the Nicene age from the mind of the apostolic age in substance as it is in time. Nevertheless, it may be admitted that even the Nicene commentators were prone to read their own conceptions of the relations of Christ to God explanatorily into Paul's simple equation of them. Athanasius appeals, as he was thoroughly entitled to do, to Paul's conjunction of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as the common source of grace and the common object of prayer against the Arian contention that the Father and the Son are concordant indeed in will, but not one in being. In the eleventh section of the third of his orations against the Arians, he gives expression to this appeal thus, quote, Therefore also, as we said just now, when the Father gives grace and peace, the Son also gives it, as Paul signifies in every epistle, writing, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For one and the same grace is from the Father in the Son, as the light of the sun and the radiance is one, and as the sun's illumination is effective through the radiance, and so when he prays for the Thessalonians in saying, Now God, even the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ himself, may he direct our way unto you. He has guarded the unity of the Father and of the Son. For he has not said, May they direct, as of a double grace given from two, from this and that, but may he direct, to show that the Father gives it through the Son. End quote. This is not to emphasize the unity of the Father and the Son more strongly than Paul does. It is only to repeat Paul's testimony to their unity. But Athanasius cannot repeat Paul's testimony to their unity without interpolating his own conception of the manner in which this unity is to be conceived. One and the same grace comes to us from the Father and the Son. He gives us to understand because the grace of the Father comes to us in the Son. One and the same prayer is addressed to the Father and the Son, because whatever the Father gives, he gives through the Son. This explanation is interpolated into Paul's language. Paul places God and the Lord absolutely side by side, 
as joint source of the blessings he seeks for his readers, addresses his prayers for benefits he desires for his readers to them in common, treats them in a word as one. Athanasius's explanations are, of course, not as gross interpolations into the text as Arius's, but they are no less real interpolations. The outstanding fact governing Paul's collocation of God and the Lord is that he makes no discrimination between them whatever, but treats them as a unity. This is well brought out in the remarks of Chrysostom, on which Jowett had his eye when he accused him of intruding a Nicene meaning on the text. These remarks are on the prepositions in Galatians 1.1 and Romans 1.7. Had Paul written in the former of these passages, says Chrysostom, either through Jesus Christ or through God the Father alone, the Arians would have had their explanation of his having done so in the interests of some essential distinction between the Father and the Son. But Paul, quote, leaves no opening for such a cavil by mentioning at once both the Son and the Father and making the language apply to both. This he does, he adds, not as referring the acts of the Son to the Father, but to show that the expression implies no distinction of essence, end quote. On Romans 1.7, he remarks similarly on the use of from with both the Father and the Son. Quote, For he did not say, Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, but from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. There is no imposing of a Nicene sense on Paul's language here. There is a simple reflection, as in a clear mirror, of the exact sense of the texts in hand, with an emphasis of their underlying implication of oneness between God and the Lord. We are constantly pointed to 1 Corinthians 8.6, to be sure, as in some way supplying a warrant for supposing an unexpressed subordinationism to be hidden beneath the surface of all of Paul's equalizations of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is exceedingly difficult, however, to see how this passage can be made to supply such a warrant. It lies open to the sight of all, of course, that in it the one God the Father and the one Lord Jesus Christ, who are included in the one only God that, it is understood by all, alone exists, are differentiated by the particular relations in which the first and the second creations alike are said to stand to them severally. All things are said to be of God the Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are said to be unto the one and by means of the other. These characterizations are, of course, not made at random, and it is right to seek diligently for their significance. It would doubtless be easy, however, to press such prepositional distinctions too far, as such passages as Romans 11.36 and Colossians 1.16 may advise us. Perhaps it would not be wrong to say that they are to be taken rather eminently than exclusively. What it is at the moment especially important that we observe, however, is that they concern the relations of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ ad extra, and say nothing, whatever, of their relations to one another. With respect to their relations to one another, what the passage tells us is that they are both embraced in that one God, which, it is declared with great emphasis, alone exists. We must not permit to fall out of sight that the whole passage is dominated by the clear-cut assertion that there is no God but one, verse 4 and the end. Of this assertion, the words now particularly before us, verse 6b, are the positive side of an explication and proof, verse 5, rar. And the thing for us distinctly to note is that Paul explicates the assertion that there is no God but one by declaring as if that were quite ad rem, that Christians know but one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ. There meets us here, again, we perceive, as underlying and giving its force to this assertion, the precise formula we have been having under consideration. And it meets us after a fashion which brings very strikingly to our attention once more that when Paul says God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he has in mind not two gods, much less two beings of equal dignity, a god and a demigod, or a god and a mere creature, but just one god. Though Christians have one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ, they know but one only God. The essential meaning of the passage is wholly unaffected by the question whether in the words there is no God but one at the end of verse 4 we have Paul's own language or that of his Corinthian correspondence repeated by him. We may read the verse if we choose, perhaps ought to, Concerning the meats offered to idols, then, 
We are perfectly well aware that, as you say, there is no idol in the world, and there is no God but one. Still, the assertion that there is no God but one rules the succeeding verses, which, introduced as its justification, become, in effect, a reiteration of it. There is no God but one, for, for, although there are indeed so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are gods aplenty and lords aplenty, yet for us there is one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, this can mean nothing else than that the one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ of the Christians is just the one only God which exists. To attempt to make it mean anything else is to stultify the whole argument. You cannot prove that only one God exists by pointing out that you yourself have two. We are referred, it is true, to the declaration that the heathen have not only many gods but also many lords, and we are bidden to see in their one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ a parallel among the Christians to this state of affairs among the heathen. And then we are further instructed that it is only fair to suppose that Paul felt some difference in grade between the gods and lords of the heathen, and in paralleling the two objects of Christian worship with them respectively, intended to intimate a discrimination in rank between God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. On this ground, we are then asked to conclude that Paul does not range the Lord Jesus Christ here along with God the Father within the Godhead, but adjoins him to God the Father as an additional and inferior object of reverence placed distinctly as Lord outside the category of God. This whole construction, however, is purely artificial and has no standing ground in the world of realities. There is no evidence that the heathen discriminated between the designations God and Lord in point of dignity to the disadvantage of the other. This, at the end of the day, has to be admitted by both Johannes Weiss and W. Busset, who yet urge that Paul must be supposed to presuppose such a distinction here. Paul, however, intimates in no way at all that he felt any such distinction on his part. On the contrary, he includes the gods many and lords many of the heathen without question in their so-called gods on equal terms. Least of all, is it possible to separate off one God the Father from its fellow, one Lord Jesus Christ, linked to it immediately by the simple and, and make the former alone refer back to the there is no God but one. Paul obviously includes both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ within this one only God whom alone he and his readers alike recognize as existing. It would void his whole argument if Jesus Christ were conceived of as a second and inferior object of worship outside the limits of the one only God. The thing which above all others the passage says plainly is that the acknowledgement by Christians of one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ accords with the fundamental postulate that there is no God but one. And that can mean nothing else than that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ together make one God. So far from this passage throwing itself athwart the implications of the repeated employment by Paul, as by others of the writers of the New Testament, of the formula in which God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are conjoined as the one object of Christian prayer and source of Christian blessings, it brings a notable support to them. It supplies what is, in effect, an explicit assertion of the fact on which this formula implicitly proceeds. It declares that the one God of the Christians includes in his being both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians acknowledge but one God, and these are the one God which Christians acknowledge. Something of the same thing that Paul expresses by this conjunction of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, John expresses in his own phraseology by the conjunction of the Father and the Son, as in 1 John 2.14. If what you heard from the beginning abide in you, you also shall abide in the Son and the Father. Or 2 John 9 in the reverse order, he that abideth in the teaching, the same hath the Father and the Son. As well as in 2 John 3, already quoted, Grace, mercy, peace shall be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. It is true, but not adequate, to say that John never thinks of Christ apart from God and never thinks of God apart from Christ. With him, to have the Son is to have the Father also, and to have the Father is to have the Son also. The two are as inseparable in fact as in thought. The terminology is different, but the idea is the same as that which underlies Paul's unification of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Clearly, the suggestions of this formula carry us into the midst not only of Paul's Christology but of his conception of God, which obviously is not simple. Short of this, they bring us face to face with two matters of great preliminary importance to the correct apprehension of Paul's doctrines of Christ and of God, which have been much discussed of late, not always very illuminatingly. We mean the matters of the significance of the title Lord, which is so richly applied to Christ in the New Testament writings, and of the meaning of the adoration of Christ, which is everywhere reflected in these writings. We must deny ourselves the pleasure of following out these suggestions here. It must content us for the moment to have pointed out a line of approach to the correct understanding of these great matters, which surely cannot be neglected in any earnest attempt to reach the truth concerning them, and which, if not neglected, will certainly conduct us to very high conclusions in regard to them. End of God Our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ by B.B. Warfield The Appearance of the Risen Jesus to All the Apostles by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1 Corinthians 15.7 The reasons that are assigned by the commentators, for example by Meyer, for taking the all of verse 8 as masculine and referring it back to the apostles of verse 7 seem decisive. But if Paul says here, then to all the apostles, last of all of them, however to me, two corollaries appear to follow. 1. The last of all is subordinate to, not coordinate with, the epita of verse 7, and thus the chain epita epita eschaton panton is broken and the argument from it that the Apostle is giving a chronological list of the appearances of Jesus fails. The series of Epita Epita would be appropriate in any enumeration on any scheme. Compare chapter 12 verse 28. 2. The appearance of Jesus to Paul is contained in the appearance to all the Apostles of verse 7, and thus a suspicion is raised that verse 7 is not intended to assert an appearance to the Apostles collectively but rather an appearance to them distributively. Not one appearance to twelve men, but twelve appearances massed together in a single statement. Do the other contextual hints support so unexpected a result? The position of the pasin in verse 7 is certainly in its favour. Compare 1 Corinthians 7 verse 17, Romans 12 4, chapter 16 verse 16. Jelf's Grammar, section 4541. The confusing change from the tus dodeca of verse 5 to the tus apostolus of verse 7, which has troubled the commentators, would be thus explained. The strong declaration of the apostle that the appearance to the 500, ephapax, was a single appearance, is explained. And finally, the repetition of the pasin of verse 7, in the Panton of verse 8, and of the Apostolus, in the Apostolon of verse 9, and the Echinu of verse 11, all favor the distributive sense of Pasin. If such an understanding of the passage be deemed the legitimate one, we learn thus incidentally of several appearances of the risen Jesus not elsewhere recorded. Compare Acts 1.3, and a new point is given to such a passage as 1 Corinthians 9.1. Did each apostle receive then a special and personal visitation from the risen Lord? End of the appearance of the risen Jesus to all the apostles by B. B. Warfield Review of Christologies Ancient and Modern by B. B. Warfield this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christologies Ancient and Modern by William Sanday, D.D., L.L.D., Lit. D., Lady Margaret Professor and Canon of Christ Church, Oxford, Honourable Fellow of Exeter College, Fellow of the British Academy, Chaplain in Ordinary to the King, Oxford University Press, American Branch, 1910. Octavo, pages 8 to 246. 
Publicity is one of the striking characteristics of our times. Our village improvement societies demanding the removal of all fences are but a symbol of a universal temper. Perhaps Dr. Sande is the first scholar, however, who has deliberately elected to do his studying in the public view. He has, as it were, knocked down the walls of his study and, taking his seat in the open, invited all that pass by to observe him writing his great book on the life of Christ. It is pleasant to be taken thus into a great scholar's confidence, and we have all profited by the series of charmingly written volumes in which Dr. Sande has laid before us the processes of his preliminary studies for his great task. The volume now before us, he tells us, is probably the last of these, and it does not yield in interest to either of its predecessors. We confess, however, to a certain decrease in the interest with which we look forward to the work to which they lead up, as we have read one after the other of these preliminary studies. They pass in review a great mass of modern research, and whatever they touch upon they illuminate. It would be difficult to find a more sympathetic survey of the recent literature of gospel criticism or a more useful guide to the intricacies of modern constructions of the person of Christ. But it is possible for width of sympathy itself to become a snare, and there are other qualities than breadth of importance to a teacher of fundamental religious truth, and it is not strange that the term latitudinarianism has ever acquired an evil connotation. As we have re-read, one after the other, Dr. Sande's preliminary studies, while our admiration of the extent of his learning and the clearness of his comprehension of the currents of recent thought has steadily grown, misgivings have grown with it of the firmness of his grasp on the fundamental problems which must underlie and give its body to a life of Christ, which would do justice to the deposit of faith. It was distinctly not reassuring to observe the nature of the hospitality which he accorded in the earliest of these volumes to certain very wire-drawn hypotheses as to the personality of the author of the fourth gospel. It was not more reassuring to observe the nature of the commendation which he gave in the second of them to Albert Schweitzer's brilliant, in some respects surely epoch-making, but sadly negative history of what Schweitzer's translators call, not unfairly from their point of view, the quest of the historical Jesus. Nor does reassurance come with the present volume with the feebleness of its hold upon the biblical and historical Christologies its readiness to fly for refuge to doubtful modern speculations as supplying the key to the mystery of our Lord's person, its determination to have a Jesus who in all his earthly manifestations was phenomenally strictly human. If the outline given on page 179 and following of what Dr. Sande calls the working of our Lord's consciousness, in which is briefly traced his career from the cradle to the grave, is to furnish, as seems likely, the schematization of the coming life of Christ, the mould which is to determine the lines of its structure, then, we may as well say frankly at once, we shall have no interest in the new life of Christ whatever. For then it will be nothing but one more of those reduced lives of Christ, of which the world has already too many, the writers of which, deserting the testimony of the sources, have, as Renan puts it, imputed themselves to their victim, and creating a Jesus after their own image, permitted him to function only within the limits of their own consciousness. It will be a matter of sincere regret if, after the warnings of even a Vrede and a Schweitzer, Dr. Sande should only again psychologize the life of Christ. The title of the present volume, Christologies Ancient and Modern, might lead one to expect to find in it a historical sketch of Christological thought in the Church, or perhaps a critical discussion of the chief Christological theories which have been current in the Church. It is not quite either of these. Its leading motive is rather the suggestion of a new Christological theory, the Christological theory which is to underlie the forthcoming life of Christ. Even so, however, the general drift of ancient Christological thought up to Chalcedon and the chief forms of German Christological construction of the last century are lightly sketched, to form a background against which the new suggestion may be thrown out. These sketches are drawn, of course, by the hand of a master, although only leading principles are brought out, with no attempt to enter into details. In these circumstances, probably, we ought not to scrutinize with too much care the occasional details which are rapidly alluded to. Otherwise, we might question the description of Tertullian's trinity, without qualification, as what is called an economic trinity, page 26, and we should certainly demure to the rendering of his Oeconomias Sacramentum by the mystery of the divine appointment, page 25. 
Dr. Sande himself at a later point uses the term economy in Tertullian's sense when, page 45, he speaks of projecting our ideas of personality into the eternal economy of the Godhead, which, by the way, is precisely what Tertullian was in the act of doing when he wrote the passage which Dr. Sande quotes. The language which is used in speaking of the Chalcedonian formula, pages 54 to 57, again does not seem to us to retain perfect exactness. The Chalcedonian fathers would seem to have done all they could to save themselves from the charge of conceiving the two natures as separable and separate, when they solemnly declared that they were united a the aretas. Leo's agit ultra que natura quod proprium est cum aterius communicatione would seem to preclude the supposition that these two natures were conceived as operating distinctly, and the emphatic, without confusion, without conversion of the decree, would certainly appear to render it impossible to describe it as allowing, quote, by a system of mutual give and take for the transference of the attributes from one nature to the other, end quote, which is a characteristic feature not of the Chalcedonian but of the old Lutheran Christology. Nor do we think it happy, page 104, to take over Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5.19, in the form God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, without remark, as a fair expression of the Richilian view of Christ's person. We suppose it to be unquestionable that these words, as they stand in Paul's epistle, have a soteriological rather than Christological content, and should be read, God was, in Christ, reconciling the world with himself. Or, to put its full point upon it, it was God who was reconciling the world with himself in Christ, and it is hardly desirable to perpetuate a perversion of an apostolical phrase by making it, in its perverted use, the vehicle of a special Christological hypothesis. Small incidental matters of this kind, however, are scarcely more worth adverting to than the incapacity the American publishers show, page 27, 40, 51, 121, to print a Greek phrase correctly, a matter which must be especially mortifying to Dr. Sande and his British publishers alike, to whom such things are unwanted. The centre of interest in the volume lies not in its historical but in its constructive aspect, in the tentative modern Christology which it outlines, This is dominated by a gently expressed but perfectly firm refusal of the doctrine of the two natures on the one side and a fixed determination on the other to have a Jesus who, phenomenally at least, shall be strictly human. It will go without saying, of course, that if there be not two natures in the person of Christ, then there can be but one, and he must be conceived, therefore, either as a purely divine nature as person or as a purely human nature as person. In the former sense, we shall be landed inevitably, of course, in some form of docetism, in the latter, as inevitably, in some form of humanitarianism. Dr. Sande, as is his gracious wont, speaks kindly of the docetists, and seeks and finds the element of truth which they saw and endeavoured to conserve. But he does not cast in his lot with them. Neither, very properly, will he consort with the Canotists, who think to have in a one-natured Jesus both God and man, on the theory that a shriveled God is a man, and that Jesus, who is nothing but a man, may be thought to have been God before he shrunk into human limits, thus losing, really, both natures in the attempt to make one two. There is nothing left for Dr. Sande, therefore, but a pure humanitarianism. His historical sense, however, and his Christian heart will not permit him to think of Christ merely as man. He feels compelled to recognize deity in him as well as humanity, but not deity alongside of the humanity. Why not, rather, he suggests, deity underlying and sustaining the humanity, as deity underlies and sustains all humanity? Then we may think of Christ as strictly human, but as man differs from man in the richness and fullness with which the divine that underlies his being surges up in him and enters into his consciousness, and Jesus stands in this incomparably above all other men, we may think of him as incomparably the divine man. Thus Dr. Sande would cut the knot of the Christological problem. Obviously what he gives us is, at best, only a new Nestorianism, a Nestorianism stated in terms of modern speculation. Jesus Christ is a man in whom God dwells in a fullness in which he does not dwell in other men. At worst, what he gives us is a devout humanitarianism, a humanitarianism stated in terms of mystical contemplation. The doctrine of the Incarnation gives place to a theory of divine immanence, and Jesus Christ is just the God-filled man. 
the basis of Dr. Sande's suggested Christology we perceive is a mystical doctrine of human nature. Support for this mystical doctrine of human nature he seeks, we must now note, in recent speculations as to the subliminal self. Nobody doubts or has ever doubted that mental processes take place below the threshold of consciousness, and nobody doubts that God operates on the human soul, as we say, beneath consciousness. The peculiarity of Mr. Meyer's doctrine of the subliminal consciousness, as it is misleadingly called, for how can we speak of unconscious consciousness, to which Dr. Sande attaches himself, is that this subliminal consciousness is supposed to be not merely the larger but the nobler part of the self. Quote, the wonderful thing is, writes Dr. Sande, page 145, that while the unconscious and subconscious processes are, generally speaking, similar in kind to the conscious, they surpass them in degree. They are subtler, intenser, further reaching, more penetrating. It is something more than a metaphor when we describe the sub- and unconscious states as more profound. It is in these states and through them that miracles are wrought, end quote. Our subconscious states and operations are not subnormal or even normal, but supernormal. Nay, they are even divine, for beneath our subliminal selves lies the ocean of the infinite, and as we are open at the bottom, the tides of the infinite wash in. If we pass down deep enough into our subliminal being, then we shall find God, or if the tides of the infinite wash in high enough, they will emerge in our consciousness." Dr. Sande pictures our human consciousness, quote, as a kind of narrow neck through which everything which comes up from the deeps of human nature has to pass, end quote, page 176. This narrow-necked vessel, he tells us, has an opening at the bottom. Quote, through it there are incomings and outgoings which stretch away out infinitely and in fact proceed from, italics, and are, end italics, God himself page 178, italics, ours. Quote, that, he adds most naturally, is the ultimate and most important point. Whatever there may be of divine in man, it is in these deep, dim regions that it has its abiding place and home. End quote. Accordingly, he refuses to follow Sir Oliver Lodge when that scholar speaks of this larger and dominant entity and greater self which is still behind the veil as not anything divine, but greater than humanity. Quote, I should not like to put upon it this limitation, end quote, says Dr. Sande, page 193. Dr. Sande apparently supposes that the conception of human nature thus enunciated will homologate with the biblical doctrines of divine influence, of the indwelling spirit, of the framing of Christ in us. It will not. Its affiliations are rather with pantheizing mysticism, if we ought not to say outright with pantheism. That is, if, as we suppose, the distinction of pantheism from mysticism lies in its postulating as an ontological fact what mysticism proposes as an attainment of effort. On the basis of this mystical view of humanity, Dr. Sande suggests that we may frame our conception of the person of Christ. With him too, as with us, whatever there is of divine must be looked for in the subliminal regions as, quote, the proper seat or locus of all divine indwelling or divine action upon the human soul is the subliminal consciousness, end quote. So, quote, the same or the corresponding subliminal consciousness is the proper seat or locus of the deity of the incarnate Christ, end quote, page 159. It is safe to transfer the analogy of our human selves to him, so far at least as to understand that whatever there was of divine in him, it was in Quote, these deep, dim regions, end quote, that it had its, quote, abiding place and home, end quote, page 178, and in coming up into consciousness, quote, must needs pass through a strictly human medium, end quote, page 165. Quote, we have seen, writes Dr. Sande, page 165, what difficulties are involved in the attempt to draw, as it were, a vertical line between the human nature and the divine nature of Christ, and to say that certain actions of his fall on this side of the line and certain other actions on the other. But these difficulties disappear if, instead of drawing a vertical line, we draw rather a horizontal line between the upper human medium, which is the proper and natural field of all active expression, 
and those lower deeps which are no less the proper and natural home of whatever is divine. This line is inevitably drawn in the region of the subconscious. That which was divine in Christ was not nakedly exposed to the public gaze, neither was it so entirely withdrawn from outward view as to be wholly sunk and submerged in the darkness of the unconscious. But there was a sort of Jacob's ladder by which the divine sources stored up below found an outlet, as it were, to the upper air and the common theatre in which the life of mankind is enacted. End quote. The precise meaning of this is perhaps not altogether clear. What it seems to say is that the difference between our Lord and us lies fundamentally here, that the infinite washes into his subliminal self more constantly and more freely than into ours. And so, though his life, quote, so far as it was visible, was a strictly human life, yet this human life was, in its deepest roots, directly continuous with the life of God himself, end quote, page 168. Quote, if St. Paul could quote and endorse the words of a pagan poet claiming for the children of men that they are also God's offspring, end quote, Dr. Sande goes on to expound, quote, and if they are this notwithstanding that they are confined in a body as creatures of perishable clay, if in spite of these limitations it may still be said of them that in God they live and move and have their being, might not the same be said in a yet more searching and essential sense of him who was son in a more transcendent and ineffable mode of being than they, end quote. Dr. Sande assures us that there is ample room left here for the homoousion, quote, whatever the homoousion means, end quote. We suppose he means that we may understand, if we will, that the whole of that self-determination of the Godhead, which we call the Son, may have invaded the subliminal recesses of the being of Jesus as the infinite washes in varying measures into all of us. But even so, does the man Christ Jesus differ from us, into the subliminal being of all of whom the infinite washes in varying measures, otherwise than in degree. And how does this conception of Jesus separate itself essentially from that, say, of Ernest Renan, who writes as follows, Vie de Jesus, page 78, quote, The men who have most highly understood God have felt the divine in themselves. In the first rank of this great family of true sons of God, Jesus must be placed. Jesus had no visions, God does not speak to him from without. God is in him. He feels himself with God, and he draws out of his own heart what he says of his Father. He lives in the bosom of God and enjoys constant intercourse with him. He does not see him, but he hears him. He believes himself in immediate relation with God. He believes himself God's Son. The highest consciousness of God which has ever existed among men was that of Jesus." End quote. Surely this is as eloquently said as that. Does it not also present as lofty a conception of Jesus' relation to the divine being? We are not endeavouring to convey the impression that Dr. Sande's attitude towards our Lord's person is the same as Renan's. He tells us expressly that it is not. It would be monstrous to doubt Dr. Sande's complete loyalty of heart to the true deity of Christ, which he constantly asserts in the face of all gainsayers. But it is quite another question whether the mode of conceiving the person of our Lord, which he tentatively puts forward for our consideration, conserves the true deity of Christ. We cannot think it does. Dr. Sande very properly discriminates contemporary Christian thought into two main types, which he calls full Christianity and reduced Christianity, each of which has a Christology of its own. The Christology, which he has worked out here in outline only, distinctly belongs to the type which he calls reduced Christianity. How could it help doing so when it is insisted that the humanity of our Lord must be taken in such real earnest that his life, quote, so far as it was visible, end quote, must be conceived as a, quote, strictly human life, end quote, and his consciousness, Dr. Sande says his human consciousness, but in these circumstances the adjective seems decidedly otiose, as entirely human and yet the application to him of the Chalcedonian conception of the two natures is firmly declined. No adherent of the doctrine of the two natures will fall a whit behind Dr. Sande in the seriousness with which he takes the humanity of our Lord. The true and perfect humanity of the Lord is as real and as precious a part of the doctrine of the two natures as is his true and perfect deity. 
to the adherent of the doctrine of two natures as truly as to Dr. Sande, quote, the human consciousness of the Lord, end quote, is entirely human. But to him, the human consciousness of the Lord is not the entirety of his consciousness, and he will not say that, quote, whatever there was of divine in him, on its way to outward expression, whether in speech or act, end quote, why not say in thought too? Quote, passed through and could not but pass through the restricting and restraining medium of human consciousness, end quote. For the adherent of the doctrine of the two natures is determined to take the deity of the Lord in real earnest also. And this is not taking the deity of the Lord in real earnest, but is subjecting it to the yoke of the humanity. When Dr. Sande says, therefore, quote, if whatever we have of divine must needs pass through a human medium, the same law would hold good for him, end quote, the adherent of the doctrine of the two natures draws back. This could be only if our Lord were not only human as we are, but divine only as we are. We may indeed say this of his human nature, in which the spirit dwells as he dwells in us, only without measure, while he dwells in each of us according to his measure, but we must not leave Christ's divine nature, which we have not, wholly out of account. He is not merely the most perfectly God-indwelt man who ever was, though he is that. He is God as well. And he is God first and man only second. Why should he who is God and the living God, infinitely full of the incomparable activities which we call divine, on assuming a human nature into personal union with himself, forthwith become incapable of life expression, save through, quote, the restricting and restraining medium of human consciousness, end quote. If we begin with the categories of purely human activities and proceed by confining the activities of our Lord to these, whatever else we include or exclude in our conception of Christ, we exclude the idea of God manifest in the flesh. The adherent of the two natures has this advantage over all such constructions of the person of Christ, as this which Dr. Sande proposes, that in doing justice to the humanity of Christ, and none can surpass him in the earnestness with which he takes the humanity of Christ, he does justice also to his deity. The doctrine of the two natures, it must be confessed, is not very much in favour in the circles of modern scientific theology. Dr. Sande, though himself turning away from it, finds himself impelled by his mere sense of justice to say a good word for it, as not, after all, so black as it is painted. There are many causes which concur to produce this widespread indifference or rejection of it. Among them, there should not be permitted to fall out of sight this very potent one, the change in men's attitude to the Bible. For the doctrine of the two natures is a synthesis of the entire body of biblical data on the person of Christ, and a synthesis which has been worked out in the crucible of life, not in that of mere intellectual inquiry. Work so done is done for all time. The principle of the Chalcedonian formulation is full justice to the entire body of the biblical data, but men are no longer seeking to do full justice to the entire body of the biblical data. The Bible has fallen to pieces in their hands, and they are impatient of an effort to synthesize all its points of view, as an artificial attempt to induce a fictitious unity in a variegated array of unrelated notions. What each successive investigator is endeavouring to accomplish is to penetrate behind the superincumbent mass of biblical ideas, to discover, if he may, not the common truth which binds them all together and finds trustworthy if partial expression in each, but the lost truth which has been covered up and hidden under them all and can be recovered only by tearing them away and laying bare the forgotten reality beneath. The Bible having been lost, the Christ of the Bible has naturally been lost also, and each thinker is left very much to his own imagination to picture how it were fitting that God should become man. Meanwhile, it is certain that we know absolutely nothing of the facts of Christ's life or its manifestations except what the New Testament writers tell us, and on many grounds their account of it and of its rationale is far more apt to be true to the reality than any we can invent for ourselves today. If we are searching for the real Jesus, we shall find him nowhere else than in the New Testament writings, and we can have few better proofs that we have found him than is furnished by this fact, that all the representations of the New Testament writings are capable of so simple and so complete a synthesis as is provided in the doctrine of the two natures. 
In it, all the biblical data are brought together in a harmonious unity in which each finds recognition and from which each receives its complete exposition. The key which unlocks so complicated a lock can scarcely fail to be the true key, and when the key is once in our hands, we may turn the argument around and from the details of the key authenticate the wards of the lock into which it fits. That all the data of the New Testament Synthetize in the doctrine of the two natures authenticates these data as competent elements of the great reality because it were inconceivable that so large a body of varying and sometimes apparently opposite data could synthetize in so simple a unifying conception were they not each a fragment of a real whole. End of Review of Christologies Ancient and Modern by B. B. Warfield Review of Personality in Christ and in Ourselves by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Personality in Christ and in Ourselves by William Sanday, D.D., LLD, Lit, D.D., Lady Margaret Professor and Canon of Christ Church, Oxford, Honourable Fellow of Exeter College, Fellow of the British Academy, Chaplain in Ordinary to the King, New York, Oxford University Press, American Branch, 1911, Octavo, pages 75. Dr. Sanday's Christologies, Ancient and Modern, published last year, was reviewed in this journal for January 1911, pages 166 to 174. His purpose in that book was, he tells us, to suggest a tentative modern Christology. The modernness of the Christology he suggested consists in two things. First, it deserts the historical Christology of the two natures and proposes to us a Christ who is, phenomenally at least, of only a single nature, and that nature purely human. Secondly, it seeks to explain what is divine in Christ by putting to the subliminal self which underlies the conscious self of every man, and explaining that even in common men this subliminal self is invaded by divine influences, or rather washed into by the divine, and may well be supposed in Christ's case to have been so invaded in a unique measure. Thus, as was pointed out in our review of the book, the divine human Christ of the New Testament and of historical Christianity deriving from the New Testament was reduced to a purely human Christ in whom God dwelt, though in a fuller measure, just as he dwells in all men. In the pamphlet now before us, Dr. Sanday gives us a supplement, or perhaps we may rather say a compliment to the Christologies Ancient and Modern. As the title of the pamphlet advises us, its interest lies in the philosophical basis which that volume proposed to us, rather than in the Christological structure erected on it. The pamphlet consists of two lectures delivered in November 1910, in which an effort is made to ascertain precisely what personality is in man, with a view to preparing the way for Dr. Sanday's doctrine of the subliminal self as the locus of divine influences, and a retrospect in which he passes in review such of the criticisms of the Christologies, ancient and modern, as he considers especially worthy of remark, chiefly or wholly, again, with reference to the philosophical side of that work. As will be seen, the Christology suggested in that work passes largely out of sight in this supplementary material. This, we think, a pity, partly because we do not find Dr. Sanday's further remarks on the philosophical basis of his new Christology very helpful, and partly because the purpose of the book was, after all, to suggest a new Christology, and the Christology suggested ought to hold, and in our own case we frankly admit does hold, the place of chief interest. It must be confessed that the few allusions to Christology which are found in the pamphlet are distinctly discouraging. In reading the book, one could not help hoping that, in the enthusiasm of propounding a new theory of the person of Christ, Dr. Sanday might have failed to observe all its implications, and especially its reduction of Christ to merely a divinely endowed man. But our startled eyes can scarcely miss taking up from the pamphlet phrases and even paragraphs which, though few, seem only too clearly to intimate that Dr. Sanday's conception of the Incarnation is fatally inadequate, that the Incarnation is reduced in his thought of it to mere inhabitation, and that, indeed, to all appearances, it is confused with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Already at the opening of the first lecture we hear the Incarnation spoken of as 
The Meeting of Human and Divine, page 4, in a context which suggests that its specific character is not fully allowed for. But it is towards the end of the second lecture that the most disturbing phraseology occurs. It is not merely that inexact language is employed. Such a phrase as his incarnate nature, page 4, for example, as Dr. Sande uses it, is distinctly untheological. In strict speech, it can mean nothing but our Lord's divine nature, which is the one nature in his person of which incarnation can be affirmed. But Dr. Sande does not mean by it his divine nature in distinction from his human nature, but apparently uses the phrase to speak of our Lord's total being as some sort of composite. What clear sense can be attached to the term incarnate in the phrase does not appear. If our Lord has but a single nature, and that nature is human, to qualify this nature by the epithet incarnate seems merely a very loose and misleading way of saying that Christ's human nature is in some way more divine than that of other men. Incarnate has sunk to be little more than an honorific epithet, notifying us that in Christ we are dealing with a particularly divinitized man. A couple of pages further on, Dr. Sande cites Paul's great words, Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and pronounces them the enunciation of an ideal which has never been and never will be completely realized. Paul, however, is not here proclaiming an ideal but describing an experience, and an experience cannot but be realized. Not only Paul, but every Christian in point of fact realizes this experience, and not one is a Christian at all of whom it cannot be affirmed, each no doubt in his own measure, for it is only another way of saying that the Spirit of Christ dwells in us and takes the guidance of our lives, and if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But Dr. Sande comments on it as follows, quote, If we could conceive of it as realized... We should say not that there were two gods, but that there were two incarnations, end quote, page 49. This comment is not perfectly clear to us. We do not understand what the import of the negative clause is, but it seems certainly to imply this much, that in Dr. Sande's mind, a perfect indwelling would be an incarnation. The ideal of Paul carried to its complete realization is what Dr. Sande understands by incarnation. Incarnation is, therefore, in its mode, an indwelling. On the immediately preceding page, page 48, he tells us this explicitly. There is only one God, he tells us, and only one divine, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in us is the same Holy Spirit who dwelt in Christ. What is the difference, then, between Christ and us? The difference, he tells us, was not in the essence, nor yet in the mode or sphere of the indwelling, but in the relation of the indwelling to the person. The divine influences working alike in him and in us do not hold and possess our persons. The difference, he tells us, quote, was not in the essence nor yet in the mode or sphere of the indwelling, but, italics, in the relation of the indwelling to the person, end italics, italics his. The divine influences working alike in him and in us do not, italics, hold and possess, end italics, our person, as the deity within him, italics, held and possessed, in italics, the person of the incarnate Son, italics, again, his. Then does the fact that the Holy Spirit, Dr. Sande explicitly mentions the Holy Spirit as the indwelling agent, dwelling alike in us and in him, held and possessed his person, quote, meaning the whole person, each several organ and faculty, but especially the central core of personality, the inner controlling and commanding person, end quote, as he does not hold and possess ours, constitute our Lord, the incarnate Christ? Incarnation, we perceive, is reduced explicitly to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Christ is just the man in whom the Holy Spirit dwells without measure. Needless to say, here is a complete evacuation of the meaning of the term incarnate, and equally needless to say, here is a complete evacuation of the conception of incarnation, Christ is merely a man in whom the Holy Spirit dwells in greater measure than he dwells in other men. He is not God and man, he is not even God in man, he is man with God dwelling in him, as, but more completely, God dwells in all men. Now, of course, the scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit does dwell in Jesus Christ, and they teach that the Holy Spirit that dwells in him is the same Holy Spirit that dwells in us and that he dwells in him after the same fashion in which he dwells in us. 
only beyond measure in him, while he dwells in us, each according to his measure. But the scriptures do not confound this indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the human nature of Christ with the Incarnation. This indwelling is, according to the scriptures, additional to the Incarnation and fits the human nature, which is assumed into the personal union with the Divine in the Incarnation for its great companionship. The substitution of this indwelling of the Spirit in Jesus Christ for the Incarnation is just the elimination of the Incarnation altogether. Christ's divine nature is cut away from him, and his spirit-indwelled human nature is presented to us as the whole Christ. How this differs in essence from Socinianism and Ebionism, it would certainly be interesting to learn. If we may be permitted conjecturally to penetrate behind what lies on the face of Dr. Sande's pages and attempt to discover the origin of the error which has led to these conclusions, we should be inclined to find it in a conception of the incarnating act as the entrance of God into a man or a human nature, so that God, so to speak, clothed himself in human nature. Such is not the conception of Scripture. According to Scripture, God the Son did not at the incarnation enter into a man, but took a human nature up into personal union with himself. Accordingly, assumption is the theological term to describe the act, and it would be truer to speak of the human nature of Christ as existing in God than of man as existing in it. Jesus Christ is primarily not a man in whom God dwells, but God who has assumed into personal union with himself a human nature as an organ through which he acts. Even historically, the term incarnation does not mean the insertion of deity into flesh or humanity. Incarnari, incarnatus, incarnation are just the Latin equivalents of sarcome, sarcothis, sarcosis. Compare Irenaeus against heresies, 1.10.1, 3.19.1, and mean just to be made flesh, made flesh, making flesh. The impression which has grown up amongst us, that reads the sense of the insertion into flesh into them, is just a disease of language, and is perhaps responsible for more bad thinking on the Incarnation than we realize. This pamphlet has been incorporated into a new edition of the Christologies Ancient and Modern, 1911. End of Review of Personality in Christ and in Ourselves by B. B. Warfield Review of The Authority of Christ by B.B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Authority of Christ by David W. Forrest, D.D., Edinburgh, Edinburgh, T.T. T. and Clark, 1906, New York, imported by Charles Scribner's Sons, price $2 net, octavo, pages 16, to 437. There is a story told of an impetuous and somewhat headstrong cavalry leader in our great civil war, which is brought back to our memory by Dr. Forrest's book. He had just ordered a daring charge when he was interrupted by an aide de camp, riding furiously and bringing imperative orders from the general in command to draw back. Of course, I obey my superior officer, he said, with no attempt to conceal his chagrin. But, he had once remarked, his face clearing up. Mr. Aide de Camp, this is a very remarkable order which I find it difficult to understand, and how do I know it has not suffered some sea change in its transmission through you? And indeed, how do I know the old man is quite himself this morning? Men, he said, turning to his forces, charge. The authority of Christ, says Dr. Forrest, is of course final. It has in all ages been acknowledged by the Christian Church to be final. Page 1. Compare pages 101, 392. But it is certainly not always easy to ascertain precisely the bearing of either his commands or his example. Pages 160, 393. And in point of fact, men have repeatedly, and in great masses and through long periods, gone astray in their appeal to his authority. Nor is it easy to be sure that some of the phrases transmitted to us, quote, have not come to us coloured by later reflection, end quote, page 399. His disciples certainly misunderstood him in some of his utterances and modified them to suit their own convictions, pages 312, 317, 319, and though, quote, the question of subsequent modification or interpretation touches, end quote, 
different parts of his teaching with more or less force, it is legitimate on all occasions to raise it. Page 292. And in any event, Jesus' own outlook was bounded by the horizon of a man of his own time, race and social and intellectual opportunities. The mysteries that press on us pressed similarly on him. The mystery of suffering, for example, quote, we have no reason to suppose, end quote, that the data required for its solution, quote, lay within Christ's purview more than within ours, end quote, page 141. Quote, the detailed course of the kingdom in the world was inscrutable, end quote, to him as to us, because, quote, the influences that determined it were infinitely complex, end quote. And above all, the factor of the free human will comes in to modify all forecasts, page 300, 312. It is not difficult for us to convict him even of positive errors. No doubt he shared the current opinion which attributed the 110th Psalm to David, and the later chapters of Isaiah to Isaiah, page 69. Nor did he err only in matters of biblical criticism. Quote, his teaching in many of its parts is colored by temporary Jewish influences, end quote, page 96. Even the parables, at least those, quote, that portray the final judgment, are affected by suggestions from Jewish traditional belief, end quote, page 292. Thus we are carried through the whole Sorites, and despite the occasional accidental dropping of such a phrase as, quote, Christ teaches with authority, end quote, page 331, the only conclusion that can be reached is that no such authority can justly be assigned to the teaching of Christ, as has, quote, in all ages been acknowledged by the Christian Church, end quote, page 1. As we read, we are inevitably reminded of Nelson at St. Vincent, vociferously protesting his subjection to his admiral's authority, but taking great care to clap his glass to his blind eye and crying out, I see no signal, to go his own way. And here we must emphasize the phrase, his own way, for we must not suppose that Dr. Forrest puts aside the authority of Jesus in favor of that of the scriptures. As he says himself, generalizing on an individual instance, Quote, he who believes that Christ's thought had its limitations will not think that Peter's knowledge on such a matter was infallible. End quote. Page 330, compare page 413. Quote, is it at all likely, he demands, that the apostle was commissioned to reveal an eschatological truth which was concealed from the Lord himself, or which he deliberately refrained from proclaiming? End quote. We do not pause here to point out that, according to John's representation... John 16, verses 12 and 13, precisely this might seem very likely, or to point out that according to Dr. Forrest's own principles, there seems no good reason why the later writer, after mature reflection and the teaching of experience, might not have known better than Jesus. What we are concerned to point out here is that so far from falling back from Christ's authority upon that of the Holy Ghost speaking through the apostles, it is one of Dr. Forrest's aims in setting aside the authority of Christ, to escape also from the authority of Scripture. It is, in fact, just because Christ's authority authenticates the Scripture that Christ's authority is onerous to him. He sweeps the field clean and leaves himself logically without any external authority at all, and he succeeds very fairly in living practically up to this logical result. Pages 372, 382, 421 compare page 2, 64 and 68. There is, of course, an appeal here and there to scriptural teaching, as if there were some good reason why we should not outrun the scriptural warrant for this or that, page 50. But this occasional slip is explicable usually from the influence of long habit and from a sense of the force of the appeal upon those addressed. There is exhibited no great tendency to defer to the detailed teaching of John or Paul or Peter, but rather a suggestion here and there of an underlying hesitancy in appealing to it. At one point, no doubt, page 330, there seems to be a hint let fall that we may appeal from any one apostle to, quote, the common primitive faith, end quote, as a better basis of confidence. What is not shared by all, or a plurality of the apostles, we are told, quote, according to every sound canon of biblical criticism, can only rank as a theologumenon, end quote, of the individual, and as not, quote, forming part of the common primitive faith, End quote. fails by implication of normative authority, page 339. 
The New Testament, however, is treated on the whole as but a product of the Church, page 383, which can possess no higher authority than belongs to the Church, even though it comes from the, quote, creative period of the Christian faith, end quote, page 421. We say truly, then, that Dr. Forrest strips himself of all external authority and stands forth as, in some sense, autonomous. Has he not the Spirit as truly as any of the apostles, and does not the promise of guidance into all the truth belong to him as really as to them, and does there not lie behind him a much longer and a much wider experience than lay behind them, through which the Church has learned many things? We have thought it best to begin thus by stating briefly the central and determining line of thought of Dr. Forrest's volume, that we may have before us at once the principles which have controlled his thought, and the issue to which he would conduct us. We may properly revert now, however, to the manner in which these principles and conclusions find utterance. Dr. Forrest takes for his subject the authority of Christ, and his end is to determine the sphere in which that authority, shall we say, is available, or shall we say, is extant, and its character, or shall we say, its mode of operation, within that sphere. In one word, Dr. Forrest's purpose is to investigate the limits of Christ's authority, both extensively and intensively. In what sphere is he authoritative, he asks, and then how authoritative is he in that sphere? He cannot be said to proceed in his discussion on a right line, nor does the book give the impression of a unity. One gets the suggestion as he reads that it may have been composed piecemeal, at perhaps disconnected periods, and not in all its parts with the same precise end prominently in view, and with the same definitions and presuppositions vividly in mind. Nevertheless, the whole is bound together in some sort of unity by the fact that the whole treats in one way or another of the authority of Christ, and if at one time there seems an implicit recognition underlying the discussion of the plenary authority of our Lord's declarations, and only a zeal to provide against their misapplication, while at another there seems a tendency to deny at least absolute authority to his declarations themselves, the reader still is able with a little care to find his way amid the resulting ambiguities. If we may be allowed a conjecture as to the composition of the book, we may perhaps suppose that it originated in a strong feeling on Dr. Forrest's part that the authority of Christ has been and is frequently much too lightly asserted, and has accordingly been invoked for a multitude of points of view and conceptions, usages and practices for which no colourable warrant can be found in the recorded teaching and example of Jesus. Here is... For example, a portentous sacerdotal system like that of the Church of Rome, or here is an impracticable scheme of conduct like that propounded by Tolstoy, or here is a thoroughly indefensible withdrawal from public life and avoidance of the common duties in which our complicated modern social organization enmeshes us, or here is an innumerable body of particular crochets more or less offensive to sane thought, and for all of them alike, the authority of Christ is confidently appealed to. The case obviously calls for a serious examination of the basis on which the authority of Christ is claimed for these things, and Dr. Forrest has felt this obligation and has given us a series of excellent chapters in which the interpretation of Christ's precepts and the general bearing of his teaching is searchingly examined and illustrated. It is a dreary mass of crass and often evident misinterpretations and misapplications of Christ's words which he has to expose. If Dr. Forrest had stopped at this point, although there would certainly remain points of detail which would invite criticism, he would have made us all his debtors. But unfortunately there are a number of instances in which the authority of Christ is invoked for matters not to Dr. Forrest's mind, with regard to which it cannot be denied that the recorded words or example of Jesus warrant the appeal. And Dr. Forrest has unhappily permitted himself to be misled on their account into an attempt to discredit the authority of Christ. He pleads that we must not raise the dilemma in men's minds, quote, as to whether the acceptance of his authority is compatible with loyalty to truth, end quote, in any region of their investigation, page 2. 
and he does not seem to perceive, or at least does not stay at this point sufficiently to consider that if this principle is given universal validity, it amounts to saving Christ's authority in name while discarding it in fact throughout the whole range of knowledge. Under its pressure, he seeks to escape the dilemma, first by throwing doubt upon the exact transmission of our Lord's words and example, and next by invoking a theory of the Incarnation by which the authority of his teaching and example, even when fully before us, is reduced to the vanishing point. The book thus becomes a sustained attempt to throw off the authority of Christ altogether, and by this driftage of the argument, its own unity is, as we have said, seriously marred. For what is the use of arguing at great length that the teaching and example of Christ have been misapplied by this or that class of reasoners, or body of Christians, if we are not quite certain what the teaching and example of Christ are, and they have no authority at any rate? The assertion in the opening chapters of the book of a theory of the Incarnation which robs the teaching and example of Christ of all authority antiquates beforehand the argument of the later chapters that the teaching and example of Christ have often been grossly misinterpreted by those who have appealed to them. The argument of these later chapters proceeds on a major premise which has already been discredited and can command our attention only if the assertion of the former chapters is rejected by us. The gravamen of the case the book seeks to make out certainly lies, therefore, in its opening chapters, in which Dr. Forrest attempts to expound the Incarnation as, in its very nature, voiding the authority of Christ, and that attempt must, therefore, claim our previous attention. We think this unfortunate, for the excellence of the volume lies in its later chapters, in which the proper use of Christ's authority is studied. But we have no choice. Both the logic of the case and Dr. Forrest's own arrangement of his matter demand of us to seek the crux of the volume in its opening chapters and its theory of the Incarnation. This theory of the Incarnation is nothing other than the canotic theory, which, after enjoying a remarkable vogue in the middle of the last century, has in most recent years fallen very much out of credit, as continued discussion has thrown more and more into light its inherent weaknesses, or rather impossibilities, metaphysical, exegetical, theological, and religious. Respectable in the hands of its first propounders as an attempt to do justice to Christological data neglected by the Lutheran construction in which they had been bred, it has lost the respect of men when it has become only a fig leaf to hide the nakedness of those who, fallen from their first estate of trust in the God-man, yet shrink from standing forth in a bare, naturalistic conception of the person of Christ. It is thus, unfortunately, that it appears in Dr. Forrest's pages, as in those of most of its remaining advocates. Dr. Forrest declines to enter into the deep questions which such a theory necessarily brings with it. Quote, it is quite foolish, he says, to seek to disparage the idea of the son's self-limitation by asking what became of his cosmical function during the incarnate period. End quote. Page 95. And then he enumerates a number of the suggestions which have been made to meet this and similar difficulties raised by the canotic assumption, with the general implication that any of them will do well enough, although no one of them has yet been invented which does not fatally infringe upon the Christian doctrine of the Trinity or our fundamental conception of God. With these things, however, Dr. Forrest does not concern himself. His concern is rather with the right of men to hold to be false, what the Son of Man recognized as true, says he, quote, The frank recognition that such was the character of the Son's incarnate state is a prime necessity for Christian faith at the present time. For this age is preeminently one of historical research, bent upon discovering as far as possible the actual facts of the past. Now it has been demonstrated beyond dispute that there are sayings of our Lord which, taken literally, seem to conflict with established results of biblical investigation, and that his teaching in many of its parts is coloured by temporary Jewish influences. When Professor Fleiderer, on grounds such as these, ridicules the notion that Christ is a final definitive authority, the only right reply is, we do not claim that Christ's word is final in all spheres, we can only gain for Christ his true place and essential significance by plainly recognizing not only that the limitations are there, but that they are inseparable accompaniments of a historical incarnation, 
end quote, pages 96 and 97, which, being interpreted in the brutal language of the streets, means just that we cannot, in the face of modern research, sustain the claim of Christ to authority. Dr. Forrest would indeed distinguish or say, quote, except in the sphere of faith and conduct, end quote, page 3, or, as he puts it here, quote, we do claim that he has embodied in his person and in the principles he has expounded the final revelation of religious truth and practice of what man is to believe concerning God and what duties God requires of man, end quote, page 97. The care with which this language is chosen should not, however, pass unobserved. Even in the sphere of faith and conduct, Dr. Forrest is not prepared to claim absolute and indefectible authority for every utterance of Jesus. Quote, His teaching in many of its parts is colored by temporary Jewish influences, end quote, and we shall need to take these into account in applying it to our own times. And this revelation of religious truth and practice does not find its embodiment so much in spoken words enunciating final doctrine and promulgating final precepts as in lives, quickened by the spirit he has sent, and efflorescing under his influence into true thinking and high acting. There is thus at least a tendency in Dr. Forrest's discussion to reduce the authority of Christ to his imminent action on the consciousness of the race or of his church. Quote, that he constantly confronts us with an obligation which presses down upon us from the unseen constitutes what we call the authority of Christ. End quote, page 7. This seems to mean that Christ is the incarnate conscience of the race, and his authority consists in the coincidence of his demands on us with the demands of our religious and moral nature. Quote, he quickens the impulses and resolves, end quote, of our moral and religious nature, and we respond to it in a higher outlook and upward aspiration. Quote, then a sense of law and beauty, a face turned from the clod, some call it evolution and others call it God, end quote. Dr. Forrest calls it Christ, and sees here Christ's authority manifested. It is thus that Dr. Forrest adjusts his profound reverence for Jesus as the final authority of Christians, and his inability to find in his recorded teaching a final authority for his thinking and acting. It is always painful to disturb such adjustments, and the more painful as it becomes evident that the adjustment is in the individual an expedient to retain as much as is possible to him of the higher truth. But what choice have we? In this sphere, too, the maxim will be found to have, in all its absoluteness, its inevitable application, ye cannot serve two masters. Dr. Forrest's impulse to the adoption of the canotic theory of the Incarnation seems then to be rooted in mental perplexity in view of the conflict between some of Jesus' utterances or points of view and some suggestions of recent research. This perplexity is voiced in such phrases as this, quote, if Christ is declared by us to guarantee the accuracy of what is scientifically disproved, or at least improbable in the last degree, we are much more likely to imperil his claim than to establish the disputed point, end quote, page 69. And certainly we may be permitted to suspect that the dogmatism with which the elements of the canotic theory are asserted and the fundamental postulates of the Chalcedonian Christology are discarded, is a reflection of the terror with which the dilemma Dr. Forrest finds himself in inspires him, the terror lest all trust in Christ be destroyed in wide circles by the conflict between his utterances and recent theory. But Dr. Forrest seeks support for his theory from Scripture. Why he should be exigent in this matter is not very apparent in view of the weak hold which the authority of Scripture has upon him, particularly in its historical element, the only element on which he can depend for the dramatization of our Lord's life on earth, from which he derives his chief support in advocating the canotic theory of his incarnation. But, permitting that to pass, Dr. Forrest has persuaded himself that the Scriptures give us both in their didactic teaching and in the portrait they draw of Jesus in the Gospels a canoticized Christ, and he supports himself on this their supposed testimony. We cannot say, however, we have found anything very new or particularly strong in the exegetical argument with which he has favored us. To the great passage, Philippians 2, 6 and following, he consecrates two long passages— pages 98 and following, and 338 and following, one of them a formal discussion in the canotic interests, and of course he says many things in both of them which command our attention and exhibit his own careful study of the passage. 
but in neither discussion can he be said to have advanced the matter in hand. The more formal discussion, page 98 and following, even acquires a somewhat unpleasant flavour from the sustained effort made in it to rid it of its two most obvious theological implications, that of the unbroken persistence of the Son of God in the form of God after his incarnation, and that of the consequent coexistence in the incarnate Son of two natures. It is quite certain that in the phrase en morfethe u parcho, the participle embodies the conception of continuance, and therefore declares not merely that Jesus was before his incarnation in the form of God, but also that he retained the form of God after his incarnation. The sixth verse indeed, as its tense forms unmistakably indicate, lays the basis in one broad negative statement for the entire positive statement given in verse 7, and there analysed into two parts, not less then for the he humbled himself than for the he emptied himself. The unbroken continuance of our Lord in the form of God is therefore of the very essence of the assertion, and it is it which governs the choice of the language throughout the entire passage. It is this that accounts not only for the lavon and the hienomenos in both instances, but also for the en omumoti and the schemati, which have seemed to many, quote, to point to an apparent rather than a real incarnation, end quote, only because the ruling idea of the passage, that Christ Jesus always continued to be, because he was by nature and could not but be, in the form of God, has been lost sight of. It was because he continued in his incarnation to be in the form of God, that he is said not to have come to be in the form of a servant, but to have taken the form of a servant. There was here no exchange of one form for another, but an addition of one form to another. As the ecclesiastical language has accurately phrased it, there was an assumption. Accordingly, he is said not to have become man, but to have become in the likeness of men. The docetic inference had been excluded by the he took the form of a servant. There is no illusion here, but a real assumption of the form, that is, of the characterizing quality, of all that belongs to the servant's nature. The transmutation notion is now excluded by the assertion that he did not, in assuming humanity, become man exactly, but only became in the likeness of men. He remained much more than he seemed, though his humanity was a real humanity, really assumed, and he lived in the sight of man within the limits of his humanity, so as to appear only man. This was not all. He remained in the form of God all the time as well, and therefore was only in the likeness of men. Whatever he did, therefore, as man, within the limits of the humanity he had assumed, he did voluntarily by an ever-fresh act of voluntary self-abnegation. His dying, for instance, that was not an inevitable sequence of his incarnation, but an additional act of voluntary self-devotion. He who is and remains in the form of God may properly at any and all times claim and exercise his right of being on an equality with God, the deathless one, and not die. And this possibility and right is wholly unaffected by the fact that he has assumed into union with himself the form of a servant, and thus has made it possible for him to act here too in the likeness of men. Accordingly, we are told, in order that the example of our Lord in his self-abnegation may be exhibited in its full extent, that, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. It is a voluntary act of his own, not an inevitable consequence of his changed nature, no longer in his power to do or to prevent, and that he did this by becoming, it is a change to the unnecessary, not a submission to the inevitable, that is signalized by the term, by becoming subject even unto death." Death, then at last, and all that led up to and accompanied and issued from death in his subjection to human conditions, was not the unavoidable and irresistible consequence of his incarnation, coming of itself as the necessary lot of the nature he had, not assumed but become, but an additional act of humiliation voluntarily entered into in the prosecution of his mission by him who, just because he remained in the form of God, had no necessary part in death but might well have held to his inherent right to be in this matter also on an equality with God. Not only is at least this much so embedded in the passage that it cannot by any artifice of exegesis be driven out of it, but it constitutes the main and emphasized teaching of the passage 
on which hangs its whole value to Paul in his exhortation to his readers to not look at their own things, but each also to the things of others, and thus to have the mind in them which was in Christ Jesus. The meaning of the passage to us then is precisely that, according to Paul, the Son of God did not lay aside his divine existence form in becoming man, but retaining in full possession all that characterizes God as God and makes him that specific being we call God, for that is the significance of being in the form of God, took to himself also all that characterizes a servant as a servant and makes him that specific being we call a servant, and having so done, willed to live out a servant's life in the world, subjecting himself from moment to moment by uncompelled and free acts of his unweakened will, to the conditions of the life which, for his own high ends, he willed to live, and manifesting himself thus to man, as in the likeness of men, in fashion as a man, though he was all the time lord of all. This is, of course, the precise antipodes, the express and detailed contradiction of the entire canonic construction. It is the assertion of the dual nature of our Lord, for, according to it, the humanity of our Lord was something added to, Lavon, his divine nature, not something into which his divine nature was transmuted. And this includes, of course, the assertion that within the person of Christ there are two minds, though both matters are denied by Dr. Forrest with intense dogmatism. Quote, no matter how real may be the affinity of divine and human nature, these two diverse methods or forms of operation can by no possibility coexist within the same conscious personality. End quote. Page 89, compare pages 51 and 91. Quote, there was but one mind, that of the word made flesh. End quote. Page 58, compare pages 53 and 90. It is also the assertion of the retention in the incarnate state, in possession and use, of the whole body of divine attributes which in their sum make up the form of God, although this too is not only denied but scoffed at by Dr. Forrest. He complains of those who occupy the same position here with Paul, that they, quote, calmly transfer what is true of the Son in his timeless existence to him in the period of his humiliation, as if the continuity of his absolute attributes were self-evident, end quote, page 65, compare pages 51, 53, 59. It is further the assertion that the controlling factor in our Lord's whole earthly manifestation, as well as in his entire life history, is his divine nature, since it was he who was in the form of God who not only emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, thus becoming in the likeness of men, but also, being found in fashion like a man, humbled himself by becoming subject even unto death, and that the death of the cross, although this too Dr. Forrest sharply denies, pages 91 to 92. But above all, for our present purpose, for this is the hinge on which the whole canonic controversy turns, it is the assertion that our Lord's life of humiliation on earth was a continuous act of voluntary self-abnegation, in which he, by the strong control of his absolute will to live within the bounds of a human life, moment by moment denied himself the exercise of his divine attributes and prerogatives in all that concerned his mission, because he had come to do a work, and for the doing of it, it behooved him thus to do, and not the unavoidable natural development of a purely human life, incapable as such of escaping the changes and chances which are necessarily incident to humanity. By this assertion, Paul sets aside at one stroke the whole canotic contention, to which it is essential to hold that in our Lord's life of humiliation, quote, there was not merely as Bishop O'Brien puts it in words adopted and utilized by Dr. Forrest, page 93, a voluntary suspension of the exercise of all his infinite attributes and powers, but a voluntary renunciation of the capacity of exercising them for a time. End quote. And not only Paul, we may add, but the whole gospel narrative as well, to which Dr. Forrest would make his appeal, as if it dramatized Christ's life on earth, as not only a purely human one, but a helplessly human one. A very simple test will exhibit this. Let any simple reader of the Gospels be asked whether their narrative leaves upon his mind the impression that Jesus' life and acts were determined for him by the necessary limits of a well-meaning but weak humanity. 
or were not rather the voluntary chosen course of a life directed to an end, for the securing of which he daily denied himself the exercise of powers beyond human forces. No simple reader of the gospel will be easily persuaded that Jesus' life was what it was because he had, for the time, lost the capacity to act in superhuman powers. That it was, for example, lack of power, rather than lack of will, which withheld Jesus either from making the stones bread at the demand of the tempter, else where was the temptation? Or from coming down from the cross when challenged thereto by the scoffing multitude? But when we have assured ourselves that the limitations within which Jesus' life were cast were voluntary from day to day and act to act, and not the necessary sequence of a change which had once for all befallen him at his incarnation, we have cut up the canotic theory by the roots. The advocate of the canotic theory, who, under the condemnation of the epistles, seeks comfort from the Gospels, certainly has a claim upon our pity. No one of the evangelists, assuredly, shares his conception. To all and all alike, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, and to each and all alike a divine manifestation is both a manifestation and a manifestation of what is divine. Even the oldest gospel says that Busset, whom Dr. Forrest repeatedly quotes as if he were an authority in such matters, on this occasion indeed speaking truly, quote, even the oldest gospel is written from the standpoint of faith. Already for Mark, Jesus is not only the Messiah of the Jewish people, but the miraculous eternal Son of God, whose glory shone in the world. And it has been rightly emphasized that in this regard, our three first gospels are distinguished only in degree from the fourth. End quote. And again, quote, in the faith of the community which is shared already by the oldest evangelist, Jesus is the miraculous Son of God, in whom men believe, whom men set holy by the side of God. End quote. Was wissen wir von Jesus? Pages 54 and 57. It would be hard if writers, writing for the express purpose of depicting a divine being manifesting his deity in his daily course, should have so missed their mark as to have presented us rather with a portrait in which only a human life is manifested. That they have not done so is obvious to every reader of their Gospels, and when Dr. Forrest attempts to make it appear that they have done so, he not only willfully shuts his eyes to one whole half of their representation, but sets himself in direct contradiction to their whole portraiture of Jesus. It is he, not they, who tells us that Jesus had a, quote, bounden outlook, end quote, was, quote, subject to all the influences of his immediate surroundings, end quote, and even in his perfection was not absolute but conditioned, pages 11 and 12. In their view, Jesus' outlook had no limits. He was master of all circumstances, and his perfection was just the perfection of God. So far from Jesus' perfection being to them conditioned not absolute, derived not creative, negative not positive. Quote, his sinlessness means that he did not at any point of his progressive experience deflect from the specific ideal of service set before him by God. End quote, page 12. It was just the realization in a human life of the perfection which constitutes the ethical content of the idea of God. Matthew 5, verse 48, asserted by Jesus as his own possession as the Son of God. Compare Volkmar Fritscher, Das Berufsbewusstsein Jesu, pages 31 to 32. According to the evangelists, thus, Jesus' perfection is the manifestation of the Deliosis of God in flesh, a manifestation made under the conditions of human growth, it is true, but a manifestation, and a manifestation precisely of the Deliosis of the absolute God. Others needed daily to seek from God forgiveness of their unceasing sins, he, needing no forgiveness, is the dispenser of forgiveness to others, and even commits to others the right to remit sins. As self-evident, as is the evil of all others, Matthew 7.11, so self-evident is it that doing the work of the Father brings them into unison with him, Matthew 12.50, since whatever the Father has, in that does he share, Matthew 11.28 and following. It surely is hopeless to appeal to evangelists seeking to present this conception of Jesus in order to validate a theory that, in the days of the flesh, he was phenomenally mere man with no capacity left him for divine activities. 
Of course, they represent him as growing in wisdom, and as therefore at every stage of his growth lacking in complete knowledge and perfected wisdom, as subject to changing emotions, and there might have been included, only there does not chance to be included, in this the experience of the emotion of surprise, as making inquiries and learning by experience. All this belongs to another side of his complex personality, the human side which the evangelists, though they do not dwell upon it so fully or make its validation so much the end of their writing, yet are as far from obscuring as his divine dignity and powers. If we begin with the dogmatic announcement, there was but one mind in Christ, naturally, cardit coestio. If there was but one mind in Christ, then certainly he could not have been at one and the same time the subject of knowledge and ignorance, he could not have been at once God and man. But then the whole gospel narrative becomes at once a mass of contradictions, contradictions which cannot be voided by resolutely shutting our eyes to one, and that the main line of representation and focusing attention on the lower and less emphasized series. Thus we are brought, to say nothing more, into flagrant contradiction with the main purpose and general trend of the evangelical narrative. It is designed to set forth Jesus to us in his divine majesty. To it, he is the manifestation of God in the flesh. To Dr. Forrest, he reveals nothing but human limitations in his life. Quote, Confessedly, what we desire to discover is the revelation which God has been pleased to give us in Jesus Christ. We see that in certain instances, Christ is represented as characterized by limitations. Of what value is it to say that while these existed for him in one sense, they did not exist in another? The sphere in which they did not exist is, ex hypothesi, outside the range of the revelation. End quote. Pages 55 and following, and page 79. It is worthwhile to insist on this and similar passages, for they are not chance utterances, but belong to the essence of the situation. What we have to interpret is a double series of parallel facts. The means of interpretation adopted is neglect of one whole series and exclusive validation of the other. The result is that all that is left to be said of Jesus in the days of his flesh is that he was subject to human limitations. Let us not blink this shocking result. All that Christ was in the days of his flesh was, according to this conception, that limited nature whose outlook was bounded, which was accessible to temptation, and was the subject of moral growth, page 79. This was absolutely all there was to him. Behind this there were no depths in that personality. The scriptures tell us that God's outlook is boundless, that he is essentially perfect, that he is not tempted of evil. In what sense was this Jesus, then, who was nothing beyond and above the nature whose outlook was bounded, which suffered temptation and was the subject of moral growth, and who therefore was not in any recesses of his being perfect as God is perfect, in what sense was this being God? Dr. Forrest wishes to recognize him as God. In order to recognize this being as God, however, he must redefine deity, and in redefining it he must define it away. The ultimate difficulty of all theories of the class that he is defending is thus brought before us. Having set their hearts on a merely human Christ, and yet feeling unwilling to yield up frankly the divine Christ of the gospel revelation, they end by debasing the idea of God to the human level, so that in the end we lose not only our divine Christ, but God himself. That simply is not God which is imperfect and in process of perfecting by means of temptation. If this is all that Christ is, then Christ is not God, and Dr. Forrest continues to call him such only by stress of old habits and by a willing delusion. Dr. Forrest seeks to make capital, pages 94 and 95, out of the consent of the humanitarian theorizers with the orthodox in their perception of the absurdity of the canonic hypothesis. If it is any comfort to him to cry out against the upper and nether millstones grinding together, he ought not to be denied that small comfort. It ought, however, not to seem unnatural that every consistent thinker, whether his consistency is of belief or of unbelief, should think ill of a theory which inconsistently wishes to be both at once. We cannot illustrate here in detail the strait into which Dr. Forrest is brought by his attempt to interpret the Christ of the Gospels as a mere limited human being in his phenomenal manifestation. 
It admits of no doubt, for instance, that the evangelists represent him as sharer in the whole extent of the divine knowledge, differentiated from the prophets, with whom Dr. Forrest confuses him, page 7, though he never calls himself a mere prophet, just in this, that to the prophets God reveals some items of knowledge while his son shares in all he knows, Matthew 11:28 and following. We have lately had occasion to point this out, however. See Hastings's Dictionary of Christ and the Gospels, Article Foresight, and will not here go over the ground again. Let us take the sole example we can allow ourselves, then, from another sphere, that of the divine power which the evangelists ascribe to Christ, but which Dr. Forrest, in the interests of his theory, denies to him, insisting that he wrought his mighty works, like other instruments of God's will, only by means of the power of God graciously exerted now and again in his behalf. In the course of his argument, he necessarily, however, comes across this phenomenon of the scriptural representation, that Jesus, in working a miracle, says, quote, I will be thou clean, I say unto thee, arise, end quote, while his disciples say, quote, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, end quote. In face of this contrast, Dr. Forrest knows nothing better to urge than this paradox, that, quote, the emphasis which he puts on his own personality is an assertion not of his independence of the Father, but of the entireness of his dependence upon him, end quote. By this, he apparently hopes he will persuade us that the distinction he had drawn only means that Christ was more dependent, more perfectly dependent, he would say, on an exterior power for the working of his miracles than his apostles even. Surely no one will contend that the Son is independent of the Father, much less that the mediator of the covenant in his covenant at work acts independently of the Father. Here is only one of those undistributed middles which are as characteristic of Dr. Forrest's reasoning as the misplaced only is characteristic of his style. For the whole plausibility of his paradox here depends on the ambiguity of the use of the words dependent and independent. The plain man will be slow to believe, however, that the contrast between the I will of Jesus and the Jesus Christ maketh thee of his disciples is not a contrast between the relatively independent action of the Lord and the relatively dependent or instrumental action of the apostles in the matter of working miracles. It is nothing less than obvious, indeed, that the difference in the modes of statement means that the power by which the miracles of Jesus were wrought was in some high and true sense his own power, while that by which those of the apostles were wrought was not in this high and true sense their own power. So far from it being possible to say that Jesus, quote, was not the worker of his own miracles, end quote, we must go on to say that according to this representation, he was the worker not only of his own, but also of those of his disciples as well. The whole series, his and theirs alike, were his work. Is this a false testimony of the authors of the historical books of the New Testament? Jesus Christ on earth or in heaven? But whether on earth or in heaven, the same Jesus Christ incarnate is the real source of the power by which the miracles, whether of his own or of his disciples working, were wrought. And what is really significant of the record is that it takes pains by its I will and Jesus Christ maketh thee whole to say this of all alike. There is no such distinction then in the minds of these writers as that which Dr. Forrest draws between the earthly and the exalted Christ in respect to this question. Of course, this is not to say that God the Father was not concerned in the working of these miracles and that they were wrought independently of him, that the man Jesus was not conscious of resting on the Father's power or of doing merely the Father's will, that in all his mediatorial work he did not act as the sent of the Father, as his delegate, if you will. These are deeper questions than can be touched upon in this notice, but it is surely already superabundantly evident that they are not to be lightly set aside, as if there were no profound problems here of the interrelations of the persons of the Godhead, by the shallow expedience at the disposal of a canotic theory. Enough that here too, as at every other point, the canotic theory runs precisely athwart the most emphatic deliverances of the gospel narratives. In the failure of the canotic theory on which he bases his whole argument, the entire structure of Dr. Forrest's attempt to reduce the authority of our Lord in sphere and character alike, of course, falls to the ground. 
It will scarcely do to say that God is authoritative only in the spheres of faith and conduct. It is, of course, open to Dr. Forrest to follow his Busset and his companions and assail the trustworthiness of the gospel report of Christ's teaching and life. We have already seen that he exhibits a tendency here and there to find in the evangelic report the intrusion of the later reflection of the community. We cannot believe, however, that he is prepared to carry this to such lengths as, like Busset, to disengage from the Christ of faith as presented in the evangelists, a Christ of fact who was merely man and perhaps something less than an average man. Much less to such lengths as, with Fleiderer, to lose the real Christ altogether behind the veil of the Christ of faith. The retention of the Christ of the evangelists in any recognizable form, however, entails the retention of the Christ of authority. Authority in his declarations as well as in the religious impression he made, and in his declarations in all spheres as well as in those of faith and conduct. Of this Christ, it is illegitimate to speak, as Dr. Forrest speaks of his canonic Christ, as if he were liable to repeat in his teaching Jewish errors, page 69, and not quite able to forecast the future in which his authority might be wrongly applied. There remains to us, of course, the whole duty of carefully weighing his words and example, and of seeking to apply them only according to his will. Whatever value Dr. Forrest's book possesses to us, will be found to lie in its earnest attempt to perform this work in several departments of thought and action. He has, of course, not been able, in even this serious and careful discussion, to place himself on a plane which is above criticism. But he has led us, through a study of the relation of Christ's teaching to individual and corporate duty, which is cast in a high note and cannot fail to interest every reader. We must not neglect to say frankly before closing, nevertheless, that in the course of his discussion, Dr. Forrest occasionally hints at theological positions which we cannot share and which, on another occasion, we should like to traverse, such as, for example, his very defective doctrine of providence in connection with an exaggerated doctrine of freedom, pages 139, 140, 142, 143, 146, or his conception of the gift of the Spirit without distinction of his miraculous endowment of the apostles, and his indwelling in the people of God, or indeed his fundamental conception of Christianity as summed up in the filial spirit, pages 153-202. Nor would we neglect to say equally frankly that we depreciate the apparently confused way in which certain findings of modern criticism are here and there utilized as if they stood apart item from item, and did not form a part of a closed system of anti-supernaturalistic interpretation. But on none of these things can we dwell now. We shall only stay to say in a word that Dr. Forrest's second work does not seem to us to fulfill the promise of the first one, but exhibits him as embarking upon a line of thought, from advancing in which his well-wishers would hardly pray he may be saved. Princeton, August 1906 End of Review of the Authority of Christ by B. B. Warfield. Review of the Christ of the Gospels by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Christ of the Gospels by the Reverend W. W. Holdsworth, M.A. Tutor in New Testament Language and Literature, Hansworth College, London, Charles H. Kelly, 1911. Duodecimo, pages 6 to 251. The 41st Fernley Lecture. Mr. Holdsworth's Fernley Lecture makes a book of excellent quality. If we cannot quite say that it brings a contribution to our knowledge of the great subject with which it deals, we must at least find it a thoughtful and readable discussion of this great subject in the light and to some extent under the dominance of modern views. Its subject is the Christ of the Gospels, but this subject is construed somewhat broadly. Mr. Holdsworth himself outlines the task he undertakes as follows, page 18, quote, We are not concerned here with the efforts of the Church, nor with the degree of success it attained. Our investigation is with the records upon which the Church has been built up. What is the doctrine of the person of our Lord which is given to us in the New Testament? How did it come to find a place in those writings? 
The double question calls for at least an outline statement from the writings as a whole and then for some measure of historical criticism of the four Gospels. When we have thus considered the records, it may be possible to build up from the writings such a statement of our Lord's person as will present him once again to his church as the one true object of her adoration, the God-man in fellowship with whom a man may find the only fullness of his life. End quote. We perceive that Mr. Holdsworth has a constructive purpose in view. His object is to reach a new statement of the doctrine of the person of Christ, which will once again present him acceptably to the church's adoration. The phraseology suggests that he feels dissatisfied with the statements of this doctrine, with which the church has hitherto been compelled to content itself, as well as that he recognizes that in discarding them the church has fallen away also from its proper attitude to its divine Lord. He hopes by a restatement to help the church to recover its lost ground. The method by which he hopes to attain this object is a critical re-examination of the evangelical records. Thus he expects to obtain a basis for interpretation which will yield a truer view of the person of the Lord than either the new or old views which have hitherto been prevalent. He quite properly, however, supposes that this new interpretation can be most hopefully made in the light of a general view of the teaching as to our Lord's person of the New Testament as a whole. Accordingly, after a short introduction, he begins with a rapid survey of the Christology of the New Testament, which is very well done indeed and shows a true historical sense, a clear expository talent and a thoughtful mind. From this he passes to a somewhat lengthy discussion of what he calls the gospel record, that is, a critical investigation of the origin and historical character of our gospels. Here he does not appear to us to move with such sure step, and seems to speak more as a reporter of the views of others adopted by himself with scarcely sufficient basis of individual consideration. Finally, in four chapters entitled, respectively, The Synoptic Jesus, The Johannine Jesus, The Higher Synthesis, Jesus Christ, and The Gospel Message, he presents his constructive view of the Christ of the Gospels, and offers it as the solution of the difficulties created by modern conditions, and as a new point of crystallization for the Church's adoration of its Lord. Along with much that is strikingly said and winningly argued here, we cannot help thinking that Mr. Holdsworth is at least successful in this part of his task. The conception he offers us of the God-man is vague and in danger of running off into a subjectivity which affords little support to faith. We cannot help thinking that Mr. Holdsworth is least successful in this part of his task. The conception he offers us of the God-man is vague and in danger of running off into a subjectivity which affords little support to faith. Precisely what the view of Christ's person which Mr. Holdsworth would commend to us is remains a little difficult to determine. He is constant in his affirmation of the true deity of Christ, and he does not always shun the language of the Chalcedonian Christology. He can speak of incarnation, page 222, as if he were using the term in its historical sense, and indeed of the incarnation, meaning, quote, the union of two natures, human and divine, end quote, page 41. He can even employ the precise Chalcedonian affirmation and declare that it is the teaching of the Gospels and the sole firm foundation for faith. Quote, if our faith is to have a sufficient objective, we want exactly what is offered to us in the Gospels, a true humanity and a complete divinity united in one person, End quote, page 237. Yet he can speak of this same doctrine as creating a fatal dualism in our Lord's person, page 211, and as, quote, representing our Lord as governed by two distinct personalities, which, if they do not conflict, at any rate alternate, end quote, page 138. He declares that, quote, no explanation yet offered as to how perfect God and perfect man could attain unity of consciousness in one person, can be considered sufficient, end quote, page 210. Nothing but a complete fusion of the two natures would satisfy him. Quote, it is possible that the Christian church will never be able to frame a definition that will perfectly express the complete fusion of two natures, one human and one divine, end quote, page 194. Accordingly, he can write such a passage as the following, page 132, quote, we may even accept without fear of loss or compromise in that which has interpreted us to ourselves and filled us with living hope that our Lord himself, the consciousness of a true humanity, simple and undivided, 
preceded the recognition within himself of deity. Nothing but confusion and vagueness of thought awaits us if we allow ourselves to think that the God he was came before his consciousness from the earliest days. The puerilities of the apocryphal gospels are a sufficient warning to us of the penalties which the church will pay if any attempt be made to confuse or divide the personality of our Lord by positing in him a clear sense of inherent deity from the first. We do not gain but lose when we thus divide the person of Jesus, end quote. This is surely a remarkable passage from any point of view, among others, however, not least from a logical point of view. The assertion is distinct that our Lord was both God and man. The implication is expressed that in later life he was fully conscious of being both God and man. We are warned, nevertheless, not to suppose that he could have possessed this consciousness of being both God and man in early life. The reason assigned is that this would be to, quote, divide the person of Jesus, end quote. Why, meanwhile, it should, quote, confuse or divide the complete personality of our Lord to posit in him a clear sense of inherent deity at the first, end quote, any more than at the last, remains dark. Light begins to dawn only when we begin to suspect that Mr. Holdsworth does not intend his Chalcedonian language in a Chalcedonian sense. When he speaks of, quote, the union of two natures, human and divine, end quote, in Christ, he does not seem to mean that these two natures are two distinct natures. He seems to mean that they are just one nature which is both human and divine. He does not seem to mean that Christ has a human nature and a divine nature. He seems to mean that Christ has a nature which is both human and divine. And what he seems to mean in the passage before us is that this single nature, in reality as divine as it was human, or divine because it was human, as it could not be perceived by others, so could not perceive itself to be divine until it had reached its perfection of development. Perhaps it is even implied that it is not divine except in its perfect development. It is our Lord's perfect humanity that is his deity. Let us hope we are misreading Mr. Holdsworth's meaning. There are passages which would lend some color to such a hope. He speaks, as we have seen, of two natures in Christ and of their union to form one personality. We read, page 41, quote, It is evident, from such passages as we have been considering, that to St. Paul the Incarnation meant the union of two natures, human and divine. End quote. Compare page 19. We read again, page 47, quote, No candid critic of such writings can deny that the faith of the first disciples gathers around one who was to them both perfectly human and perfectly divine. End quote. And yet again, page 48, quote, to them, the human and the divine had made one personality, unique and consummate, end quote. There are other passages which might easily fall in with these, as when we read that italics his, quote, it was italics through his humanity, end italics, that his first disciples learned to discern in him a divinity before which they bowed in worship, end quote, page 131 that, quote, the synoptic writers in delineating the humanity of our Lord lead up to his divinity, end quote, page 104, and even that, quote, the humanity they had depicted made an interpretation in terms of divinity inevitable, end quote, page 105. Though we begin to wonder why any humanity can demand interpretation in, quote, terms of divinity, end quote, and this wonder is increased when we read in similar language that, quote, when we find in him a perfect humanity, we are close upon the deity which transfigures, indeed, but never destroys it, end quote, page 155, which appears to imply that a perfect humanity approaches divinity. And our hope is quite dashed when we read plainly that perfect manhood, quote, stamps him as divine, end quote, page 141, and that, quote, a manhood so complete, end quote, as his, can be, quote, accounted for only in terms of deity, End quote, page 157. In such expressions, the separating lines that divide humanity and deity seem quite washed out, and the underlying conception seems to be that to be complete and perfect man is to be God. And therefore it is, doubtless, that instead of speaking of our Lord's divine human person, Mr. Holdsworth prefers to reverse the terms and to speak of his human divine person, page 215. We regretfully conclude, therefore, that there is floating before his mind a conception which enables him to speak of our Lord as divine as well as human, because he is perfectly and completely human. 
We gladly confess, however, that this conception seems to remain somewhat vague to him, and that his recognition of the true deity of our Lord is far more significant of his attitude to him than the explanation which he seems to suggest of how it is that he can be God as well as man. It is not reassuring, nevertheless, to see him appeal in the end with sympathy to the modes of representation of Wilhelm Hermann and Albrecht Ritschl. The lack of clearness in the presentation of his conception of the person of Christ attends also occasionally Mr. Holdsworth's less important statements. On pages 30 to 31, for instance, he cites Romans 9.5 in this somewhat odd and misleading paraphrase, Quote, as concerning the flesh, he is of the patriarchs, but in himself he is God blessed forever. End quote. Precisely what he means to convey by which it somewhat puzzles us to determine. He adds immediately, quote, there is good reason for believing that in one passage, Colossians 2.3, the true reading directly gives to Christ the name God, but even if we do not press the reading of the Vatican manuscript in this passage, etc., end quote. From the context, we suppose that Romans 9.5 is cited as, quote, directly giving to Christ the name God, end quote, as it well might be. The succeeding words, therefore, are very confusing to the reader, and not less so that it does not appear that the name God is directly given to Christ in Colossians 2.2, and especially not in the reading of B, where Christo seems to stand in opposition to do mysterio do theo, and not do theo alone. Again, after reading on page 154 that, quote, the language used, end quote, in Matthew 11, 25 to 30, quote, indicates the pre-existence of the Messiah, end quote. Why, by the way, the Messiah here? With a supporting footnote from Dr. W. C. Allen's commentary on St. Matthew, it is rather confusing to read on page 104 that the synoptics know nothing of the pre-existence of Christ, and this is introduced only by John in his account of Christ's self-testimony. Of course, every time the synoptics represent Christ as calling himself the Son of Man, they record an implication of a claim to pre-existence, and the implication of pre-existence is not easily excluded from his recorded representations of his earthly life as a mission to which he has come forth, Mark 1.28, or upon which he has been sent, Luke 4.43. We cannot think either that the suggestion that there was no recognition of our Lord's divinity among the disciples until after his resurrection... Page 49, we are stating the point more strongly than Mr. Holdsworth does, is quite consistent with the general representation in the volume with regard to our Lord's claims and his disciples' apprehension of them. It was not merely, quote, in the light of Easter Day and the Pentecost that his followers knew that this Jesus was the very God, end quote, page 48. What could his disciples have understood him to mean by the great declaration of Matthew 11:25 to 30 which Mr. Holdsworth understands to involve a distinctly divine claim, and also asserts not to stand as a, quote, rock in the sky, end quote, in the Synoptic Gospels, page 152. What meaning could they attach to such a declaration as that of Mark 13.32? What was floating before Peter's mind when he made his great confession, Matthew 16.16, 16, with its double designation of his master as not only the Christ, but the Son of the living God, even though we may agree that in its full reach, quote, it was scarcely understood even by the man who made it, end quote, page 132. What meaning did his followers attach to his response to the solemn adjuration of the high priest? Matthew 26, verses 63 to 64. We do not ask here what meaning they could attach to the culminating enunciation of essential deity by our Lord, recorded in Matthew 28, verse 19, because that was spoken after his resurrection, and may take its place, therefore, side by side with Thomas's higher scriptions in John 20, verse 28, and for another reason also, to which we shall immediately advert. This is the unhappy readiness which Mr. Holdsworth occasionally exhibits to throw doubt on the trustworthiness of the records in their reports of our Lord's sayings. This is, of course, incidental to his critical position over against the evangelical documents, which, as we have already hinted, seems to us artificial and secondary. He does not hesitate to argue for the relative priority of one account as over against another on grounds which posit the modification of the language attributed to Jesus in accordance with the changing beliefs of his reporters, page 61. 
the small place which such argumentation takes in his pages in comparison with what we have grown accustomed to in writers of less conservative instincts does not affect the principle on which alone it can rest. Thus, he is not at all averse to supposing that there is, quote, a considerable element of subjectivity, end quote, to be found in our Lord's discourses as reported by John, which, though given, quote, in the vivid form of direct speech, end quote, yet present us the Master's teaching only as, quote, enlarged and interpreted by the recording apostle, end quote, page 121. This same subjectivity he carries also into the synoptic reports. Thus, in particular, page 122, quote, it has often been pointed out that the words of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19, do not read like that which we have been accustomed to find given as sayings of Jesus in the earlier Gospels. The baptismal formula is more like an expansion made when baptism was more of a sacrament than it was in the days of Jesus, and when the doctrine of the Trinity was seen to be an inevitable deduction from our Lord's teaching of his own relation to the Father that there was an underlying saying of Jesus, thus amplified, few will wish to deny, and as the words appear in the earliest manuscripts and versions without any suggestion of hesitation, they cannot be considered an interpretation from later times. It appears, however, in the form of a divinely directed expansion of some simpler phrase. The gift of the Spirit at Pentecost had thrown a flood of light upon the person of our Lord and upon his relation to the Father, and in this light the injunction of our Lord was interpreted. The Great Commission is not less authoritative because it contains an interpretation of a command which was probably simpler in expression, though equally profound in meaning. End quote. Such criticism is essentially frivolous. Jesus could not have said what is here put into his mouth, for what is here put into his mouth belongs to the ecclesiastical usages and the doctrinal formulation of a later time. But he doubtless said something of importance, if only we had it, and... We may accept even the injunctions of a later time as authoritative. Meanwhile, there is no reason in the world for transferring what Matthew ascribes to Jesus to the later community, except unwillingness on the part of the critic to believe that Jesus could have established the sacrament of baptism and could have announced the doctrine of the Trinity, which all men afterwards, but not Jesus, could see, quote, to be an inevitable deduction from our Lord's teaching of his own relation to the Father, end quote. In a word, the critic's ungrounded theory of the development of doctrine in the first years of Christianity, a theory which denies to our Lord the capacity to draw, quote, inevitable deductions, end quote, from his own claims, becomes a Procrustean bed on which he measures the trustworthiness of all documentary evidence, and that is as much as to say that he imposes his hypothetical construction on the records instead of drawing his constructions from the records from which we may perceive that whatever we may say of the subjectivity of Matthew's account of our Lord's saying, we cannot deny the intense subjectivity of Mr. Holdsworth's interpretation of Matthew's account. Mr. Holdsworth's general critical attitude is that of the present dominant school of gospel criticism, set forth, however, in as genial and reverent a tone as it admits of. We suppose very few will go with him in the hearty acceptance he accords to Dr. Arthur Wright's highly artificial hypothesis of successive editions of Mark as the true account of the phenomena of the synoptic tradition. There are also, of course, other individualisms in his treatment of the critical problem, but these are unimportant. What he gives is, in general, merely a very clear exposition of current views supported after the usual fashion. Though he knows and praises Dr. Lightfoot's, quote, admirable discussion of the word logia, end quote, he can still tell us that when Papias says that, quote, Matthew composed his logia in the Hebrew tongue and each man interpreted these as he was able, he evidently means that St. Matthew collected and arranged a considerable number of the sayings of Christ which were floating about the Christian church, end quote, page 75. He can still tell us also that, quote, there can be no doubt that the earlier use of the word logion was in the sense of what we know as an oracle that is a short condensed utterance, end quote, page 77. Is a short condensed utterance what we know as an oracle? Or is an oracle with us not rather a sacred and authoritative utterance? In any event, the latter is what logion was to the Greeks. The word is not, in usage at least, a diminutive and it has no implication of brevity. 
Its implication is that of divinity, and Papias's statement does not represent Matthew as collecting sayings of Jesus, but as composing his scriptures. Mr. Holdsworth, even in the company of the great host of New Testament scholars who do the same, should not confound Loria with Loru. The simplicity with which he does so may be perceived by comparing the footnote on page 74 with the text. In passing, we may call attention to what seems to us a remarkable sentence on page 58. Quote, but the appearance of Logia, preserved upon pieces of papyrus, shows that there were documents at a very much earlier stage of church history than is indicated by the more ordered collections which we have in the first gospel. End quote. We pass the employment of the term Logia to denote the sayings of Christ found on certain fragments of papyrus. It was the term adopted by Mrs. Grenfell and Hunt, and though unfortunately adopted and misleading in its use, yet finds some justification in the authoritative manner in which these sayings are put forward. But do any of these scraps of papyrus antedate, quote, very much earlier, end quote, A.D. 70, before which Matthew was written, or that earlier date at which the discourses used by Matthew were put together. Is there any reason to imagine that the collection of sayings which they draw upon antedates the discourse source which Matthew draws upon and which must have been put together within the first decade or so after the crucifixion? We must not give the impression that Mr. Holdsworth's book is compact of errors. On the contrary, it is a very unusually good book of its kind so good, so reverent, and so generally positive in its point of view, that it is worthwhile pointing out in what respect it fails to sustain its high level. It will be read with pleasure by everyone who will enjoy a generally sound and telling presentation of the evidence of the deity of our Lord derived from the records, and there are scattered through it remarks of unwanted insight and helpfulness. We esteem one of these, the suggestion, page 42, of the source from which Luke may have obtained the speeches of Peter, which he incorporates in the early chapters of Acts. Why not from Mark? Mark was a companion of Peter's, and also of Paul's, where Luke must have come into contact with him. And those who think that Mark's gospel underlies Luke's, we are not of that number, can scarcely refuse to allow that Mark's reports may also underlie what Luke gives us of Peter's speeches. The whole treatment of the Christology of Peter's speeches, page 42, is suggestive. We shall give ourselves the pleasure, however, of referring to only a couple of passages which show the delicacy and precision with which Mr. Holdsworth is able to deal with burning questions in modern church life. There is, for instance, the question of social betterment. Could anything more neatly hit off the truth than this? Quote, the reproach has been flung at the church that sometimes the modern priest is more concerned for the unemployed than for the unrepentant, that the gospel of Jesus Christ contains a definite social reference and prospect few will wish to deny. In accepting and using the language of Jewish eschatology, our Lord shows that he too has a social and political promise for the world. Italics, but the material good is always a secondary production of the kingdom. End italics, end quote page 245, italics ours. The world is to be bettered through its conversion, otherwise not. The preaching of the gospel is therefore the prime instrument of social betterment. Then there is the question of church union. Quote, we are justified then in seeking the unity which all desire, not along the lines of organic unity, nor in any system of church orders, however revered they may have become and however charged they may be with historic association, but wherever the presence of its one Lord is realized, when two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst, and it is impossible for any one, unless blinded by prejudice, to deny that it is the presence of the Christ that makes the church. End quote, page 249. These two are golden words, and a golden day will dawn for the churches when their leaders cease to seek unity in anything else than in Christ. There are few names in which more crimes against the Church of Christ have been committed, and are being still committed in our day, not least on mission ground, than the name of unity. A show of organized strength in the face of the world is everywhere being made to take the place of the only real strength which comes out of loyalty to Christ and his word 
Everywhere, men are busy building a big house over a divided family and wreck nothing of that divided heart which can prosper in nothing. End of Review of The Christ of the Gospels by B.B. Warfield Review of Jesus Christus in der Geschichte by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jesus Christus in der Geschichte, ein Beitrag zu den Drus- und Jato-Debatten von D. Ebrard Wischer, Professor an der Universität in Basel, Tübingen, Verlag von J.C.B. Mohr, Paul Siebeck, 1912. Sexte Decimo, pages 42. Ebrard Wischer always writes interestingly, and this address, for it is an address, delivered at a conference of Christian students, is no exception to the rule. In substance, it is a popular presentation of the argument developed at length and with more scientific stringency in his well-known article on historical certainty and faith in Jesus Christ, published in the Zeitschrift für Theologie und Kirche for 1898. Heft 3, pages 195 to 260. Although, therefore, it declares on its title page that it is a contribution to the Druze and Yato debates, it has only the slightest connection with these debates. They are mentioned only that the reader may be counseled to let them alone and go behind them. No doubt Druze and Yato may be answered point by point, but what then? The real question still remains untouched for it is Vischer's, quote, conviction that by this labor, necessary and meritorious as it is, the difficult questions raised by Druze and his predecessors are by no means answered, that, on the contrary, precisely by this defense the real problem which is in debate is made a burning one, the question, to wit, of how a historical personality, which, because it belongs to history, shares also the lot of all that is historical and passes more and more into the past, of how such a personality can possess at the same time abiding significance, can be for humanity the guide, who guides them, despite all the changes of times and relations, most surely and most directly to the eternal ground of all being and becoming. It is precisely by a defense which follows the doubts of the historicity of Jesus step by step, which takes up every consideration urged against the sources which come into account and tries its weight, that it first becomes thoroughly clear what it means that Jesus Christ, too, is a historical object. End quote, page 6. What is historical belongs to time, nay, rather to a time, and as times succeed times, it fades more and more into the past, to which, indeed, it inherently belongs, bearing its character and meeting, perhaps, its needs, but certainly not ours, upon whom a new heaven and a new earth have dawned. Jesus Christ, as a historical object, cannot escape this twofold result of his very historicity. He becomes only a shadowy figure in the fading past, and what may be discerned of him through the mists of time belongs distinctly to the past, separated from our modern world by a deep chasm. Quote, what has this historical Jesus, this figure of a Jewish rabbi, in his indefiniteness and in the limitations of his times, in common with what has this historical Jesus, this figure of a Jewish rabbi, in his indefiniteness and in the limitations of his times, in common with what Christianity has believed and confessed itself to possess in Christ? How can the significance which a great part of mankind has ascribed and continues to ascribe to Jesus for its relation to God be combined with the knowledge that Jesus is a historical object and all that is historical is transitory? This is the real religious problem which comes into discussion in this controversy over the historical Jesus. End quote. Page 9. Having thus posited the problem, Vischer addresses himself to solving it. At the outset, he is concerned that we shall adopt the right method. It is usual to begin with an investigation of the oldest tradition concerning Jesus, first of all, of the conception of Christ of the earliest Christian community, and to ask first how far this is credible, and then how far we can recognize today a guide in this Jesus shown to be historical. This, Fisher considers a bad way. 
we shall scarcely go through with it without subjecting the results of our researches to a certain amount of manipulation to make them fit our needs. He recommends to us, therefore, an opposite way. Let us begin, he says, with the other end, with what Jesus Christ has been and is to men, and proceed backwards from that to what he was as a historical figure. Quote, Let us turn from the investigators who dispute over the trustworthiness of the oldest tradition to the company of those who from the times of the first disciples until today have gathered about Jesus Christ as their Lord. What have they always believed that they found in and through Christ? And whence have they drawn this assurance, confident in which many have gone to their death? End quote. Page 10. The argument which he proposes, it will be seen, is that from effects to their cause, and the principle on which he proceeds, a principle fully developed and defended at length in the earlier article to which we have already adverted, Zeitschrift für Theologie und Kirche, 1898, is that not only a sound, but the only sound method of reaching absolute certainty as to past things is through observation of their present effects of past personalities and events necessarily implied in present conditions we may have true certainty of all other past things only a greater or less degree of probability may be attained proceeding on this principle vischer passes in rapid review what we may call the sequences of jesus in history and emerges at length in the following conclusion Quote, if now, after this journey through history, after this survey of what the Christian community, yea, humanity in general, have received from Jesus and ever anew receive from him, we turn back to the problem from which we started out. We have now found the right standpoint for replying to the questions contained in it. Now at length we are in a position to give a clear and distinct answer to the question as to the historicity of Jesus and it is certainly not too much to say that the arguments brought against it appear to us now simply ridiculous, not because we now, as no doubt we are accustomed to here, occupying the standpoint of faith, have no need to give heed to the objections of historical science, but because we have struck out the method by which alone we can attain to a real, complete knowledge of historical objects, the method to wit of inference from the collective still tangible effects to their causes. Undoubtedly, it is altogether right when, in order to obtain an assured judgment as to Jesus, all the testimonies to him that lie before us, in and out of the Bible, are examined in the most exact manner, according to the methods which the historian applies in all his investigations. The Gospels before all, as well as the epistles of Paul, and the well-known passages in Tacitus, Pliny, and Suetonius, only so will we guard ourselves from substituting, on the ground of actual and alleged religious experiences, fantasies for the historical actuality. We would not then, by an appeal to the element of faith, juggle with the Christ of history. But neither would we neglect, when dealing with Jesus, what seems to us a matter of course in the case of every other great man, to the still existing vestiges of which we can and must infer the greatness or nature of a historical phenomenon, there belong not merely the oldest written testimonies which give an account of it, but much more its work and the effects which proceed from it. It would be a remarkable historian who should carefully collect all the notices about Dante and search the whole history of his times for traces of his existence and not put himself under the influence of the Divina Commedia, but leave it to one side unheeded. Of course, the greater a personality is, the more important he is for the history of mankind so much the more impossible is it for any rightly to comprehend his actuality and personality except those who stand under his influence and possess the organs to feel the imperishable power of his work. That is true of a Dante and a Goethe, of a Giotto and a Bach, of a Francis of Assisi and of a Luther as well as of a Jesus. And we are asking no exceptional treatment for him when we reply to those who combat his historicity only when we attend to Jesus' effects in history and experience them in ourselves are we in position to decide this question. It is therefore quite intelligible when, to the plain Christian who lives in the gospel, the conflict over the historicity of Jesus seems absurd. 
only after we have traced the effects of Jesus through history and taken account of what the Christian community believes it possesses in Christ and why it believes it possesses it do we understand also how far Jesus Christ, in spite of being a historical man affected in many respects by the limitations of his time, of his people and of his locality, yet can possess abiding religious significance. End quote. Page 35 and following. What it is important to observe here is that Vischer is not arguing that the Christ of faith may be indifferent to historical assault. He is seeking the certitude of history, not of faith. And he is arguing that history gives us a Jesus whose existence is not merely probable, in however high a degree, but absolutely certain, certain with the certainty of the axiom that every effect must have a cause. His method is to point out that historical certainty does not wait upon the criticism of the witnessing documents, but may be grounded in quite other considerations. Nay, wherever it exists indeed must always rest on other considerations, on the observation, in a word, of historical effects. Had history preserved for us no single intimation of the existence of Dante, the existence of the Divina Commedia would compel, not suggest, his postulation. And had historical records preserved for us no single intimation of the existence of Jesus Christ, or what comes to the same thing, should historical criticism obliterate every existing intimation of his existence, there exist in the world effects quite as palpable as the Divina Commedia, which compel, not suggest, his postulation. What the consideration of these effects gives us is not probability, however high, but certainty. Of course, the estimation of the effects and the discovery of the nature of their cause implies a certain capacity of appreciation. To infer a Raphael from the Sistine Madonna, a Beethoven from his Sonatas, a Dante from the Divina Commedia, implies specific endowments in the observer. Likewise, to infer from the effects which he has wrought in the world a Jesus Christ has its implication also of endowments in the observer. This circumstance, however no more in the one case than in the other, destroys the validity of the inference. It only directs us to its proper organs. Nor does Vischer desire, by this appeal to the witness of the effects, to set aside the appeal to the critically examined sources. So far as, under criticism, they yield a positive result, they supply, according to him, the details as to the personality inferred from his effects in the world. There could have been no Divina Commedia had there been no Dante, but it is from the historical notices of Dante that we draw our portrait of Dante. Our certainty that there was a Jesus is drawn from the effects he has wrought in the world. What manner of Jesus he was, we are to go to the criticized testimonies which have come down to us to tell us. To put it coarsely, our certainty of the existence of Jesus is given us in the effects he has wrought in the world. Our conception of what this Jesus thus certified to us was given to us in the critically reconstructed records. To put it thus coarsely does injustice to Vicious' position. It does not seem to do as much injustice to it, however, as it ought to. It can scarcely be contended that the inference from effects is only to the existence of a cause without involving anything as to the nature of that cause. The qualitative is as stringent as the merely quantitative inference. It is not the existence of merely a man, but of a genius, and of a genius of quite specific gifts that we infer from the Divina Commedia, the Sistine Madonna, the Sonatas of Beethoven. What from the effects Christ has wrought in the world? Fisher himself tells us, page 11, that in whatever various ways men may have expressed it, the one thing which Jesus Christ has meant to all the world in all ages may be summed up in the one word, God. What, then, if the criticism of the sources gives us, as the Jesus that really lived, not God, but man? In his eagerness not to juggle away the historical Jesus in the interests of the Christ of faith, and in the fear that men shall set their fantasies in the place of the historical actuality in their thought of Jesus, Vischer does not here do justice to his own principle of interpretation. When we survey the effects of Jesus in the world, we are compelled to infer as cause not some Jesus merely, but a Jesus of a very particular quality, of a quality which alone could be the cause of these effects. And that Jesus is not the Jesus which Vischer would commend to our acceptance on the basis of the criticism of the sources. 
how, after his survey of these effects, he can still recommend us to see in Jesus merely a man is a standing wonder. No matter what Jesus' criticism extracts from the sources, the Jesus which actually was is the Jesus which is required to account for his effects in the world. Or rather, no criticism of the sources can be sound which eliminates from them the Jesus which corresponds to the effects which he has wrought in the world. For it is undeniable that the Jesus which lies on the face of the sources is the very Jesus who appears in these effects. It will not do to attempt to account for the presence of the divine Jesus in the historical records on the ground that it is a natural creation of those who have felt the effects of Jesus and to substitute for him another Jesus who stands in no recognizable relation to these effects. What needs to be accounted for is not the rise of the divine Jesus in the consciousness of his first followers, but the fading of the divine Jesus out of the consciousness of so many of his later followers. It is this last estimate of him which stands in contradiction with the observed effects he has left in the world. We wonder in this connection what Vischer can mean by words like these. Page 25, quote, Yea, even the death on the cross, this frightful enigma, furchtbare Reize, for the solving of which the deepest thinkers have ever afresh labored, end quote. To Vischer, Jesus Christ, though bringing to the world a revelation of God which has revolutionized the world, was, after all, only a rabbi of Nazareth who cannot himself, but only God who has revealed himself in him, be our comfort and support in life and in death. Page 39. Why should the death of such an one, even on the cross, be a frightful enigma to which profound thinkers devote continual labor in the hope of reaching a solution of it? Is there any enigma in a good man who throws himself athwart the religious prejudices of a fanatical people, falling a victim to their hate? What is there in Jesus' death more than in that of Socrates, which will justify us in speaking of it as a frightful enigma, which ever presents itself to the investigation of profound thinkers in the hope that mayhap they may fathom its mysteries? On Fischer's view of whom and what Jesus was, there is no mystery here, whatever, no enigma to solve. What should a Galilean rabbi do, but after a while, die? And what could a good man do, other than die a martyr for his cause? And what could be more natural than that the zealots for the law should slay him, who made himself greater than Moses and the prophets, and clothed himself, with whatever meaning, with those prerogatives of God, the forgiveness of sins on earth, the judgment of the world? On the inevitableness of Jesus' death, on Fischer's presuppositions, see the instructive exposition of Julius Kaftan, Dogmatic, pages 570 to 572. And as for the cross, how else could he have managed to die by judicial sentence just then and there? If there be an enigma here to study, a mystery worthy of the thought of men of thought, it is because... There is something more in Jesus than a rabbi of Nazareth, and something more in his death than the natural end which a rabbi of Nazareth, who called down on himself the wrath of his fanatical compatriots, would make. That there was something both more in him and in his death is certain, with that historical certainty which, Fischer insists, resides in the necessary implication of an adequate cause in observed effects. We wish he himself had followed his argument until he had uncovered precisely what this something more is. End of Review of Jesus Christus in der Geschichte by B.B. B. Warfield Review of Dogma, Fact and Experience by B.B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dogma, Fact and Experience by A. E. J. Rawlinson, Student of Christ College, Examining Chaplain to the Bishop of Lichfield, Formerly Tutor of Keble College, Oxford, London, Macmillan & Co., 1915, Crown, Octavo, pages 7 to 207. This little book is one of the reverberations of the explosion which followed the publication of the manifesto of young liberal high churchmen called Foundations, 1913. Compare this review for July 1913, pages 526 to 538. 
Mr. Rawlinson was one of the contributors to that volume and had prepared an essay on the resurrection and the life to be inserted into a new and enlarged edition of it, which was at one time in contemplation. That project having been abandoned, he has added four other essays to that one and has published them in this volume. The four additional essays treat of religion and temperament, dogma and history, our Lord's view of the future and clerical veracity. The last of these essays is, of course, a defense of the ethical position of liberal churchmen in the Church of England against the strictures of bishops Weston and Gore. See this review for October 1914, pages 529 to 585. The defense runs on the ordinary lines and amounts to saying that the animus imponentis is not strict, that everybody understands the situation and so nobody is deceived, and that so little has really been settled as yet as to Christian truth, or at least as to the Christian truth that is in dispute, after 2,000 years, that patience should be had for a little while with very varying forms of belief and modes of statement. The first essay is an appeal to us not to look upon religion as so entirely an emotion that it really depends on temperament, and people of a different temperament are incapable of religion. The second essay is an interesting examination of the inner meaning of modernism. The two remaining essays, On the Resurrection and the Life and Our Lord's View of the Future, are the most important. The former of these, reversing Paul's method of explaining our resurrection by Christ's, which had occurred, been observed, and therefore was well understood, seeks to explain away Christ's resurrection by application to it of a theory of ours, which has not yet occurred, which has consequently not been understood, and which is comparatively therefore ill understood. The precise manner of our Lord's resurrection, Mr. Rawlinson suggests, may profitably be left for the present undefined. Meanwhile, as the Church has condoned Westcott's theory, which disbelieves in the real existence of matter and represents our Lord as entering at what we call the resurrection on another form of existence under new conditions, in which his life formed a new embodiment, why should it balk at other theories which allow, like this, no real resurrection of the flesh? Why should it balk, for example, at a view which should combine the doctrine upon the one hand of a miraculous annihilation of our Lord's body, in so far forth as it was a body of flesh and blood, with the assertion, upon the other, of such a series of self-manifestations of the risen Lord to the disciples, as Canon Streeter and those who think with him affirm? To our moderns, any theory apparently is more acceptable than the plain fact of a genuine resurrection, which is affirmed by its witnesses. Even a miracle, it seems, may be called in, if only it is not this miracle. The essay on Our Lord and the Future undertakes to face the question whether Our Lord was mistaken in his eschatological outlook. The difficulty of the question is not minimized, nor is the seriousness of the issue which it raises. It is here, surely, it is remarked, that the storm center of theological speculation resides at the present moment. It is probable enough that this, and not the controversy about miracle, will be for the next generation the great intellectual difficulty of the Christian religion. The various methods of dealing with the question which have been advanced are reviewed, and then a new solution is proposed. It is this. Our Lord was a prophet, and prophets were accustomed in their outlook on the future to confuse immediacy with certainty. The truth would appear to be that the prophets expressed, in the terms of the proximity of the kingdom, their assurance of its certainty. The prophet is neither clairvoyant nor soothsayer, and prediction is not the essence of his role. His certainty assumes the form of immediacy, and it is psychologically inevitable that he should see the kingdom as a thing that is near. It is within his horizon, and a man's horizon is short. Three score years and ten is its utmost limit. And to the prophet the kingdom is in sight. They exhibit the ideal not as something dim and remote and shadowy, but as something vivid and close at hand, full of present inspiration and power. So, whether in the prophets or in the creeds, or in the words of Jesus, the certainty of the arrival of the kingdom is expressed in the terms of an assertion of its proximity. It is easier to criticize than to construct, and we think Mr. Rawlinson's criticism of others' explanations more successful than his attempt to construct an explanation of his own. There is Professor A. G. Hogg's explanation, for example. According to Professor Hogg, 
Jesus gave expression in these statements to a genuine hope which he cherished, to a real will of God. But his own hope, God's will, hung for its realization upon the cooperation of men, and the cooperation of men has failed, and so Jesus' hope, God's will, has failed too. The criticism on this representation is excellent. Thus to make the kingdom dependent for its consummation upon the attitude of man is in effect to put man at God's mercy and to demand that men should have faith to believe that the kingdom, even so, will one day come, is in the last resort to ask them to put their trust not in God but in their fellows and in themselves. That surely is to rob God of its essential character as a faith, not in man or in the faith of man but in God. End of Review of Dogma, Fact and Experience by B.B. Warfield Review of Die Beicht im Zusammenhänge mit der sakralen Rechtspflege in der Antike by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Die Beicht im Zusammenhänge mit der sakralen Rechtspflege in der Antike, ein Beitrag zur näheren Kenntnis kleinasiatisch-orientalischer Kulte der Kaiserzeit von Franz Steinleitner, Doktor der Philosophie Leipzig, Kommissionsverlag der Dietrichen Verlagsbuchhandlung Theodor Weicher, 1913, Octavo, Pages 135. The following essay, says the author, moves in the frontier region between philosophy and theology in the field of the history of religion. Hermann Usner and his school have led the way to the study of the problems in the history of religion presented by that period, quote, when young Christianity entered upon its victorious course in the slippery field of the religious syncretism and theocracy of vanishing antiquity and introduced into the history of mankind a completely new epoch of its spiritual life. End quote. Franz Cumond, in his great Mithras works, and after him Hugo Hepting, in his studies on the Attis worship, have shown us how to illuminate dark subjects by collecting the scattered material from every quarter and subjecting it as a whole to intelligent scrutiny. The road having been opened by such competent hands, it has been diligently walked in. Investigation into, quote, the chaos of ideas and religious usages of that period of strong religious agitation, end quote, has been pushed steadily on. We need recall but such leading names as A. Dietrich, Anrich, Reitzenstein, Wendland, and the essays published in the Archiv für Religionswissenschaft, in the Religionsgeschichtliche Versuchen und Vorarbeiten, and in part in the Zeitschrift für die Neue Testamentliche Wissenschaft und die Kunde des Urchristentums. As a result, we understand, as never before, the vital contact in which the world of antiquity, which was passing away, and the rising world of Christianity stood with one another, how, quote, the two worlds, however inimicably they envisaged one another and bitterly struggled with one another, were nevertheless inseparably bound together, end quote, how, quote, the Christian spirit, liberated from Judaism, formed a new body for itself out of the members of dying antiquity, and thus the spirit of Greece and the religiousness of the Orient, stamping themselves on Christian ideas and usages, won new life for themselves, and lived in Christian clothing, end quote. When we remember, however, that the earliest Christianity gained its adherence largely from the lower classes, and afterwards established itself preeminently in the region in which the old popular religions most flourished, it will be perceived that, in the investigation of the process of the Hellenization of Christianity, the study of the popular religions can least of all be neglected. Quote, Along with the popular religion of Greece, whose usages were concentrated in the mysteries, the Oriental religions come into consideration, and not least among them the Phrygian worship, which was spread throughout the whole of Asia Minor, and whose inscribed and sculptured monuments are found scattered over the whole of the Roman Empire. End quote. In these circumstances, it has seemed to the author eminently worthwhile to attempt to gain a better knowledge of the popular religious ideas and usages of the Phrygian and Lydian cults. As a contribution to that end, he has selected a particular element in their religious usages for investigation, the institution of confession. 
Quote, whether and how far this sacrament of the church is to be considered an inheritance from old oriental piety and beliefs may be left, meanwhile, out of consideration. The fact is that this cult institution existed in the oriental religions, which strove with Christianity for the dominion of the world, and everywhere in the Roman Empire set themselves in the longest and most lasting opposition to its victory. End quote. The material for his investigation, Dr. Steinleitner, finds in a considerable body of Lydian and Phrygian inscriptions of the class commonly called votive or expiatory inscriptions, coming from the 2nd and 3rd Christian centuries, supplemented by some inscriptions from Knidos of the 1st or 2nd centuries before Christ, and a few literary notices. This material he gathers together from all sources, reprints and re-edits with an adequate commentary. This constitutes the first part of his work, pages 7 to 74. The second part, pages 75 to 123, is an essay founded on this collected material on, quote, confession in antiquity, end quote. This essay really constitutes a very interesting exposition of the theology of the inscriptions and gives us a valuable insight into the religious ideas which ruled the minds of the people of Asia Minor near the opening of the Christian century. The first chapter treats of, quote, the relation of man to deity in the Lydian Phrygian religion, end quote. The second of, quote, sin and punishment according to the Lydian and Phrygian expiatory inscriptions, end quote. The third of, quote, religious administration of justice in Lydia and Caria, end quote. The fourth of, quote, confession in the cults of Asia Minor, end quote. While the fifth adds a section on, quote, a confession in the mysteries of Samothrace and the Isis worship, end quote. When Dr. Steinleitner comes to sum up at the end, page 121 and following, the results of his discussion, he naturally lays his stress on the chief object which he had in view, namely the establishment of the existence of a regular institution of confession in the primitive religion of Lydia and Phrygia, quote, in which the sinner confesses his sin before the priest as the representative of the deity in order to propitiate the deity and thus to become free from sickness and want the consequences of the sin, end quote. Other elements of the old religion, however, interest us more. Most of all, its conception of deity as both all-powerful and as intimately concerned with human life in all its manifestations. Quote, if we sum up briefly what has been said, remarks Dr. Steinleitner at the end of the discussion of this matter, the religion and life of the Lydian and Phrygian people in its lower strata appears as dominated by the belief that the deity is the absolute lord and ruler of his worshipper, but no ruthless tyrant like, say, Baal in the Syrophoenician religion, but certainly the Tyrannos or Kyrios, and yet also the greatest benefactor and the righteous judge from whose hand the believer receives blessing and calamity as a child receives its mother's caresses and its father's chastisements, end quote. Dr. Steinleitner seems to consider this conception of deity one-sided in its emphasis on the power and all-pervading activity of God. It seems to us a conception which does great credit to its sharers. One of the results of it was to develop a series of epithets for the deity which expressed its power and rulership, and among these epithets, Kurios was prominent. Quote, the title Kurios, which meets us in this inscription, says Dr. Steinleitner on one occasion, is a divine predicate conceived in a genuinely oriental fashion and thoroughly intelligible in the Eastern world, that occurs in Thrace, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt, and that found also its way into the religious language of Christianity. End quote. Christianity did not derive its employment of Kyrios as an epithet of God, or as a standing designation of Christ, from the folk religions of the Orient. It is well to know, however, that the heathen converts to Christianity could find no difficulty in catching the high implications of the term as used by Christians. Another result of this conception of God was the highly supernaturalistic colouring given by it to the whole view of life. Quote, a further characteristic of the Lydian Phrygian religiousness and of its view of the relation between God and man, writes Dr. Steinleitner, is the belief in epiphanies of the deity in which the deity reveals its might suddenly and unexpectedly to believers, a belief shared no doubt with the Lydians and Phrygians by other stocks of Asia Minor. The notion of the epiphany of a god or demonic being is primitive Greek and was possessed also by other peoples, but the idea and significance of the epiphania of the deity 
or of a demon in the popular belief of the Greeks and divine appearances in the belief and conception of the peoples of Asia Minor and the Orient, this difference exists, that the appearance of the deity for the pious Oriental on the ground of his belief in an absolute dependence on the deity, extending to all situations in life, and of its constant care for the health of his soul, which shows itself in atonements, expiations, and all kinds of asceticism, means not only a beneficent intrusion into the life of the individual or the establishment of a community, but also an experience of religion in the mystical sense in which he lives and moves. End quote. Dr. Steinleidner wishes, it is true, very illegitimately to apply this point of view at once to the conversion of Paul in a naturalistic psychological explanation of the supernatural features of the narrative. Paul was anything but a cold casuist, like his Pharisaic companions. His religiously readily excitable character, his inward faith, his vital mysticism, can at bottom find its roots only in the Anatolian inheritance of the former tent-weaver of Tarsus. We must consider also the whole mystical nature of the Apostle. He experienced other ecstatic conditions and could relate visions and revelations of the Lord. Quote, Out of these psychological and religious foundations which Paul had brought with him from his Anatolian home with its old traditions of visible epiphanies of the deity and its ever new experience of the dynamis of gods and demons in ecstasies and visions, we may perhaps explain his experience of Christ before Damascus as an ecstatic visionary occurrence, end quote. But even such a bizarre use of it as this does not destroy the value to the student of the New Testament of the fact here made evident that, quote, Epiphania is in this religious language the terminus technicus for a sudden and unexpected appearance of the deity in order to help its worshippers in time of need and misfortune, end quote. When Paul speaks of the glorious epiphany of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, he was using language which had a perfectly determinate meaning for his readers. It is perhaps natural that in inscriptions of this kind the only sins which are mentioned are breaches of the rules of the cult, by which breaches the deity is supposed to be offended, and it may not be quite justified to infer from this fact that the Lydian Phrygians had no consciousness of distinctly ethical faults as sins. There is a tendency apparent to extend the responsibility for acts of sin beyond the individual who actually commits them to his group, and there is an instance of vicarious satisfaction for a fault, a brother undertaking the task for a sister. There is even an instance in which the sin appears to be carried back of the sinful act to the sinful wish. On the whole, however, we get little help to the understanding of New Testament language from this section. We note only that the word for sinning is amartano. Amartia occurs, but not frequently. We lay no stress on the mention of an unpardonable sin, and we do not find ourselves particularly interested in the treatment of sickness, asthenia, as the punishment of sin or the use of kolasin and kolasis, with apparent preference for the notion of punishment. The most valuable contribution which these inscriptions make to the interpretation of the New Testament is due to the appearance in one of them, perhaps in two others, of the term lutron, to express the means by which immunity from the consequences of a fault was secured from the deity. For naturally the confession of the fault to the priest did not complete the making of satisfaction for it. The climax and completion of the expiatory process was formed rather by the erection of a tablet on which the sin and its punishments with the name of the sinner were notified, and that by requirement of the god. The ordinary expression for this command to make expiation in the Lydian inscriptions is epizetin, although sometimes apetin also occurs. In the case of the particular inscription which we have mentioned, however, we read lutron cat epitarin the interpreters have puzzled themselves over this lutron. Sir William Ramsey and Perdrizet take it in the sense of evche. Buresh leaves to it its sense of ransom, but scarcely knows what then to do with the inscription. Steinleitner, with too great deference to A. Deismann, as we think, starts with the idea of the price of emancipation for a slave and thinks that we must assume that a man was supposed to come into bondage to the deity by sin and required to be ransomed out by this expiatory offering. We see no reason why we should travel so roundabout a pathway to so simple a conclusion. 
the Lutron simply indicates the expiatory tablet as the price paid to the god for immunity for the fault committed. And thus we have before us a special use of Lutron, parallel to the special use of it which Deismann has so fully illustrated as the emancipation price of slaves, in which it is used as the immunity price of faults in the service of deity. The point of interest is that we have here a usage of Lutron very closely akin to the sense in which it and its derivatives are employed in the New Testament. In our Lord's great saying in Mark 10.45 and Matthew 20 verse 28, for example, and in the apostolic doctrine of redemption. When we read, for example, in Hebrews 9.15 of a ransoming of transgressions, we are moving in the same circle of ideas as when we read in this inscription, quote, Artemidorus, the son of Diodotus and Amir, together with his six kinsmen, knowing and unknowing, a ransom according to command, to men Tyrannus and Zeus Ogmenus, and the gods with him. End quote. This is a ransom of sin. It is a price paid, though not of silver or gold, by means of which is obtained the remission of sin. Ephesians 1 7, Colossians 1 14. End of review of the Beicht im Zusammenhänger mit der sakralen Rechtspfleger in der Antike by B. B. Warfield. Exegetical note on Philippians 4, verse 5, by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exegetical note on Philippians 4, verse 5. O curios en jus. This phrase is usually confidently explained as referring to the nearness in time of our Lord's second advent. Against this understanding of it, however, there lie very grave objections, not indeed dogmatic, for engus in that case would simply be taken as enghizin in James 5 verse 8, 1 Peter 4 verse 7, which would then be parallel passages, but exegetic. It may be asked, indeed, whether the idea thus supposed to be expressed is altogether a congruous one. When we speak of a person being near, do we intend to express a time or a space relation? Is the phrase capable of conveying a purely temporal idea? Incongruous or not, however, the phrase so taken would certainly be unexampled. Its parallel does not occur in the New Testament. We there read of a time or a season being near in time, Jonah 2 verse 13, Revelation 1 verse 3, or of an event or action being near in time, Luke 21 verse 31, but never of a person being near in time. What would it mean? The same is true of the LXX, if Tromius is to be trusted. Twice in elevated poetical language, Job chapter 13 verse 18, chapter 17 verse 12, we meet with phrases which might be carelessly quoted as exceptions, but the poetic thought in both cases is evidently conceived under space relations. At the most they could be pleaded as parallels to our present passage, only if we should understand it in high poetic imagery, to represent our Lord's triumphal procession as having started already towards the world and to be drawing gradually near. Manifestly, this is too much to read into the words in prose. It seems clear, therefore, that the probability is quite strong that Enghus here should be understood in its primary and prevailing Pauline, it never expresses time in Paul except Romans 13.10, sense, as expressing nearness in space, it is a strong corroboration of this that we find the identical phrase in use in the Psalter. Psalms 118, 150, 119, 151, 145, 18, that hymn book of the ancient church whose every phrase was as familiar to Paul and his followers as household words. And the ascendetic proverbial way in which it occurs in our passage gives it a very strong appearance of being a quotation. Led by these considerations, we propose to read the phrase as a reminiscence of the psalms above quoted and as parallel to such passages as Clement to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 21, translating, The Lord is near in space. It is a matter of quite minor consideration as to which person of the Trinity is meant by Ocurios. Paul prevailingly uses the term of Christ, but not invariably, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 16. 
especially in quotations from the Old Testament, it is used for God. For example, Romans 4 verse 8, chapter 9 verse 28, chapter 11 verse 34, etc. We may therefore assume that it is used in that sense here. The only point remaining is the question of connection. The phrase is a syndetic, and we are therefore left to the logical flow of thought for hints as to the connection. We may read it either, Let your forbearance be known to all men, for the Lord is near. Or, The Lord is near, therefore be anxious for nothing, but in everything let your requests be made known unto God. Little is hazarded in saying that whichever connection be adopted, the sense near in space is better than that which assigns the reference to the second advent. In either case, the purpose of the phrase is either minatory or hortatory. But who can accept a minatory clause in such a context? We must, therefore, receive it as hortative. But the Lord's nearness to aid is a much stronger thought to urge as an indictment to a Christian life than the consciousness of the shortness of time before Christ's coming, unless his coming be looked at in a minatory light. Again, the fact that the Lord is near and can hear our requests yields a much stronger motive to roll our cares over on him than the fact that the second advent is nigh, unless indeed we should read this as teaching the uselessness of caring for a future which would probably never come. And we cannot so read it without putting Paul in conflict with facts as subsequently developed and with his own teaching in 2 Thessalonians. It seems plain, therefore, that the context requires us to take the phrase as referring to the nearness of God to hear and help, not the speedy coming of the second advent. If so, it is equally clear that the connection with the following, rather than the foregoing context, is to be preferred. The sense, therefore, may be thus expressed. The Lord God is near, and can therefore hear and help. Therefore, in nothing give way to worry, but in everything, through prayer and petition, let your wants be made known to God, etc. The passage finds its analogue not in James 5 verse 8, but in Matthew 6 verses 25 to 34. End of exegetical note on Philippians 4 verse 5 by B.B. B. Warfield. The Coming of Dr. McCosh by B.B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Personal Recollections of Princeton Undergraduate Life. 4. The Coming of Dr. McCosh by Benjamin B. Warfield, class of 1871. The Coming of Dr. McCosh. It was to the college I described in my article that Dr. McCosh came in the autumn of 1868. His coming was sufficiently dramatic. The college had assembled at the opening of the session with its eyes fixed on the approaching event and was in a little fever of anticipation. There were meetings of the classes to appoint representatives who might meet in committees and make all due preparations. Through this machinery, James Thomas Finley of Montgomery, Alabama, a member of the senior class, was selected to pronounce a Latin address of welcome to the new president on Inauguration Day. Ushers were appointed, a committee of all classes was busied with preparations for a promenade concert. My own class distinguished itself by secretly arranging to come out suddenly on the inauguration day in a new class cap. It was of plain navy blue cloth with a small blue button on the top and a yellow cord just over the visor. The voracious historian, when describing the glories of the day, does not omit to record, quote, the appearance of our class in the new class cap was one of the features of the day and was very highly spoken of, end quote. I am afraid that the cap fostered pride, and this pride too had to fall. The historian is compelled to record further that after the promenade concert, quote, some of the class attempted to take canes from the freshmen, but as they were not well backed up by the rest of the class, they met with but little success. This, he adds, drew down upon us the siege of canes in 72's typical forms, end quote, that is, in 72's rake, admirably named after one of Dr. McCosh's books. At last, on October the 20th, the news was spread that Dr. McCosh had landed in New York and would reach Princeton that afternoon. Class meetings were held and marshals elected 
to take charge of the procession and the whole body of the students together with the faculty and the faculty of the theological seminary were at the dummy station at three o'clock to meet him. He was given a rousing reception and escorted to his new home, from the steps of which he gave the students an address, expressing his pleasure in being with them. Afterwards, so the story went, I will not vouch for its truth, the two young ladies of the party went for a stroll, accompanied by a couple of collegians who had been presented to them. They strolled to Trenton and back without turning a hair. Their escorts, on the contrary, spent the next day or two in bed. Thus Princeton made its first acquaintance with the new woman. October 27th was the inauguration day, and a great day it was. The official records declare that the concourse was the greatest ever seen in Princeton, and think it necessary to mention that special trains were run from New York and Philadelphia. The procession formed on the campus at 12 o'clock and marched to the first church where the exercises were held. Quote, Every class, we are told, for 50 years back, without an exception as far as was known, was represented. End quote. Two graduates of the class of 1795 were on the stage to bridge the gulf of an hundred years that stretched between the two great Scotchmen, Witherspoon and Macosh. The exercises consumed three hours and a half and were followed by the students with unwearied attention. Especially did they punctuate the address of their own representative with applause straight through from his Sol exoptatus iluxit to his Semperantes, fidentes, laetantes de iterum iterumque salvere jubemus. Ameliorations of College Life Dr. McCosh had taken as the subject of his inaugural address academic teaching in Europe. It contained really his program, and he was by no means slow in beginning the translation of his theory into practice. I cannot say that the interior life of the student body was at once much affected by the new breath that was blowing through the institution, but change was in the air. Numerous changes in the regulations governing the students were rapidly introduced. They were all enthusiastically received because they all made for the amelioration of the student's lot. The freshmen were liberated from the exclusive rule of the tutors. Morning prayers were brought down from 7 to 8.15 o'clock, thus permitting students to have their breakfast before attending them, a permission which was sometimes availed of. Evening prayers on Saturday were intermitted, giving the students for the first time one unbroken afternoon in the week. The gymnasium was built, and in the gymnasium there were bathrooms, the first bathrooms ever installed on the campus. Before that, students were expected to bathe in their tooth mugs. A classroom building was erected, and nobody who did not, as we did, crawl directly out of the basement of Stanhope Hall into the decent, well-lighted, well-heated and well-aired rooms of Dickinson Hall can know what that meant. A new dormitory was built, Reunion Hall, which was thought very fine and convenient then, but now, in comparison with so much that is better, is thought neither. The students assimilated every such improvement as it came, took every advantage of them all, and went on in their own way rejoicing. Revolution of the college work. It would be a mistake to think such improvements unimportant, but of course they lay on the periphery. At the centre of Dr. McCosh's scheme of reconstruction lay a revolution in the manner in which the college performed its teaching function. We began at once to feel the new life stirring here too. Dr. McCosh believed in giving encouragement to collegiate scholarship, and we soon found prizes multiplied and, above all, competitive fellowships established. These fellowships were first offered to the class of 1870. He had sound views of the function of examinations and wished so to employ them as to give them an educational value. To that end, he desired that they might crown long periods of study and not be permitted to chop up the course of instruction into short bits, something as an editor will chop up an article into little bits suitable to the weak assimilative powers of his readers. It must be confessed that the attempt to graft the better system on existing custom produced at first somewhat weird results. In my graduating year, there were sessional examinations at the end of each of the sessions and annual examinations embracing the work of the whole year and biennial examinations at the end of sophomore year, 
embracing the work of the first two years, and final examinations embracing the work of the whole four years. An accident complicated the working of this elaborate scheme. One of my classmates, rooming in the south entry of West, my own room, 13 West, was on the top floor of the north entry, fell sick with a mild case of varioloid just two weeks before the end of the second session. Of course, the students took advantage of the situation to get themselves ordered home by their parents. The session came to an abrupt close. It was hoped that the sessional examinations would be escaped, but nothing of the kind. The first thing we had to do on reassembling for the short third term was to pass the omitted second term examinations. Then came, scattered through May, the final examinations on the work of the earlier years. And then, in early June, the senior finals... Not unnaturally, the historian of the class complains that the whole third term seemed poisoned with examinations. On June the 14th, however, we emerged from our last examination into the senior vacation, which covered the two weeks before commencement. In former years, this senior vacation had been much longer, some six weeks or so long. After the year had been divided into three sessions, the seniors finished their work at the end of the second session and had the third session free. The curtailment of this senior vacation was one of Dr. Makosha's reforms. The most far-reaching of Dr. Makosha's reforms, so far as we experienced them in these first years of his administration, was, of course, the enrichment of the course of study by the introduction into it of new branches and the inauguration of the elective principle of administering it. That such a change was sorely needed and constituted genuine reform, there can be no doubt. I do not myself think that it was made in the best possible manner. To put the matter into a nutshell, instead of introducing the new branches around the solid core of general educative branches, as honour courses, subjected to the elective principle, the new branches of study were themselves made the required core of the course, and the old general educative branches the elective fringe around them. Thus the old general educative course was not enriched by the addition of the new branches, but supplanted by the substitution of the new branches for it. One of the results of this was that the students were forbidden to pursue the study of Latin, Greek and mathematics after their sophomore year. Any two of these subjects of study the student might pursue, but not all three, and thus the common culture of the educated gentleman was denied them. So dissatisfied was I with the limitations thus imposed that after making my choice of two subjects, I applied for and obtained permission to take on the third and now forbidden subject also, and I pursued it through the rest of my course, not as a substitute for any other portion of the work of the class, but as additional to it. This was no hardship, as the classroom work was quite light. The actual tendency of the new method of administering the course was already revealed in the choices of my class for junior year the first instance of its application. Four subjects were proposed, out of which we had to choose two. Modern languages were taken by 60 men, Latin by 54, mathematics by 25, and Greek by 20. When that happened in the green tree, we all knew what was going to happen in the dry. Dr. McCosh as a teacher. The best thing that Dr. McCosh brought to Princeton was himself. He had an inspiring personality and was a great teacher. So soon as I have said that, I feel bound, however, to stop and discriminate. He had absolutely no faculty for quizzing. I speak, of course, only of his early years in Princeton, when I was his pupil. And he was perfectly helpless in the face of disorder. When disorder required to be controlled, he never, by any chance, fixed upon the right man as the author of it, and he did not know how to reprove without temper. He completely lacked a sense of humour. I do not mean that he had no humour of his own, or that he was not sometimes the cause of humour in others. I mean that he saw with difficulty the humour that arose outside of himself. This delivered him, of course, bound hand and foot into the hands of the Philistines. That these students did not take advantage of him and render his life unendurable, as they did the lives of more than one instructor in my day, fairly driving them out of the institution, was due to their genuine admiration for him as a man and as a teacher, admiration for the sincerity of his character, the elevation of his thought and life, the force of his intellect, in short, for his real greatness. After all, all said he was a great man and a great teacher. It was in his lectures that his great qualities as a teacher showed themselves, 
and it was through them that he made his impact as a teacher on his pupils. He was distinctly the most inspiring force which came into my life during my college days. No, he did not make me a Darwinian, as it was his pride to believe he ordinarily made his pupils, but that was doubtless because I was already a Darwinian of the purer water before I came into his hands and knew my origin of species and animals and plants under domestication almost from A to Izzard. In later years I fell away from this, his orthodoxy. He was a little nettled about it and used to inform me with some vigour, I am speaking of a time thirty years agone, that all biologists under thirty years of age were Darwinians. I was never quite sure that he understood what I was driving at when I replied that I was the last man in the world to wonder at that, since I was about that old myself before I outgrew it. Other Inspiring Teachers Next to Dr. McCosh, I received most inspiration, I think, from Dr. Packard, a man of very different personality. No student dared to chirp in his room. He was so very quiet, his manner was so very courteous, his demeanour so extremely demure, that everybody felt it would be best not to stir him up. He made us feel the classical authors which we read with him as literature. I had the happiness to read some of the Greek plays with him, as well as the Latin authors which it was his more particular business to teach. He inspired me to turn the whole of the Antigone into English verse. I say nothing of the quality of the verse. In a matter of this kind, the point is, as Dr. Johnson said of the dancing dog, not whether it is done well, but that it is done at all. But nearly anything is possible at eighteen. Then there was Dr. Welling. I think I must place him next as an intellectual force in my college life. I am afraid my class did not treat him well. The English classroom had bad traditions attached to it, bad traditions which outlasted our time and Dr. Welling's time. He paid us out in his examination papers. When we read this question in one of our senior papers, explain the following lines of Milton. Now had night measured with her shadowy cone halfway up hill this vast sublunar vault. There were some who felt that an unfair intern had been taken upon them. Had they not formally given up the higher mathematics at the end of sophomore year? Religious life in the college. I must say a word of the religious life of the college in my day. It was very good. Religion was a very real and a very pervasive force among us. A majority of the students were members of the church. There were individual men from whose persons radiated religious influence. I must not name living men, but John Laird is dead, and lo, his good works are still following him. A very large proportion of these students were preparing for the ministry. In my own class, which graduated 74 men, 21 had already before graduation decided upon the ministry as their life work. 27 ultimately found their way into it. Most of those studying for the ministry entered on graduation the neighboring seminary. There was, accordingly, always a great body of recent graduates of the college continuing their studies in that institution. In the year 1872-73, to 73, 51 of the 117 students of the seminary were graduates of Princeton College, and in 1874-75, to 75, 45 out of its 116 students. During the four years of my class's residence in college, the Princeton men in the seminary were year by year as follows, 41 out of 115, 31 out of 107, 33 out of 117, 35 out of 122. With nearly a fourth of the students in college looking towards the seminary and nearly a third of the students in the seminary looking back to the college, the path between the two institutions was naturally beaten very smooth. Religious instruction in the college in my day was very good. The centre of it was Dr. McCosh's Sunday afternoon lectures. Dr. McCosh's lectures were always both interesting and valuable. Most of the professors were ministers and were not slack in exercising religious influence. The habit of church-going was in full vigour. The students, after attending chapel at eleven o'clock on Sabbath morning and Dr. McCosh's lecture in the afternoon, and many of them also prayer-meeting in the early evening at the rooms of the Philadelphian Society, still found themselves strong enough to fill Dr. MacDonald's gallery at the first church in the evening. The Philadelphian Society, when I entered college, was unpleasantly housed in the basement of Philosophical Hall. After Dickinson Hall was built and the senior and junior classrooms on the upper floor of Stanhope Hall were released for other uses, 
These were assigned to the Philadelphian Society and were refitted after a fashion which seemed to us very splendid. Hamilton Murray of the class of 1872 apparently thought otherwise, and when he was lost at sea, shortly after his graduation, was found to have left the society a generous sum for building itself a suitable home. This was the origin of Murray Hall. It was said in our time that no class in Princeton College ever passed through its four years without experiencing a religious revival. Our class formed no exception. Our revival came near the end of our junior year. Scarcely anyone in the class was left ungarnered. When I entered the seminary two years later as a student for the ministry, I found among a multitude of old college friends already gathered there before me one of the most obdurate of my classmates. Princeton College, in the earlier years of the 70s, was found by many an ingenious youth a means of grace, as well as a seminary of learning at a school of life. Ehoi, fugaces labuntur ani, or since the modern languages are now the mode, let us say with a less genial poet, vorbei sind die Kinderspiele, though surely we shall not follow him in the frightfulness of his further remarks. We were lusty infants, though the average age of the members of my class at graduation was 22 years, 10 months, and 23 days. End of The Coming of Dr. McCosh by B.B. Warfield James McCosh, D.D., L.L.D., and William Greenow Thayer Shedd, D.D., L.L.D., by B.B. Warfield this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reverend Dr. James McCosh died at Princeton on the evening of Friday, November 16, 1894, and the Reverend Dr. W. G. T. Shedd died in New York City on the morning of Saturday, November 17, 1894. Thus nearly together passed into their reward two of the greatest Presbyterians of our generation. Each had been given a message to deliver and had delivered it. Each had had committed to him a charge to keep and had kept it. Each had been called upon to champion the cause of truth against serious odds and had not shunned the task. They never sold the truth to serve the hour. Doubtless no one accomplishes all he fain would do. Of all alike, it must in some sense be said that the great design unfinished lies, their lives are incomplete, and their circles are perfected only in the life beyond the grave. But above most men it was given to these to finish their work. They lay down to sleep at last, full alike of days, of honours, and of service. Both were many-sided men of varied gifts. Both served their generation and earned its gratitude and admiration by performances in very diverse spheres of activity. But the highest claim of each to perennial remembrance will doubtless be found to rest upon the contribution he has made to the defense and exposition of fundamental truth, philosophical or theological. Dr. McCosh was a devoted pastor, a preacher of simplicity and power, an impressive teacher, a college president, great in all the qualities requisite to success in that complicated sphere, a writer of a strikingly attractive English style, but he was above all things a great religious philosopher. Dr. Shedd was a noble preacher, an admirable teacher of an unusually wide range of subjects, a man of letters, an accomplished scholar, a philosophic thinker, but above all, he was a great theologian. Both men had the clearness of vision to discern reality in philosophy or religion. Both had the courage, on discerning it, to grasp and hold it for themselves and for us. They have embalmed not their memories only, but their teaching also, for us in a somewhat voluminous literary product to which we shall increasingly feel our debt. The present writer had the happiness of a personal acquaintance with both these great men. He entered Princeton College as a student in the autumn in which Dr. McCosh took charge of its administration and sat at his feet in the classroom for three stimulating years which have left their permanent impression on all his thinking. The admiration which he began then has been deepened by the intercourse of more mature years. His acquaintance with Dr. Shedd was of later date and less close, but it was quite long and close enough to leave memories which will not lightly be yielded. 
On the establishment of the Presbyterian and Reformed Review, both Dr. McCosh and Dr. Shedd gave it their fullest sympathy and encouragement and promised it their active cooperation. Engrossment in other employments and the increasing infirmities of age curtailed their actual contributions to its pages. Dr. McCosh contributed a single paper to its first volume, a characteristic paper on recent works on Kant, volume 1, pages 4 to 5 to 440. The opening article of the first number of the review was a paper by Dr. Shedd on The Meaning and Value of the Doctrine of Decrees, Volume 1, pages 1 to 25. Subsequently, he contributed papers on What is Animal Life, Volume 1, pages 443 to 447, The Materialistic Physics Unmathematical, Volume 2, pages 323 to 326, Notes on Current Topics, Volume 3, pages 312 to 322, and How Were the Four Gospels Composed, Volume 4, pages 461 to 469. But the services of neither of them to this review can be measured by their contributions to its pages. In particular, Dr. Shedd has not only furthered its interests in every way possible, but has honoured it from the beginning by serving as one of its board of editors. There is, therefore, a peculiar fitness special to this review, which comes to the aid of the general interest which attaches to the careers of two men, of such light and leading, to enforce upon us the acceptable duty of laying before our readers a measurably full account of the lives of these two great men, and a well-considered estimate of their services to mankind and to truth. We have the pleasure in announcing that this task has been kindly undertaken for the review, in the case of Dr. McCosh by President Francis L. Patton, and in the case of Dr. Shedd by Professor John DeWitt. We shall present these papers to our readers in our April number. Meanwhile, we content ourselves with laying our little garland of gratitude and love upon the graves of these masters of thought. There is a realm of truth, and these men set themselves for its defence, and it is in part due to them that we still possess it as our heritage. We can never estimate the greatness of this possession, but at least... We have a voice with which to pay the debt of boundless love and reverence and regret to those great men who fought and kept it ours and keep it ours, O God. End of James McCosh, D.D., L.L.D., and William Greenow Thayer Shed, D.D., L.L.D., by B.B. Warfield. James by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. James, a form of the name Jacob. 1. James the son of Zebedee. Matthew 4.21, 10 verse 2, Mark 1.19, 3 verse 17, and brother of the apostle John. Matthew 17, verse 1, Mark 3, verse 17, 5, verse 37, Acts 12, verse 2. One of the earliest disciples, Matthew 4, 21, Mark 1, 19, and 29, compare John 1, verses 40 and 41, and most trusted apostles, Matthew 17, verse 1, Mark 5, verse 37, 9, verse 2, 13, verse 3, 14, verse 33, Luke 8, verse 51, 9.28. Of our Lord. Of his birthplace or early home we are told nothing. His occupation as a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, in partnership with Peter and Andrew, Luke 5.10, might seem to suggest a contiguous locality. But the fishery of the Sea of Galilee was expressly kept free for every Israelite, and a social difference between the sons of Zebedee and the sons of Jonas may be implied in the facts that the former kept hired servants, Mark one twenty, and that John, at least, was known to the high priest, John 18, verse 16, and may have had a house in Jerusalem, chapter 19, verse 27. His father, Zebedee, appears only once in the pages of the Gospels, Matthew 4, verse 21, Mark 1, verse 19, where he raises no obstacle to his sons following Jesus. From Matthew 27, verse 56, compared with Mark 15, verse 40, 16, verse 1, and with John 19, verse 25, it seems reasonable to infer that his mother was named Salome and was sister to the mother of Jesus, in which case James would be a near kinsman of Jesus 
and, like him, of Davidic descent. His name occurs only in the Synoptic Gospels and the Book of the Acts, although he is alluded to twice in the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verse 40 and 41, chapter 21, verse 2. It never occurs apart from that of John, which it ordinarily precedes. Matthew 4, verse 21, 10, verse 2, 17, verse 1, Mark 1, verse 19 and 29, chapter 3, verse 17, chapter 5, verse 37, chapter 9, verse 2, chapter 10, verse 35 and 41, chapter 13, verse 3, chapter 14, verse 33, Luke 5, verse 10, 6, verse 14, 9, verse 54. While John is designated as the brother of James, Matthew 4, verse 21, 10, verse 2, 17, verse 1, Mark 1, verse 19, 3, verse 17, 5, verse 37. From this, it has been inferred that he was the older brother, while the occasional reverse usage in Luke, chapter 8, verse 51, revised version, 9, verse 28, and Acts 1, verse 13, revised version, 12 verse 2 only, is supposed to arise from John's greater prominence in the apostolical circle. Along with John, he received from Christ the name Boagenes, or Son of Thunder, Mark 3 verse 17, and along with him earned his master's rebuke for the fierceness of his anger against the Samaritan village which would not receive Jesus, Luke 9 verse 55 and the indignation of his fellow apostles for his ambitious self-seeking, Mark 10, verse 41. After the crucifixion, we find him with the other apostles in Galilee, John 21, verse 2, and in Jerusalem, Acts 1, verse 13, and his record closes with his death by the sword at the hands of Herod Agrippa I, probably A.D. 44, chapter 12, verse 2. He was the first of the apostolic band to seal his testimony with his blood. 2. James, the son of Alphaeus, and one of the apostles of our Lord. Matthew 10, verse 3, Mark 3, verse 18, Luke 6, 15, Acts 1, 13. Nothing further is certainly known of him. It is natural, however, as it has been usual, to assume that the James of Matthew 27, verse 36... Mark 15, verse 40, 16, verse 1, Luke 14, verse 10, is this James, in which case we may learn that he bore the surname of the little, English versions the less, possibly with reference to his stature, Mark 15, verse 40, that his mother was called Mary and was one of the women who had accompanied Christ, and that he had a brother named Joseph, Levi, or Matthew, who, according to Mark 2, verse 14, was son of Alphaeus and that he had a brother named Joseph. Levi, or Matthew, who, according to Mark 2, verse 14, was the son of Alphaeus, may be another brother, and it is possible to fill in the ellipsis of Luke 6, verse 16, Acts 1, verse 13, so as to make the apostle Judas another brother. It is possible further to identify the Mary of Clopas of John 19, verse 25, with Mary, the mother of James, and it is then possible, though scarcely natural, to read John 19, verse 25 as declaring that Mary of Clopas was Jesus' mother's sister. By this combination, James, the son of Alphaeus, would be made out to be the cousin German of our Lord. It is common on this assumption to take still another step and on the ground of the similarity between the names of the Lord's brethren and those of the sons of Alphaeus so obtained to suppose that this near relative of our Lord's is intended by James the Lord's brother. The whole construction is, however, very insecure and does not seem to satisfy the biblical facts. 3. James the Lord's brother Matthew 13, verse 55, Mark 6, verse 3, Galatians 1, verse 19, and the head of the church at Jerusalem in the apostolic age, Acts 12, verse 17, 15, verse 13, 21, verse 18, Galatians 1, verse 19, 2, verses 9 and 12. This James is mentioned by name only twice in the Gospels, Matthew 13, verse 55, Mark 6, verse 3, but the outlines of his life may be traced by means of the notices of the Brethren of the Lord, who constituted a distinct class, both during our Lord's life, when they did not believe on him, John 7 verse 5, and after his resurrection, when they are found among his followers, Acts 1 14. 
The exact relationship which these brethren bore to our Lord has always been a matter of dispute. Some, identifying them with the sons of Alpheus, represent them as his cousins. Others think of them as his half-brothers, children of Joseph by a former marriage. As they always appear with Mary, living and journeying with her and holding just such relations with her as would naturally be borne by her children, Matthew 12, verses 46 and 47, Luke 8, verse 19, John 2, verse 12, there is no reason to question the natural implication that they were Jesus' own brothers. As James's name stands first in the lists, Matthew 13, verse 55, Mark 6, verse 3, it is probable that he was the oldest of our Lord's brothers. He doubtless shared their unbelief, John 7, verse 5, and doubtless also their natural anxieties in his behalf, Mark 3:31 and following. When or how the change was wrought in him, by which he became a servant of Christ, Acts 1.14, James 1.1, 1, 1, we are not told. Possibly, as in the case of Paul, his conversion was due to a special appearance of the risen Lord, 1 Corinthians 15.7. From the very first organization of the church in Jerusalem, James appears as its head, Acts 12.17, 15 verse 13, 21 verse 18, Galatians 1, 19, 2 verses 9 and 12. As early as AD 40, when Paul first visited Jerusalem after his conversion, James's position was such that Paul felt it necessary to name him along with Peter as having been seen by him, Galatians 1, 19. The reference of Acts 12 verse 17, AD 44, where James is clearly the official head of the brethren, as well as that of 21 verse 18, A.D. 58, where he seems to stand at the head of the elders of the church, compare 15 verse 6, enables us to estimate wherein his preeminence consisted. As he was not an apostle, the revised version margin gives the correct translation of Galatians 1.19. We cannot be far wrong in assuming that he was the head of the board of elders of the church at Jerusalem, that is, what we should call the pastor of that church. See Elder. As such, his name stands for the Church of Jerusalem, Galatians 2.12, of which he was the natural representative, Acts 12.17, 15 verse 13, 21 verse 18, and visitors to the church made themselves known in the first instance to him and laid their errand before him. 12 verse 17, 21 verse 18, Galatians 1, 19, 2 verse 9. In his position, James's life work was naturally to smooth the passage of Jews over to Christianity. That he stood on the same platform of faith with Paul is apparent not only from Paul's assertion in Galatians 2, 9, but also from James's remarks recorded in Acts 15 verse 13, 21 verse 20. But on both occasions, he speaks also in behalf of the Jewish Christian conscience, and it is equally apparent that as Paul became as all men to all men because he was sent to all, James became as a Jew to Jews because he was sent to Jews. The use of his name by intense Judaizers, Galatians 2 verse 12, and the later Clementine literature is thus explicable, as also the admiration which is said to have been conceived for him by the Jews themselves, who are reported to have given him the surname of the Just, Eusebius, Ecclesiastical Histories 2.23. After Acts 21.18, A.D. 58, we meet no further reference to James in the New Testament. Secular history tells us, however, that he was martyred in a popular outbreak of the Jews in the interregnum between the death of the procurator Festus and the appointment of his successor, i.e. A.D. 62. Antiquities 20.9 and 1. Eusebius, Church History, 2.23. 4. James, the father or brother of the Apostle Judas. Luke 6, verse 16, Acts 1, verse 13. Nothing further is known of him. End of James by B.B. Warfield. Epistle of James by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This letter does not announce itself as the production of an apostle, but describes its author simply as James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 verse 1, Revised Version Margin. It is most natural to think of James, the Lord's brother, as meant, and all the characteristics of the letter agree with this attribution. The letter bears a distinct flavor of primitiveness. The Christian place of worship is still spoken of as a synagogue. 2 verse 2. Christians are not sharply discriminated from Jews. 1 verse 1. The sins rebuked and errors corrected are such as would naturally spring up in a Jewish soil. While there is not a trace of the controversies which already in the sixth decade of the first Christian century were distracting the whole church. It is therefore usually dated about A.D. 45 and considered the earliest of the New Testament writings. It is addressed to the twelve tribes which are of the dispersion, 1 verse 1 revised version, that is, not to the dispersed Jews nor yet to the whole Christian church, considered as the spiritual Israel, but probably to the Christians, 2 verse 1, 5 verse 7, among the Jewish dispersion, as the Jews dwelling outside the Holy Land were technically called. John 7 verse 35, compare 2 Maccabees 1 27. The object of its writing was to reform and correct those sins and errors to which its lately Christianized Jewish readers continued to be liable and to encourage them in the sore trials to which they were exposed. After the address, 1 verse 1, James first consoles his readers in their trials and exhorts them to steadfastness, pointing out at the same time the source of the temptation to apostasy, chapter 1 verses 2 to 21. He proceeds then to warn them against mere word service, explaining what is meant by true faith. Chapter 1, verses 22 to 27. What will be the effect of true faith on the prevalent sin of respective persons? Chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. And how a true faith evinces itself. Chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. Exhortations against hasty assumption and misuse of the functions of religious teachers and exposure of their root in a jealous heart follow, chapter 3 verses 1 to 18, and then reproofs of contentiousness, chapter 4 verses 1 to 12, and self-sufficiency, chapter 4 verse 13 to chapter 5 verse 6. The epistle closes with exhortations to patience in suffering, chapter 5 verses 7 to 12, and to prayer as the sufficient resource of the Christian in every need, verses 13 to 18, along with a final declaration of the joy of Christian propagandism, verses 19 to 20. The linguistic and rhetorical character of the epistle is very high. It is written in Greek, which is surpassed in purity by that of no New Testament writings except those of Luke, and in a strikingly elevated and picturesque style, resembling that of the Hebrew prophets. It contains more imagery drawn from nature than all the epistles of Paul. In this recalling the manner of our Lord's synoptic speeches, to which it presents numerous parallels, the tone and matter of its teaching are appropriate to its early date and the recent emergence of its readers from Judaism. The section on faith and works, chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, has often been misapprehended as a polemic against Paul's doctrine of justification by faith, or at least as a corrective of perversions of that doctrine. It is really a rebuke of a prevalent Jewish notion that mere intellectual assent to divine teaching is all that is necessary for salvation. James, as pointedly as Paul, makes faith the instrument of salvation. Chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, and Paul, as firmly as James, insists that the only saving faith is a faith that works. Galatians 5, verse 1. There is clear evidence of the use of this epistle by the church from the very earliest times. Origen, however, writing early in the third century, is the first writer to quote it explicitly by name, and there was a period during which the Latin writers seemed to have used it little. Luther, not fully seeing its harmony with Paul, permitted himself to speak unguardedly about it. It is historically indicated as an integral portion of the sacred canon. End of Epistle of James by B.B. Warfield Jude by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Jude. In revised version of Jude 1, Judas. An English form of the name Judas given in the authorized version to the writer of the epistle of Jude, verse 1. He describes himself simply as brother of James, by whom the author of the epistle of James and leader of the church in Jerusalem seems to be meant. In this case, Jude should be a brother of the Lord and not an apostle, and these inferences seem borne out by the presence of a Judas in the lists of our Lord's brethren, Matthew 13.55, Mark 6.3, and by the apparent implication of verse 17 of his epistle that its writer was not an apostle. Those who identify the brothers of the Lord with the sons of Alphaeus nevertheless identify Jude with the apostle Judas. Except his bare name, nothing is recorded of him beyond what we may infer from the fact that the brethren of the Lord did not believe in him during his life on earth, John 7 verse 5, and that after his resurrection they were his followers, Acts 1.14. An interesting story told of his grandchildren by the church rite Hegesippus and preserved by Eusebius, Church Histories 3.20 confirms the possible inference from 1 Corinthians 9.5 that he was married and implies that he was dead before A.D. 80. The general epistle of Jude is a brief epistle. It names its author as Judas, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Verse 1, revised version, margin. That is probably Judas the brother of the Lord, Matthew 13.55, Mark 6.3. Its address is quite general to them that are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Verse 1, Revised Version. Nevertheless, it is probable from the character of the epistle, which seems intended for a special occasion and is full of allusions which would be likely to be intelligible only to Jews, that some particular body of Christians was intended, which, from the circumstances of sending the letter, did not need to be specified in the address. It is most natural to think of it as intended for the Jewish Christians dwelling in Palestine, the letter has been largely used by 2 Peter 2, and must have been written before it, probably not much before. It seems most natural to date it about A.D. 66. It was called out by the outbreak among Jude's readers of an alarming heresy with immoral tendencies, probably something like the incipient Gnosticism rebuked in the pastoral epistles and the Apocalypse, verse 3, 4, 10, 15, 16, and 18 and was designed to save the churches addressed from its inroads. After the address, verses 1 and 2, it assigns the reason for its writing, verses 3 and 4, and then first announces the condemnation in store for the false teachers, verses 5 to 16, and afterwards divulges the duty of true Christians in the circumstances, verses 17 to 23, concluding with a rich and appropriate doxology, verses 24 and 25. Owing doubtless to its brevity, there are no very clear traces of the use of Jude in the very earliest fathers of the church. In the latter part of the second century, however, it is found in full use in the Greek and Latin churches alike and was clearly from the beginning a part of the Christian canon. End of Jude by B. B. Warfield Imputation by B. B. Warfield this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Origin and Meaning of the Term The theological use of the term imputation is probably rooted ultimately in the employment of the verb imputo in the Vulgate to translate the Greek verb lo there in Psalm 32.2. This passage is quoted by Paul, in Romans 4.8, and made one of the foundations of his argument that in saving man God sets to his credit a righteousness without works. It is only in these two passages and in the two axiomatic statements of Romans 4.4 4 and 5.13 that the Vulgate uses imputo in this connection. Compare with special application 2 Timothy 4.16, Philemon 18. There are other passages, however, where it might just as well have been employed, but where we have instead reputo, under the influence of the mistaken rendering of the Hebrew hashab in Genesis 15.6. In these passages, the authorized English version improves on the Latin by rendering a number of them, Romans 4.11, 22.23.24, 2 Corinthians 5.19, James 2.23, 
by impute and employing for the rest synonymous terms, all of which preserve the metaphor from accounts inherent in Lohises there and Elohin in this usage, such as count, Romans 4, verses 3 and 5, account, Galatians 3, 6, and reckon, Romans 4, 4, 9 and 10, the last of which the revised English version makes its uniform rendering of Lohises there. Even the meagre employment of imputo in the Latin version, however, supplied occasion enough for the adoption of that word in the precise language of theology as the technical term for that which is expressed by the Greek words in their so-called commercial sense, or more correctly, be called their forensic or judicial sense, that is, putting to one's account, or in its twofold reference to the credit and debt sides, setting to one's credit or laying to one's charge. Three Acts of Imputation From the time of Augustine, early 5th century at least, the term imputation is found firmly fixed in theological terminology in this sense, but the applications and relations of the doctrine expressed by it were thoroughly worked out only in the discussions which accompanied and succeeded the Reformation. In the developed theology thus brought into the possession of the Church, three several acts of imputation were established and expounded, these are the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity, the imputation of the sins of his people to the Redeemer, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ to his people. Though, of course, with more or less purity of conception and precision of application, these three great doctrines became the property of the whole Church and found a place in the classical theology of the Roman, Lutheran, and Reformed alike. In the proper understanding of the conception, it is important to bear in mind that the divine act called imputation is in itself precisely the same in each of the three great transactions into which it enters as a constituent part. The grounds on which it proceeds may differ, the things imputed may be different, and the consequent treatment of the person or persons to which the imputation is made may and will differ as the things imputed to them differ. But in each and every case alike, imputation itself is simply the act of setting to one's account, and the act of setting to one's account is in itself the same act, whether the thing set to his account stands on the credit or debit side of the account, and whatever may be the ground in equity on which it is set to his account. That the sin of Adam was so set to the account of his descendants that they have actually shared in the penalty which was threatened to it, and that the sins of his people were so set to the account of our Lord that he bore them in his own body on the tree, and his merits are so set to their account that by his stripes they are healed, the entirety of historical Orthodox Christianity unites in affirming. Pelagian Opposition to the Doctrine Opposition to these doctrines has, of course, not been lacking in the history of Christian thought. The first instance of important contradiction of the fundamental principle involved is presented by the Pelagian movement, which arose at the beginning of the 5th century. The Pelagians denied the equity, and therefore under the government of God the possibility of the involvement of one free agent in the acts of another. They utterly denied, therefore, that men either suffer harm from Adam's sin or profit by Christ's merits. By their examples only, they said, can either Adam or Christ affect us, and by free imitation of them alone we share in their merits or demerits. It is not apparent why Pelagius permitted himself such extremity of denial. What he had at heart to assert was the inadmissibility by the human subject of plenary ability of will to do all righteousness. To safeguard this, he had necessarily to deny all subjective injury to men from Adam's sin, and from their own sins too, for that matter, and the need or actuality of subjective grace for their perfecting. But there was no reason growing out of this point of sight why he might not allow that the guilt of Adam's sin had been imputed to his posterity and had supplied the ground for the infliction upon them of external penalties, temporal or eternal, or that the merits of Christ might be imputed to his people as the meritorious ground of their relief from these penalties." as well as of the forgiveness of their own actual sins and of their reception into the favour of God and the heavenly blessedness. Later Pelagianizers found this out, and it became not uncommon, especially after Duns Scotus's strong assertion of the doctrine of immediate imputation, for the imputation of Adam's sin to be exploited precisely in the interest of denial or weakening of the idea of the derivation of inherent corruption from Adam. 
A very good example of this tendency of thought is supplied by the Roman Catholic theologian Ambrosius Catharinus, whose admirable speech to this effect at the Council of Trent is reported by Father Paul. Even Zwingli was not unaffected by it. He was indeed free from the Pelagianizing attenuation of the corruption of nature, which is the subjective effect on his posterity of Adam's sin. With him, original sin was both extensively and intensively a total depravity, the fertile source of all evil action, but he looked upon it rather as a misfortune than a fault, a disease than a sin, and he hung the whole weight of our ruin on our direct participation in Adam's guilt. As a slave can beget only a slave, says he, so all the progeny of man under the curse are born under the curse. Importance of the Doctrine In sharp contradiction to the current tendency to reduce to the vanishing point the subjective injury wrought by Adam's sin on his posterity, the churches gave themselves to emphasizing the depth of the injury and especially its sinfulness. Even the Council of Trent acknowledged the transfusion into the entire human race of sin, which is the death of the soul. The Protestants, who as convinced Augustinians were free from the Pelagianizing bias of Rome, were naturally even more strenuous in asserting the evil and guilt of native depravity. Accordingly, they constantly remark that men's native guilt in the sight of God rests not merely upon the imputation to them of Adam's first sin, but also upon the corruption which they derive from him, a mode of statement which meets us indeed as early as Peter Lombard, and for the same reason. The polemic turn given to these statements has been the occasion of a remarkable misapprehension as if it were intended to subordinate the imputation of Adam's transgression to the transmission of his corrupted nature as the source of human guilt. Precisely the contrary is the fact. The imputation of Adam's transgression was not in dispute. All parties to the great debate of the age fully recognized it, and it is treated therefore as a matter of course. What was important was to make it clear that native depravity was along with it the ground of our guilt before God. Thus it was sought to hold the balance true and to do justice to both elements in a complete doctrine of original sin. Meanwhile, the recovery of the great doctrine of justification by faith threw back its light upon the doctrine of the satisfaction of Christ, which had been in the possession of the church since Anselm, and the better understanding of this doctrine thus induced in turn illuminated the doctrine of sin whose correlative it is. Thus it came about that, in the hands of the great Protestant leaders of the 16th century and of their successors, the Protestant systematizers of the 17th century, the threefold doctrine of imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity, of the sins of his people to the Redeemer, and of the righteousness of Christ to his people, at last came to its rights as the core of the three constitutive doctrines of Christianity, the sinfulness of the human race, the satisfaction of Jesus Christ, and justification by faith. The importance of the doctrine of imputation is that it is the hinge on which these three great doctrines turn and the guardian of their purity. Socinian, Arminian, and Rationalistic Opposition Of course, the Church was not permitted to enjoy in quiet its new understanding of its treasures of doctrine. Radical opponents arose in the Reformation age itself, the most important of whom were the Socinians. By them it was pronounced an inanity to speak of the transference of either merit or demerit from one person to another. We can be bad with another's badness or good with another's goodness, they said, as little as we can be white with another's whiteness. The center of the Sicinian assault was upon the doctrine of the satisfaction of Christ. It is not possible, they affirmed, for one person to bear the punishment due to another. But their criticism cut equally deeply into the Protestant doctrines of original sin and justification by faith. The influence of their type of thought, very great from the first, increased as time went on and became a factor of importance both in the Arminian revolt at the beginning of the 17th century and in the rationalistic defection a hundred years later. Neither the Arminians, for example, Limbourg, Corselius, nor the rationalists, for example, Wegscheider, would hear of an imputation of Adam's sin, and both attacked with arguments very similar to those of the Sicinians, also the imputation of our sins to Christ, or of his righteousness to us. Rationalism almost ate the heart out of the Lutheran churches, and the Reformed churches were saved from the same fate only by the prompt extrusion of the Arminian party and the strengthening of their position by conflict with it. 
In particular, about the middle of the 17th century, the covenant or federal method of exhibiting the plan of the Lord's dealings with men began to find great acceptance among the Reformed churches. There was nothing novel in this mode of conceiving truth. The idea was present in the minds of the church fathers and the schoolmen, and it underlay Protestant thought, both Lutheran and Reformed, from the beginning, and in the latter had come to clear expression, first in Ursinus. But now it quickly became dominant as the preferable manner of conceiving the method of the divine dealing with men. The effect was to throw into the highest relief the threefold doctrine of imputation and to make manifest as never before the dependency of the great doctrines of sin, satisfaction and justification upon it. Laplace and later theologians and schools. About the same time, a brilliant French professor, Jose de Laplace, of the Reformed School at Saumur, reduced all that could be called the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity simply to this, that because of the sin inherent in us from our origin, we are deserving of being treated in the same way as if we had committed that offence. This confinement of the effect of Adam's sin upon his posterity to the transmission to them of a sinful disposition, inherent sin, was certainly new in the history of Reformed thought. Andreas Rivetus had no difficulty in collecting a long line of testimonies from the confessions and representative theologians explicitly declaring that men are accounted guilty in God's sight, both because of Adam's act of transgression imputed to them and of their own sinful disposition derived from him. The conflict of views was no doubt rendered sharper, however, by the prevalence at the time of the covenant theology in which the immediate imputation of Adam's transgression is particularly clearly emphasized. Thus, immediate and mediate imputation, for by the latter name, Laplace came subsequently to call his view, were pitted against each other as mutually exclusive doctrines, as if the question at issue were whether man stood condemned in the sight of God solely on account of his adherent sin, or solely on account of his inherent sin. The former of these doctrines had never been held in the Reformed churches since Zwingli, and the latter had never been held in them before Laplace. From the first, both adherent and inherent sin had been confessed as the double ground of human guilt, and the advocates of the covenant theology were as far as possible from denying the guilt of inherent sin. Laplace's innovation was, as a matter of course, condemned by the Reformed world, formerly at the Synod of Carrington, 1644-45, to and in the Helvetic Consensus, 1675, and by argument at the hands of the leading theologians, Rivetus, Turretin, Mauritius, Dresden, Leidecker, and Mark. But the tendencies of the time were in its favour and it made its way. It was adopted by theologians like Wittenbach, Endermann, Stapfer, Ruel, Wittringer, Venema. And after a while it found its way through Britain to America, where it has had an interesting history forming one of the stages through which the New England theology passed on its way to its ultimate denial of the quality of sin involving guilt to anything but the voluntary acts of a free agent, and finally becoming one of the characteristic tenets of the so-called New School theology of the Presbyterian churches. Thus it has come about that there has been much debate in America upon imputation in the sense of the imputation of Adam's sin, and diverse types of theology have been framed, especially among the Congregationalists and Presbyterians, centering in differences of conception of this doctrine. Among the Presbyterians, for example, four such types are well marked, each of which has been taught by theologians of distinction. These are, one, the Federalistic characterized by its adherence to the doctrine of immediate imputation, represented, for example, by Dr. Charles Hodge. Two, the new school, characterized by its adherence to the doctrine of mediate imputation, represented, for example, by Henry B. Smith. Three, the realistic, which teaches that all mankind were present in Adam as generic humanity and sinned in him, and are therefore guilty of his and their common sin, represented, for example, by Dr. W. G. T. Shedd and four, one which may be called the agnostic, characterized by an attempt to accept the fact of the transmission of both guilt and depravity from Adam without framing a theory of the mode of their transmission or of their relations one to the other, represented, for example, by Dr. R. W. Landis. End of Imputation by B. B. Warfield
review of He That Is Spiritual by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He That Is Spiritual by Lewis Sperry Chafer. New York, Our Hope Press, 1918. Duodecimo, pages 10 to 151. Price, 75 cents. Mr. Chafer is in the unfortunate, and one would think very uncomfortable, condition of having two inconsistent systems of religion struggling together in his mind. He was bred an evangelical, and as a minister of the Presbyterian Church South, stands committed to evangelicalism of the purest water. But he has been long associated in his work with a coterie of evangelists and Bible teachers, among whom there flourishes that curious religious system at once curiously pretentious and curiously shallow, which the higher life leaders in the middle of the last century brought into vogue, and he has not been immune to its infection. These two religious systems are quite incompatible. The one is the product of the Protestant Reformation and knows no determining power in the religious life but the grace of God. The other comes straight from the laboratory of John Wesley, and in all its forms, modifications and mitigations alike, remains incurably Arminian, subjecting all gracious workings of God to human determining. The two can unite as little as fire and water. Mr. Chafer makes use of all the jargon of the higher life teachers. In him, too, we hear of two kinds of Christians, whom he designates respectively carnal men and spiritual men, on the basis of a misreading of 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and following, page 8, 109 and 146 and we are told that the passage from the one to the other is at our option whenever we care to claim the higher degree by faith, page 146. With him too, thus, the enjoyment of every blessing is suspended on our claiming it, page 129. We hear here too of letting God, page 84, and indeed we almost hear of engaging the spirit, as we engage, say, a carpenter to do work for us, page 94, and we do explicitly hear of making it possible for God to do things, page 148, a quite terrible expression. Of course, we hear repeatedly of the duty and efficacy of yielding, and the act of yielding ourselves is quite in the customary manner discriminated from consecrating ourselves, page 84, and we are told, as usual, that by it the gate is opened into the divinely appointed path, pages 91 and 49. The quietistic phrase, quote, not by trying, but by a right adjustment, end quote, meets us, page 39, and naturally such current terms as known sin, page 62, moment by moment triumph, page 34 and 60, the life that is Christ, page 31, unbroken walk in the spirit, pages 53 and 113, unbroken victory, page 96, even Pearsall Smith's famous at once, Quote, the Christian may realize at once the heavenly virtues of Christ, end quote, page 39. It is a matter of course after this that we are told that it is not necessary for Christians to sin, page 1 to 5, the emphasis repeatedly thrown on the word necessary, leading us to wonder whether Mr. Chafer remembers that, according to the confession of faith to which, as a Presbyterian minister, he gives his adhesion, it is, in the strictest sense of the term, not necessary for anybody to sin, even for the natural man. 9. 1. Although he thus serves himself with their vocabulary, and therefore, of course, repeats the main substance of their teaching, there are lengths, nevertheless, to which Mr. Chafer will not go with his higher-life friends. He quite decidedly repels, for example, the expectation of repetitions of the Pentecostal manifestations, page 47, and this is the more notable because in his expositions of certain passages in which the charismatic spirit is spoken of, he has missed that fact to the confusion of his doctrine of the spirit's modes of action. With equal decisiveness, he repels, quote, such man-made unbiblical terms as second blessing, a second work of grace, the higher life, and various phrases used in the perverted statements of the doctrines of sanctification and perfection, end quote page 31 and 33, including such phrases as entire sanctification and sinless perfection, page 107, 139. 
He is hewing here, however, to a rather narrow line, for he does teach that there are two kinds of Christian, the carnal and the spiritual, and he does teach that it is quite unnecessary for spiritual men to sin, and that the way is fully open to them to live a life of unbroken victory if they choose to do so. Mr. Chafer opens his book with an exposition of the closing verses of the second and the opening verses of the third chapter of 1 Corinthians. Here he finds three classes of men contrasted, the natural or unregenerated man and the carnal or spiritual men, both of whom are regenerated but the latter of whom lives on a higher plane. Quote, there are two great spiritual changes which are possible to human experience, he writes, page 8, the change from the natural man to the saved man and the change from the carnal man to the spiritual man. The former is divinely accomplished when there is a real faith in Christ, the latter is accomplished when there is a real adjustment to the spirit. The spiritual man is the divine ideal in life and ministry, in power with God and man, in unbroken fellowship and blessing, end quote. This teaching is indistinguishable from what is ordinarily understood by the doctrine of a second blessing, a second work of grace, the higher life. The subsequent expositions only make the matter clearer. In them, the changes are rung on the double salvation, on the one hand from the penalty of sin, on the other from the power of sin, salvation into safety and salvation into sanctity, page 109. And the book closes with a long, drawn-out analogy between these two salvations. This analogy is announced with this statement, quote, The Bible treats our deliverance from the bond servitude to sin as a distinct form of salvation, and there is an analogy between this and the more familiar aspect of salvation, which is from the guilt and penalty of sin. End quote, page 141. It ends with this fuller summary, quote, There are a multitude of sinners for whom Christ has died who are not now saved. On the divine side, everything has been provided, and they have only to enter by faith into his saving grace, as it is for them in Christ Jesus. Just so, there are multitudes of saints whose sin nature has been perfectly judged, and every provision made on the divine side for a life of victory and glory to God, who are not now realizing a life of victory. They have only to enter by faith into the saving grace from the power and dominion of sin." Sinners are not saved until they trust the Saviour, and saints are not victorious until they trust the Deliverer. God has made this possible through the cross of his Son. Salvation from the power of sin must be claimed by faith. End quote, page 146. No doubt what we are first led to say of this is that here is the quintessence of Arminianism. God saves no one, he only makes salvation possible for men. Whether it becomes actual or not depends absolutely on their own act. It is only by their act that it is made possible for God to save them. But it is equally true that here is the quintessence of the higher life teaching, which merely emphasizes that part of this Arminian scheme which refers to the specific matter of sanctification. Quote, what he provides and bestows is in the fullest divine perfection, but our adjustment is human and therefore subject to constant improvement. The fact of our possible deliverance, which depends on him alone, does not change. We will have as much at any time as we make it possible for him to bestow, end quote, page 148. When Mr. Chafer repels the doctrine of sinless perfection, he means, first of all, that our sinful natures are not eradicated. Entering the old controversy waged among perfectionists between eradicationists and suppressionists, he ranges himself with the latter, only preferring to use the word control. Quote, the divine method of dealing with the sin nature in the believer is by direct and unceasing control over that nature by the indwelling spirit. End quote, page 134. One would think that this would yield at least a sinlessness of conduct, but that is to forget that, after all, in this scheme, the divine action waits on man's. Quote, the Bible teaches that while the divine provision is one of perfection of life, the human appropriation is always faulty and therefore the results are imperfect at best. End quote. Page 157. God's provisions only make it possible for us to live without sinning. The result is, therefore, only that we are under no necessity of sinning. But whether we shall actually sin or not is our own affair. Quote, His provisions are always perfect, but our appropriation is always imperfect. What he provides and bestows is in the fullest divine perfection but our adjustment is human. The fact of our possible deliverance, which depends on him alone, does not change. 
we will have as much at any time as we make it possible for him to bestow, end quote, pages 148 and 149. Thus it comes about that we can be told both that the, quote, child of God and citizen of heaven may live a superhuman life in harmony with his heavenly calling by an unbroken walk in the spirit, that the Christian may realize at once the heavenly virtues of Christ, end quote, page 39, and that, in point of fact, he does nothing of the kind, that all Christians do sin, page 111. A possibility of not sinning which is unillustrated by a single example and will never be illustrated by a single example is, of course, a mere postulate extorted by a theory. It is without practical significance. A universal effect is not accounted for by its possibility. Mr. Chafer conducts his discussion of these, quote, two general theories as to the divine method of dealing with the sin nature in believers, end quote, on the presumption that, quote, both theories cannot be true, for they are contradictory, end quote. Page 135. Quote, the two theories are irreconcilable, end quote, he says. Page 139. Quote, we are either to be delivered by the abrupt removal of all tendency to sin, and so no longer need the enabling power of God to combat the power of sin, or we are to be delivered by the immediate and constant power of the indwelling spirit, end quote. This irreducible either-or is unjustified. In point of fact, both eradication and control are true. God delivers us from our sinful nature, not indeed by abruptly, but by progressively eradicating it, and meanwhile controlling it. For the new nature which God gives us is not an absolutely new somewhat, alien to our personality, inserted into us, but our old nature, itself remade, a veritable recreation or making of all things new. Mr. Chafer is quite wrong when he says, quote, Salvation is not a so-called change of heart. It is not a transformation of the old. It is a regeneration or creation of something wholly new, which is possessed in conjunction with the old so long as we are in the body. End quote. Page 113 That this furnishes out each Christian with two conflicting natures does not appall him. He says quite calmly, quote, The unregenerate have but one nature, while the regenerate have two, end quote, page 116. He does not seem to see that thus the man is not saved at all. A different, newly created man is substituted for him. When the old man is got rid of, and that the old man has to be ultimately got rid of, he does not doubt. The saved man that is left is not at all the old man that was to be saved, but a new man that has never needed any saving. It is a temptation to a virtuoso in the interpretation of Scripture to show his mettle on hard places and in startling results. Mr. Chafer has not been superior to this temptation. Take but one example. Quote, all Christian love, he tells us, page 40, according to the scriptures, is distinctly a manifestation of divine love through the human heart, end quote, a quite unjustified assertion. But Mr. Chafer is ready with an illustration. Quote, a statement of this is found, he declares, at Romans 5, 5, because the love of God is shed abroad, literally gushes forth, in our hearts by produced or caused by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us, end quote. Then he comments as follows, quote, This is not the working of the human affection, it is rather the direct manifestation of the love of God passing through the heart of the believer, out from the indwelling spirit. It is the realization of the last petition of the high priestly prayer of our Lord, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. John 17.26 it is simply God's love working in and through the believer. It could not be humanly produced or even imitated, and it of necessity goes out to the objects of divine affection and grace rather than to the objects of human desire. A human heart cannot produce divine love, but can experience it. To have a heart that feels the compassion of God is to drink of the wine of heaven. End quote. All this bizarre doctrine is the transference of God's love in the sense of his active power of loving to us so that it works out from us again as new centers, is extracted from Paul's simple statement that by the Holy Spirit, which God has given us, his love to us is made richly real to our apprehension. Among the parenthetical theological comments which Mr. Chafer has inserted into his quotation of the text, 
it is a pity that he did not include one noting that ek her is not is her, and that Paul would no doubt have used is her had he meant to convey that idea. A haunting ambiguity is thrust upon Mr. Chafer's whole teaching by his hospitable entertainment of contradictory systems of thought. There is a passage near the beginning of his book, not well expressed, it is true, but thoroughly sound in its fundamental conception, in which expression is given to a primary principle of the evangelical system, which, had validity been given to it, would have preserved Mr. Chafer from his regrettable dalliance with the higher life formulas. Quote, in the Bible, he writes, the divine offer and condition for the cure of sin in an unsaved person is crystallized into the one word, believe, for the forgiveness of sin with the unsaved is only offered as an indivisible part of the whole divine work of salvation. The saving work of God includes many mighty undertakings other than the forgiveness of sin, and salvation depends only upon believing. It is not possible to separate some one issue from the whole work of his saving grace, such as forgiveness, and claim this apart from the indivisible whole. It is therefore a grievous error to direct an unsaved person to seek forgiveness of his sins as a separate issue. A sinner minus his sins would not be a Christian, for salvation is more than subtraction, it is addition. I give unto them eternal life. Thus the sin question with the unsaved will be cured as a part of, but never separate from, the whole divine work of salvation, and this salvation depends upon believing. End quote, page 62. If this passage means anything, it means that salvation is a unit, and that he who is united to Jesus Christ by faith receives in him not only justification, salvation from the penalty of sin, but also sanctification, salvation from the power of sin, both safety and sanctity. These things cannot be separated, and it is a grievous error to teach that a true believer in Christ can stop short in carnality, and, though having the Spirit with him and in him, not have him upon him, to use a not very lucid play upon prepositions in which Mr. Chafer indulges. In his attempt to teach this, Mr. Chafer is betrayed, page 29, into drawing out a long list of characteristics of the two classes of Christians, in which he assigns to the lower class practically all the marks of the unregenerate man. Salvation is a process, as Mr. Chafer loyally teaches. The flesh continues in the regenerate man and strives against the spirit, he is to be commended for preserving even to the seventh chapter of Romans its true reference. But the remainders of the flesh in the Christian do not constitute his characteristic. He is in the spirit and is walking, with however halting steps, by the spirit. And it is to all Christians, not to some, that the great promise is given, Sin shall not have dominion over you. And the great assurance is added, Because ye are not under the law, but under grace." He who believes in Jesus Christ is under grace, and his whole course, in its process and in its issue alike, is determined by grace, and therefore, having been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son, he is surely being conformed to that image, God himself seeing to it that he is not only called and justified, but also glorified. You may find Christians at every stage of this process, for it is a process through which all must pass, but you will find none who will not, in God's own good time and way, pass through every stage of it. There are not two kinds of Christians, although there are Christians at every conceivable stage of advancement towards the one goal to which all are bound and at which all shall arrive. End of Review of He That Is Spiritual by B. B. Warfield Repentance and Original Sin by B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The question is sometimes asked whether we must repent of original sin. It is sometimes asked triumphantly by controversialists who fancy that they disprove by it the reality of original sin. The Christian heart, they argue, turns in instinctive repentance away from all sin. It is absurd, however, to talk of repenting of original sin. The only sin that is recognizable as such, therefore, under the test of repentance, is our actual transgression. 
It is also, however, sometimes asked anxiously by earnest Christians eager to perform their whole duty before the Lord. All sin, they reason, must be repented of, that it may be forgiven. Must I not then repent of the sin of our first father, which has been imputed to me, just as really and just as poignantly as I repent of my own actual transgressions, if I am to hope for forgiveness and reception into life? If not, I am not practically assuming the frivolous attitude of the young Frenchwoman who, when asked by her confessor, what must we do to repent unto life, replied archly, We must first of all sin, my father. In approaching a question like this, we must obviously begin by making sure that we are not using our terms confusedly. What do we mean by repentance? And what do we mean by original sin? Clearly, if we use these terms in shifting senses, we shall never arrive at a stable solution of the problem propounded. If repentance means for us simple sorrow, however sharp, our conclusion may be one thing. If it means for us amendment of life, our conclusion may be quite a different thing. If original sin means for us Adam's personal sin made ours by an external act of imputation, our conclusion may be one thing. If it means for us our own inborn depravity, common to us and the whole race of man, our conclusion may be a very different thing. Let us agree at the outset, therefore, that the terms shall be understood in their broadest and fullest sense. By repentance we are to mean not merely sorrow for and hatred of sin, but also the inward turning away from it to God with full purpose of new obedience. By original sin we are to mean not merely adherent but also inherent sin, not merely the sinful act of Adam imputed to us, but also the sinful state of our own souls conveyed to us by the just judgment of God. When so understood, it would seem sufficiently clear that we must repent of original sin. The corruption that is derived by us from our first parents comes to us indeed as penalty, but it abides in us as sin and must be looked upon as sin both by God and by the enlightened conscience itself. Surely the all-holy God cannot look upon depravity without abhorrence. The all-just God cannot look upon it without righteous indignation. To suppose otherwise would be to suppose that what is in its very nature the direct contradictory of his holiness is either not recognized by him as such, or, being so recognized, does not produce within him the appropriate emotions. As long as God is God, he will not be able to endure the sight of depravity without both abhorrence and indignation. It is idle, therefore, to speak of our innate depravity as uncondemnable viciosity. Whatever is vicious is by that very token condemnable and in the sight of God already condemned. In proportion, then, as the Christian's conscience is quickened by the Holy Spirit and instructed by the Word to estimate things from the standpoint of God, in that proportion will he both abhor and condemn himself for the depravity that dwells within him. And this is the reason of the poignancy of self-arraignment which characterizes Paul's language in the seventh chapter of Romans, which leads some careless readers to doubt whether it is the fit expression of the consciousness of a regenerated man. Only the regenerate man, however, could experience such sharpness of agony over his indwelling sin. Every regenerated man will, like Paul, so soon as his eyes are opened, feel the deepest contrition for his indwelling sin and form the stoutest purpose to oppose and overcome it. What he does will seem black enough in his illuminated eyes. What he is will seem blacker still. And the very core of his repentance will be his firm determination not only to do better but to be better. And thus it appears that so far from its being impossible to repent of original sin, repentance, considered in its normative sense, not as an act of turning away from this sin or that sin, but of turning from sin as such to God, is fundamentally just repentance of original sin. Until we repent of original sin, we have not, properly speaking, repented in the Christian sense at all. For it is characteristic of heathen thought to look upon sin atomistically as only so many acts of sin, and at repentance also, therefore, atomistically as only so many acts of turning away from sinning. The Christian conception probes deeper and finds behind the acts of sin the sinful nature and behind the specific acts of repentance for sins the great normative act of repentance for this sinful nature. He only then has really repented who has perceived and felt the filthiness and odiousness of his depraved nature 
and has turned from it to God with a full purpose of being hereafter more conformed to his image as revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. But, it may be said, we can at least then not expect to repent of imputed sin. The language again is ambiguous. Our own actual transgressions are imputed to us, counted as ours, counted against us, just as truly as is Adam's first act of transgression, and so is our own inward depravity. But if what is meant is that we cannot be expected to repent of Adam's act of sin, the guilt of which is imputed to us as the judicial ground of the infliction upon us of the penalty threatened to him, this is true enough. It is not the personal ill-desert of Adam's sin that is transferred to us by imputation, but only the law relation to it, not the reatus corpore, but only the rectus poenue. And though the latter may and does supply a ground for grief and sorrow and regret on our part, it is only the former that can lay a foundation for turning away from sin with a set purpose after a changed life, to be lived in the strength of God. Nevertheless, it is perhaps not always sufficiently considered how deeply we may, how deeply sensitive souls do, enter by sympathetic identification into original sin, even in this purely imputative sense, so as to quicken within us something which very closely simulates repentance. Human nature, it has been strikingly said, is so constituted as to implicate us not only in our own personal moral acts but also in the moral acts of each other, and in consequence thereof conscience in its higher exercises extends beyond the sphere of our individual conduct and is sympathetically affected by the conduct of others, filling us with shame and grief at the moral degradation of those we love and inspiring us with joy and satisfaction when they are seen to excel in virtue. The author of this remark presses it beyond all bounds and would fain replace with this sympathetic identification the really vicarious substitution of Christ for his people. Yet the remark itself is obviously true and has its proper application. A father's heart is broken by the crime of his son, and a son is degraded by a father's disgrace. A mother enters, more often fully than the culprit herself, into a daughter's shame. We feel, even in some sense, participants in the blameworthiness of those with whom we are closely connected. A sensitive soul, implicated with mankind as sinful, may feel thus as man, and so we enter sympathetically into the guilt of the race. We may be sure, though this was not all, nor yet the core of our Lord's identification with his people, yet that his pure and sensitive soul did, by this way of sympathetic identification, also enter into the sinfulness of the race he had come to redeem, and that in this was hidden one source of his sufferings for us. Doubtless others also, his followers, partakers of his spirit, may have, like him, so borne in their own souls the sorrow of sin, of sin conceived of as his sin, guilt before God, and not as personal corruption. Let this sorrow for sin, however, reach its fullest height, and still it falls short of repentance. It may produce shame, it may reach in its degree, even to agony. It may be properly designated as grief, sorrow for sin, godly sorrow for sin. It may quicken to a perception of our own share in any sin more particularly in question. It may arouse a father to probe his heart to the discovery of his own failure in training the son who has disgraced him. It may stir up the son to perceive what effect his own failure in duty and obedience may have had in deteriorating his father's character. It may greatly increase the poignancy of our contrition as we repent for such share as we may have had in others' transgressions. But the essential element of true repentance, properly and precisely so called, will necessarily be lacking. There can be no turning away from sin to God except in the case of those in whom the sin dwells as actual sin. Every element of repentance except this essential element may thus be present in what we may somewhat improperly call this sodalic repentance, but where this element is absent, there repentance, strictly so called, cannot be present. We conclude, therefore, that the actual presence of sin in its completeness is requisite for the performance of the act of repentance in its completeness. The element of guilt, liability to punishment, may be present and repentance be impossible in its completeness. We may, in that case, feel grief, sorrow, and regret, but not experience reformation. Only when not only liability to punishment, but personal demerit is present, can repentance in its full sense enter in. 
Hence it follows that our blessed Lord could not repent in this full and precise sense of the word. He did nothing, and he has nothing for which he could feel regret, nor did he share our sin in the sense of inner corruption or personal ill-desert. He was as incapable of repentance as of the sinfulness from which it is the recoil. But of him alone, of those who have as men trodden this earth, can it be said that there was no place in him for repentance. The infant of days has that within him which is offensive to God's sight and will be the ground of abhorrence to himself so soon as the eyes of his spirit are opened that they may truly see his state, and so soon as he is capable, by reason of age, of mental action, so soon is repentance within his duty and, by God's grace, may be within his power. End of Repentance and Original Sin by B.B. Warfield Sanctifying the Pelagians by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If it only could be done realiter, it surely would be worthwhile. Pelagius's own perfection seems to have been sadly marred by insufficient attention to exactitude of statement, and that of many of his followers appears to be the result of an inability, certainly not confined to Pelagians, to notice, as Hanak puts it, any appreciable difference between what they actually do and what they ought to do. Unfortunately, however, the sanctifying of the Pelagians that has been thrust on our attention has always been merely nominaliter, ordinarily even per accidens. It is not wholly unstudied, to be sure, when the Reverend Dr. S. D. McConnell, in one of his deliciously wrong-headed books, speaks smilingly of, quote, that sweet Saint Pelagius, end quote. The reader greets the phrase with an answering smile and passes on with no desire to deny to Dr. McConnell the universal right of creating our saints in our own image. But we know it is only Homer nodding when we read in Dr. Hodgkin's Italy and Her Invaders. Edition 1, Volume 2, page 395, that Avitus, quote, the forlorn bishop emperor, fearful for his life, left Italy by stealth to repair to the tomb of St. Julianus of Eclana, end quote. The authority is, of course, Gregory of Tours, and Gregory of Tours, equally of course, says nothing of St. Julianus of Eclana, but tells us instead that the wretched Avitus, Quote, fled with rich gifts to the Basilica of St. Julian, Martyr of Avonie, end quote. Still equally, of course, Mr. Hodgkin has in his second edition corrected his mistake, and now, volume 2, page 392, tells us that Avitus's purpose was, quote, to repair to the tomb of Julian the Martyr, an Avonian saint, end quote. So far as Mr. Hodgkin is concerned, therefore, the canonization of Julian was only short-lived, Indeed, even in his first edition, he was as unkind to him in one place as he was overkind in another, taking away with one hand, as it were, while giving with the other. On page 247, at least, he tells us that Augustine was at Hippo, quote, busily employed adding a confutation of the Emperor Julian to the vast library of books which already owned him as author when the news came of the Vandal invasion, end quote. Of course, this also has been corrected in the second edition, and it must be admitted with some vigour, as if Dr. Hodgkin were a little spiteful against a man who had led him into such confusion with his Julians. We now read that the great bishop was, quote, adding a confutation of Julian of Eclana, the Pelagian heretic, end quote. In the interests of historical accuracy, thus, he who was St. Julianus of the first edition has reverted in the second into just Julian the Pelagian heretic. Julian did not have to wait for Dr. Hodgkin's temporary slip in his behalf, however, to receive the doubtful honours of verbal sanctification. If there were not many historians of Dr. Hodgkin's quality, there were many Pelagianizers of Dr. McConnell's quality in the Dark Ages, and they felt an equal desire with his to honour their own. Nor did they lack the courage, if courage is what is required, to do so, each in his own way. One instance is of sufficient inherent interest to merit a brief account of it here. 
readers of the article on Julianus of Eclana in Smith and Wace's Dictionary of Christian Biography, volume 3, page 472a, will have noticed the following sentences towards the end. Quote, it is singular, however, that Petrus da Natalibus should devote a chapter of his Catalogus Sanctorum to him under the title of the Sancto Giuliano Confessiore, 339. It is clear that he means Julianus of Eclana as he quotes what Gadanius says of him and refers to his having written four books, Adversus Augustinum Ejus Impugnatorem, whom, however, he strangely calls an Heresiachus. Petrus also says, what does not appear elsewhere, that Julianus wrote against others as well as against Augustine, end quote. It is to this account of Julian by Petrus de Natalibus that we wish to direct attention for a moment. Petrus de Natalibus, or Petrus Equilinus, as he is sometimes called, was by birth a Venetian who, after a service as parish priest in his native city, became, in 1372, the 20th Bishop of Aquilia, or Gesola. This episcopal town owed its foundation to the inhabitants of Oderzo and Asolo, who, fleeing from the Huns, were glad to take refuge at the mouth of the Piave, where they built a new city and called it Equilium. Ecclesiastically, it belonged not to Aquilia, but to Grado, and received its first bishop in 876. It was absorbed into the Patriarchate of Venice in 1466, soon after the death of its 24th bishop. Its site is now marked only by the little village of Ieso di Struta, or La Cava Zucarina. The fame of its great bishop Peter rests on two works in which he raised monuments to his patriotism with respect at once to church and state, our Catalogus Sanctorum and a corresponding Catalogus Venetorum Senatorum et Gestorum Eorum, printed at Vicineza in 1493. Our Catalogus Sanctorum also apparently was printed at Vicineza in 1493 from the press of Henry of Santoso. It was a folio of 332 leaves. Its title page reads as follows. Omnipotenti Deo, Immaculente Semper Virgine Marie, Universaque Celesti Curie Splendori et Animabus Nostris Utilitati. Catalogus Sanctorum et Gestorum Eorum ex diversis volumnibus collectus editus a reverendissimo in Christo Patri Domino Petro de Natalibus de Venetis Dei Gratia Episcopo Eculino Antonio Velli Vicentini ad Lectorem Ende Cassilabon. On the back of folio 326 stands the following, Catalogi Sanctorum per Reverentissimum Dominum Petrum de Natalibus Uenetum Episcopum Equilinum Editi Opus Finit Vicentia per Henricum de Sancto Ursiu Librarium Solerticura Impressum Augustino Barbadico Incluto Venetiarum Duce, Anno Salutis, 1493, Priide Idus Decembris, Laus Dei, Register, Printer's Mark with initials RV. There followed in the early 16th century very numerous editions, as, for example, Lyons, 1500, Nuremberg, 1501, Strasbourg, 1503, Venice, 1506, Strasbourg, 1513 and 1514, Venice, 1516, and so on. Before the end of the first quarter of this century, even a French translation had appeared in two folio volumes, the title of which is given by Gris as follows. Le Grand Catalogue de Sons et Sons Nouvellement Translat de Latine de Pierre de Natal en François par Guy Breslet, Paris, Galliot de Pré, 1523-1524. to 1524. 
The book seems indeed almost to have vied in popularity with the Legenda Aurea itself, and it appears to have shared with that book the fate of popular compilations and to have been much corrupted in its several reproductions by large additions to its original text. We have not ourselves been able to see a copy of the book. But the editions of 1506 and 1513 have been kindly examined for us at Berlin by the Reverend F. W. Lutra, B.D., from whose descriptions we are able to communicate the following facts. There are no less than 23 Giuliani enumerated in the catalogue. Ten of these, however, are merely listed in the calendar of saints, their names and festal days alone being given. Seven chapters of the third book are headed Le Sancto Giuliano, and of these three receive the adjunct Confessore. Of these, chapter 38, not 39, as Smith and Wace say, though of course the numeration may differ in different editions, treats of Julian of Eclana. This chapter is verbatim identical in the two editions examined, and runs as follows. There was another Julian the Confessor, concerning whom Gennadius, in his work on illustrious men, says that he was of a vigorous character and eloquent, learned in the divine scriptures, proficient in Greek and Latin, and famous among the doctors of the church. He wrote four books against Augustine, his opponent, and again eight books against other heresiarchs. There is extant also a quite remarkable book of disputation between the two, defending each his own side. He was exceedingly liberal in almsgiving. He died, however, in the time of the Emperor Valentinian, the son of Constantinus. A glance is sufficient to show the accuracy of the account given by Smith and Wace of Peter's treatment of the subject, except that one would scarcely infer from that account that Peter depends wholly on Gennadius for his facts, and only bunglingly departs from him in order to Pelagianize the statement. This, however, is true, and it is to illustrate this that we have adverted to the matter at all. Gennadius, it must be remembered, was himself of semi-Pelagian proclivities. This is quite apparent from the eulogistic tone in which he speaks of the semi-Pelagian leaders, for example Cassian and Faustus, and not less from the perfunctory manner in which he deals with the Augustinian leaders, for example Prosper, and even Augustine himself, and the even inimical colouring of his chapters treating of them. Of the one class of writers he speaks with unconcealed admiration, of the other with scarcely concealed dislike. Gennadius' book it must be further remembered, was propagated by Pelagianizing hands, and in its passage down the years gathered much Pelagianizing detritus. Most of the relevant chapters have suffered more or less from this cause, the chapter on Augustine perhaps most of all. The editors in their critical digests communicate from the manuscript a number of these editions, and thus enable us to note their character and estimate their tendency. We shall set down the chapter on Augustine as it is edited by Dr. Richardson and the same chapter as it may be supposed to have been read by those dependent only on the worser manuscripts. From this the reader may judge how the work of Gennadius may have been current, say, in the 14th century. Gennadius as presumably written. Gennadius as presumably read. Augustine of Africa, Bishop of Hippogorensis, a man renowned throughout the world for learning, both sacred and secular, unblemished in the faith, pure in life, wrote works so many that they cannot all be gathered. Augustine of Africa, Bishop of Hippogorensis, a man renowned both throughout the world for learning, both sacred and secular, unblemished in the faith, pure in life, wrote works so many that they cannot all be gathered. For who is there that can boast himself of having all his works, or who reads with such diligence as to read all he has written? For who is there that can boast himself of having all his works, or reads with such diligence as to read all he has written? Wherefore, on account of his much speaking, Solomon's saying came true that, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. As an old man even, he published fifteen books on the Trinity, which he had begun as a young man. As an old man, even, he published fifteen books on the Trinity, which he had begun as a young man, in which, as Scripture says, brought into the chamber of the king and adorned with the manifold garment of the wisdom of God, he exhibited a church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. 
in which, as Scripture says, brought into the chamber of the king and adorned with the manifold garment of the wisdom of God, he exhibited a church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In his work on the incarnation of the Lord also he manifested a peculiar piety. In his work on the incarnation of the Lord also he manifested a peculiar piety. On the resurrection of the dead he wrote with equal sincerity and left it to the less able to raise doubts respecting abortions. On the resurrection of the dead he wrote with equal sincerity and left it to the less able to raise doubts respecting abortions. His error, however, contracted, as I have said, from too much speaking, though exaggerated by the violence of enemies, did not yet raise a question of heresy. The animus against Augustine, and much more against Augustinianism, already apparent in Gennadius himself, may have thus been much increased in the text as it came to Peter. Nevertheless, it must be admitted that the manuscripts, as reported by the editors, do not seem to preserve any substantial variations in the text of chapter 45, or 46, which deals with Julian. In the recension given by Fabricius, at least as reported in Minier, CPL, volume 48, page 1083, and that given by Richardson, we have precisely the same text, though the possibility lies open, therefore, that Peter, at this point, substantially repeated the Gennadius he had in an already Pelagianized text. It seems more likely that he is himself responsible for its Pelagianization. It is a matter that must be left for special students of the textual history of Gennadius to determine. In any event, the recension of Gennadius given by Peter marks the extremity of its Pelagianizing. In Gennadius, Pelagius is a heresiarch, once for all branded by the church a heretic, and Julian also, though admirable in character, taught heresy. Even to the Pelagianizing glossators of Gennadius, Augustine, though a wearisome chatterer who by reason of his much speaking fell into error, yet fairly escaped heresy. To Peter, Augustine has become the heresiarch and Julian the saint. How much of this is mere blundering, how much of it traditional error, how much of it conscious polemics, it is difficult to tell. We set down the Latin text of Gennadius and Petrus side by side, and Petrus side by side, that their relation to one another may be made clear. Gennadius, edition Richardson, Julianus Episcopus, Vir acer ingenio in divinis scripturis doctus, caressa et latina lingua scholasticus, prius ergo quam impiatatem palagi, in se aperidet claros in doctoribus ecclesia fuit, posteo vero heresim pelagi defendere nisus scripsit adversum Augustinum, Impugnatorem ilius libros quatuor et iterum libros octo. Estet liber altercationis amborum partes suas defendentium. Hic Julianus ele emosinis tempore famis et anguistie indigentibus prorogatis multos Miserationis specie nobilium presipuaque religiosorem in licenies heresi sue sociavit moritur Valentiniano Constantini filio imperante. Peter of Natilibus, editions 1506 and 1513. Iulianus alius confessor fuit de quo ait Gennadius de viris illis tribus, quod acer ingenio et facundia extitit, divinis scripturis doctus, greca et latina lingua scholasticus et inter docteres ecclesia claros. Hic scripsit adversus Augustinum eius impugnatorem libros quat tuor et iterum adversis alios heresiachas libros. 8. Extat et liber altercationis amborum partes suas defendentium satis conspicus. 
hic fuit in ele emosinis liberalissimus. Mortitur autem Valentiniani imperatoris Constantifili tempore. The principle of the alteration seems to be primarily to strike out all reference to Julian's implication in heresy. In the attempt to do so, the text is thrown into some confusion. The sentence that declares Augustine to have been his opponent is eked out by a clause declaring that Julian's eight books were written against other heresiarchs than Augustine, and this leaves the reference of Amborum in the next clause hanging in the air. The grossness of all this blundering cannot, however, conceal the deliberateness of the Pelagianization of the text. End of Sanctifying the Pelagians by B.B. Warfield What should be the attitude of the American clergy towards the revised version of the Scriptures by B.B. Warfield? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I may as well say frankly at the outset that I do not think the revised version perfect. Or, if this be deemed a barren assertion, I do not object to whittling it to a sharper point by putting it into the form of a confession that the revised version appears to me to be deformed by many faults which could have been avoided. The revised version needs a revision. If anyone felt it worthwhile, it would be easy to make out a bill of indictment against it, very similar in appearance to those made out fifteen years ago against King James's New Testament and collected by Dr. Schaff into an instructive volume. Take Dr. Lightfoot's treatise as an example. The necessity of a fresh revision is urged by him on account of errors in it arising from false readings, the creation of artificial distinctions and obliteration of real ones, faults of grammar and lexicography, archaisms, etc. Does anyone doubt that items can be produced for every one of these heads from the revised version? Suppose, for an archaism, we turn to Nahum 2.9, there is none end of the store, the glory of all pleasant furniture. Is that 19th century English? Or is it good modern English to say, my inward friends, Job 19.19, or his kneesings, Job 45.18, or I will work and who shall let it, Isaiah 43.13. As to artificial distinctions, it is the same word that is goodness in Hosea 6.4 and mercy in verse 6. When Hosea, chapter 12, verse 3, wishes to recall Genesis 32.28 to his readers' minds, the revisers do what they can to prevent him by translating the one passage, Thou hast striven with God, and the other, He has power with God. The word that is mercy in Psalm 103, verse 8, is loving kindness in Psalm 51, 1. While mercy occurs twice in that verse as the translation of two other words, thus the two faults of creation of artificial distinctions and obliteration of real ones go hand in hand a matter that could be tolerably copiously illustrated. Examples of a certain coarseness of grammatical work are equally easy to adduce, as, for instance, such renderings of the aorist participle as I beheld Satan fallen as lightning from heaven, Luke 10.18, and I saw a light shining around me, Acts 26.13, compare also 15.13, etc. Renderings as inconsistent with each other as both are inconsistent with good grammar or the remarkable that one of you hath his father's wife, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, or the inadequate treatment of the tense in Crieth of Isaiah 6, 3, and he made of Psalm 7, 15. As to errors arising from the retention of a faulty text, quite a number could be gleaned from each testament. It may not be amiss for me to say frankly that I should personally like to see the whole text-critical portion of the margin of both testaments swept into the waste-basket where I think it belongs. What possible good purpose can all the talk about most, many, some, a few ancient authorities, sick, of which confused and confusing notes are no less than 399, if my count be correct, in the New Testament, often inconsistently and misleadingly framed, or about some ancient versions, serve. Such things are necessarily caviar to the general. 
Whenever a reading is so well witnessed that doubt arises whether it be not genuine, it should be put into the margin with a simple or dot dot dot. The effort to make a show of text-critical processes in the margin of a popular volume is sure to breed misconception, if it be not a pedantic impertinence. This is scarcely the proper opportunity, however, for collecting the errors of the revision. The samples that I have given are doubtless enough to illustrate my assertion that this revision is deformed by errors of every one of the classes that were urged against the authorized version as reasons for its revision. If it be replied that the number of faults in the authorized version was a more potent reason for revising it than their mere variety, I answer that I have not undertaken to show that the revised version is in need of revision to an equal extent, but only alike with the authorized and I am grateful for being led thus easily to the second assertion which I had in mind to make at the outset. It is this. The revised version appears to me to be almost incomparably better than the authorized version. I desire to make this observation as pointedly as I made the former one. Some people seem to think that when they have collected and tabulated a number of petty faults, mixed often with a greater number of individual preferences, with the triumphant result of showing that the revised version is not perfect, they have settled everything. I beg leave, on the contrary, to remind the readers of this review that the practical question before the English-speaking Christian world today concerns not absolute but relative perfection. It will not do to neglect to note, collect, appreciate, or try to get corrected, for that matter, the faults of the revised version, and I, for one, have no words but those of respect for scholars who are doing this somewhat disagreeable work. But when they are collected and tabulated and tested and proved, they do not amount to a corporal's guard compared with the mixed multitude that rushes upon us from the noble and competently accurate but inexact version which we call the authorized version. And this fact it will not do to neglect either. The pity of the thing is that when the comparatively few and unimportant faults of the revision are gathered together and spread out to view, many look upon them in so sadly one-sided a way that they never think of asking either of the two very important, or necessary rather, questions. What proportion do these faults bear to the whole mass of matter in this version, and what proportion do they bear to the faults in other versions? I am not concerned nor inclined to minimize these faults, here they are, and I am very sorry for every one of them, and would gladly see them removed. But it is quite impossible to overlook either of these two facts. They are inappreciable as compared with the great army of passages accurately and felicitously rendered, and there is no other version in any tongue that possesses so few of them. If on the one side, then, we must frankly own that the revised version is not perfect, on the other let us frankly own that it is the most perfect of versions." As regards its purity relative to our authorized version, a very simple test suggested by the use I have made above of Bishop Lightfoot's treatise may be sufficient here. Dr. Scharf, in his valuable introduction to the volume there cited, gives, among other errors, 21 instances in which the authorized version, to the hurt of the sense, neglects the Greek article. In every one of these cases the appropriate correction has been made by the revised version. In the immediately preceding pages he tabulated 27 cases of mistranslation. All but three of these are corrected in the text of the revision, and the remaining three in the margin. These again are but samples. The truth is that it is little appreciated how many the changes made by the revision are, and when men see a considerable list of inaccuracies gleamed from its pages, they begin to feel that the changes must be usually for the worse. The remedy is to realize how small a proportion of the whole number of alterations introduced, and how much smaller a proportion of the whole text these few and usually unimportant errors constitute. According to Mr. Wendell, the revised version of the New Testament contains 179,914 words, 154,526 of which are retained from the authorized version, so that about 86% of the revised version is authorized version. This leaves 25,388 words which are new to the revision. What proportion of these 25,000 words have been challenged as inaccurate or unhappy by the critics of even the most trenchant pens? What proportion of them have been proved to be such? The case is similar in the Old Testament. A careful writer informs us that 
830 changes have been made in Judges, 684 in Psalms 1 to 41, 335 in Hosea, 1389 in Job. If we take Judges and Job as samples, this gives us an average of four changes to every three verses. But when the whole mass of renderings to which objection can be raised on any ground are gathered together, how far short they fall of this average. Let the most carping critic loose on Judges or Job, and will he be able to find a fault and a third in every verse which is not common to the two versions? And if not, he confesses that the alterations made by the revisers are in general good and serviceable, and therefore that the book is a better version than the old one. I cannot take space to illustrate the nature of the improvements that have been made. They are pervasive and reach deeper than the surface. Much of the prophecy and poetry of the Old Testament now becomes for the first time clear or even comprehensible to the English reader. But if testimony is worth anything, I can testify that, having personally collated, in the most exact way, almost half of the New Testament, I have found the vast majority of the changes distinct improvements. Even in the matter of the English style of the revision, and its bad English runs all the way from pure cockneyisms up to such pedantic and stiff renderings that cease to be English at all, and becomes Greek in an English dress, the critics appear to me to have used very exaggerated language. The English is illegitimately harsh only in spots which might be easily revised, and generally needs only to become familiar to be loved. And in all that goes to make a version of a divine book good, fidelity to the form and spirit of the original, accuracy and strength of rendering, it is a very marked improvement on any popularly used version in English before it. Now, what should be the attitude of the American clergy towards this book? Primarily, I should say, an attitude of even-handed justice. This means, on the one side, that its faults should be frankly and readily confessed, and it means, on the other side, that its excellences should find equally ready and hearty recognition. And it means, still further, that the real proportion that exists between these faults and excellences should be correctly estimated and allowed to govern our thinking and action towards the version. If the relative excellence of the two versions actually be as I have represented, This even-handed justice will mean nothing less than the hearty acceptance of the revised version and the substitution of it in our use, private and public, for the authorized version, just as rapidly as the vested love of our flocks for the old form of words will permit us to make so great a change. This acceptance, of course, must not be allowed to tie our hands against the effort to get the revised version itself so revised as to free it from the faults that mar its perfection. Just in proportion to the heartiness with which I accept it as my version, does my zeal grow to have it perfected. And I see no good reason why its recognized errors should wait until the twentieth century for correction. No time for correcting them so good as the present can be hoped for. They are not yet so entrenched in our use and want as to appear old friends whose removal seems murder, and the making and criticizing of the new version has prepared a race of scholars to perform the work such as a new generation may not produce. I see no reason why the revised version should not pass through a series of improved editions as rapidly as the first English translations in Tyndale's and Coverdale's time, resulting now, as then, in a fixed form of greater excellence. Let the twentieth century correct the errors she discovers. Let us correct those that disturb us. Nor, on the other hand, must this acceptance be so overzealous as to trample on the rights of the old version to our admiration for its own excellences, or on the right of God's people to have God's word dealt out to them in an accustomed and beloved form. It does not in the least follow, because the revised version is much better than the authorized, that the latter is therefore worthless. Not only is it the well of English undefiled above all other fountains, but it is God's word competently exact in its rendering for all practical purposes. It has been the instrument of the Spirit for the saving and sanctifying of millions of souls, as well as the admiration and despair of all masters of English style. He who, because in God's grace he has got a better version than even this queen of versions itself, can contemn this, or fail to be enraptured with its majestic cadences and balanced harmony, betrays great littleness of spirit. We still read Coverdale's Psalms with delight and reverence. But a greater than Coverdale is here. Just because it is such, we cannot afford to drive it out of the house of God with cords. 
Men love it, even its faulty renderings start vibrations in thousands of souls, and the saint whose rebellious heart has been conquered by it, and whose broken heart has been comforted by it, has a right to hear its doubly precious words so long as he longs for them. Let us honour this truly honourable sentiment and be governed in our supplanting the good with the better by both wisdom and tenderness. To wean need not be to take away nourishment. Let the taste of the better be so wisely imparted that the hungry soul shall gradually seek and prefer it. To those of our clergy who cannot, like me, so heartily prefer the new to the old, I should say, at least give this version a fair chance. It may be that its failure to command our immediate acceptance is due to something in us rather than its own shortcomings, an unreasoning, though certainly not unreasonable, devotion to the Bible of our youth and inheritance and associations, a certain amount of shocked resentment at alterations in so familiar and precious texts, a great sense of newness like the smell of new paint, a, so to speak, away from homedness in its pages. We should not act hastily. All these are excellent reasons for temporary hesitation, but none of them are sound grounds for a permanent attitude. When the revised New Testament first appeared, I substituted it for the old in my private and devotional reading, just with the design of discovering how it would stand so severe a test. After four years, it is so entrenched in my affections that I could not return to the former use of the old version without the sense of a great loss. My heart, as well as my judgment, prefers the new. I believe that this experience awaits all who try a like experiment. Our memories are kept filled with the sweet sounds of our dear old wording, because we keep them refreshed by constant re-reading. The favorite texts of this year are, to a considerable extent, supplanted by a new set of equally precious ones next year, and these new ones, gradually taking the place of the old, though perhaps never entirely displacing them, may as well as not come from a new version. Above all, the superior exactness of the revised version brings the heart one step nearer to the word itself. Shall we lightly estimate this gain? We owe it to our people, too, to give the new version a chance among them. Let the people see whether they really do prefer the old to the new. My own pastor appears to me to have admirably managed this. He does not obtrude the revised version, but it is always in the pulpit, and sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both are used, and as both are constantly appealed to and frequently compared, the people are led to realize that both represent the word of God. I have never heard of anyone who objected to this process. Everyone seems pleased, instructed, edified, and meanwhile the revised version has its chance. Each parishioner gradually acquires a grounded notion of the comparative value of the two, and better than that, no one can fail to acquire, whichever version he finally prefers, a respect for the other, and a regard for the preferences of others. End of What Should Be the Attitude of the American Clergy Towards the Revised Version of the Scriptures by B.B. Warfield The Archaeology of the Mode of Baptism, Part 1, by B.B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is rather striking to observe the diversity which has grown up in the several branches of the Christian Church in the mode of administering the initiatory rite of Christianity. Throughout the whole West, a fusion is in use. The ritual of the great Latin church directs as follows, quote, Then the godfather or godmother or both holding the infant, the priest takes the baptismal water in a little vessel or jug and pours the same three times upon the head of the infant in the form of the cross, and at the same time he says, uttering the words once only, distinctly and attentively, in, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, he pours first, and of the Son, he pours a second time, and of the Holy Ghost, he pours the third time. End quote. Here is a trine effusion. With the exception of the large Baptist denominations, Protestants use a single effusion. The Baptists employ a single immersion. Throughout the East, a trine immersion is the rule. Although practice seems sometimes to vary whether all three immersions shall be total, 
The Orthodox Greek Church insists somewhat strenuously upon trine immersion. The ritual in use in the Russian Church directs as follows, quote, And after he has anointed the whole body, the priest baptizes the candidate, held erect and looking towards the east, and says, The servant of God, in, is baptized in the name of the Father, Amen, and of the Son, Amen, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen, now and ever, and to ages of ages, Amen. At each invocation he immerses the candidate and raises him again. End quote. Significant variations obtain, however, among the other Oriental communions. The Nestorians, for example, cause the candidate to stand erect in water, reaching to the neck, and dip the head three times. The Syrians, whether Jacobite or Maronite, place the candidate upright on his feet and pour water three times over his head in the name of the Trinity. The office of the Syrian Church of Jerusalem provides as follows, quote, The priest first lets the candidate down into the baptistry, then, laying his right hand on the head of the person to be baptized, with the left hand he takes up water successively from before, behind, and upon each side of the candidate, and washes his whole body. Funditque super caput edrus et abluit totum ipsius corpus. End quote. In the Coptic Church, the custom has become fixed for the priest to dip the body the first time up to the middle, the second time up to the neck, and the third time over the head. Sometimes, however, apparently, the actual practice is that the child is dipped only up to the neck, and the immersion is completed by pouring the water over the head. The Armenians duplicate the rite in a very odd way. Among them, we are told, quote, the priest asks the child's name, and on hearing it, lets the child down into the water, saying, this, in, servant of God who is come from the state of childhood, or from the state of a catechumen, to baptism, is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. While saying this, the priest buries the child, or catechumen, three times in the water as a figure of Christ's three days burial. Then, taking the child out of the water, he thrice pours a handful of water on its head, saying, As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Hallelujah! As many of you as have been enlightened of the Father, the Holy Spirit is put into you. Hallelujah! End quote. If we neglect for the moment the usages of minor divisions of the Church, we may say that the practice of the Church is divided into an Eastern and a Western mode. Broadly speaking, the East baptizes by a trine immersion, the West by a fusion. When we scrutinize the history of these differing practices, however, we quickly learn that, with whatever unessential variations in details, the usage of the East runs back into a high antiquity, while there are indications on the surface of the Western usage that it is comparatively recent in origin, and survivals of an older custom persist side by side with it. To be sure, the immersion, as practiced by the Protestant Baptists, can scarcely be numbered among these survivals. The original Baptists apparently did not immerse, and Dr. Dexter appears to have shown that even the first English Baptists who seceded from the Puritan emigrants and formed a congregation at Amsterdam, baptized by a fusion. It would seem that it was by the English Baptists of the 17th century that immersion was first declared to be essential to valid baptism, and the practice of immersion by then can be looked upon as a survival from an earlier time only in the sense that it was a return to an earlier custom, although with the variation of a single instead of a trine immersion we may more properly designate as a survival the practice of immersion which has subsisted in the great cathedral of Milan, a diocese in which many peculiar customs survive to remind us of its original independence of Rome. The Roman ritual itself, indeed, continues to provide for immersion as well as for effusion. The rubric reading, quote, if he baptizes by immersion, the priest, retaining the mitre, rises and takes the infant, and being careful not to hurt it, cautiously immerses its head in the water, and baptizing with a trine immersion, says only a single time, In, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. End quote. A similar survival appears in the Anglican prayer book, the rubric in which runs as follows. Quote, then the priest shall take the child into his hands and say to the godfathers and godmothers, Name this child. And then, naming it after them, if they shall certify him that the child may well endure it, 
he shall dip it into the water discreetly and warily, saying, In, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. But if they shall certify that the child is weak, it shall suffice to pour water upon it, saying the foresaid words, etc. End quote. Here, immersion, though a single immersion, is made the rule, and effusion appears only as an exception, although an exception which has in practice become the rule. The prayer book of the Protestant Episcopal Church in America accordingly parallels the two modes, the rubric reading, quote, and then naming it, the child, after them, he shall dip it in the water discreetly, or else pour water upon it, saying, etc., end quote. A similar reminiscence of the older usage was near being perpetuated in the formularies of the British and American Presbyterian churches. John Lightfoot has preserved for us a curious account of the debate in the Westminster Assembly upon the question whether the new directory of worship should recognize immersion alongside of a fusion as an alternative mode of baptism or should exclude it altogether in favor of a fusion. The latter was determined upon, but Lightfoot tells us, quote, it was voted so indifferently that we were glad to count names twice, for so many were unwilling to have dipping excluded that the votes came to an equality within one, for the one side was twenty-four, the other twenty-five, end quote. The guarded clauses which finally took their places in the Westminster Directory and Confession of Faith reflect the state of opinion in the assembly revealed by this close vote, and, when read in this light, will not fail to operate to enshrine still a reminiscence of the earlier custom of baptism by immersion. If we will bear in mind the history of the mode of baptism in the English church, as thus exhibited in the formularies framed by her, we shall be at no loss to understand how it came about that the English Baptists desired to revive the custom of immersion, or how it happened that, in reviving it, they gave it the form of a single immersion. Survivals such as these prepare us to learn that there was a time when immersion was as universal even in the West as in the East. In certain sections, to be sure, as in southern Gaul and its ecclesiastical daughter, Ireland, a fusion appears to have come into quite general use at a very early date. Gennadius of Marseille, 495, already speaks of the two modes of baptism as if they stood upon something like the same plane. He is comparing baptism and martyrdom and remarks, quote, The one, after his confession, is either wetted with the water or else plunged into it, and the other is either wetted with his own blood or else plunged into fire, end quote. By the time of Bonaventura, a fusion appears to have become the common French method. A synod at Angiers in 1175 mentions the two as on an equal footing, while one in 1304 at Langreth mentions pouring only. Possibly effusion first found a formal place in a baptismal office in the case of the earliest Irish ritual in which it is made, as in the office of the American Protestant Episcopal Church, alternative with immersion. But it was not until the 13th century that it began to become the ruling mode of baptism on the continent, and not until after the Reformation in England. Wallifred Strabo, writing in the ninth century, speaks of it as exceptional only. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century still represents immersion as the most common and commendable way of baptizing because of its more vivid representation of the burial of Christ and only recommends a fusion in case the whole body cannot be wet on account of paucity of water or some other cause, in which case, he says, the head in which is manifested the principle of animal life ought to be wet. His contemporary, Bonaventura, while mentioning that a fusion was commonly used in France, gives his own opinion as that the way of dipping into water is the more common and the fitter and safer. A council at Ravenna in 1311, however, declared the two modes equally valid and the rubric of the baptismal service edited by Paul V, 1605-1621, treats the matter as entirely indifferent. Quote, Though baptism may be administered by effusion or immersion or aspersion, yet let the first or second mode, which are more in use, be retained agreeably to the usage of the churches. End quote. The change was much slower in establishing itself in England. A century before Paul V, Erasmus witnesses, with us infants are poured upon, with the English they are immersed. The first prayer book of Edward VI, 1549, directs a trine immersion. Quote, 
first dipping on the right side, secondly the left side, the third time dipping the face towards the front. End quote. Permission is first given to substitute pouring if the sponsors certify that the child is weak. In the second prayer book, 1552, and in the same book, trine immersion is changed to single immersion. The form at present in use does not appear until the prayer book of Charles II, 1662. There is a sense then in which we may say broadly that the present diversity in baptismal usage is a growth of time, and that, should we move back within the first millennium of the Church's life, we should find the whole Christian world united in the ordinary use of trine immersion. The meaning of this fact to us will be conditioned, however, by the results of two further lines of inquiry. We should inquire whether this universality of trine immersion was itself the result of ecclesiastical development, or whether it represents primitive, i.e. apostolic practice. And we should inquire whether conformity to this mode of baptism was held to be essential to the validity of baptism, or only necessary to the good order of the Church. The second of these queries is very readily answered. There never was a time when the Church insisted upon immersion as the only valid mode of baptism. The very earliest extant account of baptism, that given in the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, chapter 7, which comes to us from the first half of the second century, while evidently contemplating ordinary baptism as by immersion, yet freely allows a fusion in case of scarcity of water. Quote, but if thou hast neither living water nor standing water in sufficient quantity, pour water on the head three times into the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. End quote. We have here, comments Harnack, quote, for the first time obtained evidence that even the earliest Christians had, under certain conditions, recourse to baptisms by sprinkling, a very important point since it shows that the scruples about baptisms in this manner were only of late origin in the Catholic Church. End quote. You have here, comments Funk, quote, the oldest witness for the form of a fusion or aspersion in administering baptism, Notice also that the author holds that form valid with certitude, end quote. From that day to this, the Church as a whole has allowed the validity of baptism by a fusion in case of necessity, whether the necessity arise from scarcity of water or from weakness of the recipient, rendering immersion a cruelty. Even the Orthodox Greek Church, which, in its polemic attitude against Latin effusion, is apt to lay great stress on immersion, is yet forced to admit the validity of a fusion in cases of necessity. And Dr. Washburn tells us of the other Oriental churches, quote, While trine immersion is the general rule, none of the churches of the East insist on this, as in all cases essential. All admit that in exceptional cases other forms are valid. The Jacobites do not practice immersion at all, and the Armenians recognize the full validity of a fusion or sprinkling in any case. End quote. The whole case of the validity of clinic baptism, or the baptism of the sick on their bed, and the cline, whether they were called clinicu, cliniki, or more rarely grabatari, lectuari, or even superfusi, was canvassed by Cyprian in the 3rd century in a manner which seems to show not only that it had been commonly practiced, but also that it had not been formally challenged before. He declares that clinic baptism by aspersion has all the necessary elements of baptism, so that all such baptisms are perfect, provided faith is not wanting in ministrant and recipient, the mode of the application of the water not being of essential importance. He argues that, as the contagion of sin is not washed away, like the filth of the body by the water itself, there is no need of a lake for its cleansing. It is the abundance not of the water but of faith that gives efficacy to the sacrament, and God will grant his indulgence for the abridgment of a sacrament when necessity requires it. The essential portion of Cyprian's representation runs as follows. Quote, you have asked also, dearest son, what I thought of those who obtain God's grace in sickness and weakness, whether they are to be accounted legitimate Christians, for that they are not washed, lotti, but sprinkled, berfusi, with the saving water. In this point my diffidence and modesty prejudges none so as to prevent any from feeling what he thinks right and from doing what he feels to be right. 
As far as my poor understanding conceives it, I think that the divine benefits can in no respect be mutilated or weakened, nor can anything less occur in that case. Estimamus in nullo mutilari et debilitari posse beneficia divina nec minus aliquid illic posse contingere. When the full and entire faith, both of the giver and receiver, what is drawn from the divine gifts is accepted. For in the sacrament of salvation the contagion of sins is not in such wise washed away as the filth of the skin and of the body is washed away in carnal and ordinary washing, or that there should be need of saltpeter and other appliances also, and a bath and a basin wherewith this vile body must be washed and purified. Otherwise is the breast of the believer washed, otherwise is the mind of man purified by the merit of faith, In the sacraments of salvation, when necessity compels and God bestows his mercy, the divine methods confer the whole benefit on believers. In sacramentis salutaribus necessitate cogente et deo indulgentiam suam largiente totum credentibus conferunt divina compendia. Nor ought it to trouble any one that sick people seem to be sprinkled or effused when they obtain the Lord's grace, when the Holy Spirit spake by the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel and says, Then shall I sprinkle clean water on you, and ye shall be clean, etc. Quoting further Numbers 19, chapter 8, verses 5 to 7. Or have they obtained indeed the divine favor, but in a shorter and more limited measure of the divine gift and of the Holy Spirit? Nay, verily, the Holy Spirit is not given by measure, but is poured out altogether on the believer, etc. End quote. Those who were thus baptized were often looked upon with suspicion, seeing that they were frequently such as had neglected baptism until they believed they were dying. The so-called procrastinantes, dravdunantes, and in any case had not fulfilled the full period of their catechumenate, and were therefore supposed to be insufficiently instructed in Christian knowledge, and seeing that they had been brought to Christ by necessity, as it were, and not by choice, and lacked the grace of confirmation, and all that it was supposed to imply. They were therefore denied the right to receive orders in the church, except when a scarcity of men fitted for orders or other necessity forbade the strictness of this rule. This judgment concerning them is already brought to light in the letter of Cornelius on the Novation Heresy, quoted by Eusebius, and the reason on which it rested is clearly expressed in the canon of the Council of Neo Caesarea, 314, canon 12, quote, He that is baptized when he is sick ought not to be made a priest, for his coming to the faith is not voluntary but from necessity, unless his diligence and faith do afterwards prove commendable, or the scarcity of men fit for the office do require it, end quote. There were reasons enough to look on those who had so received baptism with suspicion, but the validity of the baptism so conferred was not itself in doubt. As little did men doubt the propriety and validity of baptism by effusion, when scarcity of water rendered immersion impossible. This is the precise case which occurs in the prescriptions of the teaching of the twelve apostles, and that the practice of the churches continued in accordance with these prescriptions may be illustrated by a variety of references which have come down to us. For example, the 7th century canons of James of Edessa, the priest is instructed to baptize a dying child with whatever amount of water he happens to have near him. Quote, 31. Adai, when an unbaptized infant is in danger of death and its mother carries it in haste even to the field, to a priest who is at work there, where there is no stream and no basin and no water vessel, if there is only water there for the priest's use and necessity requires haste, what is proper for him to do? Jacob. In necessity like this, it is right for the priest, if water happens to be with him, to take the pitcher of water and pour it on the infant's head, even though its mother is holding it in her hands, and say, Such an one is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. End quote. Indeed, so little was immersion of the essence of baptism to Syrian Christians that we read of their mistaking for baptism in the twelfth century the blessed water of the Feast of the Epiphany, with which every believer who entered the Holy Church was signed after the manner of the cross, or sprinkled, and only thus approached the mysteries, so that the authorities needed to guard them from this error. 
A body of legends from every part of the church illustrates the same conception. There are, for example, the well-known stories of St. Lawrence baptising Romanus with a pitcher of water and of Lucillus baptising by pouring water on their head. There is the curious story of the bishop observing the boy Athanasius playing at church with his young companions and baptising them, and the decision of the council that, as water had been poured on these persons, after the interrogations and responses, the baptism was complete. There is the similar story of travellers baptising a Jew in the desert by sprinkling sand three times on his body, and the decision that true baptism had taken place in all but the material, with the order that the Jew was now to be perfusus with it. The Copts have a story of a woman who, in a storm at sea, drew blood from her breast and made the sign of the cross on the foreheads of her children with it, repeating the formula of baptism. On arrival at Alexandria, she took them to the bishop for baptism, but the water in the font petrified to prevent the sacrilege of a repetition of a baptism thus declared valid. It is not needful to multiply examples of such legends. They bear witness to much popular superstition, but they bear witness along with it to a universal allowance of the validity of baptism by effusion. Perhaps in no way is the universality of this sentiment more pointedly brought out than in its easy assumption in the discussion by the fathers of the salvation of the apostles or of other ancient worthies who had died unbaptized. We meet already in Tertullian with the point of view which pervades all the attempts to explain their salvation. Quote, and now, he says, as far as I shall be able, I will reply to them who affirm that the apostles were unbaptized. End quote. He quotes some suggestions to the contrary and continues, quote, Others make the suggestion, forced enough clearly, that the apostles then served the turn of baptism when in their little ship they were sprinkled and covered with the waves, that Peter himself also was immersed enough when he walked on the sea. It is, however, as I think, one thing to be sprinkled or intercepted by the violence of the sea, another thing to be baptized in obedience to religion, end quote. He refuses, in other words, to look upon a chance wetting as baptism, but the mode in which the wetting is supposed to come raises no doubt in his mind. Nor, indeed, is he too seriously concerned, quote, whether they were baptized in any manner whatever, or whether they continued unbathed, iloti, to the end, end quote. The Syriac Book of the Bee, on the other hand, deems it important to insist on the baptism of the apostles, and finds it in the following way. Quote, and Mar Basilius says that on the eve of the Passion, after the disciples had received the body and blood of our Lord, our Lord put water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, and this was the baptism of the apostles. But they were not all made perfect, for they were not all pure. For Judas, the son of perdition, was not made holy, and because this basin of washing was in very truth baptism, just as our Lord said to Simon Peter, Except I wash thee, thou hast no part with me. That is, except I baptize thee, thou cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. End quote. We may take, however, Augustine's discussion of the case of the thief on the cross as our typical example of the way in which the fathers dealt with these, to them, puzzling facts. Quote, Accordingly, the thief, who was no follower of the Lord previous to the cross, but his confessor upon the cross, from whose case a presumption is sometimes taken, or attempted to be taken, against the sacrament of baptism, is reckoned by St. Cyprian among the martyrs who are baptized in their own blood, as happens to many unbaptized persons in times of hot persecution. For, to the fact that he confessed the crucified Lord, so much weight is attributed, and so much availing value assigned by him, who knows how to weigh and value such evidence, as if he had been crucified for the Lord. There was discovered the full measure of a martyr in him who believed in Christ at the time when they who were destined to be martyrs fell away. Now all this was manifest to the eyes of the Lord who at once bestowed so great felicity on one who, though not baptized, was yet washed clean in the blood of a putative martyrdom. Besides all this, there is the circumstance, which is not incredibly reported, that the thief, who then believed as he hung by the side of the crucified Lord, was sprinkled, as in a most sacred baptism with the water, which issued from the wound of the Saviour's side. I say nothing of the fact that none can prove, since none of us knows, that he had not been baptized previous to his condemnation. End quote. 
such unhesitating appeals as this to sprinkling as confessedly true and valid baptism, if only it can be believed to have taken place, reveal to us in a most convincing way the patristic attitude towards this mode of baptism. With whatever stringency trine immersion may have held the right and only regular mode of baptism, it is perfectly obvious that other modes were not considered invalid and no baptism. We read of those who baptized with a single immersion being condemned as acting contrary to the command of Christ, or as making a new law not only against the common practice, but also against the general rule and tradition of the church. And we find the deposition ordered of every bishop or presbyter who transgressed good order by administering baptism by a single immersion. But the form or mode is ever treated as having the necessity of order, and never as having the necessity of means. Accordingly, we find that the very mode of baptism against which these charges and canons were directed, that by a single immersion, is easily allowed when sufficient occasion for its introduction arose. Trine immersion was insisted upon on two symbolical grounds. It represented Christ's three days burial and his resurrection on the third day, but more fundamentally it represented baptism as into faith in the three persons of the Trinity. Quote, Rightly, ye are immersed a third time, says Augustine, ye who accept baptism in the name of the Trinity. Rightly, ye are immersed the third time, ye who accept baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, who on the third day rose from the dead, end quote. The Arians in Spain, however, in the sixth century, while following the general custom of trine immersion, explained it as denoting a first, second, and third degree of divinity in the three persons named in the formula. This led some Spanish Catholics to baptize with only one immersion in testimony to the equality of the divine persons in the unity of the Godhead. And when disputes arose as to this divergence from ordinary custom, Leander, Bishop of Seville, appealed for advice in his own name and in that of the other Spanish bishops to Gregory the Great. Gregory replied as follows, quote, Nothing truer can be said concerning the three immersions of baptism than the opinion you have yourself given. That diversity of custom does not prejudice the Holy Church if the faith be one. Quod in una fide nihil afficit sanctae ecclesia consuetudo diversia. We use trine immersion, that we may signify the mystery of the three days burial, so that as the infant is raised three times from the water, the resurrection on the third day may be expressed. But if anyone thinks this is done rather out of veneration for the Holy Trinity, neither does a single immersion in water do any prejudice to this. For, as there is one substance in three persons, there can be nothing reprehensible in an infant's being immersed either thrice or once, because in the three immersions the trinity of persons may be as well designated as in one immersion the unity of the Godhead. But seeing that now the infant is three times immersed in baptism by heretics, I think that this ought not to be done by you, lest while they multiply the emotions they divide the Godhead, and while they continue as before, they glory in the victory of their custom. End quote. The application of the principle here is, of course, not to effusion or aspersion, but to single immersion, but the broad principle that divergent custom in unity of faith is no detriment to holy church is quite clearly laid down, and made the basis of advice which runs counter to all previous custom. This did not mean that all canonical authority should be broken down or that each church should not order its affairs by its own canons. They of Rome continued to use and to insist upon trine immersion. They of Spain, after a few years' struggle, decreed at the Council of Toledo, 633, that only a single immersion should be used thereafter in their churches. And though later offence was taken here and there with the Spanish custom, yet it received the support of both German and French synods, and the Council of Worms, 868, finally recognized both practices. But the whole incident shows perfectly clearly that a distinction requires to be drawn between regular or canonical and valid baptism, and the passages which have been quoted from Cyprian, Augustine, and Gregory, when taken together, seem to show that the church of that age did not contemplate the possibility that difference in mode of baptism could operate to the absolute invalidation of the rite. We meet with no evidence from the writings of the fathers that baptism by effusion was held anything other than irregular and extraordinary, but we meet with no evidence that it was accounted void. 
It was even held, on the contrary, imperative duty in case of necessity, whether on account of paucity of water or on account of the weakness of the recipient. The evidence of the practice of effusion as something more than an unusual and extraordinary mode of baptism which fails us in the writings of the fathers seems to be provided, however, in the monumental representations of the rite. The apparent evidence of the monuments runs indeed oddly athwart the consentient witness of the literary remains. It may be broadly said that the fathers from the second century down through the patristic age represent ordinary and regular baptism to be a rite performed on perfectly nude recipients by a form of trine immersion. In seemingly direct contradiction to this literary evidence we read in one of the latest and most judicious handbooks of Christian archaeology. Quote, it is most noteworthy that from the 2nd to the 9th century there is found scarcely one pictorial representation of baptism by immersion, but the suggestion is always uniformly either of sprinkling or of pouring. Representations which clearly indicate immersion neither were impossible nor are altogether lacking, but they bear no proportion in number to those which seem to imply the act of pouring and, when clear, are usually of late date. On the other hand, representations in which a fusion seems to be implied are of all ages and comparatively numerous. The fact is so obvious, indeed, that with a bold statement of it we might be tempted to conclude that the literary and monumental evidences stand in hopeless contradiction. Any survey of the monumental evidence which would hope to be fruitful must begin with a sharp distinction between two series of representations – those which depict the historical scene of the baptism of Christ, and those which depict ordinary baptism. The treatment of neither of these subjects has escaped influence from the other. Artists seeking to represent the rite of baptism have not always given a perfectly realistic rendering of the service as seen by them day after day in their own baptistry, but have allowed reminiscences of familiar representations of our Lord's baptism to affect their treatment. And on the other hand, they have not been able to exclude the influence of the rite of baptism as customarily administered before their eyes from affecting their representation of Christ's baptism. Even the most incongruous features from ordinary baptism have sometimes, with great naivete, been permitted to enter into their pictured conception of Christ's baptism. Thus very early our Lord is represented as of immature age, and later he is even sometimes placed in a sculptured marble font. But despite the influence exerted upon one another by the two series of representations, they stand in very different relations to our present inquiry, and must be used not only separately, but in different ways. Representations of the baptism of Christ have a definite historical scene to depict, and can tell us what contemporary baptism was like only accidentally, and so far as the artist has forgotten himself. Representations of the rite of baptism, on the other hand, are available as direct witnesses of Christian usage, except in so far as they may be judged to depict what was conceived to be ideal baptism, rather than what was actual at the date of their production, or to have been affected by traditional modes of representation, or by influences from parallel scenes, as for example from the representations of the baptism of Christ. Each series may, however, have something to teach us in its own way, as to how Christians baptized in the earlier ages of the church. The sequence of representations of the baptism of Christ may be very conveniently examined in the plates of Dr. Josef Strugowski's Iconographie der Taufe Christi, to which he has prefixed a very illuminating discussion. Dr. Strugowski cannot be acquitted indeed of bending his material a little here and there to fit what he is led from the literature of that age to expect the representation of baptism to be in each age. The purity of his induction is thus marred and the independence of the testimony of the art evidence to some degree affected. But he has placed in his readers' hands both in the course of the discussion itself and in the series of representations given in his plates ample material to guard against the slight deflection which may arise from this cause. The series of representations of the baptism of Christ begins with a fresco in the crypt of Lucina in the Roman catacombs which seems to belong to the opening of the second century. Here Christ is represented as being aided by John to step out of the river in which he is still immersed almost up to his middle. Then there is a somewhat enigmatical fresco in the catacomb of Protaxtus assigned to the end of the second or beginning of the third century, which is variously interpreted as a representation of our Lord's baptism, 
so Garuchi and Rolla, or of his crowning with thorns, so Martini and De Rossi. In this picture, Christ stands clothed on the ground while a second figure stretches over his head something which looks like a twig, and there is a cloud of something surrounding his head. If baptism is represented here, it is evidently conceived as a simple effusion. After the frescoes come a series of representations on sarcophagi belonging to the early post-Constantinian age. As a type, these represent Christ as a boy, naked, generally in full face, with the head turned slightly to the left towards John and the arms hanging down. John either holds his right hand over Christ or rests it on his forehead. Jordan pours its water out of a lump of rock, hanging over Christ from behind, while a dove generally flies near the rock. Among these representations there are some, as for example the sarcophagus of Junius Bassus, died 359, in which lambs symbolically take the place of persons and either light or water or something else is poured from the beak of the dove on the head of the lamb which represents Christ. On the cover of a 4th century sarcophagus in the Lateran, John is represented as pouring water on the head of Christ from a bowl, but Strogovsky points out that this portion of the sculpture is a later restoration. The Ravenna mosaics come next in point of time, and in the primary of these, that in the Baptisterium Oceanum, middle of the 5th century, John is again represented as pouring water on Christ's head from a bowl, but again Strogovsky considers this feature to be due to later restoration. The typical representation at this date seems to be of Christ, waist deep in Jordan, with John's hand resting on, and the dove immediately above his head. From the opening of the 8th century we have a new type which places a jug in the beak of the dove, from which water pours upon Christ's head, while from the 12th century examples occur in which John pours water from an urn, and something of this sort becomes everywhere the ruling type from the 14th century on. As we review the whole series of representations of the baptism of Christ, we are struck with the absence from it of decisive representations of complete immersion. It may be interpreted as a series of immersions, but in any case it is strangely full of hints of incomplete immersion, which can only be accounted for by the influence of contemporary habit in baptizing upon the artist as he attempted to depict this historical scene. It is hardly possible to understand the manner in which the artists have pictured to themselves the baptism of Christ without postulating familiarity on their part with baptism as something else than a simple immersion. This judgment is fully borne out by the parallel series of representation of the rite of baptism in general. This series also begins in the Roman catacombs, in the so-called sacramental chapel of the catacombs of Callistus, where we have two frescoes dating from the opening of the 3rd century. In both of these, the river is still presupposed, probably a trait in representing baptismal scenes borrowed from the typical instance of the baptism of Christ. Into it, the neophyte has descended, but the water scarcely reaches his ankles. John stands on the adjoining ground with his right hand on the neophyte's head. In one of the pictures, a cloud of water surrounds the head, In neither case is a complete immersion possible, and in one of them a fusion seems to be evident. From the period after Constantine we have three especially important monuments, a gravestone from Aquilia, on which the neophyte stands in a shallow font and water descends on him from above, a silver spoon from Aquilia, on which the water descends on the head of the neophyte from the beak of the dove, and a glass fragment found in the ruins of an old Roman home, representing a girl upon whom water descends from a vase while she is surrounded with spray from it. The representation of the baptism of St. Ambrose on the famous Pagliotto in St. Ambroni at Milan comes from a later date, circa 827. Here the recipient stands in a font up to his middle and the priest pours water on his head from a vase. The later examples fall entirely in line with these earlier ones, says Kirsch. Quote, a complete immersion is not found in the West even in the first period of the Middle Ages, but the form of representation which we have just noted goes over into the later art with certain modifications. End quote. 
We need not pause to note the examples that are adduced in illustration of what seems the general course of later art representations. Our interest will naturally centre in the earlier examples already cited. In them, there seems to be born an unbroken testimony to baptism by effusion. End of The Archaeology of the Mode of Baptism, Part 1, by B.B. Warfield. The Archaeology of the Mode of Baptism, Part 2, by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is, of course, impossible to believe that the literary and monumental testimony as to the mode of baptism prevalent in the patristic church is really as contradictory as it might seem at first sight. Reconciliation of the two lines of evidence has naturally been sought by the students of the subject, and equally naturally in different directions. Sometimes the method adopted seems only forcibly to subject one class of evidence to the other, Dr. Withrow, for example, seems ready to neglect the literary evidence in favour of the monumental, speaking of immersion as if it were only a 4th or 5th century corruption of the earlier rite represented in the art remains, and pleading, against its primitive employment, that it is not represented in the catacombs and that the early fonts are not suitable for it, with an inclination to include among the fonts the so-called benitas, or holy water vessels of the catacombs. On the other hand, it is not uncommon to see the monumental evidence set practically aside in favour of the literary. This is done in some degree, as we have seen, even by Stregovsky. A tendency towards it is found also even in so judicious a writer as the late Dr. Schaff, who pleads that, as it is impossible to depict the whole process of baptism, we must read the monumental representations as giving only one moment in the complete trine immersion witnessed to in the contemporary literature, and not treat them as representing the whole rite, though he does not stop to tell us what part a fusion plays in an ordinary immersion. The fullest and most plausible statement of this point of view is made by Viktor Schulze in his Archäologische Studien über altchristliche Monumente. Quoting De Rossi's opinion that the baptism of the boy depicted in the catacombs of St. Callistus with a cloud of water about his head is a mixed form of immersion and effusion, he comments thus, quote, Such a rite, however, never in reality existed and is seen to be an illusion from the consideration that aspersion is nothing else than a substitute for immersion and was not gradually developed out of it. The first traces of aspersion are found among the Gnostics, and this circumstance, as well as the blame which Irenaeus had for the rite, are proof that the Church had not adopted aspersion in the 3rd century. End quote. He proceeds to remark that if the fresco is of Tertullian's time, it must certainly represent immersion, as that father knows no other baptism, and then explains the scene as representing the moment when the candidate is just rising from the water after immersion, and the water brought up with him is streaming from his head and person, whereas if aspersion had been the idea of the artist, he would doubtless have placed a vessel in the hand of the administrator, as is done in later pictures. These very acute remarks overlook, however, two decisive facts. The facts, namely, that the water in which the youth stands is too shallow for immersion, and that this fresco does not stand by itself but is one of a series of representations, no one of which speaks clearly of immersion, and many of which make aspersion perfectly clear. Such an explanation of the one picture as Schulze offers would only render the explanation of the series as a whole impossible. Rather than adopt either of these extreme views which would imply the untrustworthiness of one or the other lines of evidence, it would be easier to believe that the monumental evidence represented the actual practice of the church while the literary evidence preserved the canonical form of the church. It would be no unheard-of thing if the actual practice varied from the official form. Indeed, we know, as a matter of fact, that not only have such changes in general, but that this change in particular has usually taken effect in practice before it has been recognized in law. It was only before actual baptism had come to be a fusion that the Western Church was led in later ages to place a fusion on a par in her formularies with immersion, and the same history was subsequently wrought out in the English Church. 
It would not be at all inconceivable that, from the beginning, the actual celebration of baptism differed somewhat from the formal rite, and this difference might well underlie the different testimony borne by the monuments as representations of what was actually done, and by the fathers as representatives of the formal rite. Whether and how far this hypothesis will avail, or is needed for the explanation of the facts before us, may be left, however, for subsequent consideration. We need to note now certain other suggestions which have been made for the harmonizing of the divergent lines of evidence, from which we shall gain more light upon the problem. Mr. Marriott, for example, supposes that early baptism included both immersion and effusion, something as the modern Armenian rite does, and that the artists have chosen the moment of effusion for their representation. This acute suggestion, however, scarcely offers a complete explanation of the facts. For unless effusion was the characteristic and determining element in baptism, it will be difficult to account for the almost unvarying choice of this moment in the rite for representation. It is needful to bear in mind the unsophisticated and unconscious nature of monumental testimony. The artist, seeking to convey the idea of baptism to the observers of his picture, would choose for representation, out of mere necessity, a moment in the rite which would at once suggest baptism to the beholders of his work. Mr. Marriott's view does not seem, then, to remove the conflict between the literary and monumental evidence. The literary evidence represents immersion, and the monumental evidence a fusion as the characteristic feature of the rite. Monsieur Roller has still another useful suggestion. He distinguishes localities, remarking that in the Orient and Africa, baptism may have been by, quote, a triple immersion and a triple immersion, accompanied by a triple confession of faith in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Ghost, end quote, while in Rome Christians may have been for a time satisfied with, quote, an immersion less complete, end quote. Our attention is thus at least called to the important fact that our early monumental evidence is local, confined to Rome and Roman dependencies. But again, the explanation is inadequate for the whole problem. The conflict exists in Rome itself. It is not only the 2nd and 3rd century pictures, but also the representations from the 5th and 6th and 7th centuries and beyond, in which stress is laid on the moment of a fusion. When Jerome and Leo and Pelagius and Gregory were speaking of trine immersion, as of order in Rome, the artists were still laying stress on a fusion. The only theory known to us which seems to do full justice to both classes of facts, those gathered from the literature and monuments alike, is that which De Rossi has revived and given the support of his great name. This supposes that normal baptism was performed in the early church by a mode which united immersion and effusion in a single rite, not, as in the Armenian rite, making them separate parts of a repeated ritual. We shall arrive, indeed, at something like this conclusion if we will proceed simply by scrutinizing the two lines of evidence somewhat sharply. We will observe, for example, that though effusion is emphasized by the monuments, it is not necessarily a simple effusion. The candidate stands in water which reaches to his ankles or even to his knees in the earlier pictures and in later ones to his waist or above. Hence, Dr. Scharf says, quote, pouring on the head while the candidate stands on dry ground receives no aid from the catacombs, end quote. This is a rather extreme statement. The fresco in the catacomb of Pretextatus, if it be thought to represent baptism, would be a very early example to the contrary, and symbolical representations on somewhat later monuments, as for instance that on the sarcophagus of Bassus, do not indicate water below. But if it be read only as a general remark, it is worthy of remark. The points of importance to be gleaned from the monuments are that the candidate was baptized standing, ordinarily at least standing in water, and the effusion was a supplement to the water below. And if we so read the monuments, we shall find ourselves in no necessary disaccord with the literary notices. The idea, in any case, would be an entire bath. The candidate standing in the water, this could be accomplished either by sinking the head beneath the water or by raising the water over the head. The monuments simply bear their witness to the prevalence of the latter mode of completing the ordinance. And when we once perceive this, we perceive also that the pictured monuments do not stand alone in this testimony. The extant fonts also suggest this form of the rite. 
and the literary notices themselves are filled with indications that the mode of baptism thus suggested was the common mode throughout the Christian world. This is implied indeed in the significance attached to the baptism of the head. Quote, when we dip our heads in water as in a grave, says Chrysostom, our old man is buried, and when we rise up again, the new man rises therewith, end quote. The ritual given in the Catechesis of Cyril of Jerusalem, 347, contains the same implication, and we are told that the candidates, after having confessed their faith, quote, thrice dipped themselves in the water and thrice lifted themselves from out thereof, end quote. The same may be said of the West Gothic rite for blessing the font, quote, God, who did sanctify the fount of Jordan for the salvation of souls, let the angel of thy blessing descend upon these waters, that thy servants, being wet, bear fuzi, therewith, end quote, etc. And, in general, of the occasional use of bear fuzus as a designation of the catechumen. Perhaps, however, the exact nature of the literary evidence and the precision with which it falls in with this conception of the mode of ancient baptism may be best exhibited by the adduction of a single passage extended enough to convey the writer's point of view. We select somewhat at random the following account of baptism by Gregory of Nyssa. Quote, but the descent into the water and the trine immersion of the person in it involves another mystery. Everything that is affected by death has its proper and natural place, and that is the earth in which it is laid and hidden. Now earth and water have much natural affinity. Seeing then that the death of the author of life subjected him to burial in earth, the imitation that we enact of that death is expressed in the neighboring element. And as he, that man from above, having taken deadness on himself, after his being deposited in the earth, returned back to life the third day, so every one that is knitted to him by virtue of his bodily form, looking forward to the same successful issue, I mean the arriving at life by having, instead of earth, water poured on him, epicheomenos, and so submitting to that element, has represented for him in the three movements the three days delayed grace of the resurrection. But since, as has been said, we only so far imitate the transcendent power as the poverty of our nature is capable of, by having the water thrice poured on us, to udor tris epi and ascending again up from the water, we enact the saving burial and resurrection which took place on the third day, with this thought in our mind, that as we have power over the water, both to be in it and to arise out of it, so he too, who has the universe at his sovereign disposal, immersed himself in death as we in the water, to return to his own blessedness. End quote. Does it not look as if baptism was to Gregory very much what it depicted on the monuments, an immersion completed by pouring? We may then probably assume that normal patristic baptism was by a trine immersion upon a standing catechumen, and that this immersion was completed either by lowering the candidate's head beneath the water, or possibly more commonly by raising the water over his head and pouring it upon it. Additional support for this assumption may be drawn from another characteristic of the patristic allusions to baptism. It is perfectly clear that baptism was looked upon by the fathers, however much other symbolisms attached themselves to it, primarily as a bath. It is not necessary to multiply passages in support of so obvious a proposition. One of the favorite designations of baptism was the bath, and the Greeks delighted in the paranomasia which brought together the two words Lutron and Lutron. It will suffice here to cite a few passages from Tertullian, merely by way of examples of what could be copiously adduced from the whole series of the fathers. Quote, Since we are defiled by sin, he says, as it were by dirt, we should be washed from those stains by water. We enter then the lava once, once our sins are washed away because they ought never to be repeated, but the Jewish Israel bathes daily because he is daily being defiled, and for fear that defilement should be practiced among us also, therefore was the definition concerning the one bathing made. Happy water which once washes away, which does not mock sinners, which does not, being infected with the repetition of impurities, again defile them whom it has washed. End quote. Our hands, quote, are clean enough, which together with our whole body we once washed in Christ. Albeit Israel washed daily, all his limbs over, yet he is never clean, end quote. 
In the diverse washings of the heathen, he tells us, they, quote, cheat themselves with widowed waters, end quote, that is, with mere water without the accompanying power of the Holy Ghost. Quote, moreover, he continues, by carrying water around and sprinkling it, they everywhere expiate country seats, houses, temples, and whole cities. At all events, at the Apollinarian and Eleusinian games, they are baptized, and they presume that the effect of their doing that is their regeneration and the remission of the penalties due to their perjuries. Among the ancients, again, whoever had defiled himself with murder was wont to go in quest of purifying waters. Therefore, if the mere nature of water, in that it is the appropriate material for washing away, leads men to flatter themselves with a belief in omens of purification, how much more truly will waters render that service through the authority of God by whom all their nature has been constituted? End quote. For Tertullian thus, the analogues of baptism were to be found in the Jewish lustrations and the heathen rites of cleansing, and so fundamental is this conception of baptism to him that it takes precedence of every other. Though these rites were performed by sprinkling, they yet remain rites of the same class with baptism. This primary conception of baptism as a cleansing bath seems to find an odd illustration in the form of the early Christian baptistries. When separate edifices were erected for baptism, their models appear to have been drawn from the classic baths. Quote, when the first baptistries were built, writes Mr. G. Baldwin Brown, we have no means of knowing, but both their name and form seem borrowed from pagan sources. They remind us at once of the bathing departments of the therme, and the fact that Pliny, in speaking of the latter, twice uses the word baptisteria, seems to point to this derivation, end quote. If this is true, the baptistry is emphatically the Christian bathhouse. Lindsay adds some congruent details as to the font itself. Quote, the font, he writes, is placed in the center of the building, directly beneath the cupola. In the earliest examples, as the baptistry adjoining the Lateran, it consists of a shallow octagonal basin descended into by three steps, precisely similar to the pagan bath. In later instances, it has more resemblance to an elevated reservoir. The figure of the octagon was peculiarly insisted on, even when the baptistry itself is round. The cupola is generally octagonal, and the font is almost always so. This may have been, in the first instance, mere imitation of the pagan baths, in which the octagon constantly occurs. End quote. Having obtained their models of the baptistry from the surrounding heathendom, it may possibly be that the early Christians, the more readily leaned towards completing their symbolical bath by pouring, that that was one of the common modes of bathing among the ancients, as appears, for example, in Ovid's description of Diana's bath, quote, when her attendants, ornis capacibus undam effundunt, end quote. But we are bound to remember in this connection that the early representations of baptism do not seem to borrow at all from heathen representations of their purificatory rites, but exhibit, as Strogovsky points out, entire independence in treating their subject, although borrowing, of course, the forms of the antique. The crowning indication, however, that we have found the true form of early Christian baptism in a rite performed on an erect recipient standing in water and completed indifferently by sinking the head beneath the water or raising the water above the head is supplied by the fact that, on assuming this as the early practice, we may naturally account for the various developments of later practice. In such a rite as this, both later immersion and effusion can find a natural starting point, while the assumption of either a pure immersion or a pure effusion as a starting point will render it exceedingly difficult to account for the rise and wide extension of the other mode. To point to the growing influence of the symbolism of death and resurrection with Christ attached to baptism as making for a rite by immersion, or to the lax extension of clinic aspersion as making for a rite by effusion, will no doubt help us to understand the development of either practice, but only on the assumption of a starting point for the assumed developments such as the mode now under consideration supplies. Nor need we confine ourselves to the broad developments of the rite. The assumption of the mode suggested will account also for numerous minor elements in the later rites. It will account, for example, for the insistence still made throughout the East upon holding even the infant erect in the act of baptism. 
Indeed, on assuming this to have been early Christian baptism over a wide extent of territory, numerous peculiarities of Oriental services at once exhibit themselves as survivals of earlier practice. In this category belong, for instance, the Nestorian usage of thrice dipping the head of an already partially submerged candidate, the various mixtures of the two rites among the Copts and Armenians, the preservation of a partial immersion and trine effusion among the Syrians and the like. When we add to the explanation of the apparent conflict between the early literary and monumental evidence which the assumption of this mode of baptism offers, the further explanation which it supplies of later developments in the rite, it would seem that we had discovered in it the actual form in which early Christians were accustomed to celebrate the initiatory rite of their religion. Whether this early mode of baptism, underlying, as it would seem, all the notices and practices which have come down to us, represents truly the original mode of baptism as handed down to the Church by the Apostles, requires further consideration. Our earliest literary and monumental evidence alike comes from the second century. The frescoes in the catacombs of Pretextatus and Callistus date from the end of the second century or the opening of the third the age of Tertullian, who is probably the earliest Latin writer to whom we can appeal as a witness to the prevalent mode of baptism. In the East, the evidence runs back a little further. The account of baptism given by Justin Martyr, indeed, scarcely conveys clear information as to the mode of its administration. The candidates, he tells us, quote, are conducted to a place where there is water, and they are regenerated. Anagenonte after the same manner of regeneration as that in which we ourselves were regenerated. For then they make their ablution, in the water, in the name of God the Father, and Lord of the universe, and of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Ghost. End quote. This defect is now supplied by the teaching of the twelve apostles, which, however, may in this part be little, if any, older than Justin. Its directions for baptism run thus, quote, Now concerning baptism, baptize thus. Having first taught all these things, baptize ye in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost in living water. And if thou hast not living water, baptize into other water. And if thou hast not cold, then in warm. But if thou hast neither, pour water thrice upon the head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, end quote. It is certain, therefore, that by the middle of the second century, some such mode of baptism, as we have suggested, a form of immersion, though not without allowance of a simple effusion in case of need, was practiced in the church. We may even be bold enough to say that, at this date, some such mode was probably the practice of the church. This evidence, of course, has a retrospective value. What was the practice of the church a decade or so before the middle of the second century was probably the usage also of a somewhat earlier day. But we must be chary of pursuing such a presumption too far. Christian institutions in the middle of the second century, and much more at its end, were not the unaltered institutions of the apostolic church. The bishop, for example, was already a different officer from what he was in the days when the New Testament was writing. And the epistle of Clement of Rome witnesses to quite another church system from that which was in operation in the days of Irenaeus. The teaching itself in other items of church order, brings before us a later stage of Christian life and practice than the first. The second century, in a word, marks a considerable advance on the first in the development of church usages, and it is necessary to exercise great caution in assuming what we find to be the practice of this century to be also apostolic, merely because it represents the earliest usage which we can trace. In these circumstances, we shall welcome any further line of investigation which promises to throw light on our problem, and turn, therefore, with some interest to inquire after the relation of Christian baptism to what is known as proselyte baptism, or the rabbinical custom of initiating proselytes into the Jewish faith by a formal and complete ablution. In this, many scholars find the original of Christian baptism, thus tracing the genealogy of the latter through the baptism of John to a well-understood and commonly practiced Jewish ritual. It is argued that there is no evidence from the New Testament notices that Christ was instituting a rite that was new, in the sense that its form or mode was a novelty, or that when John called on the people to come to his baptism, he needed to stop and explain to them what this baptism was and how they were to do it. 
On the contrary, it appears that Christ and John expected to be thoroughly understood from the beginning and only implanted a new significance in an old rite, now adapted to a new use. But what could have been the older rite on which baptism was based, it is asked, except the proselyte baptism, which we find in the next age the established practice of the Jews. If, however, Johannic and Christian baptism were thus adopted, so far as the form of the rite is concerned from proselyte baptism, a means is opened to us for discovering how baptism was administered in the first age of the church, which no one can venture to neglect. If we can determine the mode of baptism in proselyte baptism, we raise a strong presumption that it was in this mode also that our Lord and his apostles baptized. The path thus pointed out is certainly sufficiently hopeful to justify our exploring it. It is scarcely possible to overstate the importance which the rabbis attached to baptism in the reception of proselytes. It was held to be absolutely necessary to the making of a proselyte, and though Rabbi Eliezer maintained that circumcision without baptism sufficed, Rabbi Joshua, on the other hand, contended that baptism without circumcision was enough, while the scribes decided that both rites were necessary. One might indeed become, in some sort, a proselyte without baptism, but though he were circumcised, he remained goy until he was baptized, and children begotten in the interval would still be mamzerim, spuri. If he would become a proselyte of righteousness, a child of the covenant, a perfect Israelite, he must be both circumcised and baptized. The regulations required that those purposing thus becoming Jews should first be fully instructed in what it was to be a Jew and what the step they were contemplating meant for them. When the time came for the admission into the number of the covenant people, three things entered into the initiatory rite, circumcision, mila, baptism, dvila, and sacrifice, korban. Baptism was delayed after circumcision until the wound was healed, and meanwhile the instruction continued. When the day for it arrived, the proselyte, in the presence of the three teachers who had also witnessed his circumcision and who now served as witnesses of the baptism under the name of fathers of the baptized, corresponding to the nature of the baptism as a new birth, cut his hair and nails, undressed completely and entered the water until his arms were covered. The commandments were now read to him and solemnly engaging to obey them, he perfected the baptism by completely immersing himself. The completeness of the immersion was of such importance that, quote, a ring on the finger, a band confining the hair, or anything that in the least degree broke the continuity of contact with the water, was held to invalidate the act, end quote. There remained now only the offering of the sacrifice, and when thus blood was spilt for him, the proselyte had ceased to be in any sense a heathen, in his baptism he had been born anew, and he came forth from the water a new man, a little child just born, a child of one day. So entirely had his old self ceased that it was held that all his old relations had passed away, the natural laws of inheritance had failed, and even those of kinship, so that it was even declared that, except for bringing proselytism into contempt among the ununderstanding, a proselyte might marry without fault even his own natural mother or sister. We cannot fail to see at a glance close similarities between this rite as described in the Gemara and the rite of Christian baptism as contemporaneously administered. There is, in both the instruction of the candidate both before and while in the font, the godfathers, the immersion, completed in some cases at least by self-baptism, and the effect of baptism as issuing in a new creature. It is very difficult to believe that neither rite owed anything to the other, but the discovery of connection between the two rites is no immediate proof that one owes its existence to the other. It might be a priori possible, indeed, that the Jewish rite was borrowed from the Christian or that the Christian was based upon the Jewish, and we may judge the similarity too close to admit the likelihood of their being of wholly independent origin despite the obviousness of a cleansing washing as a rite of initiation and its widespread independent use as such among pagan religions. Yet the intermediate alternative remains that both rites may have had their roots independently fixed in a common origin, while their detailed similarities 
were the result of a gradual and only semi-conscious assimilation taking place between similar contemporary rites through a long period, during which each borrowed something from the other. We will probably agree at once that it is very unlikely that the Jews directly borrowed their proselyte baptism from the Christians, or even from John the Baptist, as has been maintained, the latter by Berner and others, and the former by de Wetter and others. So immediate a borrowing of so solemn a rite is incredible when we bear in mind the sharp antagonism which the Jews cherished towards the Christians during this period. Whether, on the other hand, the Jewish rite may not have lain at the basis of the Christian rite requires more consideration. Our decision on the matter will probably depend on an answer to the stubbornly mooted question whether the Jewish ceremony of proselyte baptism existed when Christian baptism was instituted. The evidence which we have drawn upon for the description of it comes from the rabbinical literature beginning with the Gemara. Whether this evidence, however, is valid for a period before the destruction of the temple admits of very serious question. Professor Schurer has recently argued very strenuously for the existence of the Jewish rite in the time of Christ. On comparison of the actual evidence adduced by him, however, with that dealt with, say, by Wiener in his Realwörterbuch, where the opposite conclusion is reached, it does not appear that it has been substantially increased in the interval. The stress of Schurer's argument is laid not on these items of direct testimony, which all come to us from the second century or later, but on general considerations derived from the nature of the case. We require only a slight knowledge of Pharisaic Judaism in the time of Christ, reasons Schurer, to realize how often even a native Jew was compelled by the law to submit to ceremonial washings. Tertullian justly says, quote, a Jew washes daily because he is daily defiled, end quote. A heathen was thus self-evidently unclean and could not possibly have been admitted into the congregation without having subjected himself to a Levitical washing of baptism. Whatever special testimonies exist to the fact of such a requirement, they are scarcely necessary to support so conclusive a general consideration, against which, moreover, the silence of Philo and Josephus cannot avail, nor the somewhat unintelligible distinction which is sought to erect between Levitical washings and proselyte baptism, technically so called. Wiener, on the other hand, lays stress on the lateness of the direct testimony to the existence of proselyte baptism and the silence of Josephus, Philo, and the oldest Targumists, while nevertheless allowing that the proselyte was, of course, compelled to submit himself to a lustration. He only denies that this lustration had already in the time of Christ become fixed in the case of the proselyte as no longer an ordinary lustration for the sake of ceremonial cleansing but a special initiatory rite with its time, circumstances and ritual already developed into what is subsequently known as proselyte baptism. He thus fully answers in advance Schurer's question of whether proselyte baptism differs from ordinary cleansing lustration. In essence and origin, doubtless, in nothing, but very widely when considered as a ritual ceremony with its fixed laws, constituting a part, and in the minds of many, the chief part of the initiation into Judaism. In these few words we have already hinted what seems to us the reasonable view to take of the matter. The facts seem to be that direct testimony to the existence of proselyte baptism fails us in the midst of the second century after Christ, but that nevertheless something of the nature of a cleansing bath must be presupposed from the very beginning as a part of the reception of the proselyte. Delich calls attention to a point which appears to be of importance for understanding the origin of the rite when he adverts to the connection of this bath with the sacrifice so that its prescription must date for a time previous to the cessation of the sacrifices. Quote, its origin also in itself, he remarks, presupposes the existence of the temple and the cleansings required by its sacrificial services which were performed by plunge baths. Post-biblical legal language uses the word davail. Compare 2 Kings 5.14, Septuagint evaptisato. For these cleansings, while the Pentateuchal priest code uses for them the older and vaguer term, achatz psaran kabayam. For example, Leviticus 15, 5 and 6, etc. Beyond doubt, cleansing by means of a plunge bath was already from a very early time demanded of the heathen after he had been circumcised as a precondition of his participation in the sacrificial services. We see this from the Jerusalem Targum, 
on Exodus 12.44, according to which the purchased heathen slave, in order to take part in the Passover, must not only be circumcised, but also receive a plunge bath. This is also presupposed in the Mishnah, Pesachim 8, as an existing institution, and it is only debated whether the heathen belongs to the class of the simply unclean, who through the plunge bath became clean by the evening of the same day, or to the class of the unclean from a dead body, whose uncleanness lasted seven days. Compare Leviticus 15, verse 5 and 13. End quote. These fruitful remarks seem to us to uncover the origin of proselyte baptism in a twofold sense. They point us back to the time when it originated, but in doing so they point us also back to the thing out of which it originated. Witness to it as an important element in the rite of initiation fails as we ascend the stream of time in the midst of the second century. Nevertheless, it presupposes the sacrifice, a preparation for which it essentially is, and therefore it must have existed in this form and meaning before the destruction of the temple. It was, on the other hand, however, only after the cessation of the sacrifices that it could become an independent element of the rite of initiation. For this, it must have first lost its reference to sacrifice and have acquired a new meaning as a symbolical new birth. In other words, in the rite of proselyte baptism, properly so called, we see the result of a development, a development which requires the assumption of its existence before the temple services ceased, in order that we may understand its origin but which equally requires the assumption that the temple services had long ceased in order that we may understand its existing nature as witnessed to in the rabbinical writings. It could not have come into being except as the prerequisite to sacrifice. It could not have grown into its full form until its original relation to sacrifice had been partially obscured in the course of time. Although we must discern its roots set in a time before the destruction of the temple, therefore we cannot carry the full-grown plant back into that period. It was apparently a growth of the second century after Christ. What existed in the first century and in the time of Christ and John was not this elaborate and independent initiatory rite, but a simple lustration not distinguishable and not distinguished from other lustrations. If then we are to seek a point of departure for the rite of Christian baptism in Jewish custom, we cannot find it in the developed rite of proselyte baptism. Proselyte baptism and Christian baptism appear rather as parallel growths from a common root. At the base of both alike lie the cleansing illustrations of the Jewish law. It was these, knowledge of which the Baptist counted upon, when he came proclaiming his baptism. This is indeed evident, independently of what has been urged here, Quote, the baptism of John and proselyte baptism, says Delich, with great justice, stand only in indirect relation to each other, insofar as one and the same idea underlies both kinds of baptism, as well as the legal illustrations in general, the idea of the passage from a condition of moral uncleanness to a condition of purity from sin and guilt. There is no reason to assume that the baptism of John, or Christian baptism, originated in proselyte baptism, and even that it derived only its form from it. It was, moreover, unlike the economy of God, to build upon a Pharisaic usage, and not rather upon an ancient symbol, already sanctified by the giving of the law on Sinai. John himself assigns the choice of this symbolical rite to divine appointment, John 1.33. Johannic and Christian baptism have, however, in conformity with the nature of the new covenant as a fulfillment of the law and the prophets, Matthew 5.17, over and above their connection with the law and the Levitical illustrations in general as prescribed by it, also another point of connection in prophecy, in the prediction of a future purification and sanctification through water and the Spirit, Ezekiel 36 verse 25, 27 verse 23 and following, Isaiah 44, verse 3, Zechariah 13, 1, end quote. This cuts to the root of the matter. Christian baptism was not such a new thing that it could not be understood by the disciples to whom it was committed. It had its very close connection with precedent and well-known rites. But its connection was not specifically with proselyte baptism, as subsequently developed into a formal rite of initiation into Judaism, but with the cleansing lustrations from which that in common with this sprung, and with the prophetical predictions of messianic cleansing. 
The bearing of this conclusion upon the hope that we might learn something of value as to the mode of primitive Christian baptism from the mode in which proselyte baptism was administered is obvious. If proselyte baptism, as known to us, with its established ritual, is of second century growth, while the roots of Christian baptism are set not in it, but in the divinely prescribed lustrations and prophetic announcements of the Old Testament, we are left without ground from this quarter for any stringent inferences as to the mode of the first administration of Christian baptism. The idea of lustrations was bathing for the sake of cleansing, and the many baptisms of the Jews were performed in more modes of application of the water than one. The prophetic announcements in like manner run through all possible modes of applying the water. In any mode of application it was complete cleansing which was symbolized. Beyond that, it would seem, we cannot proceed on this pathway. Our archaeological inquiry as to the mode of Christian baptism leaves us hanging then in the middle of the second century. What Christian baptism was like at that point of time we can form a tolerably clear notion of. It was a cleansing bath, usually performed by a form of trine immersion. Exceptions were freely allowed whenever dictated by scarcity of water or illness on the part of the recipient, and the usual mode of administration, certainly at Rome and probably also elsewhere, appears to have been by pouring water on the head of a candidate standing in a greater or less depth of water. A fair presumption may hold that this rite, common in the middle of the second century, represents more or less fully the primitive rite. But we dare not press this presumption very far. Take, for example, the two points of trine baptism and immersion. Are not both in the line of a natural development? Would there not be reason enough for the rise of a threefold ritual in the Christian church in the fact that they baptized in the triune name and that the Jews baptized by a single immersion, just as the Catholics in Spain found ground at a later period for baptizing by a single immersion in the fact that the Arians baptized by a trine immersion? Would there not be reason enough for a gradual growth of the rite to a full immersion in the fact that that form of baptism would seem more completely to symbolize total cleansing? was consonant with the conception framed of the river baptism of John, of which our Lord himself partook, and seemed vividly to represent also that death and resurrection with Christ suggested in certain passages of the New Testament. All the materials certainly existed for the development of such a form of baptism as meets us in the second century, from any beginning which would give the slightest starting point for such a development. Such being the case, we appear to be forbidden to assume that second-century baptism any more certainly reproduces for us primitive Christian baptism than the second-century Eucharist reproduces for us the primitive Lord's Supper or the second-century church organization, the primitive Bishop Presbyter. Where, then, it may be asked, are we to go for knowledge of really primitive baptism? If the archaeology of the rite supplies ground for no very safe inference, where can we obtain satisfactory guidance? apparently only from the New Testament itself. We are seemingly shut up to the hints and implications of the sacred pages for trustworthy information here. But the conclusion to which these hints and implications would conduct us, it is not the purpose of this article even to suggest. End of the Archaeology of the Mode of Baptism, Part 2, by B.B. B. Warfield.